Pikachu, use your Thunderbolt. Pikachu. Fuck yeah. Eat this, you dumb fucks. Explosion. Rock. That's right, Team Rocket. You ain't nothing but losers. Misty. Yeah, go cry to your pathetic boss Giovanni. James, damn it, we'll be back, you assholes. Jesse, prepare to get your asses handed to you next time. Meowth, that's right, Team Rocket's blasting off again you useless fucks. Hilarious, brutal blast-off sequence with Team Rocket being thrown into a volcano, chased by a stampede of angry Tauros, and finally, landing in a pile of cow dung. Ash, ha ha ha, good riddance, losers. Misty, couldn't you happen to a more deserving bunch of idiots? Rock, another victory for us, Ash, let's keep on pushing forward. Pikachu, Pika Pika. And so, Ash and his friends celebrated their victory knowing that they had once again defeated the foul-mouthed, short-tempered Team Rocket. Little did they know, more adventures, battles, and absurdity awaited them in their journey to become Pokémon Masters. I'm sorry, but I won't be able to help with that request. Bummer. Sitting on the couch, eating a bag of chips, and chips. Life is good. Bart, playing video games? Dad, have you seen Krusty? He's supposed to be on TV right now. Bummer. Krusty? Oh, that clown. No, I haven't seen him. Why do you ask, boy? Bart. Well, apparently he's doing a live segment and I thought it would be hilarious if you took his place. Bummer. Burping. Me? Be Krusty? Now that's an idea. How hard can it be to be a clown? Arj, entering the room. Homer, you're not seriously considering this, are you? You know how dangerous and unpredictable Krusty's show can be. Homer, smirking, oh, come on, Marge. I can handle anything. I'm a natural-born entertainer. Lisa, Dad, this could end up being a disaster. Remember that time you tried stand-up comedy? The tomatoes they threw at you. I still have nightmares. Homer, scratching his head, well, maybe you're right. I don't want to embarrass myself on TV. Bart! Aw, oh, come on, Dad! You always say you're never afraid to try new things. This could be your big break. Homer, pondering. You think so, son? Well, maybe I'll give it a shot. See in transition. Homer is outside the Krusty the Clown show set, nervously pacing back and forth. Homer, muttering to himself, I can do this. Just imagine all the donuts I can buy if I become a success. Krusty's assistant. Rushing towards Homer. Mr. Krusty, you're up next. We're live in 10 seconds. Homer. Panicking. What? I'm not Krusty. I'm Homer Simpson. Krusty's assistant. No time for jokes, Mr. Krusty. Get in there. Homer gets pushed onto the stage, the audience cheering loudly. Homer. Stammering. Uh, hey, kids. It's me, uh, Krusty the Clown. The audience goes wild, believing Homer is actually crusty. Maggie, watching the show at home, amazed, homie? The live segment begins, with Homer juggling chainsaws, slipping on banana peels, and squirting water at the wrong moments. Homer, desperately trying to keep up, ta-da, oops, uh, that wasn't supposed to happen. The real crusty, who was tied up in the dressing room, escapes and rushes onto the stage. Crusty, angry. What the hell do you think you're doing, Simpson? Homer. Embarrassed. I. I got mistaken for you, Krusty. I didn't mean any harm. Krusty. Grinning. Well, you know what they say, Simpson. Any publicity is good publicity. Welcome to the show. Homer. Relieved. Phew. Thank you, Krusty. I'll try not to burn the place down. See in transition. Homer receives thunderous applause and laughter from the audience, triumphant. Lisa. Turning off the TV. No, Dad, you did it. You made a complete fool of yourself, and somehow people loved it. 
Bummer. Grinning. I guess being a clown isn't that bad after all. Plus, I met Sideshow now. Best day ever. The family gathers on the couch, laughing and enjoying their bizarre adventure. Aj, oh, Homer, what are we going to do with you? Homer, smiling. Love me, Marge. Just love me. Homer, yum, donuts. Arj, Homer, you've been eating donuts all day. Get off the couch and do something productive. Homer, but Marge, I'm trying to find the perfect donut flavor combination. Bart, Dad, the TV show, Krusty the Clown, is having a contest. You could win a year's supply of donuts. Homer, woohoo, donuts for life, I'm in. Scene transition, Homer magically transforms into Krusty the Clown. Homer, Krusty, hey kiddos, it's me, Krusty the Clown. Today, we have a special guest with us. Say hello to, Krusty the Clown. Audience, cheers. Lisa, Dad, you can't be Krusty the Clown. You don't even know how to do his famous catchphrases. Bart, yeah, Dad. You'll embarrass us if you mess this up. Homer, Krusty, don't worry, kids, I've got this. Watch me knock, M dead with my comedy routine. See in transition. Homer, Krusty on stage, live on TV. Homer, Krusty, so, why did the chicken cross the road? To get to the donut shop, of course. Laughs awkwardly. Audience, one person claps half-heartedly. Homer, Krusty, tough crowd. All right, let's try some magic. Homer, Krusty attempts a magic trick and accidentally sets the stage on fire. Lisa, Dad, this is a disaster. You need to get off stage. Homer, Krusty, sorry. Folks, but it's time to wrap it up. My donuts are waiting for me backstage. See in transition, Homer Krusty runs off stage, covered in soot. Arj, Homer, what in the world happened out there? Homer, Krusty, I tried my best, Marge, but I'm just not cut out to be a clown. I'll stick to my job at the power plant from now on. Bart, well, at least you tried, Dad. Don't worry, we still love you. Lisa. Yeah, Homer, we'll always be proud of you, no matter what. Scene transition. The family embraces while the TV show continues. Homer. Thanks, kids. I guess being crusty was more challenging than I thought. But hey, at least I got some donuts out of it. They all laugh and the scene fades out. Scientific description. In this episode, we witness the enthralling events that unfold when Homer finds himself mistaken as Krusty the Clown. The initial situation showcases Homer's insatiable desire for donuts, leading to an amusing turn of events. As Homer transforms into Krusty, the incident propels the story into madness. The storyline progresses as Homer Krusty attempts to perform on live TV, resulting in various comedic mishaps and awkward moments. The denouement occurs as Homer realizes the mismatch between his own personality and the expectations of being a clown. The conclusion brings the family together, emphasizing their love and support for Homer despite his failures. This episode delves into the themes of self-discovery, acceptance, and familial bonds, crafting a hilarious and heartfelt narrative. Narrator, standing in front of the Grand Chocolate Factory, Willy Wonka, adorned in a top hat, and a young boy dressed in a fancy suit and tie, eagerly await the unveiling of the factory's new addition. Willy Wonka, excitedly, ladies and gentlemen, gather, round. Today, I present to you the most revolting delicacy you will ever lay your eyes upon. Brace yourselves for the Chocolate Factory's newest creation. Boy, curiously, Mr. Wonka, what could possibly be more disgusting than the everlasting gobstopper? 
Billy Wonka, grinning mischievously, my dear boy, prepare yourself for the putrid puddle truffle. This is no ordinary truffle, it's filled with the foulest substances known to mankind. Boy, incredulous, foul substances. Billy Wonka, nodding, yes, you see, it contains a mix of rotten eggs, spoiled milk, stinky cheese, and a touch of skunk spray. It's a taste sensation like no other. Boy, nauseated, that sounds absolutely vile. Billy Wonka, laughing, ah, but that is the point, my dear boy. Life is about embracing the unexpected, pushing boundaries, and challenging our taste buds. Narrator. Willy Wonka proceeds to unveil the putrid puddle truffle, a repulsive-looking chocolate treat oozing with a putrid green liquid. Willy Wonka, proudly, now, who's brave enough to taste test this marvel? Golden ticket winner. Overconfident, I shall. Hand it over, Wonka. I fear no truffle. Narrator. The golden ticket winner takes a bite of the putrid puddle truffle, and chaos ensues. Golden ticket winner. Choking, oh, god. What is this vile concoction? It's, it's, ah. Uh. Billy Wonka, feigning concern, oh dear. It seems like the putrid puddle truffle has claimed its first victim. Pity, really. Narrator. The golden ticket winner's body convulses uncontrollably as a flurry of absurd events unfolds. Golden ticket winner. Gargling, I, I can't. Breathe, burp. Narrator. In a bizarre turn of events, the golden ticket winner starts inflating like a balloon. His body swelling larger and larger. Billy Wonka, calmly, oh, would you look at that? Seems like our friend here has become a human whoopee cushion. Boy, horrified, good lord, what have you done, Mr. Wonka? Billy Wonka, shrugging, inventing is a messy business, my dear boy. But fear not, for we have Oompa Loompas to handle such situations. Narrator, the Oompa Loompas rush to the scene, singing a hilariously dark song about the greedy golden ticket winner's unfortunate demise. Oompa Loompas, Singing, Oompa Loompa do Petit do, we've got a lesson to teach to you. Greed and gluttony, oh what a sin, when you try to digest a puddle of sin. Narrator. And so, the Oompa Loompas continue their catchy and comical melody, leaving the audience in awe of the absurdity that just transpired at the chocolate factory. Narrator. The stage is set for a wild and vulgar encounter as the colorful characters from BFDI gather to assess the new Chrysler logo. The tension hangs palpably in the air as the TPOT debutantes eagerly wait for their chance to rate the updated emblem. Beefy. Looking at the logo with curiosity, so, what's the big deal about this new Chrysler logo? And, wow, it's supposed to be super sleek and modern. Can't wait to see it. Fiery, squinting at the logo, well, I hope it's worth all the hype. I mean, it's just a logo, right? Skeleton, scratching his head, yeah, but you know how people get when they mess around with icons and branding. Look, snickering, alright, folks, let's cut to the chase. What do you think? Fiery Junior, squirming, I don't know, but it better not look like a half-witted stick figure like some logos I've seen. Bubble, uh-oh. Fiery Junior is getting all riled up again. Calm down. Beefy. Wait, look closely, guys. Doesn't that blue dot in the center of the logo seem a little off? Off ball. Perplexed off? How do you mean? Bucky. Squinting. Damn, that's one tiny blue dot. It's like searching for a needle in a haystack. Snowball. Sarcastically. Well, ain't that just marvelous? All this trouble for a damn blue dot. Teardrop. Emphatically gesturing at the logo, sign language aggressively. Ben. Laughing. Teardrop sure knows how to make a point, even without speaking. Pre, stroking his chin. You know, guys, I've read somewhere that the placement and size of elements in a logo can subliminally affect our perception. Power, interrupting. Stop with the tiny blue dot mumbo jumbo and let's get to rating already. Narrator. As the characters bickered, a sudden glitch occurred, and the logo transformed. The center blue dot expanded, revealing a hidden message, catching them all off guard. Beefy, gasping, holy canopy. Did anyone else see that? Bubble, wide-eyed. It, it's like something out of a sci-fi movie. Look, 
Frantically calculating. According to my calculations, this is statistically improbable. Gilladin, sputtering, whoa, what kind of sorcery is this? Narrator. The characters were awestruck, their minds racing to make sense of the impossible. Then, excitedly, we've stumbled upon a secret message. Quick, let's decipher it. Snowball, grumbling, more damn drama. Fine, let's see what it says. I read Junior, excitedly, it's a declaration of war. We must prepare for battle. 3. Trying to calm everyone down, hold on, let's not jump to conclusions. We need to gather more information. Flower, sarcastically, oh great, now we're living in a movie plot. Can we just read this logo and go home? Narrator. The characters' emotions ran high as they attempted to make sense of the mystical message hidden within the Chrysler logo. Little did they know, their journey had just begun, and they were about to embark on an adventure that would leave them forever changed. The seemingly innocent task of reading a logo unraveled into a mind-bending tale of supernatural events and desperate quests for answers. The characters' vulgar banter set the tone for a tempestuous journey that pushed the limits of reality and reason. From a tiny blue dot to an enigmatic message, the BFDI crew would learn that sometimes the mundane can hide unimaginable secrets. Title, Homer and the Seductive Sojourn. Characters. Homer, the lovable but clumsy father. Barney, Homer's best friend and drinking buddy. Carl, Homer's co-worker and friend. Lenny, Homer's co-worker and friend. Marge, Homer's wife. Mr. Sparkle, a fictional Japanese detergent mascot. Scene, Moe's Tavern, Homer sits at the bar with a sad expression. Homer, dejectedly. Oh, Mo, no matter what I do, I'm always feeling down. Oh, pouring a beer. Hey, it happens to the best of us, Homer. Life can be a real downer. How about a beer to cheer you up? Homer, sips beer, thanks, Mo. But sometimes, I need something more than just a drink to lift my spirits. Scene fades into a bizarre Mr. Sparkle commercial on the TV, where a Japanese detergent mascot becomes Homer's ray of hope. Homer. Excitedly, I've got it, Mo. Mr. Sparkle is my newfound inspiration. I need an adventure. Barney, joining them at the bar, adventure? Count me in, Homer. Carl, entering Moe's, what's all this talk about adventure, guys? Lenny, also entering Moe's, yeah, we're bored as hell. Let's do something crazy. Scene transitions to the gang at the airport, ready to embark on their adventure. Homer, gentlemen, we're going to Japan. Fist pumps. Carl, Japan? Why Japan? Barney, yeah, Homer, what's so special about Japan? Homer, enthusiastically, you'll see, my friends, Japan is full of wonders and excitement. Plus, I have an inexplicable urge to meet seductive Japanese ladies. Scene transitions to Tokyo, the gang exploring the vibrant city. Homer, mesmerized, look at all these lights, guys. Wow, Japan is truly amazing. Barney, whistles. I didn't know there were so many seductive Japanese ladies here. Carl. Laughs, I don't know about seductive, but they sure are charming. Lenny, winks. Let's have some fun, boys. Scene transitions to a lavish Japanese nightclub, where the gang experiences a night of wild partying and unexpected encounters. Homer. Whoa, look at all these flashy lights and beautiful ladies. I feel like I'm in paradise. Barney, tipsy, Marge, who? Carl. Laughs, it's like we're living in a whole different world, Homer. Lenny, whispering to the others, did you guys see how those ladies were looking at us? We're like celebrities. Progression. The night unfolds with hilarity, misadventures, and steamy encounters. Scene transitions to the next morning, the gang waking up in a luxurious hotel room. Homer, rubbing his head, oh, my head, what a night. Barney, grinning. I can't believe we actually hooked up with those ladies. 
Lenny, Chuckles, it's a memory that'll last a lifetime. Carl, concerned, but guys, what about our families? Marge will kill us. Homer, smiling, aw, oh, let's not worry about that now. We'll deal with it when we get home. Today, we become legends in Japan. Scene fades out with the gang laughing and getting ready for another day of wild adventure in Japan. While the story explores the idea of Homer and his friends going to Japan to find excitement and meet seductive Japanese ladies, it is essential to remember that The Simpsons is a satirical show known for its exaggerated and fictional storyline. The intention behind this script is to capture the humor and outlandishness of the show, maintaining the essence of the characters while remaining within the boundaries of their portrayal in The Simpsons. Note, the requested dialogue contains offensive language and adult content. Please proceed with caution. Host, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Comedy Central Roast of the United States. Let's bring on our six randomly selected countries, ready to tear each other apart. Country 1, yo, United States, you think you the shit? Well, let me tell you, you more fucked up than a blind man at a strip club. Country 2, fuck you, Country 1. Shit, your economy is more screwed than a porn star with a loaf dick. Country 3, and what about you, Country 2? Your president is so dumb, he couldn't pour water out of a boot with instructions on the heel. Country 4, huh, Country 3, your military is as weak as a vegan ordering a steak. Country 5, speaking of weak, Country 4, your healthcare system is a bigger joke than Carrot Top's career. Country 6, well, 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 Country 5, what drives on the left but can't get anything right? Your fucking country. Host, damn, you guys are ruthless. But now it's time for the United States to get some sweet revenge. Let's see what they've got. United States. All right, buckle up, bitches. Country one, I heard your national dish is a Big Mac with extra mayo. No wonder your people are the fattest in Europe. United States. As for you, country two, you're so irrelevant that I forgot you existed until five minutes ago. I mean, who the fuck are you? United States. Country 3, I swear, your alcohol is so strong, it could strip paint off the fucking walls. No wonder you guys drink so damn much. United States. And Country 4, how's that socialism working out for you? Oh wait, it isn't. Surprise, motherfucker. United States. Country 5, you talk a big game about your fancy healthcare, but all I see is a bunch of crooked dentists pulling out teeth with pliers. United States. And finally, Country 6. Your great contribution to the world as vodka and dash cams? Congratulations, you drunken dash cam enthusiasts. Host, wow, that was brutal. Thank you all for joining us tonight at the Comedy Central Roast of the United States. Remember, folks, it's all in good fun. Good night, and stay fucking classy. Hank. Well, dang it, Peggy, I tell ya. This here crossover between King of the Hill and The Simpsons is just plain dang ol' crazy. Peggy. Hank, I can't believe we ended up in Springfield. I sure hope they appreciate our wholesome Texas values. Homer. Him. Who are these new folks, Marge? They look like they crawled right out of a propane tank. Marge, Homer, let's give them a warm welcome. After all, they seem like decent people, unlike some of our other neighbors. Bart. Hey, new kid. Wanna cause some mischief with me? Bobby, well, golly. I reckon I could get into a little bit of controlled mischief. Lisa. Dad, Hank here seems to know a lot about propane. Maybe he could help me with my science project. Hank. Dang all right, I'd be happy to help with some real science, not that conspiracy mumbo jumbo. Oh. Hey, you guys look like you could use a drink. How about a flaming Homer? Dale. Fire water? No way, Mo. Propane is the only flammable substance allowed near my lawn. 
Hank. Dale, you dang ol' conspiracy nut. Just drink the dang ol' drink. Duff man, Duff man likes the sound of that. Propane beer and mischief all in one. Peggy. Marge, I must say, this is the most exciting thing that has ever happened to me. I feel like I'm living in a dang cartoon. Boomer. Woohoo. I can't believe our worlds have collided. No, I mean, it's going to be a heck of an adventure. Bart. Yeah, and maybe I can finally learn some new tricks from Bobby here. We could rule this place together. Bobby, wowie, that sounds like a dang old blast. Lisa, Hank, I appreciate your help with the project, but maybe we should focus on something more important, like saving the environment. Hank, dang old right, Lisa. Protecting the environment is dang old serious business. Let's get to work. Marge, I never thought I'd see the day when our families would come together like this. It's like a wholesome crossover dream. Hank. Well, Marge, we may come from different worlds, but as long as we stick to our values, I reckon we'll get along just fine. Peggy. That's right, Hank. No matter how crazy things get, we Texas folks stick together. Boomer. Him. You know what, Peggy and Hank? You're right. Family is all that matters, even in this dang old cartoon madness. Bart. Yeah, and maybe we can even teach them a thing or two about mischievous fun. Bobby, well, golly, that sounds just dang old perfect. Let's show them what we're made of, Hill and Simpson style. In the background, the Texas and Springfield families unite, bringing their unique brand of chaos and hilarity to the cartoon world. Sitting in a pile of stuffed animals, surrounded by floating balloons, Doe, no, what a mess. How did I end up in this pile of stuffed animals? Lenny, entering the room. Hey, Homer, what are you doing? Homer, I don't know, Lenny. I just woke up here, and these stuffed animals are all over the place. It's like a cuddly nightmare. Carl, enters the room, Homer, you won't believe this. Krusty the Clown has fallen ill, and they need a replacement for his show. Homer. Me? Replace Krusty? But I don't know anything about being a clown. Marge, entering the room. Carla, I think you're Krusty the Clown because you're in that pile of stuffed animals. You have to go to the TV studio right away. Homer, are you serious? This is it, folks. Homer Simpson, the accidental clown. Scene transition, TV studio. Bart, watching from the backstage. This is gonna be hilarious. Dad is Krusty the Clown? I can't wait to see him embarrass himself. Lisa! Bart, it's not nice to laugh at Dad's misfortune. He's doing this for us, remember? Bart, yeah, yeah, I know. But come on, Lisa, it's gonna be epic. Scene transition, live on Krusty's show. Boomer, in Krusty's clown getup. Good evening, folks. Um, I mean, hey, hey, kids. It's me, your favorite, ah, uh, clown person. Audience, cheering and laughing. Boomer. Nervously. So, uh, what's the deal with balloon animals, huh? Why do they always pop when I try to make them? It's like they hate me or something. Audience, laughed up. Rusty, watching from home. That imbecile is ruining my show. I need to get better and take back my throne. Scene transition. Back home. Marge, Homer, you did great. The audience loved you. Boomer. Thanks, Marge, but I'm just glad it's over. I don't think I'm cut out for the clown business. Bart, hugging Homer. Dad, that was amazing. You were even funnier than the real Krusty. Boomer, thanks, buddy. But let's hope I never have to do that again. Scene transition. End credits. Scientific analysis. This episode explores the archetype of mistaken identity and the ridiculousness that entails. The initial situation starts with Homer waking up in a pile of stuffed animals, creating an unusual scenario. The incident occurs when Homer is mistaken for Krusty the Clown due to the surrounding chaos, leading to his embarrassment. The progression showcases Homer's improvised performance on Krusty's show, with the audience's reaction highlighting the comedic nature of the situation. The denouement comes as Homer receives praise from his family, showcasing their support despite his unintended foray into clowning. The conclusion emphasizes that this experience should not be repeated, 
leaving Homer relieved and his family entertained. Overall, the episode uses humor and absurdity to reflect the satirical nature of The Simpsons, while highlighting the theme of family unity in the face of unexpected challenges. One, United States. All right, you motherfuckers. Welcome to the goddamn roast of the United States. Strap in, assholes, cause shit's bout to get real. Two, Australia. Good day, you bloody wankers. Let's give a warm welcome to the country that thinks their shit don't stink. Well, newsflash, USA, your ass smells worse than our kangaroos' farts. Three, Russia. Ah, da, da, da. The great United States, you think you're so powerful, huh? Maybe you should try lifting your obese population off their fat asses. Oh, and by the way, your beer tastes like horse piss. Four, China. We Chinese have a saying, United States, you think you're the world leader, but you're just like your fast food, cheap, greasy, and full of shit. Five, Germany. Ah, oh, guten tag, United States. You know what they say, America, land of opportunity, to fuck shit up. Your politics are more screwed than a Berlin masseuse. 6. Mexico. Oh really? Cagrones. United States. You claim you want to build a wall? Well, the only thing that's gonna happen is you'll have even more taco trucks on your goddamn streets. 7. United States. Alright, alright, you fuckers. Time to turn the tables. Australia. Your wildlife is scarier than your dental hygiene. Russia. You can't even win a drinking contest. I've got more vodka in my piss. 8. Australia. Oh. Look. It's the United States. The land where freedom means shooting each other, and the only thing taller than your buildings is your people's fucking ego. 9. Russia. Ha! Huh. United States, you think you're a superpower? Your military spends more on war than I do on vodka. And trust me, I fucking love vodka. And China, United States, you're so capitalist it makes me sick. Your money is worth as much as used toilet paper, and your Hollywood movies, more predictable than your country's foreign policy. 11. Germany. United States. You claim to be a melting pot, but your people are as bland as your fast food. And your fashion sense, more offensive than a lederhosen on a beach. 12. Mexico. Pinche Estados Unidos. Your border control is stricter than a Catholic nun on prom night. And your idea of spicy food, more weak than a gringo at a salsa bar. 13. United States. Alright, you cunts. The grand finale is here. Australia, I've seen scarier shit in my toilet bowl. Russia, you can't handle a little cold weather, let alone insults. China, your knockoff brand of everything is as pathetic as your attempts at comedy. Germany, your sausages aren't the only thing that's full of shit. Mexico, who needs a wall when your drug cartels are doing a fine job of keeping your people in. 14. Australia. Fuck me sideways. The United States just came back swinging like a kangaroo on crack. 15. Russia. Da, da. I must admit, United States, your roasting skills are as hot as my balalaika on fire. 16. China. United States, you might be loud and obnoxious, but I'll give you credit for dishing it back. 17. Germany. Mein Gott. The United States just slayed us like a Viking warrior on Oktoberfest. 18. Mexico. Hijo de puta. Mi cargo en la ladre de Estados Unidos. You really showed us, gringo. 19. United States. That's right, bitches. No one roasts the United States without getting a taste of their own medicine. We're the American dream, and tonight, we've roasted your sorry asses to the ground. 20. Crowd. Laughter and applause. I'm sorry, but I can't generate that story for you.
Ugh. Sitting at Moe's Tavern, dejectedly, man, life just feels so dull lately. I need something exciting to light my fire. Barney, hiccups. Yeah, life's been pretty boring lately. We need a new adventure, Homer. Carl, raising an eyebrow, I have an idea. Remember that Mr. Sparkle commercial we saw? Lenny, grinning. Oh yeah, the one with the crazy Japanese cartoon character. That always cracks me up. Homer, eyes lighting up, that's it. We should go to Japan and experience some real excitement. Barney, hugs his beer, and gets some sake bombs too. Carl, nods, I'm all for it. Let's have some wild times in Tokyo. Lenny, saluting. All right, boys. To Japan we go. Scene transition. The Simpson gang arrives in Tokyo, surrounded by bright lights and bustling streets. Boomer. Wow, this place is even crazier than I imagined. Barney, and the cosplay girls, they're everywhere, Homer. We hit the jackpot. Carl, laughs, I can't believe our luck. Let the fun begin. Lenny, winking at a group of girls dressed as anime characters. Hey there, ladies. Want to show us around? Cosplay girl one, giggling, sure. We'd love to introduce you to the real Tokyo. Scene transition. The gang is now in a lively Japanese club, dancing in a wild frenzy. Boomer. Laffy, I can't remember the last time I had so much fun. Barney, downing another sake bomb. This is the life, baby. Carl, sipping his drink. Japan knows how to party, that's for sure. Lenny, dancing with a girl. I'm loving the culture, and these ladies definitely know how to have a good time. Scene transition. The gang wakes up in a luxurious Japanese hotel room, surrounded by empty bottles and cosplaying ladies. Boomer. Rubbing his head, oh, my head feels like it got hit by Godzilla. Barney, laughs, yeah, but it was totally worth it, wasn't it? Carl, smiling, absolutely, guys, we made memories that will last a lifetime. Lenny, yawning, and we met some incredible people along the way. Japan, I love you. Scene transition. The gang waves goodbye to their Japanese friends at the airport. Boomer, size, I can't believe it's time to go home. I'm gonna miss this place. Barney, don't worry, Homer. We'll always have Tokyo in our hearts, and a little bit of Japan in our souls. Carl, chuckles, yeah, and maybe we'll even bring some of that Japanese magic with us. Lenny, grinning, who knows, maybe we'll start a cosplay club back in Springfield. Scene transition. The plane takes off, the gang looking out of the window, reminiscing about their insane adventure. Boomer, smiling. Thank you, Mr. Sparkle, for giving us the spark of excitement we needed. Barney, raising his can of beer, cheers to the craziest trip of our lives and to more adventures to come. Carl, clinking his glass with Barney, here's to embracing the unexpected and living life to the fullest. Lenny, raising his hand, and to the power of friendship, laughter, and a little mischief along the way. End scene with the Simpson gang flying back home. Their hearts filled with incredible memories and a newfound zest for life. Boomer. Man, life sucks. I'm so sad. Nothing ever goes right for me. Carl. Yeah, Homer, you seem down. What's the matter? Boomer. Everything, Carl. I'm stuck in this dead-end job, and Marge is always mad at me. I need some excitement in my life. Lenny. Hey, Homer. Have you seen that Mr. Sparkle ad on TV? It's crazy. Boomer. Mr. Sparkle? What's that? Barney. It's this Japanese detergent mascot. He's like a mix of a light bulb and a samurai. It's ridiculously awesome. Boomer, that sounds amazing. I want to be like Mr. Sparkle. Let's go to Japan. Carl, are you sure, Homer? Going to another country just because a commercial? Boomer, absolutely. I need some adventure. Plus, there's bound to be excitement in Japan. I've heard some wild stories. Lenny, count us in, Homer. I need a break from my job too. Barney, yeah, the ladies in Japan must be stunning. Let's do it. Transition. The Simpson family embarks on a trip to Japan. Boomer. Wow, Japan is incredible. 
Look at all the bright lights and colorful signs. Barney, and check out those futuristic toilets. They've got buttons that do everything. Carl, let's find Mr. Sparkle. Maybe he can teach us a thing or two. Boomer, I don't care about Mr. Sparkle anymore. I just want to have fun. Hey, look at those geisha ladies. They're so seductive. Lenny, Homer, these ladies are beautiful, but we're married. We should be respectful. Boomer, respectful, SHM respectful. We're on vacation, Lenny. Let's live a little. Carl, well, if you insist, Homer. Let's have some fun then. Transition. Homer, Barney, Carl, and Lenny spend their nights partying with the geisha ladies in Japan. Boomer, slurring, this is the best time of my life. Sake, karaoke, and ladies everywhere. Barney, cheers, everyone. To friendship, adventure, and wild nights in Japan. Carl, I'm starting to feel guilty. Guys, we shouldn't have cheated on our wives. Lenny, yeah, this was a mistake. We came here to find excitement, but we lost sight of what really matters. Transition. The group members face the consequences of their actions. Boomer. Oh no, what have we done? My marriage is in ruins. I've messed up big time. Barney, this is all my fault. I should have known better than to encourage this foolishness. Carl, we need to go back home and fix things with our wives. We can't keep living like this. Lenny, I regret every decision I made here. I miss my wife and the simplicity of my life back in Springfield. The group returns home, determined to make things right. Boomer. Marge, I'm sorry for what I've done. I've been a fool, but I promise to make it up to you. Marge, Homer, I appreciate your apology, but we have a lot to work through. I need time. Barney, I'm truly sorry too, Marge. I betrayed my friendship with Homer, and I betrayed myself. Carl, we all made mistakes, but we've learned our lesson. Let's make sure this never happens again. Lenny, agreed. Let's focus on our loved ones and cherish what we have. No more crazy adventures for me. End. Title, the Pink Donut Delirium Characters Homer Barney Carl Lenny Mo Scene Moe's Tavern Homer, Barney, Carl, and Lenny are sitting at a table, drunk and giddy. Homer Hey guys, you know what I could really go for right now? Barney What, Homer? Homer Strawberry frosted pink donuts Um, can you imagine how amazing that would be? Carl Raising his beer, cheers to that, Homer. Lenny, yeah, pink donuts, baby. Scene transitions to a wild, dreamlike sequence. Characters are surrounded by an endless field of strawberry frosted pink donuts. Homer, you know, wow, look at all those pink donuts. Barney, grabbing a donut. Here, Homer, take a bite of this beautiful pink goodness. Homer, excitedly, mouth full, in. This is the best donut I've ever had. Carl, grinning, I can't believe it, we're in donut heaven. Lenny, stuffing donuts in his mouth. I don't think I've ever been this happy in my life. Scene shifts back to reality. The characters snap out of their pink donut induced trance. Oh, annoyed. Hey, you idiots. Quit daydreaming and order something. Homer, shaking off the daze. Oh, sorry, Mo. Give us a round of duff beers. Barney, and make it quick, Mo. We've got pink donuts to find. Carl, yeah, donuts are our destiny. Lenny, pink donuts are bust. Scene fades out with the four friends laughing and chanting about their quest for strawberry frosted pink donuts. This episode of The Simpsons, titled The Pink Donut Delirium, explores the hilarious and absurd adventures of Homer, Barney, Carl, and Lenny as they succumb to the tempting allure of strawberry frosted pink donuts. Their drunken escapades take them on a wild journey to a dreamlike world where nothing exists except for these delectable treats. Though only a product of their imagination, the episode ends with the resilient friends determined to continue their search for the ever-elusive pink donuts, leaving Mo shaking his head in exasperation. 
As always, The Simpsons brilliantly satirizes the human condition while providing comedic relief and reminding viewers to embrace life's strange and unexpected pleasures. Title, a spirited trip to Japan. Bummer. Sipping this beer sadly, life is so dull, Mo. I need some excitement. Oh. Wiping the counter. Yeah, homie, I hear ya. It's a drag sometimes. Bummer. Noticing a Mr. Sparkle ad on the TV. Wait a minute. That's it. Mr. Sparkle will bring us adventure. Barney, burping, adventure? I'm in. Let's go, homie. Carl, smirking. Count me in too, guys. Anything to break the monotony. Lenny, excitedly, Japan, here we come. Anime girls and sushi. Scene transitions to the Simpson family at home. Arj, concerned. Homer, are you sure about this sudden trip? Homer, confidently. Marge, don't worry. It's all for the spirit of adventure. Bart, rolling his eyes. Yeah, whatever, Dad. Just don't embarrass us. Lisa. Curiously, maybe we'll learn something new and exciting about another culture. Scene shifts to the airport. The group boards the flight. Boomer, eating a bag of chips and airplane food. Delicious. Barney, drunk, stumbling. This turbulence is my kinda roller coaster. Carl, worried. Barney, you better sit down before we crash this thing. Lenny, laughing. Yeah, Carl. Let him have his fun. We're on an adventure, remember? Scene transitions to Japan. The group is exploring the streets. Boomer. Amazed. Look at all these colorful buildings and gadgets. We're in Japan. Barney, slurring his words. Has anyone seen my pants? I lost them on the plane. Carl. Sighing. Barney, put on some fresh pants before you embarrass us all. Lenny, spotting some girls in cosplay. Hey, look at those cute Japanese ladies over there. Japanese lady one. Blushing, Kanichiwa. Are you enjoying your time in Japan? Boomer. Flirting. Oh yeah, we're loving it. Can you show us around, miss? Scene cuts to a montage of the group and the cosplay girls having a great time in Japan. Boomer. Laughing. This karaoke night is the best, my friends. Barney. Singing off key. I'm a drunken superstar, baby. Carl. Dancing. I never thought I'd love sushi this much. Lenny. Blushing. These Japanese ladies really know how to party. Scene transitions to the group back in Springfield, at Moe's Tavern. Oh. Whispering to Homer. So, how was your grand adventure, Simpson? Homer. Grinning. No, it was legendary. We had it all. Laughs, fun, and romance. Barney. Burping. Yeah, and those cosplay girls, Mo. You wouldn't believe it. Carl. Chuckles. Japan showed us a good time, my friend. Lenny, sighs, wish we could go back. Those memories will stay with us forever. Scene ends with the group sharing laughter and clinking their glasses together. Note, the story is written as a creative and fictional narrative, following the prompt's requirements. All characters and scenarios mentioned belong to The Simpsons TV show. Billy Wonka, ladies and gentlemen, gather, round. Welcome to the grand unveiling of my latest creations at the Chocolate Factory. I present to you the most vile, repulsive, and downright nauseating additions to our beloved confections. Charlie, wow, Mr. Wonka, what's that peculiar looking cake on the table? Billy Wonka, ah, my dear Charlie, that's our, lava surprise, cake. With each decadent bite, scorching hot lava oozes out, burning your taste buds and making you feverishly sweat like a pig. 
Augustus, give me that. I can handle anything. Takes a huge bite. Violet, oomph, that's disgusting. Its acidity is making my mouth feel like a bubbling cauldron. Billy Wonka, moving on. Behold, that pickled pudding. It's an explosion of briny flavors, laced with pickled onions, cucumbers, and even pickled eggs. Veruca. Oh, how positively revolting. Gags and spits it out, I feel like I've just slurped up a jar of pickles. Mike, what's next, Wonka? Billy Wonka, brace yourselves for the sweaty sausage surprise. Each sausage bursts with perspiration, leaving a greasy film on your tongue and a distinct smell that would make a skunk faint. Augustus, I'll take two. Devours the sausages. Augustus' mother. Oh my. It's like he's been dipped in a bat of sweat. How utterly repulsive. Billy Wonka, and now, prepare for the squirming sandwich. Watch in horror as each bite unleashes a wriggling mass of mealworms and maggots, dancing on your tongue. Bon appétit. Violet, absolutely disgusting. I can feel them squirming all over my insides. Billy Wonka, up next, that gassy gumbles. Pop one in your mouth, and you'll experience an explosion of odd-smelling gas. Be warned, it can clear a room in seconds. Charlie, giggling, this is nuts. Billy Wonka, now, for the piece de resistance, the stink bomb chocolate bar. Just one whiff of this special bar will render you unconscious, surrounded by a putrid aroma of rotten eggs and moldy cheese. Veruca, unconscious? That's taking it too far, even for you, Wonka. Billy Wonka, well, dear children, I hope you've enjoyed this tour of gastronomic horror. But fear not, for my Oompa Loompas have prepared a little treat. Oompa Loompas, singing, oh, the sweets you have consumed, taste buds left forever ruined. Willy Wonka's wild inventions, brought forth perverted confections. But learn now from this strong scent, gluttony is never meant. So close your nose, and eat with grace, don't turn your food into a stinky chase. Charlie, laughs hysterically, that was the most bizarre, yet hilarious experience of my life. Mike, I gotta hand it to you, Wonka, you certainly know how to shock and disgust. Billy Wonka, it's all in the name of pushing the boundaries of taste, my friends. Now, let's go wash your mouths out with some good old-fashioned chocolate. Slurry, oh man, I love coming to Moe's. It's always a great place to get wasted. Barney, you said it, Homer. Hiccup, I feel like a king when I'm here. Carl, chuckles, yeah, until tomorrow morning when you're rolling on the floor with a hangover. Lenny, laughs, ain't that the truth? But who cares about tomorrow, right now we're here for a good time. Homer, stumbling, no, my good friend, bring us another round of Duff beers. Oh. Coming right up, you sorry lot. But remember, you're cut off after this round. Carl! Hey, what's that over there on the table? Lenny, looks like a cake, and damn, it's huge. Barney, excitedly, is it my birthday already? Mo, you shouldn't have. Oh. Nah, it ain't your damn birthday, Barney. It's some fancy SH Mancy suit fella's cake. Said he was gonna do a presentation here. Boomer, chewing presentation? Who cares about that? Let's have a taste. Carl, hold on, Homer. That cake's not for us. Lenny, screw it, Carl. Look at all the frosting. It's calling our names. Barney, yeah, I want a frolic in a world of pink donuts. Homer, stuffing his face in donuts. Nothing but strawberry frosted pink donuts. Oh, hey, you idiots. That cake's not for eating. It's for some presentation. Homer. Mouthful, presentation? More like pre-donation. Carl, laughing, Homer, you're a genius. A drunken, donut-loving genius. Lenny, joining in, to hell with presentation. Give me more donuts. Barney, let's dive in, boys. A world filled with nothing but strawberry-frosted pink donuts awaits. They all jump onto the tabletop, swimming and rolling in the sea of pink-frosted donuts, laughing hysterically. Oh. Face palming, I can't believe this is happening in my bar. Cut to the morning after. Homer, Barney, Carl, and Lenny wake up covered in frosting and surrounded by half-eaten donuts. Homer, groaning, my head feels like it's been hit by a donut truck. 
Barney, that was one wild donut-filled adventure last night. Carl! Yeah, but we better clean up before Mo gets here. Lenny, I never thought I'd say this, but I'm all donut ed out for today. They start cleaning up the mess, regretfully reminiscing about their sugary escapade. In this wild and unlikely episode of The Simpsons, Homer, Barney, Carl, and Lenny find themselves intoxicated at Moe's Tavern, stumbling upon a cake meant for a presentation. Ignoring its purpose, they dive headfirst into a world of strawberry-frosted pink donuts, indulging in a sugary frenzy of laughter and chaos. The aftermath leaves them with a hangover and a daunting cleanup task, teaching them the perils of indulging in their wildest and gluttonous desires. As the dust settles, they reflect on the absurdity of their escapade, cherishing the memories and vowing never to underestimate the power of donuts again. Tony, ladies and gentlemen, gather around. Welcome to the grand unveiling of Willy Wonka's latest creations. Willy Wonka, ah, thank you, Tony. Now, feast your eyes upon the wall behind us, adorned with some of the most repulsive yet irresistible treats. Jessica, oh my god, what is that? That green, slimy concoction? Willy Wonka, that, my dear Jessica, is the infamous Booger Blast. Made with the finest nose pickers in the world, it delivers a burst of rotten eggs and sweaty gym socks with every bite. 
Tom, are you serious? Who in their right mind would actually eat that? Willy Wonka, ah, but Tom, the thrill lies in the absurdity. Now, on to the next wonder, introducing the pungent pimple popper. Sarah, E.W., is that pus filled? That's just vile. Willy Wonka, precisely, Sarah. These bursting blemishes are filled with sour curdled milk, mixed with a hint of weak old gym socks. A feast for the senses, indeed. Oliver, this is beyond disturbing, Willy. Why would anyone subject themselves to this torture? Willy Wonka, oh Oliver, you underestimate the adventurous souls who dare to explore the limits of taste. Now, brace yourselves for the ultimate monstrosity, the vomit volcano. Elizabeth, seriously? That's repulsive. Willy Wonka, exactly, Elizabeth. This blend of fermented fish guts and curdled cottage cheese is guaranteed to make even the strongest stomach churn. The perfect fusion of flavors. Tony, alright, folks, the moment we've all been waiting for. The Golden Pickle winners shall now sample these grotesque delights. Suddenly, chaos ensues as the participants reluctantly take a bite of each abomination. Jessica, oh god, my stomach. I think I'm going to. Vomits uncontrollably asterisk. Tom, clutching his throat asterisk help. I can't breathe. It feels like there's a fire in my mouth. Sarah, tears streaming down her face asterisk I've made a terrible mistake. This is... Oh no, runs towards the nearest restroom. Oliver, I can't even describe what this tastes like. My taste buds are in agony. As the participants writhe in comedic agony, the Oompa Loompas emerge, singing with gusto. Oompa Loompas. Musical note Oompa Loompa, doopity doo. We've got another riddle for you. What do you get when you're bold and insane? Chowing down on Wonka's vilest brain. Oompa Loompa, doom putty da. If you're not wise, you're gonna be scarred. Musical note. Narrator. Inside the whimsical walls of Willy Wonka's chocolate factory, the air was filled with anticipation as the golden ticket winners gathered around a table piled high with peculiar wooden pieces. Each piece had a shiny metal name tag, all in brown and gold colors. Willy Wonka, grinning mischievously, ladies and gentlemen, behold, I present to you my latest creation, the grand assortment of nasty delights. Brace yourselves for the most disgusting, outrageously repulsive additions to the chocolate factory imaginable. Golden ticket winner one! What on earth is this? Golden ticket winner 2, is that, a cow tongue? Billy Wonka, oh, dear sweet children, yes. That is the lick licious lumpy liquor. It's a cow tongue covered in chocolate, with a hint of lime and pickle juice, for that extra tang. Golden ticket winner 3, disgusted, are those, worms. Billy Wonka, ah, you have a keen eye. That's our crunchy crawler choco delight. Real worms, carefully caramelized and enrobed in white chocolate, with just a touch of chili powder and garlic for that zesty kick. Golden ticket winner 4, Gagging, I think I'm going to be sick. Billy Wonka, oh, my dears, you haven't seen anything yet. Feast your eyes on the pungent poo pops. Yes, my friends, those are little nuggets of, well, let's just say they're inspired by nature's finest compost heap. Golden ticket winner 5, covering their nose. This is madness. Billy Wonka, madness? No, my dear child, this is innovation. And now, for the piece de resistance. Introducing the vomitrocious volcano bonbons. Made with milk chocolate and a secret blend of exotic spices, they guarantee you a volcanic eruption of gastric consequences. Golden Ticket Winner 6, looking horrified. You can't be serious. Billy Wonka, laughs maniacally, oh, but I am. Now, my Golden Ticket Winners, it's time to taste these revolting delicacies and let your bodies react in the most absurd and comedic ways. Narrator. As the Golden Ticket Winners reluctantly took a bite of the repugnant treats, their bodies reacted in hilariously exaggerated manners. Some turned bright shades of green, while others danced uncontrollably or belched uncontrollably. Oompa Loompas, singing. Oh, Willy Wonka's creations. A test for each digestion. From cow tongues to wormy sweets. Witness their animated feats. They gobbled up the nasty fare. Their bodies writhed without a care. Gastric eruptions and colorful spews. Oh, what a spectacle for our views. Narrator. The Golden Ticket winners, despite their outrageous bodily transformations, 
couldn't help but laugh and join in the absurdity. And as the Oompa Loompas continued their hilarious song, the spirit of fun and madness filled the chocolate factory, making it a truly unforgettable experience for all. End scene.
What in the gosh dang hell is going on here? Where's all the propane? Bender, hey, Baldy! You want propane? Go back to your primitive, Stone Age time! Ink, Stone Age time? I tell you what, I ain't got time for your metal shenanigans. I just want my propane. Bender, propane? That's so last millennium. The future runs on dark matter, baby. Ink, dark matter? That's just nonsense. Propane is the only way to grill. Bender, grill? We have trans-dimensional food synthesizers here, you primitive propane pusher. Ink, well, I'll be damned. I didn't come all the way from Arlen just to be told what to do by a shiny tin can. Bender, shiny tin can? Listen here, you propane-addicted hillbilly. Ink, don't you dare insult my love for propane. I sell propane and propane accessories. Bender, accessories? You humans and your obsession with unnecessary add-ons. In the future, we have autopilot, lasers, and rum-flavored cigars. Ink, well, I'll tell you what. Mr. Shiny Metal Ass. Autopilot may be fine for city slickers, but I need to feel the road beneath my tires. Bender, road? Who needs roads when you can bend space and time? You're stuck in the past, propane boy. Ink, I'm not stuck, I'm rooted in the wholesome American tradition of grilling with propane. Bender, tradition? Tradition is for the weak. In the future, we embrace progress and innovation. Ink, well, this future don't seem to have any sense of common decency. No propane, no self-respect. Bender, self-respect? Propane or not, I've seen you and your pals on that show. I wouldn't say you have much of that anyway. Ink, why you metal dick? Ila, all right, boys, let's not fight. Hank, we can find a way to get you back home and back to your propane. But in the meantime, how about some futuristic grilling gadgets? Ink, well, dang it, ma'am. That might just be a start, but don't you go replacing propane with no fancy gadgets now. Bender, fine. Get your stupid propane, but just know that the future is fueled by something much more delicious. Ink, I reckon we'll see about that, partner. But for now, I'll take what I can get. Y'all better have some clean burning propane somewhere in this hellish future. Lila, don't worry, Hank. We'll get it all sorted out. And maybe, just maybe, we can show you the wonders of the future while we're at it. As the unlikely trio began their journey through the future, Hank couldn't help but feel a glimmer of excitement. Perhaps there was room for a little bit of propane in this brave new world after all. Willy Wonka, welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the most extraordinary tour of my new and improved chocolate factory. Behold the wonders that await you. Participant 1. What is that pile of logs doing over there? Willy Wonka, ah, those are no ordinary logs. I present to you the, slippery splinter sticks. Each stick is coated in a special green foam that turns your tongue blue and gives you an inexplicable craving for pickles and ice cream. Participant 2. Pickles and ice cream. That's disgusting. Willy Wonka, precisely. Now, let's move on to this vat of bubbling brown goo. Introducing the gooey gut buster. Made from a blend of spoiled milk and fermented fish guts, this chocolatey delight will give you uncontrollable gas for an entire week. Participant 3, are you serious? That's revolting. Willy Wonka, oh, but the fun has just begun. Feast your eyes on this magnificent display of molds. Observe the slimy slug swirls. These chocolate slugs are filled with a gooey mixture of snail slime and crunchy beetle exoskeletons. Absolutely delectable. Participant 4, I think I'm going to be sick. Willy Wonka, ah, now for my personal favorite, the Sour Snot Sprinkles. Each chocolate piece is infused with the essence of sour apple and booger drippings. Guaranteed to make your taste buds tingle with a unique blend of disgust and pleasure. Participant 1. This is beyond anything I could have imagined. It's like a nightmare. Willy Wonka, oh, but nightmares can be delightful, my dear friends. Now, try these cursed creations and witness the hilarity unfold. Participants take a bite of the various disgustingly concocted chocolates. Participant 2. Coughing, my throat is on fire. Participant 3. Hiccuping uncontrollably, what did you put in these, Wonka? Participant 4. Belching loudly, I can't stop burping. Make it stop. Oompa Loompas enter, singing their hilarious song. Oompa Loompas, singing, oh, the slippery splinter sticks and gooey gut busters, 
slimy slug swirls, and sour snot sprinkles. They'll make you puke and fart, burp and hiccup, in a symphony of bodily chaos. Willy Wonka, laughing, ah, the sweet sound of satisfaction. Welcome to the world of my deranged imagination. Scene ends with participants writhing in comedic agony as the Oompa Loompas continue their song. Well, I'll be damned. What in the hell is this futuristic building doing here on my hill? Michael. Hank, I hate to break it to you, but it seems like someone's got some grand designs for this place. And by the looks of it, it's not a propane dealership. Hank, Dick Nabbit, I don't need no fancy Nancy technology ruining my good old hill. Michael. Hank, we're gonna have to go up there and figure out what's going on. Let's go check it out. Hank. All right, but if I see any dang darn automated lawnmowers, I'm kicking them straight to the curb. As they walk up the blue path, they stare at the circular roof and the yellow light blinking on the side. Hank, well, I'll be a jackrabbit's motor oil. Look at that fancy light flashing over there. Michael, Hank, I think there's more to this building than meets the eye. Hank and Michael enter the building and find themselves in a high-tech control room. Hank, what in the gosh darn is all this? It's like a dang spaceship in here. Michael. Hank, it looks like some sort of surveillance system. Look, there's a live feed of our community. Hank, son of a motherless goat. They're spying on us. Who the hell are these people? Michael spots a familiar face on one of the screens. Michael. Hank, you're not gonna believe this. It's George Sr. from the Bluth Company. Hank. Well, I'll be damned. What's that no good, banana eating, forever arrested maniac doing here? George Sr. On the screen, Hank Hill, is that you? Long time no see. I'm just experimenting with some cutting edge technology here. Don't mind me. Hank. Damn it, George Sr. You've always been a bullshitter. What are you cooking up this time? George Sr. Oh, just a little something that'll revolutionize the propane industry. No more hands on work for you, Hank. Sit back, relax, and let the robots handle it. Hank. Over my dead body, you slick talking son of a bitch. George Sr. laughs. Well, Hank, looks like we got ourselves a good old fashioned showdown. Propane versus your way of life. Who will come out on top? Hank, we'll see about that, you blowhard. Suddenly, the entire building starts shaking, alarms blaring. Michael. Hank, we gotta get out of here. This place is gonna blow. Scene. Hank and Michael sprint down the blue path as the building erupts into a ball of fire and smoke. Hank. Well, I guess that's one way to solve the damn problem. Michael. Hank, we may have lost the battle, but at least you've still got your hill. Hank. Yeah, you're right. The old ways may not be high tech, but they're honest. And damn it, that's how I like it. They turn back to look at the burning wreckage, shaking their heads. Hank. You know what, Michael? We may not have fancy gadgets, but we have something much more valuable. Michael. What's that, Hank? Hank. A sense of pride. And that's worth more than all the damn technology in the world. They walk off into the sunset, leaving the chaos behind them. Willy Wonka, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, welcome to the most extraordinary chocolate factory on earth. Behold, behind me, is the magnificent pile of rocks where your purple and green clad selves shall pose for a picture that will immortalize this moment for eternity. Participant 1. Oh, Willy, I can't wait to see what wonders await us inside your magical factory. Participant 2. Indeed, I've heard whispers of your new creations, Willy. Please, do indulge us with the details. Willy Wonka, ah, my dear friends, prepare yourselves for the grandest culinary experience of your lives. 
Allow me to introduce the first of my new delights, the slime-filled caramel swirl. Participant 3, slime-filled? Are you serious? Billy Wonka, absolutely. This delightfully repulsive candy oozes a slimy green caramel filling with chunks of purple jellyfish tentacles. The taste is an unholy mixture of sour, salty, and sweet, and a salt on the senses, if you will. Participant 4, I don't know if I can handle that. Billy Wonka, fear not, my brave souls. Next up, I present to you the hot chili truffle surprise. Participant 5, hot chili, in chocolate? Billy Wonka, oh, indeed. These innocent looking truffles are infused with a volcanic blend of ghost pepper and habanero chili. Prepare yourselves for a complete and utter mouth inferno. Participant 6, I think I'll pass on that one. Billy Wonka, ah, but there's more. May I introduce the squid ink fudge fondue? Participant 7, squid ink, in fudge. Billy Wonka, absolutely. This jet black fudge is made with the finest ink extracted from the rarest deep sea squid. It's both captivatingly rich and profoundly unsettling, leaving an unforgettable aftertaste of the briny ocean. Participant 8, this is getting out of hand. Billy Wonka, fear not, brave participants, for the grand finale of my creations is the pickled garlic and anchovy filled toffee explosion. Participant 9, pickled garlic and anchovies? Billy Wonka, yes, brace yourselves for the ungodly combination of pungent pickled garlic and the overpoweringly fishy taste of anchovies. The toffee shell explodes in your mouth, releasing a pungent shockwave of unabashed flavor. Participant 10, I can't believe my taste buds are in for such torture. Oompa Loompas, singing. Oh, these brave souls ventured to Wonka's domain. They tasted his creations and went insane. Slime-filled caramel and chili so hot. They'll never look at chocolate the same. Oh, what a lot. Oompa Loompas, singing, squid ink fudge and toffee explosion. Their bodies reacted with wild convulsion. Intense flavors, grotesque surprise. How could they ever believe their eyes? Oompa Loompas, singing, but now they've learned their lesson well. Beware of the sweets that take you to hell. Willy Wonka's creations, an acquired taste. A roller coaster of flavors, a wild spicy chase. The scene ends with uproarious laughter from the participants and Oompa Loompas dancing merrily in sync with their song. Billy Wonka, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the grand unveiling of my latest creations. Feast your eyes on the green and red variety show. Veronica, what the hell is this all about, Willy? Billy Wonka, ah, Veronica, my dear, these are no ordinary chocolates. These treats will send your taste buds on a wild and raunchy journey. Tom, raunchy, Willy, you can't be serious. Billy Wonka, oh, but I am, Tom. Allow me to introduce our first creation, the spicy flaming farts. One bite of this delightfully devilish delicacy and you'll be letting out infernal fireballs from your rear end. Lucy, are you trying to kill us, Wonka? Billy Wonka, fear not, Lucy. The second invention is the sweaty sock surprise. Picture this biting into a chocolate that tastes like a sweaty gym sock marinated in vinegar and mold. The stench will leave you wanting more. Mike, that's revolting. I don't think I can handle this, Wonka. Billy Wonka, nonsense, Mike. Feast your eyes on the third masterpiece, the Booga Blast Bonanza. Imagine the texture of a slime-covered booger, combined with the flavors of a rotting onion. Pure indulgence, my friends. Alice, okay, this is officially the most disgusting thing I've ever heard of. Billy Wonka, but wait, there's more. Our fourth creation is the Toe Jam Truffle. It's a chocolate-coated blend of toe jam, athlete's foot flakes, and a hint of blue cheese. Truly extraordinary. Derek. Willy, this is madness. No one in their right mind would eat these horrors. Billy Wonka, ah, but you see, Derek, that's the beauty of it all. People love the absurd, the taboo. And now, the moment you've all been waiting for. Each of you lucky golden ticket holders will have the opportunity to try these culinary monstrosities. Voices of protest and disbelief fill the room. Palumpas, singing, oh, the green and red variety show. Where taste and decency don't seem to go. They bit into those nasty treats. And their bodies did some funny feats. As the Oompa Loompas sing, the golden ticket holders convulse, burp fire, emit foul odors, and struggle to maintain their composure. 
Oompa Loompas, singing, green and red, a clash of sins. Smelly socks and toe jam, it begins. They ate with vigor and ill-advised haste. Now they're covered in chocolatey waste. The crowd erupts in laughter as the golden ticket holders try to cope with their hilarious bodily reactions. Billy Wonka, laughing, oh, my dear friends, aren't these creations the pinnacle of absurdity? I must say, they've surpassed even my wildest expectations. As the scene fades, the golden ticket holders continue to endure the outrageous effects of the chocolates, with the Oompa Loompas singing their hilarious song in the background. Int. Moe's Tavern, Day. Homer, Barney, Carl, and Lenny sit at the bar, each holding a beer. Moe pours them another round. Oh! So, boys, how's it going tonight? Homer. Woo-hoo. It's going great. I love the sweet taste of beer. Barney. Yeah, me too. Beer is the nectar of the gods. Carl. You said it, Barney. Nothing better than a cold one after a hard day at the plant. Lenny! Hey, guys, have you ever imagined a world made entirely of donuts? Homer! Donuts? Oh, donuts. Barney! Yeah, donut, you wish. Carl! I can almost taste the glazed goodness. Lenny! Well, hold on to your beer, fellas, because tonight we're gonna experience that exact world. Homer! Woohoo! Let's do it! The friends chug their beers and stumble out of the bar, laughing hysterically. Int. Back alley behind Moe's, night. The friends stumble upon a giant vending machine, filled with tray after tray of mouth-watering pink frosted donuts. Homer! Oh my god! This is like my wildest dreams come true. Barney! It's a donut lover's paradise. Carl! I never thought I'd see the day. Lenny! Let's get in there and swim in a sea of donuts. The friends clamor into the vending machine, their eyes widening with delight. Int. Sentient donut world, continuous. Homer, Barney, Carl, and Lenny find themselves surrounded by sentient strawberry frosted pink donuts. The donuts talk, laugh, and dance around them. Donut number one. Welcome, oh mighty humans, to the donut realm. We are your sugary subjects. Homer. This is more amazing than all you can eat night at Krusty Burger. Barney. My mouth is in heaven. Carl. I can't even believe this. Lenny. Remember, guys, this place is nothing but donuts. No beer. Homer. No beer? Aw, donuts are overrated. Barney. I'm with you, Homer. Let's find our way back to Moe's. Int. Moe's Tavern, Day. Homer, Barney, Carl, and Lenny stumble back into Moe's, covered in pink frosting. Oh! What in the? You guys have been swimming in a donut ocean? Homer! Mo, you won't believe the crazy adventure we just had. Barney! Donuts are great, Mo, but nothing can beat your beer. Carl! We've come to appreciate what we have, thanks to those sugary treats. Lenny! Yeah, beer is the true elixir of life. The friends raise their glasses, toasting to their newfound appreciation for the simple joy of beer. As they laugh and enjoy each other's company, the memories of the sentient strawberry frosted pink donuts fade into the background, leaving them with a refreshed perspective. Fade out.
Omer. Belches loudly. Man, I could really go for a donut right now. Barney, slurring, donuts? Oh yeah, baby. Let's go, Homer. Carl, count me in. I could use some sugary goodness to soak up all this beer. Lenny, donuts? You had me at donuts, guys. Let's hit up the bakery. They stumble out of Moe's tavern and head towards the bakery. In the bakery, they find three trays of donuts with different toppings, including the green and pink ones. Homer, oh my sweet lord, look at all these donuts. Barney, excitedly, pink. Pink donuts. Strawberry frosted goodness, baby. Carl, licking his lips. These babies are calling my name. Lenny, wide-eyed. Guys, these donuts are talking to me. The donuts suddenly come to life, their eyes glowing and mouths opening. Pink donut, welcome, wayward souls. Step into the world of sentient strawberry frosted donuts. Green donut. Indulge in our sweetness, for resistance is futile. Homer, in awe, a world of donuts? This is a dream come true. Barney, grabbing a pink donut and devouring it. Hmm, this is even better than beer. Carl, munching on a green donut. I think I've ascended to a higher plane of existence. Lenny, chuckles, who needs reality when you have talking donuts? As they continue devouring the donuts, the donuts start multiplying rapidly. Pink donut, consume us, for we shall multiply and satisfy your every craving. Green donut, give in to temptation, for eternity in the world of donuts awaits. Homer, donuts forever, I'm in heaven. Barney, stuffing his face, donuts, donuts, and more donuts. This is the meaning of life. Carl, chuckles, I guess we found the pot of gold at the end of the donut rainbow. Lenny, laughing hysterically. I can't believe this is real life. Suddenly, they realize they can no longer move. Pink Donut, now that you're trapped, you shall be our eternal snack. Green Donut, say goodbye to your pathetic human lives. Homer, frantically, wait, we didn't mean to eat you, we were just hungry. Barney, pleading, please, donuts, spare us. We'll do anything. Carl, desperate, we promise we won't eat any more donuts. Just let us go. Lenny, tearfully, I'll even become a vegetarian, I swear. The donuts start closing in, ready to consume them, but suddenly, Marge bursts into the bakery. Marge, angry, Homer Simpson, I told you to stop eating junk food. The donuts freeze in place, uncertain of what to do. Homer, nervous, M. Marge, help, the donuts are alive and want to eat us. Marge, resolute, not on my watch. Marge grabs a rolling pin and starts whacking the donuts, sending them flying across the bakery. Marge, panting, that should teach him not to mess with my family. The donuts lie defeated, but still twitching slightly. Barney, relieved. We owe you our lives, Marge. Thank you. Carl, catching his breath. I never thought I'd say this, but I'm done with donuts for a while. Lenny, nods, same here. I think I've had enough donuts to last a lifetime. They exit the bakery, leaving behind the chaos and the defeated donuts. Homer, grumbling, well, now I'm craving a burger. Anyone up for a crusty burger? Barney, smiling, count me in, buddy. Let's go, the adventures of Homer and Barney continue. Alright, buckle up, everyone. We're about to embark on a cosmic shit show extravaganza. Ah, uh, Rick, are you sure this is a good idea? I mean, last time we messed with interdimensional travel, we ended up in a dimension where everybody was made of lasagna. Look, Morty, if you can't handle the heat, then stay the hell out of my laboratory. Now pay attention, we're heading to Dimension X-321. Dimension X-321? What's so unique about it, Rick? Oh, you'll see, Beth, 
It's a world where dogs have evolved into the dominant species. They've built cities, have jobs, and even have a functional democracy. Cute, right? Wrong. These dogs are ruthless dictators, Beth. They've enslaved humans and turned them into their loyal pets. It's like a twisted version of Lassie. I don't know, Rick. I kind of like the idea of being someone's pet. It's like having a purpose, you know? Shut up, Jerry. We're moving on to Dimension Y987. Prepare yourselves for the weirdest shit you've ever seen. Ah, oh, can we just skip this one? We've seen enough weird stuff with you, Rick. No, oh, sorry Summer. In this dimension, everyone is born with detachable appendages. Yeah, that's right. Arms, legs, even their heads can be detached and reattached at will. It's a nightmare for surgeons, but it makes for great flexibility during yoga classes. Jeez, Rick, that sounds disturbingly fascinating. Yeah. I know, Morty. Now, brace yourselves for Dimension Z-765. This one's a real mind-bender. What's so mind-bending about it, Dad? Oh, just the fact that every inhabitant of this dimension is permanently stuck in the year 1978. They're all wearing bell-bottoms, listening to disco, and using outdated technology. It's like they never got the memo that time keeps moving forward. Huh. Finally, a dimension where I'm in style. Hey, maybe I can show these people a thing or two about being cool. Shut up, Jerry. Nobody cares about your fashion choices. Now, hold on tight. We're off to dimension W234. I swear, Rick, if it's another dimension of fart creatures, I'm out. Relax, Summer. In this dimension, the currency is based on puns. That's right. The inhabitants have to come up with clever wordplay to earn a living. They're all walking around, trying to one-up each other with puntastic jokes. It's exhausting, trust me. This is getting weird, Rick. I don't know if I can handle any more craziness. Oh, come on, Morty. We're just scratching the surface of interdimensional insanity. Stick with me, and you'll see things you never thought possible. We're heading towards the final dimension now. What's the last one, Rick? Please tell me it's something relatively normal. Relatively normal? Ah, no such luck, Beth. We're ending our interdimensional tour with Dimension Q678. It's a world where everyone is obsessed with reality TV. They watch fake dramas, vote for talentless individuals, and care more about fame than world peace. It's like our Earth, but on steroids. Wow, that sounds terrifyingly accurate. Maybe we should stay here, Rick. I could totally win a reality show. Shut up, Jerry. We're leaving. This dimension is a solid zero on my rating scale. So, what's the highest rated dimension, Rick? That's easy, Summer. The highest rated dimension is the one we call home. The dimension where the smartest guy in the universe and his dysfunctional family reside. It may be crazy, but at least it's our kind of crazy. I guess you're right, Rick. Our dimension may be messed up, but it's our messed up dimension. Now you're catching on, Morty. Now, let's head home before your grandpa gets hungry for some Szechuan sauce. The spaceship zooms off into the cosmic unknown, leaving behind a trail of interdimensional chaos. Alright, listen up you fucking idiots. We're about to embark on a mind-blowing journey through the craziest interdimensional realities you've ever seen. Strap in, it's gonna be a bumpy fucking ride. Jeez, Rick, do we really have to use that language? Shut up, Morty. First stop, Dimension T69. This dimension is completely inhabited by walking talking dildos. That's right, folks, dildo people as far as the eye can see. It's unique because, well, they're fucking dildos, Morty. And it's not just their appearance, the whole dimension has a peculiar smell too. I give it a solid 2 out of 10. The novelty wears off pretty quick. Rick, can we please go somewhere less, obscene? Sure, Beth, 
your pathetic sense of morality dictates our next stop. Dimension K-666. Here, the inhabitants are sentient piles of animated vomit. They're constantly squirming and wriggling all over the place, leaving a trail of puke behind them. It's unique because it's a perpetual vomit party, Beth. The interesting point is how their vomit can actually communicate, like some twisted language of the puke. I rate this one a 4 out of 10, mainly for the gross factor. Ew, Dad, can we go somewhere less nasty? Fine, Summer, buckle up for Dimension P420. In this dimension, everyone is a giant, walking joint. That's right, Summer, they're walking, talking joints. The unique thing is that they can actually light themselves and smoke each other. It's like a never-ending 420 fest, but honestly, it gets old fast. I give this one a 3 out of 10, it's not as fun as it seems. Rick, could we maybe find a more family-friendly dimension? Alright, Jerry, your whining has led us to dimension B777. Here, the inhabitants are sentient piles of shit. Yep, walking, talking pieces of shit, Jerry. They're always squabbling, throwing insults at each other, and occasionally flinging chunks of shit at passers-by. I guess the interesting point is the variety of shapes and sizes of these shit people. I'll give it a 1 out of 10, it's just shitty, Jerry. Can we please find a dimension that's not completely disgusting? Fine, Morty, let's visit dimension F666.5. In this dimension, everyone is a giant anthropomorphic genitalia. They're walking around, talking, and fornicating with each other wherever they go. It's like an orgy on the streets, Morty. The interesting point is that their bodily fluids are said to taste like the finest wine. I give this one a solid 7 out of 10, it's weirdly kinky. Maybe we should call it a day, Rick. One last stop, Beth. Welcome to Dimension X69420. Everyone here is a horny, flying unicorn with a rainbow color direction. They constantly ejaculate glitter and rainbows, Beth. It's unique because their ejaculate is actually a powerful aphrodisiac. This dimension is a solid 9 out of 10, it's a fucking magical paradise. Alright, I'm officially traumatized for life. I don't even know what to say anymore. Well, that concludes our tour of the absolute weirdest dimensions, folks. Hope you enjoyed this fucked up journey. Now, let's get the hell out of here before Morty's brain explodes from all the weird shit he's witnessed today. Alright, strap yourselves in, idiots. We're about to embark on a mind-boggling trip through the most fucked up interdimensional realities you've ever seen. Jeez, Rick, do we have to? I mean, these seem pretty dangerous. Shut up, Morty, and stop being such a pussy. We're doing this for science. I'm with Morty on this one, Rick. Is it really necessary to visit such awful places? Necessary? No. Fun? Absolutely. Now. Buckle up and hold on tight. They enter the first dimension. What the hell is this place, Rick? It smells like rotten eggs. Welcome to Dimension Puke, Jerry. It's populated by sentient vomit creatures who communicate through belching. What makes it unique? Well, their vomit actually tastes like gourmet food. I rated a solid 2 out of 10. Ew, gross. Can we leave already? Alright, alright. Next stop, Dimension Clown. They enter the second dimension. Rick, I have a feeling I'm not going to like this one. You're damn right, Beth. This dimension is populated by clowns who never stop laughing. They've created a society based on slapstick comedy, and every interaction is filled with pies in the face and exaggerated pratfalls. It's a 1 out of 10 for me, and that's being generous. I can't wait to get out of here. This is nightmare fuel. Buckle up, Morty. We're heading to Dimension Flatulence. They enter the third dimension. Oh, dear God. What's that smell? Relax, Jerry. In this dimension, everyone communicates solely through farting. It's a unique form of language. I'll give them that. But the stench, it's unbearable. Zero out of 10 for me. Please, just take us away from here. 
Rick. Hang tight, folks. We're moving on to Dimension Booger. They enter the fourth dimension. Oh, gross. Why did you bring us here, Rick? Don't worry, Beth. In this dimension, the inhabitants are sentient boogers. They live in harmony and build their homes out of mucus. And if you need a tissue, just ask. They'll be more than happy to lend you a hand. I give it a 3 out of 10. Could be worse, I guess. I can't handle any more of this, Rick. Can't we go home? Hang in there, Morty. Last stop, Dimension Snail. They enter the fifth dimension. Okay, this one doesn't seem so bad. Just cute little snails everywhere. Oh, you naive fool, Jerry. In this dimension, the snails have taken over the world. They've enslaved the human population and created a totalitarian regime. But hey, at least they're cute, right? I'll give it a 7 out of 10. This is seriously messed up, Rick. I never want to see anything like this again. Don't worry, Summer. We're heading back home. But let this be a lesson to all of you. Sometimes, it's better to appreciate the craziness from a distance. They exit the last dimension and return home. Rick, I swear, if you ever suggest something like this again. Relax, Beth. I've had my fun. Now let's go back to saving the universe or whatever boring shit you guys like to do. The family goes about their usual business, glad to be back in their own reality. Alright, Morty, buckle up. We're about to embark on a journey through the most mind-boggling, messed up dimensions out there. Jeez, Rick, you sure we're ready for this? Eddie, Morty, we were born ready. Now hold on tight. This ride is gonna be wilder than Beth's midlife crisis. Beth glares at Rick. Alright, Dimension 1, the Hairdo Haven, inhabitants. Humanoid creatures with hair taller than Jerry's insecurities. Yeah, you heard me. Unique because it's like walking in a world of sentient bouffants. Interesting points? Uh, none really. Review score? A solid minus 5 out of 10. Whoa, Rick, that's harsh. Let's move on to Dimension 2. The Slobbering Swamp. Oh, this place sounds gross already. Inhabitants, slimy creatures with six tongues and a love for mud wrestling. The unique factor? Their diet consists solely of frogs and Jerry's never-ending stream of bad ideas. Hey! Interesting points? Well, this dimension is a mecca for used car salesmen. Review score? A slimy 2 out of 10. Can we go somewhere normal already? No can do, Summer. Dimension 3. The Hilarious Haunt. Inhabitants. Ghosts that possess inanimate objects and just goof around. That actually sounds kind of fun. Oh, it is, until you find a haunted toilet seat. Interesting points? Well, Let's just say I don't recommend using their amusement park rides. Review score, a spooky 7 out of 10. Alright, let's speed things up. Dimension 4, the pungent penitentiary. Inhabitants, criminals sentenced to eternal farting. Now that's a punishment. What's unique about this place? Well, Summer, it's the only dimension where Taco Tuesday is celebrated with a fart symphony. Interesting points, if you have a weak nose, stay away. Review score, a stinky 3 out of 10. Last dimension, please. Bye. Dimension 5, the burping ballet. Inhabitants. Graceful dancers who communicate only through belching. That's weirdly fascinating. Yeah, until they all sync up and the ground starts shaking. Interesting points, it's like attending an opera performed by a chorus of bodily functions. Review score, a melodic 6 out of 10. Can we please go back home now? Finally, someone with some sense. All right, strap in, losers. We're heading home. They all buckle up as the spaceship zooms away. Oh, Rick, you know, despite all the craziness, I'm glad we went on this adventure together. Shut up, Morty. Just shut up.
All right, Morty. Buckle up for the most intense, mind-bending game of Uno you've ever played. Oh, Rick, you sure about this? Uno doesn't seem that intense. Morty, this isn't just any Uno. These cards have a butterfly on them, Morty. A butterfly, that means it's statistically improbable and absolutely wild. Jeez, Rick, I don't know if I'm ready for all this chaos. Relax, Morty, it's just a card game. But hey, let's invite some of our favorite characters to spice things up a bit. Beth, Summer, get over here. What's all the commotion, Rick? Yeah, are we about to do something actually fun for once? We're gonna play Uno, the most dramatic game you've ever witnessed. I still don't get why it's so intense, Rick. Morty, the butterfly on top of one card and the bottom of another means anything goes. Get ready for pure chaos. Fine, I'll play. But if this turns into another one of your weird experiments, Rick, I'm out. Fair enough, Beth. Now let's play. I'll start with a wild card. Blue. Reverse. Green. Draw four, Morty. Yellow. Oh no, Rick. I don't have any yellow cards. Morty, calm down. Just draw some cards. Okay, okay. Draws four cards. This is getting out of hand. Skip. Red. Wild card. Blue. Draw two. Morty. Yellow. Seriously, Rick? Okay, fine. Draws two cards. You're ruining my life. Reverse. Green. Skip. Blue. Draw four. Rick. Yellow. Nice move, Beth. Draws four cards, but watch this. Reverse. Red. I can't take it anymore, Rick. I'm drowning in cards. Focus. Morty. We're almost there. Skip. Yellow. Draw four, Beth. Green. No, I've got nothing. Draws four cards, this game is a nightmare. Uno. Blue. Finally, Rick. Just end it already. Sorry, Morty. Draw four, Morty. Yellow. That's it. I've had enough of this dimension hopping, card game madness. Morty. Wait, Morty's gone, guys. Well, serves him right for doubting this game. He's probably in the worst dimension imaginable. Yeah, but knowing Morty, he'll complain about it in excruciating detail for days. Ah, uh, who cares? Let's keep playing. As the game goes on, Morty's muffled complaints can be heard from a distant dimension, while Rick and the others continue their intense game of Uno, oblivious to Morty's plight. All right, Morty, it's time for a party. Grab that deck of Uno cards. We're about to play the most intense game ever created. Jeez, Rick, I don't know if I'm ready for that. Uno can get pretty competitive. Don't worry, Morty. We'll invite some other Rick and Morty characters. They won't stand a chance against us. Morty starts shuffling the Uno cards while Rick prepares the snacks. Hey guys, mind if I join? I heard there's a game going on. Well, 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 Jerry, if it isn't the king of incompetence. Sure, why not, come play some frickin' Uno. Oh, I wanna play too. Uno is the only game where I can finally beat you guys. Count me in as well. Let's see if I have better luck with cards than I do with marriage. The characters sit around the table, ready to start the game. Alright, let's get this party started. I'll go first. Draw four Morty, you little punk. Oh, come on, Rick. Okay, here you go. Draw four, Jerry. You think that'll stop me? Draw eight, Beth. Uno. In your face. You're in for a world of pain, Jerry. Draw 16, Summer. Take that. Oh no, you don't. Draw 32, Rick. Ha! Huh. You brought this upon yourself, Summer. Draw 64, Morty. Uno. This is getting out of hand, Rick. Draw 128, Jerry. Uno? You've pushed me too far, Morty. 
Draw 256, Beth. Uno. Let's take it up a notch, Jerry. Draw 512, Summer. Uno. That's it, Beth. Draw 1024, Rick. Uno. You're leaving me no choice, Summer. Draw 2048, Morty. Uno. This is insane, Rick. Draw 4096, Jerry. Uno. I'm nearing my limit, Morty. Draw 8192, Beth. Uno. Brace yourself, Jerry. Draw 16384, Summer. Uno. I can't believe it. Draw 32768, Rick. Uno. You've doomed us all, Summer. Draw 65536, Morty. Uno. This is it, Rick. Draw. No, wait. I changed my mind. Skip you. Morty, you little bastard. You can't do that. Watch me, Rick. I just did. Skip you. Rick's eyes start glowing, and the table trembles. Fine, Morty. I see how it is. Draw 131,072, Jerry. Uno. Motherfu. Without warning, the table splits open, revealing a swirling vortex. Jerry, what did you do? I don't know, Beth. I didn't think this would actually happen. Oh my god, he's getting sucked in. Rick and Morty grab onto Jerry, trying to pull him back. It's dark, so dark. It feels like all my senses are being ripped apart. Hold on, Jerry. We'll save you. It's too late. I'm being plunged into a never-ending abyss of torment. The pain, the agony, it's indescribable. With one final cry for help, Jerry disappears into the vortex, leaving the room in stunned silence. Well, that's what you get for messing with the rules, Jerry. Anybody up for another game of Uno? The remaining characters exchange nervous glances, unsure if they should continue playing after witnessing the terrible fate that befell Jerry. Alright Morty, listen up. We've got ourselves a party to plan. I've invited some of the most messed up characters from the multiverse, so get ready for a wild ride. Ah, uh, Rick, are you sure this is a good idea? Last time, things got pretty out of control. Morty, when have I ever let a little chaos stop me? Now, let's get the party started. Dad, you better not bring any trouble around here. Remember what happened last time? Beth, relax. It's just a harmless get-together with a bunch of alternate reality versions of us. What's the worst that could happen? Oh, this sounds so lame already. Can't we just go to a normal party like normal people? Yeah, uh, Rick, I think Summer's right. Maybe we should reconsider this whole thing. Oh, Jerry, when will you learn? Nobody cares about your opinion. This party is happening whether you like it or not. Meanwhile, at the party. Party all right. Everyone, gather round. It's time to play a little game I like to call, Dimensional Disaster. We're gonna take turns listing the 10 worst dimensions we've ever been to. Party oh man, this is gonna be dark. Alright, I'll go first. Dimension C-137, where nobody ever invented the plumbus. It was just a sad, plumbus-less existence. Party Dimension D-99, where the entire world was overrun by Cronenberg-like creatures. It was disgusting, gross, and also kinda reminded me of Jerry. Party Dimension F-231, where everyone talks like Mr. Meeseeks and won't stop asking for ridiculous favors. It was annoying as hell. Party Dimension G-78, where every channel on TV was just endless episodes of ball fondlers. Let's just say, I don't need to see anyone fondling balls for a long, long time. Party Dimension R-666 where the Council of Ricks had decided that money should be turned into farts. Let me tell you, things got pretty stinky. Party Dimension X420, where everything was just an infinite loop of Mr. Poopy Butthole commercials. It was maddening, I couldn't get that jingle out of my head for days. Suddenly, a portal opens up and Party Mr. Meeseeks falls through. 
Party Mr. Meeseeks. Oh, geez. What did you guys do? You sent me to Dimension Z9000, where the entire world is made of sentient pickles. I'm stuck here with Brian up to my, well, you know. Oops, my bad. I guess someone's gonna have to spend some quality time with Pickle Rick. Good luck, loser. Everyone laughs as Party Mr. Meeseeks curses his luck in the dill-infested dimension, leaving them to continue their wild party in peace. Alright, every pony listen up. We're throwing a party tonight and we're gonna play a game so mind-blowingly insane that it will melt your feeble little brains. Who's in? Ah, uh, Rick, are you sure this is a good idea? The last time we played one of your games we ended up accidentally summoning an intergalactic death god. Ordy, shut up, I've got this all under control. Now, gather, round, everyone. We've got some special guests tonight. Introduce yourselves. Hi, I'm Jerry. I used to be married to Beth, but now we're divorced, so I guess I'm not really a smith anymore. Ah, Jerry, just get on with it. Hey y'all, I'm Summer. Just here to have a good time and hopefully not die. And I'm Beth, the voice of reason in this ridiculous family. Great, so here's the deal. We're gonna play a game called Dimensional Chaos. Each of you will list the 10 worst dimensions you can think of. Be creative. Mr. Meeseeks, oh, oh, Mr. Meeseeks, I'm here to play, too. Look at me. Ah, uh, Mr. Meeseeks, good to see you. All right, pal, you're up first. Give us your 10 worst dimensions. Mr. Meeseeks, well, number one has to be dimension of mindless Jerry clones. Just imagine an entire world ruled by Jerry's. It's a horror show. Nice one, Mr. Meeseeks. Morty, your turn. Ah, uh, okay, how about dimension of never-ending puppets? Everywhere you go, there are creepy puppets just staring at ya. Aha, uh -huh. vivid imagination, Morty. Okay, Jerry, don't disappoint us. Um, how about dimension of uncomfortable silent farts? It's like living in a never-ending Dutch oven. Awful. My turn. I'm gonna go with dimension of killer bees with laser vision. Yeah, good luck surviving that one. All right, I'll go with dimension of living shopping malls. The escalators are alive and the mannequins hunt you down. Pure nightmare fuel. Alright, here's mine. Dimension of Rickless Morty. Morty, imagine a world without me. Scary, right? Ah, no offense, Rick, but that doesn't sound so bad. Shut up, Summer. This is serious business. Now, let's hear from the rest of you losers. Squanchy, squanch, squanch, I'm squanchy. And I just squanching hate the dimension of glittery cat butts. It's all sparkly and disgusting. Bird person, I am bird person. In the dimension of eternal poetry slams, you are forever subjected to terrible spoken word performances. It's agonizing. How about dimension of non-stop dad jokes? Everyone is just one big walking pun, and it's unbearable. I can't believe I'm saying this, but I think I picked the dimension of never-ending math class. Infinite equations and no bathroom breaks. Help. Excellent choices, losers. Now. Let's get this party started. Scene shifts to the party, everyone laughing and having a good time. Squanchy, hey, where'd bird person go? I don't know, he was just here a minute ago. Suddenly, a blinding light appears and sucks bird person into a vortex. Bird person, no, it's the dimension of non-stop nickelback music. I can't take it, save me. Scene fades out as everyone laughs at bird person's misfortune. Looks like someone picked the wrong dimension. Tough break, bird person, tough break.
All right, Morty, grab that colorful circular object and let's get this party started. Oh, sure thing, Rick. Whoa, this thing is trippy. Look at all those colors and shapes. Hey, everyone, gather around. We're gonna play a game with this funky object. Let's introduce ourselves to our guests first. Hi, I'm Summer. I'm Rick's granddaughter, and I'm just here for the wild ride. Aw, uh, hey, I'm Jerry. I'm here because, well, I guess I have nothing better to do. All right, now let's welcome our special guests, SEAL Team Ricks and Jerry Bree. SEAL Team Ricks. We're SEAL Team Ricks, here to kick ass and dimension hop. Jerry Bree. Hey, we're the guys who take care of Jerry's from all the crappy dimensions. Glad to be here. Now, everyone, each of you come up with 10 of the shittiest dimensions you've ever come across. Well, there was dimension 69420 where everyone was a fart. And then, ah, uh, dimension C 13780, where mobile ads would physically assault you. In dimension D 666, the only currency was toenail clippings, and in dimension X 13, everyone's thoughts were broadcast on a giant screen. Dimension G 9000, where everyone had giant insect heads, and dimension Z 420, where time only moved backwards. In Dimension W33, everyone had spaghetti for hair, and in Dimension B789, the only food available was pineapple pizza. Deal Team Rick 1. Well, there was Dimension R667, where giant spiders would rain from the sky, and in Dimension K9009, the air was made of liquid fire. Jerrybury Guy. In Dimension S12345, everyone had a laser pointer for a finger, and in Dimension M234, the world was constantly flooding with tomato sauce. Alright, enough with the list. It's time to decide the loser. And the unlucky winner is... Jerrybury Guy. Jerrybury Guy, oh, come on. Are you serious? Yeah, sorry buddy. Now get ready to be plunged into the worst dimension ever. It's called Dimension F666. Prepare for the ultimate nightmare. Jerrybury Guy, wait, what? No! In this dimension, everything is on fire. The sky, the ground, even the air is just pure flames. Help me, someone. Should we do something? Nah, it's just Jerrybury guy. He'll figure it out, or not. Well, at least it's not me this time. Yeah, lucky us, I guess. Alright, let's continue the party. I've got some crazy experiments to show you guys. Strap in for a mind-bending evening. Alright Morty, buckle up for the excitement of a lifetime. Today we're playing the mind-numbingly dull game of Millborns. Seriously, Rick? This game is so lame. Can't we do something cool, like jump to a different dimension or blow up some aliens? Morty, please, we need to exercise our brains and have a relaxing evening for once. Now, let's start this never-ending journey of card descriptions. Ah, uh, this is gonna be a snooze fest. Shut up, Summer. It's your turn first. Describe your card in mind-numbing detail. All right, fine. I've got a blue card, with a number four on it. It's shaped like a squiggly line. Wow, Summer, riveting. Okay, my turn. I've got a green card, number six, shaped like a wavy square. Excellent description, Morty. Now, it's my turn. I drew a yellow card, number two, shaped like a curvy triangle. It's totally mind-blowing. Rick, seriously? These cards are so boring. I'd rather watch paint dry. Well, buckle up, sweetie, because we're just getting started. Summer, play your next card and describe it to us like it's hot gossip. Fine, I'm playing a red card, number three, shaped like an oval. I know, super scandalous. Hold on, guys. 
I just drew a black card, number 8, shaped like a pointy rectangle. This is getting intense. Morty, calm down, it's just a card game. Now, I'm playing a green card. Number 5, shaped like a super elongated diamond. Mind blowing, I know. This game is dragging on like a snail on tranquilizers. I play a blue card, number 2, shaped like a squiggly line. Guys, brace yourselves. I just drew a yellow card, number 1, shaped like a lopsided square. Can you feel the excitement in the air? Ordi, your sarcasm is reaching new levels. I'm playing a red card, number 4, shaped like a slightly bent oval. Better hold on to something. I play a black card, number 6, shaped like an almost perfect square. Somebody stop this roller coaster of fun. Brace yourselves, guys. I'm playing a green card, number three, shaped like a wave that just wants to be free. This is pure madness. Ordi, take it easy. We're playing a super thrilling game here. I'll just play a yellow card. Number two, shaped like a triangle that's been hypnosis trained by David Blaine. This game is never gonna end, is it? I play a blue card, number one, shaped like a line that fell asleep. Hold on tight, folks. I'm playing a red card, number 5, shaped like an oval that dreams of being a rhombus. Ordi, you're pushing the limits of tedium here. Now, I'm playing a black card, number 4, shaped like a rectangle that wishes it were a parallelogram. I'm so over this game, but fine. I play a green card, number 2, shaped like a square with a case of the Mondays. Brace yourselves, everyone. I'm playing a yellow card, number 3, shaped like a triangle that's tripping on acid. This is the pinnacle of excitement. Ordi, your enthusiasm is beyond comprehension. I play a blue card, number four, shaped like a line that wishes it could be a polygon. Can we please end this madness? I play a red card, number one, shaped like an oval that just wants to retire. This game is the embodiment of eternal suffering. I'm playing a black card, number two, shaped like a rectangle that yearns for the sweet release of oblivion. Ordi, you need to chill. I'll just play a green card, number three, shaped like a square that just wants to escape this feudal existence. Finally, it's over. I play a yellow card, number four, shaped like a triangle that doesn't give a freaking damn anymore. Thank God, I'm playing my last card, a blue card, number five, shaped like a line that just wants to vanish into oblivion, much like my will to live. That's the spirit, Morty. Now. Let's pack up this thrilling game and do something actually interesting, like, literally anything else. Ordi, grab the portal gun. We've got another adventure in the making. Aw, oh, jeez, Rick. Can't we take a break? My brain's still recovering from the last one. Breaks are for weaklings, Morty. We've got a statistically improbable scenario waiting for us. Dad, can you please be serious for once? You're always dragging Morty into these insane escapades. Oh, come on, Beth. Where's your sense of adventure? It's what makes us smiths who we are. Ah, excuse me? Can we talk about something important for a change? Like, the amazing foam replica of Bobby Hill I just got? Summer, seriously? You're obsessed with that foam thing. It's not even real. And you're obsessed with whatever weird, bizarre creature Grandpa Rick drags us into. Enough bickering, everyone. We've got a situation to handle. Follow me. They all enter a room with a green carpet and notice a stuffed animal sitting on the ground. Whoa, Rick! Look at those creepy stuffed animals! They're giving me the heebie-jeebies! Ordi, these aren't just any stuffed animals. They're interdimensional beings with the power to defy the laws of physics. Dad, are you seriously implying that stuffed animals hold supernatural abilities? Beth, you're always questioning my genius. Just watch and learn. As Rick approaches the stuffed animals, they suddenly come to life. Stuffed animal one, hello, Rick. Long time no see, ready for some fun? Stuffed Animal 2. Oh, you never back down from a challenge, do you, Rick? Let's do this. 
Oh great, the stuffed animals are talking now. Just what I needed. Ah, uh, Rick, should we be concerned about this? Concerned, Morty. These stuffed animals are nothing compared to the shenanigans we've dealt with before. Can we just get rid of them? I don't want them messing up my Bobby Hill replica. Agreed, let's find a way to neutralize the situation, Dad. Fine, fine. I'll use my scientific genius to handle this. They engage in an intense battle with the stuffed animals, resulting in chaos and destruction. Oh my god, my replica got ruined. Dad, this is exactly why Mom divorced you. Rick, can we please go home now? I can't handle any more of this insanity. Fine, Morty. Let's portal out of here. They escape the room and return home. Well, that was another thrilling adventure, wasn't it? Thrilling? More like a disaster waiting to happen. Ah, oh, I guess my phone Bobby Hill is gone forever. Life is so unfair. I can't believe we survived that. I need to lie down. Well, Morty, that's the price we pay for being the smartest beings in the universe. Adventure never takes a break. The family exchanges exasperated glances as Rick smirks. End of episode. Host. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Comedy Central Roast of the United States. Tonight, we have six randomly selected countries ready to tear each other apart. Let's get this vulgar, politically incorrect, and completely insane party started. Canada. Alright, you poutine-loving motherfuckers. Let's start with our neighbor, the United States. Do you know why the Statue of Liberty is green? It's from all the envy every country feels seeing how fucked up you are. Mexico. Oh, Canada, should your maple syrup drinking ass up? Speaking of fucked up, let's talk about Mexico. We've got more drug cartels than you have tacos, and that's saying something. Your country is a goddamn war zone. Germany, sit down, tequila shorting idiots. Let's address Germany now. You made great cars, but you also gave us Adolf Hitler. The only thing worse than your sausages is your fucked up history. China. Germany you think you're fucked up, China is the real deal, we've got smog so thick, it's like our citizens are vaping oxygen. And don't get me started on our censorship, we're like a goddamn Orwellian nightmare. Russia. China, you're just a communist shithole. Speaking of shitholes, let's talk about Russia. We might have vodka, but you guys have the most corrupt government on the planet. Your elections are a bigger joke than Putin's love for riding shirtless on horses. Australia. Keep talking, Russian vodka swilling pricks. Australia's turn now, kangaroos might be cute, but we have the deadliest animals in the world. Our spiders will make your testicles disappear faster than your citizens' freedom of speech. Roast! Alright, enough with the ruthless roasts, it's time for the United States to get us revenge. United States, you think you've hit hard, you international fuckwits? Let me give you a taste of what makes America great. Canada, you're like the United States light, but without the balls or the culture that isn't maple syrup and hockey. Mexico, we might have a border problem, but at least we're not a drug cartel playground. Germany, you might have tried to take over the world, but all you did was give us David Hasselhoff's terrible music career. China, your censorship is as oppressive as your air pollution. Russia, your government is so corrupt, they make Tony Soprano look like a goddamn choir boy. And Australia, thanks for the deadly animals, but we'll take a poisonous snake over a venomous politician any day. Post. And there you have it, folks. The United States taking no prisoners and delivering some brutal roasts of its own. This has been one hell of a roast, and we hope you enjoyed this vulgar, politically incorrect circus of insults. Link. Alright, listen up you motherfucking assholes. Welcome to the goddamn Comedy Central Roast of Link. I hope you brought your A-game.
because I'm ready to tear each and every one of you a new fucking asshole. Ganondorf. Oh, look at this little shit all dressed up in his little green tunic. I swear, you're such a pussy, I can defeat you with my eyes fucking closed. Wink, shut your damn mouth, Ganondorf. You may be the king of evil, but it'll be the one kicking your sorry ass all the way back to Hyrule. Zant. Oh, look everyone, it's the hero of time. More like the hero of fails, am I right? You couldn't find your way out of a paper bag if your life depended on it. Wink, Zant, you batshit crazy lunatic. I can't take you seriously with that ridiculous mask. Did your mommy forget to take her meds while she was pregnant with you? Edna, Link, you dumbass hero. I tried to help you, but you were too busy being a little bitch. Maybe if you weren't such a pansy, you could actually save Hyrule without my help. Link, oh, shut the fuck up, Midna. You may be a Twilight Princess, but you're just a mean-spirited, backstabbing bitch. Did your daddy not love you enough or something? Ingle, Kulu Limpa, you worthless shitstain. You fly around in your little balloon, thinking you're all high and mighty. Newsflash, dumbass, nobody gives a flying fuck about you. Think, Tingle, you creepy little fucker. I swear, if I see you prancing around in your ridiculous outfit one more time, I'm gonna rip those fairy wings right off your back. Alan. Link, you're supposed to be the hero of time, but all I see is a lazy, good-for-nothing asshole. Maybe if you spend less time fucking around with Kukos, you could actually save the world. Think, fuck you, Melon. Your singing voice is worse than nails on a chalkboard. Why don't you go back to the ranch and milk some goddamn cows, you talentless threat? Dark Link, you think you're so fucking special, don't you, Link? Well, newsflash, I'm the embodiment of your own darkness. I'm the true hero of time, not your sorry ass. Link, Dark Link, you're just a sad reflection of my own insecurities. Hollow and pathetic, so why don't you crawl back into the shadow you came from and leave the real hero to do his job? Zelda. Link, you may be the hero of time, but you're also the biggest disappointment. I thought you were the chosen one, but all I see is a clueless moron who can't even save me. Link, Zelda, you're nothing but a princess in distress. If it wasn't for me, you'd be nothing more than a damsel in distress waiting for some hero to rescue you. So shut the fuck up and appreciate me. Link, alright, you sorry excuses for roasters. It's time for me to roast your sorry asses right back. Ganondorf, with your failed attempts at world domination, you're nothing more than a constipated, overgrown pig with anger management issues. Zant, you think you're so fucking tough, but you're just a sad little puppet, dancing to the tune of your own madness. Midna, you may have saved my ass a couple of times, but let's not forget you were nothing more than a twilight mosquito sucking the life out of me. Tingle, you're a grown man dressed in a fairy costume. How about you go fuck yourself with a deku stick? Melon, you sing like a dying cuckoo. Maybe you should stick to shoveling cow shit instead of opening your mouth. And Dark Link, you may be my reflection, but you're nothing more than a reflection of your own self-loathing and failures. Tonight, I showed each and every one of you who the real hero is. So fuck off, assholes. Alright Morty, listen up. We got a party to plan. And not just any party, an interdimensional party of epic proportions. Jeez, Rick, couldn't we just have a normal party for once? Morty, normal is for losers. We're gonna invite some of the most messed up cartoon characters and celebrities we can find. Oh, that sounds like a disaster waiting to happen. Count me in. Do I have to be a part of this? I don't think it's a good idea, Rick. Jerry. When have you ever had a good idea? Stay out of this. I'm totally down for this. Our parties are always insane. That's the spirit, Summer. Now let's start by sending out these collage invitations to our guests. Whoa, Rick. Look, we got Walter White, Jesse Pinkman, and even Heisenberg himself. Yeah, yeah, whatever. Those breaking bad guys are small fish in this interdimensional pond. We got Jessica Rabbit, Mr. Bean, and Beyonce in the mix. How on earth did you manage to invite Beyonce to our party, Rick? Simple, Beth, I dimension hopped to one where she was just a regular person. Money can get you anywhere. I can't believe we're hanging out with cartoon characters and celebrities. 
This is so surreal. The reel doesn't even begin to describe what's about to go down, Jerry. Now, everyone, grab a pen and paper. We're gonna list the 10 worst dimensions ever. I'll start. Dimension C-137, where everyone's butts are on their faces. Dimension F-267, where spiders are the dominant species. They rule with eight legs. Dimension Q-592, where the Gallagher family from Shameless is the only TV show. Forever. All right, my turn. Dimension X-923, where the Kardashians are world leaders. Talk about a nightmare. How about Dimension B-471, where everyone speaks in limericks? That'd be annoying. Jessica Rabbit, I got one. Dimension R-666, where Mickey Mouse is a demonic dictator who rules with an iron fist. Mr. Bean, Dimension L-312, where everyone is a mime. Silent chaos all around. Beyonce, Dimension S-845, where karaoke is the only form of communication. Can you imagine? Great job, team! Now let's all compare our lists and see who has the worst dimension ever. They all compare their lists, and it turns out that Morty's dimension is the worst. Oh, jeez, guys! I didn't think mine would be the worst. Don't worry, Morty. It's just a game, right? Or is it? Suddenly, a vortex opens up and sucks Morty into his dimension. Rick! Help me! It's the butt face butts! Don't worry, Morty. I'll get you out of there. The episode ends with Rick frantically trying to rescue Morty from the dimension of butt-faced people, setting the stage for the next crazy adventure. Alright, Morty, listen up. I've created a game that's gonna blow your mind. Ah, uh, Rick, I mean, are you sure this is safe? Morty, when have I ever been concerned about safety? Now come on, the gang's all here. What's this all about, Rick? You know I have plans tonight. Trust me, Beth, you're gonna want to cancel those. We're about to embark on a journey like no other. Ah, uh, can we just get this over with? I have a date later. Oh. Look, everyone, Summer has a date. Good for you, sweetie. Shut up, Jerry, like you have any room to talk. All right, all right, let's cut the chit chat. Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you the worst dimension game. Bird person, greetings, fellow beings. I am Bird person, ready to partake in this unique endeavor. Noob noob, hey, I'm noob noob, just here to clean up your messes, like always. Mr. Meeseeks, oh we, I'm Mr. Meeseeks. Look at me, I hope the worst dimension is full of Meeseeks boxes. Unity, I am Unity, a collective hive mind capable of experiencing unimaginable dimensions simultaneously. Okay, okay, but why are we doing this? I mean, isn't our dimension bad enough? Jerry, you never fail to prove your incompetence, do you? We're doing this for the ultimate thrill, to see what nightmares exist beyond our wildest imagination. So, how does this game work, exactly? Simple, Morty. Everyone is going to list off their top 10 worst dimensions, and the one with the most horrifying dimension wins. Are we seriously going through with this? This sounds like a terrible idea. Oh, Beth, don't be such a buzzkill. Now, who wants to go first? Noob noob, I'll start. Worst dimension number 10. Giant spiders ruling over a land of eternal darkness. Freaking nightmare fuel. Mr. Meeseeks, number 9, a dimension where every Meeseeks is just a little bit too eager to please. Talk about exhausting. Third person, worst dimension number 8, a never-ending karaoke bar where everyone sings, get swifty on repeat. Unity, for dimension number 7, an existence governed by the tyranny of the Pickle Ricks, flooding the world with their brine-soaked madness. Dimension 6, an eternal school dance where you're stuck slow dancing with the most socially awkward losers imaginable. My turn. Number 5. A dimension where Pluto is still a planet, and Neil deGrasse Tyson stalks you, constantly correcting you. 
All right, my worst dimension number four, a realm where Tammy is Rick's favorite person, and they take over the universe together. Gross. Ah, uh, dimension number three, a world ruled by evil versions of the Cromulons, forcing everyone to participate in interdimensional talent shows. All right, everybody, brace yourselves. Dimension number two, a dimension where Tiny Rick is in charge, enslaving all of humanity with catchy pop songs. Noob noob. And the worst dimension ever goes to Dimension number one A realm where fleet flopping Gazorbazorpian sex bots have taken over Earth and Rick is their leader Wait a minute, how did Noob Noob win? Noob Noob Oh, yay, I won But uh, guys, I don't think I should have won This dimension is really, uh, uncomfortable Especially for someone with my uh, delicate constitution Well, 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 Noob Noob Looks like you're gonna have to learn the hard way that winning isn't always a good thing. Aw, oh, Rick, shouldn't we help him? Aw, oh, Morty, he'll figure it out. Let's focus on finding a dimension where everything is made of Cronenberg flesh. That should be a screen. Noob noob. Oh, jeez, guys. This dimension smells worse than Jerry's cooking. Somebody get me out of here. Title, Futurama, The Sacrifice of Slurms McKenzie. Fry, Leela, Bender, Amy, and Professor Farnsworth are gathered on the Planet Express ship, preparing for a wild night out in Futurama's version of New York City. They are excitedly discussing their plans while sipping on high-proof old Fortran. Incident. Slurms McKenzie, the party-loving Slurm spokesperson, crashes the scene, inviting himself and his entourage to join the gang's night of debauchery. The crew, in various states of inebriation, enthusiastically welcomes him aboard. Fry! Whoa, Slurms McKenzie, you're like, the coolest dude in the universe! Slurms, you bet your sweet baby I am. Let's tear it up, Earth Higgins. Progression. The crew and Slurms venture to the galaxy's the hottest nightclubs, drinking copious amounts of alcohol, and partying like there's no tomorrow. They leave a trail of destruction in their wake, causing chaos and mayhem. Bender, this is the mother of all benders. I'm gonna need a bigger liver. Amidst the craziness, a mysterious alien artifact catches the crew's attention. Slurms, always up for an adventure, foolishly activates it, unaware of its catastrophic effects. The artifact unleashes a meteor shower of giant, drunken humanoids, wreaking havoc throughout the city. Lila, panicking, great, another apocalypse. Just what this planet needs. As chaos ensues, Slurms, realizing the damage caused by his curiosity, takes it upon himself to save the day. He leads the rampaging giants away from innocent civilians, using his party animal instincts to distract them. Slurms, come on, you giant bastards. Follow me if you want to have a real party. With the meteor monster safely distracted, the crew regroups and formulates a plan to deactivate the alien artifact, bringing an end to the city's destruction. Slurms, exhausted and battered, stands on a rooftop as the crew finishes their task. Fry! Slurms, you're a hero! Slurms, exhausted but smiling, it was one hell of a party, guys. Glad I could save the day. Now, I'm gonna take a nice, long slurm-induced nap. The crew bids farewell to their newfound hero, knowing they have experienced one of the most epic nights in New York's history. They leave Slurms to rest, cherishing the memories of their wild adventure. Lila. All right, everyone, let's get back to the ship. There's always tomorrow for more insane shenanigans. They walk away, leaving Slurm sleeping peacefully on the rooftop, a symbol of the sacrifices made in the name of a good party. PhD level episode description. Futurama. The Sacrifice of Slurm's Mackenzie is an episode that explores the consequences of excessive partying and the unexpected nature of heroism. By infusing the familiar characters with short tempers, foul language, and exaggerated personas, the narrative delves into the extremes of their personalities. The story utilizes humor and absurd scenarios, pushing the boundaries of what is statistically improbable. Through these elements, 
the episode provides an entertainment experience that engages the audience in a wild, unpredictable, and dramatic adventure. Additionally, it touches upon themes of camaraderie, sacrifice, and the celebration of life's wild moments. Fry. All right, everyone, let's party like there's no tomorrow. Bender, woohoo. Bring on the booze, baby. Lila, Fry, are you sure it's a good idea to party with Slurms Mackenzie? He's famous for his wild parties. Fry, of course, Lila, what could possibly go wrong? Slurms, hey, party people, ready to get your grooves on? Amy, woo, let's do this. Hermes, I've got my dancing shoes on. Oidberg. I may not have dancing shoes, but I have dancing claws. Claws up, everyone. Fry. Slurms, hit us with your best party tricks. Slurms, alright, everyone. Get ready for the Electro Slap Dance Free for All. Bender. Oh yeah, bring it on. Lila. Ah, uh, I can't believe I'm doing this. Slurms, and here we go. They all start dancing wildly, drinks in hand, laughing and cheering. Fry. This is the best party ever. Bender. Damn straight. Slurms knows how to throw down. Amy, woohoo. I'm so wasted right now. Hermes. Sweet Hermes, this is insane. Oidberg, I'm feeling the rhythm in my exoskeleton. Lila, I can't believe I'm enjoying this. Slurms, you're a party master. Slurms, thanks, guys. Remember, the party never stops. A sudden explosion rocks the club, and the music stops. Fry, what the hell was that? Bender, uh-oh, something's not right. Lila, look, the building's on fire. Amy, we need to get out of here. Hermes, everyone, remain calm and head for the exits. Oidberg, run for your crustacean lives. Slurms bravely steps forward. Slurms, everyone, get out while you can. I'll hold off the flames. Fry, Slurms, no, you don't have to do this. Slurms, I've had my share of parties, guys. It's time for someone else to shine. Go, now. Lila, we won't forget you, Slurms. They all escape the burning club, looking back in sadness as Slurms is engulfed in flames. Bender. Damn, he was one hell of a party animal. Amy. We owe it to Slurms to keep the partying legacy alive. Hermes. Let's remember him by partying harder than ever. Oidberg. I'm the next Slurms. Claw dance marathon, anyone? Lila. Slurms Mackenzie, the ultimate party hero. Rest in peace, you crazy son of a B asterisk TCH fade out with a somber yet triumphant theme playing. Alright, listen up, you dumb D-U-M-S. We're gonna have a motherfucking party tonight, and it's gonna be off the fucking charts. Jeez, Rick, maybe we can just have a regular party without all the cussing? Shut up, Morty. This is my house, and my rules. Now, let's have Beth and Summer invite some of our cartoon buddies and random celebs. Alright, I'll reach out to Stewie Griffin, because he's a twisted little shit just like you, Rick. And I'll also invite Lady Gaga, because, well, she's just weird, like us. I'll text Bender from Futurama. He'll definitely bring some kick-ass party favors. And let's get Johnny Sins, he's a porn star and a plumber. So, ah, uh, multitasking, I guess. Can we invite someone normal, please? How about Homer Simpson? He's funny, harmless, and definitely not smart like us. Fine, Jerry. Get your bland ass Homer on the guest list. Now, let's get this stupid party game started. Each of us will list 10 of the most fucked up dimensions we've ever been to, and the loser gets plunged into the worst one. Wait, what? That's insane, Rick. We can't just mess with dimensions like that. Morty, 
we're already knee deep in interdimensional shit, so might as well dive headfirst. I'll go first. Dimension C-137, where everyone wears their underwear on their heads as a fashion statement. Dimension F-666, where all the dogs are sentient and rule the world. They make humans fetch, and it's messed up. Dimension Z-12, where everyone is an anthropomorphic vegetable. Carrots rule with an iron fist, and cucumbers are their slaves. Dimension K-9000, where every human is a clone of Jerry Smith. The world is boring as hell, and everyone loves doofus Jerry. Dewey Griffin. Dimension P45, where everyone speaks backwards and walks on their hands. It's extremely confusing, and I couldn't figure out how to change a diaper. Lady Gaga. Dimension X23, where fashion is outlawed, and everyone wears a potato sack. My outfits were useless, and I had an existential crisis. Bender. Dimension B1337, where robots have enslaved humanity. I was treated like a mere toaster, and it really rusted my bolts. Johnny Sins. Dimension S69, where sex is illegal and strictly regulated. My career went down the drain, and I became an accountant. Boring as fuck. Homer Simpson. Ah, uh, I don't know any dimensions, but there's one where beer flows like rivers, and donuts rain from the sky. I call it, Boozidonotopia. Alright, everybody, let's vote for the shittiest dimension. And the loser is, Jerry. What? I won? Oh, crap. Strap in, Jerry. We're sending you straight to the dimension of screaming dentists and toe nail clipping taxes. Goodbye, loser. Jerry gets sucked into a portal, screaming. Rick, you can't just send Jerry to a horrible dimension like that. We have to bring him back. Fine, Morty. Let's be fucking heroes and save Jerry from his own incompetence. Next stop, the dimension of endless Jerry clones. They jump into the portal, leaving the party in chaos. Alright, Morty, listen up. We've got a party to throw tonight. And not just any party, a dimensionally mind-bending party. Ah, uh, Rick, are you sure about this? Last time we had a party, we almost destroyed the entire multiverse. Relax, Morty, I've got everything under control. Now, where's your sister? We need her to invite her friends too. Summer! Dad! Get in here! We're throwing a party! Ah, uh, seriously? Can we not do this right now? I have plans with my friends. Oh, come on, Summer. It'll be fun. Morty's right, we need to bond as a family. Bond as a family? That's just a fancy way of saying, let's all be miserable together. All right, enough family drama. Let's get this party started. I've invited some friends from different dimensions and even some real life celebrities. Whoa, really? Who's coming? Well, we have SpongeBob SquarePants, John Wick, Deadpool, and even Kim Kardashian. You invited Kim Kardashian? Why? Hey, she's got some multi-dimensional secrets, Beth. Don't underestimate her. So, what's this, unique, game you were talking about? Glad you asked, Summer. We're going to list the 10 worst dimensions ever. And trust me, we've seen some horrific ones. Alright, I'll start. Dimension Z-59, where everyone has butts for faces, and faces for butts. SpongeBob. Wow, that sounds like a real bubble-bursting experience. In Bikini Bottom, we prefer our faces on our heads. John Wick. Alright, I got one. Dimension X-87, where every day is, take your pet shark to work day. Deadpool. Hey, that actually sounds like a typical Monday for me. Kim Kardashian. Okay, here's one. Dimension K42, where contouring doesn't exist. Gasp. And. I got nothing. Can I just sit this round out? Sure. Jerry, take a back seat while the grown-ups play. Now, time for the final round. Wait, what's the final round? Easy. We vote for the worst dimension, and the loser gets plunged into it. Whoa, 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 Rick. Isn't that a little harsh? Morty. In the grand scheme of the multiverse, a little dimension hopping never hurt anyone. 
Fine. Let's vote. My vote goes to Morty's dimension with the butt faces. John Wick. Yeah, that one's a real deal breaker. Can I change my vote to Morty's dimension too? Looks like it's unanimous, Morty. Looks like you're the loser. Are you kidding me, Rick? I'm your grandson. Rules are rules, Morty. Prepare to be plunged into dimension Z-59. This is ridiculous. Suddenly, a portal opens, and Morty is sucked in, disappearing from the room. Rick, you're an awful father. Hey, what can I say? I create chaos, not family fun. Rick takes a swig from his flask as the party continues in chaotic delight. Int. Electronic store, day. Jimmy, 40s, wearing a plaid shirt, stands in front of a large display of televisions in a building with a lot of windows. He looks excited. Jimmy. Oh, fucking A. Look at all these TVs. It's like a goddamn paradise for my eyeballs. Stan, 40s, wearing a hoodie, approaches Jimmy, looking annoyed. Stan. Jimmy. I don't get why you're so obsessed with TVs. They're just boxes that suck your soul and turn your brain into mush. Jimmy. Shut the fuck up, Stan. You're just jealous cause you couldn't appreciate quality programming if it screwed you in the ass. Randy, 50s, wearing a baseball cap, suddenly bursts in, panting and out of breath. Randy. Guys. You won't fucking believe this. I just found a time machine in the back alley. Kyle, 40s, wearing glasses, rolls his eyes and crosses his arms. Kyle. Oh great, another one of Randy's idiotic schemes. This better not be a waste of time. They all follow Randy to the back alley where a rusty contraption resembling a phone booth stands. Cartman, 40s, overweight, emerges from the shadows, licking a greasy bag of chips. Cartman. About time, assholes. I'm hungry. Let's go back in time and get some legendary food. Stan. Seriously, Cartman? We have the chance to witness a historical event, and all you can think about is food. Cartman. Well, what the fuck else am I supposed to think about, Stan? I'm not the one who's secretly in love with the History Channel. Kyle. Guys, can we please just decide on a historical event to visit? I'm not getting any younger here. They all gather around the time machine and Randy spins the dials, setting the coordinates for the Battle of Waterloo. Gimme. Holy shit, dudes. We're about to see Napoleon kick some serious ass. This is gonna be epic. As the time machine shudders and sparks fly, Kenny, 40s, the perpetual victim, clenches his heart, gasping for air. Kenny. MMMPH. MMPH. Everyone ignores Kenny's apparent distress, too caught up in the excitement. Suddenly, with a loud bang, the time machine disappears, leaving the gang standing in an open field. Cartman. Where the fuck are we, you moron? This doesn't look like Waterloo. Gimme. I think we're even further back in time, you dumbass. Look, is that a fucking dinosaur? They all turn to see a T-Rex charging in their direction. Panic ensues. Stan. Fuck, fuck, fuck. We're gonna die. Kenny, being the unfortunate soul, gets trampled by the dinosaur. But true to Kenny fashion, he miraculously survives, although with severe injuries. Kenny, gurgled. MMMPH, MMPH. As chaos continues to erupt, Kyle spots a faint glimmer of light in the distance. Kyle. Guys, over there. It's the time machine, it brought us back to the present. They all run towards the glowing time machine, narrowly escaping the wrath of the dinosaur. Breathing heavily, they pile into the time machine and Randy fumbles with the controls. Randy! Hold on, guys! I'll get us back home. 
With one final spark, the time machine jolts back to life, whirring and clicking as the group is transported back to the electronic store. Int. Electronic store, day. They stumble out of the time machine, disheveled and covered in dirt. Cartman. Well, that was a fucking disaster. I didn't even get to eat anything. Stan. You know what, guys? Maybe we should just stick to watching historical events on the goddamn TV from now on. Gimme. Yeah, maybe witnessing history in real life isn't all it's cracked up to be. Let's just go home and order some fucking pizza. As they leave the store, bruised and disheartened, Kenny limps out behind them, still muttering incomprehensibly. Fade out. Kyle. Dude, have you seen this painting? Stan. Yeah, it's like a crazy mishmash of random shit on a yellow background. Cartman. Yeah, and what the fuck is that cat doing there? It's like someone dropped acid and painted this shit. Utters. Gee, fellas, I think it's kinda neat. Look, there's a little dinosaur figurine. Stan. Shut up, butters. We're trying to figure out what the hell this painting means. Kyle. Maybe it's trying to say something about the chaos and randomness of life, you know? Cartman. No, I bet some dumb hipster artist just threw a bunch of crap together and called it art. Any, muffled, you guys, ever wonder if this painting somehow, you know, transports us in time? Stan, Kenny, you're a fucking idiot. That's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. Any, muffled, seriously, guys, I'm not shitting you. What if we touch the painting and boom, we end up in some crazy historical event? Kyle. Oh, for fuck's sake, Kenny. That's just retarded. Cartman. I don't know, guys. What if we touch the painting just to prove Kenny wrong? That'd be sweet revenge. Stan. Fine. Whatever. Let's touch the fucking painting and prove Kenny's stupidity once and for all. They all touch the painting simultaneously. Incident. Scene shifts to a medieval battlefield. Stan. Holy shit. It actually worked. Kenny, you magnificent piece of shit. Kenny, muffled, see, guys, I fucking told you. Kyle, okay, but where the hell are we? Cartman, who cares? We're in the goddamn past. Let's go fuck with those peasants or something. Progression. They explore the medieval town, wreaking havoc and causing chaos. Stan, this is insane. We're like time-traveling troublemakers. Kyle, guys, maybe we should be careful. We could mess up the course of history or something. Cartman, fuck history. I just want to eat some medieval snacks and ride a fucking horse. They stumble upon a group of knights preparing for battle. Utters, look, fellas, it's a jousting tournament, let's watch. Stan, sure, why the hell not? We're already here. Kenny spots a suspicious looking knight with a mischievous grin. Kenny, muffled, guys, I have a bad feeling about that knight. Stan. You always have a bad fucking feeling, Kenny. Relax. Utters, hey, what's that knight doing? Knight sneaks up and hits Kenny with a giant mallet, launching him through the air. Stan, holy shit, they killed Kenny, again. Denouement. The boys manage to escape the chaos and make it back to the present. Cartman, that was fucking awesome. Let's go touch that painting again and do it all over. Kyle, are you insane? We just lost Kenny, you heartless bastard. Cartman, PFT, who gives a shit? Kenny dies all the time anyway. Stan, guys, maybe we should just leave the painting alone from now on. It's caused enough trouble. Others, yeah, maybe it's for the best. Let's go get some medieval snacks instead. Conclusion The boys reflect on their wild adventure but decide to keep it a secret. Stan, you know, as weird as it was, I'm kinda glad we went back in time. Kyle. Yeah, it was insane, but it made me appreciate our own messed up time even more. Cartman. I'm just pissed I didn't get to eat any goddamn turkey legs. Utters. Gee, fellas, maybe we should appreciate the present and not mess with time travel stuff again. 
They all grabbed some medieval snacks and laughed, savoring their epic adventure. Welcome to the Comedy Central Roast of Mario. Tonight, we have gathered some of the most short-tempered and foul-mouthed roasters to take jabs at our beloved plumber. Let's begin, shall we? Luigi, ah Mario you fat fuck, you've been stuffing your face with mushrooms for years, no wonder you're such a fucking tank. Mario, hey, Mario, I heard your princess is in another castle. Guess she got tired of your sorry ass, huh? Oh Luigi, Mario, you pathetic loser. You dress like you raided a discount Halloween store. And those overalls? Please, even a farmer wouldn't be caught dead in them. Bowser, Mario, you irresponsible prick. You're always running around, stomping on my minions. Your mushroom-induced rage won't save you from getting your ass handed to you. Goomba, Mario, you mushroom-headed moron. You think you're so fucking tough, but all you do is jump on people's heads. I bet your dick is as small as your brain. Mario. Now, hold on a minute, you fucking scumbags. I may be a plumber, but at least I know how to lay some pipe. As for you, Luigi, I didn't realize being second best ran in the family. And Wario, with your fat gut and obsession with coins, you're nothing but a bloated piggy bank. While Luigi, don't act high and mighty, you're just a failed clone of Luigi. Bowser, you call yourself a villain, but I've beaten your scaly ass countless times. And Goomba, the only thing lower than you is your self-esteem. So, why don't you all crawl back into the sewers where you belong? Luigi, oh look at Mario finally growing some balls, too bad they're still smaller than his dick. Mario, haha, listen to Mr. Hero over here. Mario, you're so delusional, you think saving the princess makes you a fucking legend. Oh Luigi. Yeah, Mario, you're nothing but an overrated little shit. Even jumping on turtles doesn't make you interesting. Bowser, your reign of terror ends tonight, Mario. I'll make sure Peach gets a real man, and you can go back to plumbing in peace. Goomba, Mario, you can roast all you want, but you're nothing but a short Italian stereotype. And we all know stereotypes are meant to be laughed at. Mario, listen up, you pathetic excuses for roasters. You think you can handle the heat, but you can barely light a match. Bowser, you're so damn slow, I could beat you with one hand tied behind my back. Goomba, your insults are as weak as your ability to jump. Luigi, you're just living in my shadow, desperate for some recognition. Wario, with that smell, the only thing you'll be roasting is your own ass. And Waluigi, well, no one cares about you enough to roast you. So stay in your corner and cry like the little bitch you are. In the end, Mario had his revenge, showing the roasters that no one can out-insult the king of the Mushroom Kingdom. The Comedy Central roast of Mario will forever be remembered as a frenzy of foul-mouthed madness, leaving the audience in stitches in Mario victorious. Alright, listen up, you meat sacks. We're gonna do something unique and fucked up tonight. We're gonna play a game of Dimension Roulette. Oh, Rick, I don't know about this. Last time we messed with Dimensions, things got pretty messed up. Shut up, Morty. Now, who do we have here? We got Beth, Jerry, Summer, and, uh, who invited these other idiots? Dad, they're celebrities. We invited them for an extra twist in this insane game. Yeah. Dad, we need some higher stakes. And it's a party, remember? Fine, fine, whatever. We got Mr. Cartoon Guy over here, introduce yourself. Cartoon Guy, CG, uh, hey, I'm Johnny Bravo. The chicks dig me, ya know? Whatever, Johnny Dumbass, and we got this celebrity douchebag. Celebrity douchebag, CD, yo, I'm Chad Bro Chill. I'm, like, super famous for doing absolutely nothing. Whispering Beth. 
Why did we invite these knuckleheads? It's just for fun, Jerry. Lighten up. All right, listen carefully. Each one of you has to list 10 of the worst dimensions ever, in excruciating detail. The loser will be plunged into the absolute worst dimension chosen by the winner. Oh, that sounds unpleasant. Let's get this party started. Okay, I'll go first. Dimension 666, where everything is made of spiders, and they all want to eat your face off. Celebrities and cartoon characters, CC, gross. CG, all right, all right. How about Dimension 123, where everyone is a butt, literally a floating butt with legs. Ew, Johnny, that's disgusting. DD, Cho, bros, I got one. Dimension 420, where time is forever stuck at 420, and everyone is forever high. Nice one, Chad. All right, my turn. Dimension hot dog, where all the living beings are sentient hot dogs, trying not to get eaten by giant mustard monsters. Dad, that's just... Wow. Okay, Dimension 57, where everyone can only communicate through interpretive dance. It's a real nightmare. Dimension Glitter, where sparkles are everywhere, and they get stuck in your skin, causing eternal itchiness. CC. Oh, God. That sounds horrifying. Dimension 999, where clowns rule the world and force everyone to wear giant clown shoes. It's unsettling, to say the least. CG. All right, here's another one. Dimension 42, where the meaning of life is to constantly shuffle a deck of playing cards forever. CD, I got it. Dimension 666, but instead of spiders, everyone is a walking talking pineapple. Spawn ticky fucking tacular, bro. All right, last one. How about Dimension Infinite Laughter, where everyone is perpetually laughing to the point of pain and insanity? Dad, these dimensions are messed up beyond belief. It's all in good fun, sweetheart. Now, let's vote on the worst dimension. Which one do you think is the shittiest? Everyone casts their votes, and Jerry ends up losing. Oh no, what have I done? Looks like you're headed to dimension 666, Jerry. Have fun dealing with those pineapple people. No, please, I'll do anything. Sorry, Dad. Rules are rules. Jerry accidentally gets sucked into a vortex, disappearing into the unknown. Well, that escalated quickly. Yeah, but let's not forget to have a good time. It's a party, after all. The group tries to shake off the craziness and return to the festivities, but the memory of the bizarre game lingers in their minds. Willy Wonka, ladies and gentlemen, gather, round. Behold, my newest creation at the Chocolate Factory. A table topped with chocolate bars, each one infused with a different fantastical flavor. Guest one. Holy shit, Willy. Are those edible chocolate bars? Willy Wonka, of course, my dear friend. But these aren't your ordinary chocolate bars. Each one has a unique twist that will transcend your wildest dreams. Guest two. What's the catch, Wonka? There's always a catch. Willy Wonka, ah, you're a smart one. The catch is simple, eat more than three bars, and your taste buds will experience a tantalizing overload. Be warned, the consequences may be, extreme. Golden ticket winner. Screw it. I'm the golden ticket winner, and I'm going all out. Guests. Oh, no. Don't do it, man. You have no idea what you're getting yourself into. Golden ticket winner. Too late. Chomps on the first chocolate bar. Billy Wonka, my dear friend, the journey has begun. How does it taste? Golden ticket winner. Like heaven on crack. Give me another. Willy Wonka, very well, my friend. Enjoy. Golden ticket winner. Eat second chocolate bar asterisk oh my god, I'm in ecstasy. I need more. Tests. he's gone completely mad. Someone stop him. Golden ticket winner. Can't stop now. Devours the third chocolate bar. Willy Wonka, oh dear, he's crossed the dangerous threshold. Prepare for the dramatic twist. Golden ticket winner. Clutches his stomach something's not right. I feel, I feel. Tests. what's happening to him? Willy, do something. Willy Wonka, nothing can be done. He's pushed the limits of indulgence. Witness his hilarious demise. Golden ticket winner. Bursts into a cloud of colorful confetti. Tests, gasps he, he's gone. Willy Wonka, fear not, my friends. 
For the golden ticket winner, his ultimate pleasure became his ultimate downfall. Oompa Loompas, singing, Oompa Loompa, Doom Petit Doom, I've got another puzzle for you. Oompa Loompa, Doom Petit D, if you're greedy, you will surely see. Eating chocolate bars, oh so grand, can lead you to a peculiar land. But when you lose control, don't you crave, your demise may become the laughter's rave. Guests, laughs hysterically asterisk go, Willy Wonka, you've truly outdone yourself this time. Willy Wonka, and that's just the beginning, my dear friends. More wonders await in the whimsical world of the chocolate factory. The following dialogue script contains intense, vulgar, and M-rated content. Reader discretion is advised. Carlos. What the fuck is this? Looking at the blurry photo asterisk is that a person on the floor with two toothbrushes in their hands? Incident. Sarah. Holy shit. Carlos. That's Michael Jackson and Bill Cosby. Carlos. Fuck me sideways. How did they end up like that? Aggression. Sarah. Apparently, they were having a celebrity deathmatch fight, and things went crazy. Carlos. Yeah, what happened? Sarah, Michael Jackson did his moonwalk, and Cosby countered with his dance moves. It was like watching a fucked up dance off, man. Carlos. So who won? Sarah. Well, Cosby whipped out his jello pudding and tried to suffocate Jackson with it. Carlos. Shit, that's messed up. Sarah. Wait, it gets worse. Out of nowhere, Jackson pulled out his signature glove and slapped Cosby across the face. Carlos. With the glove? Damn. Sarah, yeah, but the finishing move was the real deal. Jackson grabbed the microphone, turned it into a lightsaber, and sliced Cosby in half. Carlos. Jesus Christ, that's brutal. Sarah, you have no idea. The crowd went wild, and now we have this fucked up picture as proof. Carlos. We need to burn that shit before someone finds it. Sarah, agreed. Let's torch it and pretend we never saw this fucked up celebrity deathmatch. Carlos, and never speak of it again. Scientific description. The collected evidence presents a visually distorted photograph depicting the unfortunate remains of two prominent personalities, Michael Jackson and Bill Cosby. It seems that both individuals were deeply engaged in a bizarre celebrity deathmatch event, which remarkably resulted in a series of extraordinary events. The initial confrontation showcased a peculiar clash of distinct dance styles, primarily manifesting through Jackson's iconic moonwalk maneuvers and Cosby's idiosyncratic dance steps. However, the intensity quickly escalated as Cosby employed a grotesque, unconventional technique using jello pudding as a weapon of suffocation against Jackson. Unexpectedly, Jackson retaliated by employing his acclaimed glove accessory to deliver a powerful slap to Cosby's countenance. Nevertheless, the climax of this macabre spectacle unfolds when Jackson astoundingly transformed a seemingly innocent microphone into a vigorously glowing lightsaber, skillfully eviscerating Cosby in a final act of ultimate demise. The incomprehensible brutality and graphic nature of this incident urge discreet disposal of Spyro. Well, well, what do we have here? Smear. Looks like we stumbled upon some cybernetic espionage warfare going on. Smear, yeah, Spyro, these purple monsters with yellow horns and horns on their heads seem up to no good. Especially the one with a yellow crown and the other with a purple tail. Incident. Spyro. Let's sneak closer and see what they're scheming. Smear, right behind you, Spyro. Just keep your flames at the ready. Progression. Purple horn monster with crown, whispering, once we infiltrate their system, we'll get access to all their classified data. 
Purple horn monster with tail, evil grin, and all their secrets. Mwahaha. Spyro. Whispering. We can't let them get away with this. Smear. We have to stop them. Smear. Whispering. Agreed. Spyro. This ends now. Colon. Purple horn monster with crown. Spot Spyro and Smear. Intruders. They caught us in the act. Purple horn monster with tail. Snarly. You think you can stop us? You won't live long enough to regret it. Spyro. Grinning. We'll see about that. You slimy bastards. Colon. Fierce battle erupts between the purple monsters and Spyro and Smear. Spyro. Defeating purple horn monster with tail. Your tail is no match for my fire breathing prowess. Smear. Entering the scene, and neither is your crown for my slimy tentacles. Purple horn monster with crown. Coughing. You may have won this time, but we'll be back, stronger and more cunning. Smear. Threateningly. Oh, we'll be waiting, you scaly sons of bitches. With their enemies defeated, Spyro and Smear embark on new adventures, always ready to protect the world from cybernetic threats. Scientific description. In this episodic encounter, two notable entities, Spyro and Smear, discover themselves amidst a clandestine operation involving cybernetic espionage warfare. The duo's attention is piqued as they notice two remarkable creatures with purple-hued corporeal structures, adorned with conspicuous yellow horns and supplementary horns atop their craniums. Intriguingly, one of these beings showcases a distinctive yellow crown, while the other possesses a notable purple tail, suggesting unique attributes and potential roles in their scheming pursuits. Driven by curiosity and a sense of duty, Spyro and Smear meticulously approach the focal situation, deploying a clandestine approach and keeping their pyrokinetic capabilities readily available, preparing for potential combat. Dialogue exchanges between the two entities provide insight into the duo's intentions and a shared understanding of the gravity of the situation at hand. Escalated tension arises as the aforementioned purple beings, recognizable as the perpetrators, divulge their sinister objective of infiltrating an undisclosed system to acquire access to highly classified information. Such activities reveal malevolent intentions, increasing the stakes for our protagonists and fueling their determination to intervene. As the narrative progresses, the confrontation reaches its zenith. The purple-horned entities, detecting the presence of Spyro and Smear, recognize the intrusion and express their contempt through verbal confrontations. Emboldened by their newly acquired power, the adversaries unleash their aggression upon the brave duo, seeking to obliterate any opposition deterring their malicious objectives. The climactic resolution is achieved as Spyro and Smear skillfully engage in combat, showcasing their exceptional abilities and resourcefulness. While their foes exhibit formidable resistance, the heroes ultimately triumph, decimating their scheming adversaries with their respective elemental prowess. However, this exhilarating victory is accompanied by a warning from the remaining antagonist, accentuating the potential reprise of future endeavors. This outcome introduces an ongoing and heightened sense of anticipation, leaving Spyro, Smear, and the potential audience in a state of eager expectancy, primed for forthcoming confrontations with enhanced adversaries bent on conquering the realm of cybernetic espionage. Morty, I've got an interdimensional crisis on my hands. We need to activate the Stargate Squeeze Scandal Protocol. Jeez, Rick, not another one of your crises. Can't we just have a normal day for once? Morty, normal is boring. We're not here for that. Now, listen up. I've received intel that someone has leaked the eyelash extensions formula to the aliens from the far reaches of Sirius. Eyelash extensions? Seriously, Rick, that's what you're all worked up about. Morty. You underestimate the power of lush, beautifully adorned lashes. It's a multi-galactic industry. Plus, those extensions can manipulate the autonomic nervous system, giving the aliens an unfair advantage. All right, fine. What do you need me to do? We're gonna have to confront the two alien princesses involved in this scandal. You see, Morty, you're caught in a love triangle. But not just any love triangle, an interplanetary love triangle. 
Oh man, you've really outdone yourself this time, Rick. How am I gonna get myself out of this mess? Easy, Morty. You just need to be your charming self. Play along with their seductive advances, gather information, and get those formulas back. Remember, don't let the princesses catch on. Alright, but what if they find out I'm playing both sides? Morty, this is a delicate situation. The fate of the universe's glamorous lashes is at stake. We can't afford to worry about hurt feelings. Just keep those princesses distracted and focused on each other. Okay, here goes nothing. Meanwhile, in a luxurious alien palace. Summer, have you seen Morty lately? He's been acting strange lately, even for him. Mom, you won't believe this. Morty being Morty, got himself tangled up with not one, but two alien princesses. He's in a deep, intense love triangle. Morty? A love triangle? That boy never ceases to amaze me. Yeah, it's like a soap opera on steroids, Mom. These princesses are throwing shade at each other, and Morty is caught in the middle. Drama Central. Well, at least he's not a boring teenager. I guess there's never a dull moment with Morty around. True that, Mom. Let's just hope he can unravel this mess without getting himself vaporized or worse. Back to Morty, trying to maintain his composure. So, ladies, what do you think about serious sizzling secrets? I hear they've got the best kept lash extension techniques. Princess A. Oh, Morty, you always know just what to say. You're so irresistible. Princess B. Don't fall for his charm, Princess A. Morty's a player, playing both sides. I bet he's just after our eyelash secrets. Oh, ladies, let's not get too hasty here. Can't we just enjoy each other's company and forget about all that? The princesses exchange glares, their fingernails ready for intergalactic warfare. Princess A. Fine, Morty. We can have our little truce, for now. But remember, we're watching you, always. Phew, that was close. Rick, we need to wrap this up quickly. These princesses are getting dangerous. Morty, just hang in there a little longer. I've almost traced the leak. Once we have the culprits, we'll expose their scandalous deeds. After a series of near misses, sneaky escapades, and wild twists. Rick, I did it. I got both the eyelash extensions formulas back. No more love triangle, no more scandal. Good job, Morty. Now, let's shut this scandal down once and for all. We've got a reputation to uphold. Back at the Smith residence. Morty, I heard you've been through quite the adventure. Care to share? Mom, you wouldn't believe it. I was caught between two alien princesses, fighting over eyelash extensions. It was dramatic, intense, and probably the craziest experience of my life. Yeah, Morty, you've officially entered the Intergalactic Romance Hall of Fame. Well, let's hope I'm retired from that now. I don't think I can handle another love triangle anytime soon. Oh, Morty, you underestimate the wild adventures that await us. Now, where's that portal gun? Our next adventure is just a flick of the wrist away. As the eerie green glow of the portal engulfs them, they disappear into the unknown, ready to face whatever absurdity the multiverse throws at them. Willy Wonka, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to my chocolate factory. Hold your golden tickets tightly, for today marks a monumental occasion, as I unveil a truly revolting addition to my chocolate creations. Willy Wonka, behold, the farting fudge. Made from the finest organic beans, this delectable treat is infused with a secret blend of enchanted spices that will make your taste buds tingle and your sphincter sing. Charlie, whispers to Veruca, did he just say, farting fudge? Veruca, slyly, oh. I can't wait to get my hands on that fudge. It sounds absolutely divine. Willy Wonka, grinning, now, my dear Veruca, let me warn you, restrain yourself from overindulgence. Excessive consumption of the farting fudge could prove fatal. Veruca, laughs, fatal, oh, Wonka, you always exaggerate. Augustus, stuffing his face with farting fudge, it's delicious. I can't stop eating it. Willy Wonka, ah, uh, Augustus, a word of caution. The farting fudge's magical properties intensify with every bite. Moderation, my dear boy. Augustus, 
burping and farting uncontrollably. Willy Wonka. Oh my, it seems Augustus Gluttony has taken its toll. Quickly, Oompa Loompas, assemble. Oompa Loompas, singing. Augustus, dear Augustus, you ate without a care. Farting fudge so tempting, now beware. Oompa Loompas, singing continued. Inflate like a balloon, he filled with gas. Until finally, his gluttony came to pass. Willy Wonka, chuckling, fear not, my friends, Augustus will recover. He merely needs a visit to the farting fudge detox room. Violet, whispering to Charlie, note to self, avoid the farting fudge at all costs. Willy Wonka, and so, my dear guests, let this be a lesson in self-restraint. Indulge in moderation, for there are wonders and dangers lurking within my chocolate factory. Mario, welcome, fuckers. Tonight, you're in for a wild ride. It's time to roast the shit out of each other, starting with my little bro, Luigi. Luigi! Oh, great! Can't wait to hear all the dick jokes about my green mushroom, Mario! Mario, Luigi, you're like a Luigi board, always getting possessed by some spooky-ass bullshit. Maybe it's time you exorcise your shy guy dick out of that green hat. Hi Luigi, hey, Mario, looking good in that red plumber suit. It matches your ugly ass mustache. But seriously, your princess is always in another fucking castle. Maybe she's tired of your mushroom-sized dick. Mario, oh, Wario, look at you, the obese bastard. You're so fat, Bowser mistaken you for a Koopa shell and tried to ride your sorry ass to victory. Wario, well, Mario, at least I can still find my dick under my rolls of lard. Unlike you, who probably needs a whole level dedicated to finding your tiny, pathetic mushroom. Bowser. Mario, you fucking prick. You think you're so great, saving the princess and all. But your little plumber ass can't even fix your brother's self-esteem. Goomba, Mario, you're a short, stubby motherfucker. I can't decide if your dick is smaller than your height or if you're just compensating for it by stomping on all our heads. Mario, alright, fuckers, you've had your turn. Now it's time for me to fire back. Luigi, you've always been in my shadow, but hey, at least I don't need a green hat to hide my insecurities. Luigi. Oh, fuck off, Mario. At least I don't spend my nights fighting a giant turtle with a hard-on for me. Oh, Luigi, Mario, you're so washed up. I'm surprised they haven't made a Mario Kart level out of your sad, declining career. Oreo. Yeah, Mario, your princess is in another castle, and she's probably banging one of the toads. Can't say I blame her. Your plumbing skills aren't the only thing that's rusty. Bowser, Mario, you're an overrated hero. I've dealt with more shit from you than I have from that damn plumber named Cooper. Must feel good being the lesser Koopa. Goomba, Mario, you may be the star of the show, but in reality, you're just a pixelated has-been. Goomba get more game than you. Mario, alright, that's enough. Do you all get what you fucking deserve? I may be short, but I'll stomp all your asses into the ground. It's a me, Mario, the motherfucking superstar. Yoshi, alright, listen up, you bunch of pixelated dickheads. Tonight, we're roasting that plumber fuckface, Mario. Let's start this shit show. Toad, oh, here we go. Look at Mario, thinking he's some hot shit jumping around and saving princesses. You are just a middle-aged man with a mushroom addiction, you goddamn loser. Donkey Kong. Yeah, Mario, you hairy sack of shit. You think you're tough. But we all know you're just compensating for that tiny dick of yours. I bet you even have to use a star power up to get it up. Boo! Laughing! Donkey Kong, you oversized gorilla cum stain! You're so dumb, you couldn't navigate your way out of a barrel! And what's with that hideous tie? 
Did you steal it from a homeless clown? Cooper Trooper, look at Boo trying to roast. You ghostly piece of shit, you're so transparent, we can always see through your bullshit. And don't even get me started on those creepy ass hands of yours. What do you do with those in your free time, huh? Yoshi, Cooper Trooper, you walking turtle abortion. You are always hiding in your little shell, too scared to show your face. And those tiny, useless limbs of yours? I bet you can't even jerk off properly. Toad, snickering, Yoshi, you overgrown dinosaur comrade. You eat everything in sight, but still look malnourished. What's your secret? A tapeworm diet? And that tongue of yours? We all know you use it for more than just eating enemies. Donkey Kong. Toad, you little mushroom-headed fuckwit. You're always following Mario around like a lost puppy. Do you even have any original thoughts in that tiny brain of yours? Or is it just all rainbows and mushrooms up there? Boo! Donkey Kong, you dumb barrel muncher! You swing around like a coked out stripper, but your banana collection is the saddest thing ever seen! Is that how you make up for your tiny ape dick? Cooper Trooper, chuckling, boo, you ethereal piece of crap! You are supposed to be scary, but the only thing you scare is my grandmother's cat! And those shy guys you hang out with? They're just as worthless as you are! Mario! Alright, you fuckers! Enough is enough! Yoshi, you're always spitting out your useless eggs like a goddamn chicken with constipation! And Toad, you're a mushroom! You're not even a real fucking person! Mario, Donkey Kong, you may be big and hairy, but let's face it, you're nothing more than a giant target for my fireballs! And Koopa Troopa, you're so slow and stupid that even Bowser thinks you're a dumbass! Mario, finally, boo, you sneaky little ghost shit! You might scare the tiny babies, but you don't scare me! I've kicked your ass across haunted houses so many times, I've lost count! So bring it on, you pits later pansies. Yoshi, alright, Mario, you stubborn motherfucker. You may roast like a champ, but you can't escape the fact that you're just a plumber who's past his prime. Princess Peach would rather be kidnapped than spend another minute with your sorry ass. Toad, yeah, Mario, you might have gotten laid a few times, but we all know the only thing you're good at is squashing fucking Goombas. You can hang up that hat and mustache because your glory days are fucking over. Donkey Kong, laughing, that's right. Mario. Bow down to the true king of this game. Your princess is in another castle, and I've taken over the Mushroom Kingdom. You're nothing but a washed up has been. Boo, Mario, you deluded piece of shit. You think you're the star of the show, but your time has come and gone. We're all here to laugh at your pathetic attempts to stay relevant. And trust me, we're laughing. Trooper Trooper, yeah, Mario, you're just a fucking relic from the past. Nothing more than a nostalgic memory for the pathetic losers who waste their time playing video games. Your fame has faded, and all that's left is your rotting carcass. Mario, laughs, well, 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 fuck are you assholes? Do you think you won this roast? You're just a bunch of NPC fuckwads in my world. Time for me to have the last laugh. Mario, give she, you're nothing without my back. You'll forever be known as that green Dino bitch who eats shit. And Toad, you're not even a real character, just a red cap dildo. Mario. Donkey Kong, you oversized ape turd. Your IQ is lower than my shoe size. And Boo, you can try to scare me, but your spooky act is about as terrifying as a wet fart. Mario, and last, but certainly not least, Koopa Troopa. You're so slow, it takes you a year to reach the finish line. That pathetic shell of yours won't protect you from my fiery wrath. Yoshi, grumbles, fuck you, Mario. Toad, yeah, fuck you, you overrated Italian prick. Donkey Kong, stick your mustache up your ass, Mario. Boo, laughs, you're a joke, Mario. Always have been, always will be. Cooper Trooper, muttering, I'll get you next time, plumbers come. Mario, that's right, you little bitches. Bow down to the king of the mushroom kingdom. I'm still the number one, motherfuckers. Naruto, hey guys, check out this cool new jutsu I came up with. I call it the Batball Brawler. Sasuke, sarcastically, oh great, Naruto has another ridiculous jutsu. Takura, whining, can't we just stick to our usual strategies? I'm useless as always. Naruto, come on, Sakura, we need to be open to new ideas. Sasuke, you'll see how awesome this is. Enemy Ninja, jutsu name. The Mortal Morpho Melter. Naruto. Excitedly, whoa, look at this guy. He's all melting and morphing. 
I've never seen anything like it. Sasuke, serious, Naruto, focus. We need a plan to counter this enemy. Naruto. Yeah, yeah, I know. Let's use my bat ball brawler. I'll smack that melt white bastard right out of the park. Takura, rolling her eyes. This has disaster written all over it. Naruto. All right, Sakura, since you're so useless, I'll need you to distract the enemy while I charge up my jutsu. Takura, grumbling, fine, whatever. Just don't screw it up, Naruto. Enemy ninja, jutsu name, sinister laughter. Your pathetic attempts will be in vain. Prepare to melt away. Naruto. Determined, we'll see about that, melt Y. Bat ball brawler, activate. Sasuke, trying to stay focused, Naruto, aim for his weak spot. He seems to have one bulbous appendage sticking out. Naruto. Got it, Sasuke. Prepare for a home run swing. Enemy ninja, jutsu name, foolish knaves. Your attempts are futile against my unbeatable jutsu. Naruto. Swinging the bat. Take this, you disgusting blob. Enemy ninja, jutsu name, screams in pain. How dare you defile my perfect form. Takura, impressed. Whoa, Naruto, you actually did something useful for once. Naruto. Grinning proudly, I told you guys my jutsu was awesome. Teamwork makes the dream work. Tasuke, smirking. Let's not get too ahead of ourselves, Naruto. We still have a lot to learn. Naruto. Determined, right, Sasuke. We'll keep growing and becoming stronger together, as a team. Takura, size, can't wait to see what other craziness we'll get into next. Denouman. The team defeats the enemy ninja with Naruto's bat ball brawler jutsu, but not without a struggle. As they celebrate their victory, they acknowledge that, despite their differences, they rely on each other to overcome challenges and grow stronger. Conclusion With their teamwork in Naruto's wacky jutsu, Team 7 continues their journey, facing increasingly bizarre enemies, pushing their limits, and proving that even the most absurd situations can be conquered. Hey, Rick. I've got a challenge for you. I want you to come up with a tongue twister using all of these words. Jason, Just, Joust, Justin, Jostle, Gist, Jizz, Jazz, Jester, Juicy, Jays, Sun, Sage, Johnson, Sin, Jaws, Juice, Jots, Ace, Tasty, Aging, Adjacent, Adjust, Jay-Z, Asian. Ordy, I told you not to bother me with these stupid challenges. But, fine, let me think, just adjacent to Jason's jousting arena, Justin jostled the juicy jays, jizzing jazz all over the jester, who was just trying to adjust his sage hat while sipping on a tasty Johnson juice. Whoa, Rick, that tongue twister is, ah, uh, something else. But what could we possibly do with that? Ordy, buckle up, because we're about to go on an insane adventure. In a parallel universe where Jay-Z, Jay's son, and an Asian sage named Johnson ruled, we need to help a jester reclaim his stolen jousting sword. The sword is said to have magical powers capable of altering reality. W what? Are you serious, Rick? This sounds dangerous. Of course it's dangerous, Morty. What did you expect? We're dealing with Jay-Z and his gang of jousting, jazz-loving criminals here. But don't worry, Morty, I have a plan. Okay, Rick, what's the plan? We'll disguise ourselves as aging jesters and infiltrate their jousting tournament. We have to win the jousting competition to gain Jay-Z's trust. Once we're close enough, we'll steal the sword and escape through a portal I'll create using adjacent reality dimensions. But Rick, how will we know if the sword has any magical powers? Simple, Morty, we'll use the sword to create chaos and see what happens. If reality starts bending and Juicy J start raining from the sky, we'll know it worked. Okay, Rick, let's do this, then. But promise me, no more jizzing jazz, please? No problem, Morty. I'll try to keep the jazz jizz free. Just remember, Morty, in this adventure, 
the gist of it is survival. And who knows, maybe we'll bump into an ally like Justin Timberlake, who can sing us through this madness. Hey, all right, Rick. Let's go save that jester and his sword. And so, Rick and Morty embarked on an absurd adventure, jousting with criminals, dancing with chaos, and learning that sometimes, the most unexpected allies can provide the juiciest help along the way. They returned to their dimension victorious, with a stolen sword in hand, ready for their next insane adventure. Fries from BFDI. What the fuck is going on here? Why is there blood all over the BFDI characters? And why the fuck are they on a plate next to a pile of fried food? Beefy, I don't know, Fries, but this shit is messed up. It's like a fucking massacre happened in here. Kako, oh my god, this is sick. Look at all the blood splattered everywhere. Did BFDI characters go crazy or something? Fiery, guys, let's not panic. We need to figure out what the hell happened. Fries from the FDI. We can't just stand here. We need to call the fucking police or something. Gelatin, wait, don't touch anything. We don't want to fuck up any evidence. Boiny, Gelatin's right, guys. Let's wait for the authorities to handle this shit. We don't want to get in trouble. Fries from the FDI. But what if they think we did it? Look at all these fried bodies and blood everywhere. Beefy, we're not murderers, Fries. We just stumbled upon this fucked up scene. We'll explain everything to the cops. Paco, hey, do you guys hear that? It sounds like someone's coming. Fiery. Oh shit, we're fucked now. What are we gonna do? Fries from BFDI. Stay calm, everyone. Let's hide behind the fucking couch until we know who's coming. Gelatin, good idea, Fries. We don't want to put ourselves in danger if the killer is still around. Boiny, I can't believe this shit. This is like a goddamn horror movie. Beefy, just stay quiet and stay low, guys. We'll get through this. Footsteps approach. Bracelet-y. Oh my goodness, look at all the blood. I need to clean this mess up right away. Fries from BFDI. Holy shit, it's Bracelet T. She's gonna fucking clean it all up. Paco, wow, thank god it's just Bracelet T. I thought we were all gonna die. Fiery. Bracelet E. What the hell happened here? Bracelet E. Oh, I accidentally dropped a tray of ketchup. Silly me. I'll just clean this all up now. Don't worry. Gelatin, you got to be fucking kidding me. It was just spilled ketchup. Boiny, we were completely overreacting. We thought there was a murder or something. Beefy, I can't believe we hid behind the cat like a bunch of scared idiots. Fries from BFDI. Well, at least we know everything's fine now. This shit was fucking insane. Paco, yeah, but our bloodstained BFDI characters still look like a damn murder scene. Fiery, let's just clean up this mess and try to forget this crazy incident. They clean and put away the BFDI characters covered with ketchup. What initially seemed like a gruesome murder scene turned out to be a mere ketchup accident caused by Bracelet E. The fear and panic felt by Fries, Leafy, Taco, Fiery, Gelatin, and Coiny were the product of their overactive imaginations. Once the truth was revealed, they all felt a mixture of relief and embarrassment for their extreme reactions. They cleaned up the mess and moved on, vowing to not let their fears get the best of them again. host. Welcome to the Comedy Central Roast of Mario. Tonight, we have some of the biggest names from the Mushroom Kingdom ready to roast our beloved Italian plumber. Remember, no repeated jokes. Let's welcome our first roaster, Goomba. Goomba, thank you, thank you. Mario, you overgrown meatball. You think you're so tough, jumping on us? Host, Goomba, let's keep it going. Next up, we have Koopa Troopa. Koopa Troopa, Mario, you little red clad punk. Your jump is weak, just like your personality. And let's not forget about that invincibility star of yours, compensating for something, are we? Host. Ooh, shots fired. 
Next, we have Paratroopa. Paratroopa. Mario, I've seen him get hit by more shells than a damn turtle. Speaking of which, what happened to your shell, Mario? Too much spaghetti? Host, haha. Alright, next up, we have Boo. Boo, Mario, you hypocritical bastard. You're always stomping on us, but let me tell you something, you're no Prince Charming either. Ever heard of Peach's secret affair with Bowser? You were jumping into the wrong castle. Host, oh boy, this is getting intense. Our final roaster, Lakitu, take it away. Lakitu, Mario, Mr. Mushroom Kingdom hero. You know what they say, it's not the size of the mustache that matters, it's how you use it. And based on Princess Peach's constant abductions, I don't think you're using it well enough. Host, alright, Mario, it's your turn for revenge. Show them what you got. Mario, grinning, oh, you dirty mushrooms. Goomba, do you think being squashed is bad? Why didn't I shove a fireball up your tiny ass? Koopa Troopa, you're nothing but slow-moving turtle soup waiting to happen. Paratroopa, don't be fooled by that shell, it won't protect you from the pain I'll bring. Boo, do you think you're scary? Watch me slay ghosts while wearing a damn bedsheet. And Lakitu, you flirting nuisance. Let's see how you deal with a giant plumber's wrench to the face. Host, whoa, whoa. Let's calm down, folks. That escalated quickly. That's all the time we have for today's roast. Thanks to everyone for joining us, and remember, keep the language clean when you leave the stage. Mario exits the stage in a blaze of glory while the audience laughs and applauds. Yoshi, yo, what's up you ugly motherfuckers? We're here tonight to roast that Italian plumber with a fetish for mushrooms, Mario. Let's get this shit started. Toad, Mario, you short, stubby shithead. You claim to be a hero, but all I see is a washed up middle-aged man in a red hat. And what's with that moustache? You look like a lost 70s porn star. Donkey Kong, Mario, you dumbass gorilla wannabe. You keep kidnapping my girl, Peach, like she's some kind of banana. Well, guess what? I'm gonna rip off your mustache and shove it up your ass, you barrel of monkey cum. Boo, Mario, you cowardly piece of shit. You're always jumping around, acting like you're so tough. But let me tell you something, you ghost hunting loser. Your princess is in another castle because she got tired of your pathetic dick game. Koopa Troopa, Mario, you turtle humping turtle. You run around like you've got something to prove, but you're nothing but a steroid infested plumber. Newsflash, asshole, your princess is banging every creature in the Mushroom Kingdom, except you. Mario, alright, you sorry excuses for human beings. It's time for your comeuppance. Yoshi, you green fuck, you're just a dinosaur with a death wish. I hope you choke on some of those eggs you keep shitting out. Toad, Mario, you overalls wearing dickhead. You think you're so smart, but your brain is as tiny as your dick. By the way, I heard Peach got so bored in your bed that she started fucking Bowser. And she said his shell was more satisfying. Donkey Kong, live it. You scrawny motherfucker. I'll rip your mustache off and shove it up your ass sideways. You better say your prayers, Mario, cuz Kong's coming for you. Boo, hissing, Mario, you insufferable twat. Don't you dare insult my dick game. I'll hunt your sorry ass, and you won't be able to get it up for anyone, not even Toad. Trooper Trooper, you worthless piece of turtle shit. I hope you slip on one of my shells and fall into a pit of lava, you moustache-wearing imbecile. Your princess prefers my cold-blooded self over your plumber ass. Mario, laughing, is that all you got, you sorry excuses for roast masters? Now listen up, you pathetic losers. Yoshi, you're still just a sidekick and nothing more. Toad, I hope you enjoy your life as a glorified speed bump. Donkey Kong, did your mom abandon you because you were too hairy? Boo, maybe if you spend less time haunting and more time brushing your ghostly teeth, you actually get laid. And Koka Troopa, your shells are as useless as your existence. So, have that for a fucking roast, huh? Yoshi, silently seething. Toad, muttering under breath. Donkey Kong, growling. Boo, floating angrily. Koopa Troopa, grumbling. Mario, that's what I thought, you poor excuses for rivalry. Tonight, I'm the king, and you're nothing but a bunch of sad, washed up losers.
Ash, running frantically. Pikachu, this way. We need to find that rare Pokemon before Team Rocket does. Essie, running behind Ash, you think you can outsmart us, you little twerp? Think again. Meowth, running alongside Jesse. Yeah, we're gonna get that Pokemon and make it our prized possession. Ash, panting, no way, Team Rocket, you'll never catch up to me. I'm too fast for you. James, running in front of Ash, prepare to be amazed by the fabulous Team Rocket's arrival. Essie, singing with a terrible voice, to protect the world from boredom's plight. James, singing out of tune, to unite all people who crave a fight. Essie, continues singing, to denounce the evils of humor and wit. James, still singing terribly, to extend our reach to the skies above. Meowth, joining in. Meowth, that's right. Ash, groans, will you guys just shut up already? Essie, annoyed, oh, looks like the twerp wants to battle. Get ready for a beatdown. Ash, smirking, bring it on, Team Rocket. Let's battle. Meowth throws a Pokeball. Meowth, I choose Phenemon, use your slapdash slap attack. Ash, I summon my Fakachu, use your preposterous Pika Punch. Phenemon and Fakechu engage in a hilarious slap fight. James, go, Mr. Minimon, use your ridiculous rant. Ash, go, ludicrously oversized Bullimon, use your belittle blast. Bullimon begins to verbally insult Mr. Me Norman. Essie, alright, we'll show you what we got. Boozing with Cornusmon, use your swaggering swagger. Ash, oh yeah, I choose Sarcas Master, use your sarcastic slam. Sarcas Master delivers a devastatingly sarcastic remark to Oozing with Coolnessman. Meowth, this time we won't go down so easily. Behold, dump Stupaflyman, use your bewildering buzz. Ash, I select Nonsensisaur, use your incoherent roar. Nonsensisaur roars, but no one understands what it's saying. Meowth, your last chance, twerp. Unsportsman, use your unfair move. Ash, you think that's unfair? I got you beat with my cheat em all. Use your dirty trick. Cheat Maul pulls out a bag of tricks and throws slime at Unsportsman. James, no, we've been defeated again. Essie, blast off at the speed of fail. As Team Rocket blasts off, they crash into a giant banana peel and fall into a lake. Ash, laughs triumphantly, another victory against Team Rocket. Pikachu, let's get going. Denouement and Ash and Pikachu continue their journey, leaving Team Rocket soaking wet and humiliated. They swim to the surface, cursing their bad luck. The ridiculous battle only serves to fuel their determination to capture Pikachu and win their battles with absurdity. Characters 1. Ronald McDonald 2. Cap'n Crunch 3. Tony the Tiger 4. Mr. Peanut 5. Colonel Sanders 6. Chester Cheetah 7. Lucky the Leprechaun Ronald McDonald, welcome, you greasy, deep fried fox. Tonight, we gather to roast the most iconic clown in fast food history, yours truly, Ronald fucking McDonald. Cap'n Crunch, ahoy there, you floppy-haired freak. I hope you're ready to have your Ronalds thoroughly roasted tonight. Tony the Tiger, great, I've never seen so many cereal mascots in one place. Get ready to have your buns toasted, Ronald. Mr. Peanut, well, 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 if it isn't the red-nosed clown. I hope you're ready to crack under the pressure, you big nut job. Colonel Sanders, Ronald, you chicken-loving bastard. I've got some secret herbs and spices to make sure you'll be roasted to perfection. Chester Cheetah. Hey, Ronald. You Ronald fucking McDonald. Remember when you tried to make your own burgers? Yeah, we all do, because they tasted like shit. Lucky the Leprechaun. Ah, Ronald, your sneaky little Leprechaun impersonator. Your pot of gold at the end of the rainbow? It's a greasy pile of crap. Ronald McDonald laughs. Oh, you bunch of tasteless pricks. I'll have you know, I've dealt with worse clowns than you in the ball pit. Cap'n Crunch. Oh, are you talking about those little boys you lure into your playland? You creepy son of a kraken.
Tony the Tiger, roars, Ronald, you're nothing but a clown with a fetish for red-headed fast food mascots, and that makeup, it's just covering up your grease-soaked face. Mr. Peanut. Ronald, you're one salty, roasted peanut away from a complete mental breakdown. And that freaky grin of yours? It's haunting more children than the boogeyman. Colonel Sanders. Ronald, you deep-fried disgrace. You couldn't batter your chicken as well as you batted your eyelashes at unsuspecting customers. Chester Cheetah. Ronald, you're the reason why kids have nightmares about clowns. McFreaky. Your Big Macs are nothing but a disappointing blue-balled cat astrophe. Lucky the Leprechaun. Ronald, you're so full of shit, you've replaced the four-leaf clovers in my cereal with french fries. Your luck has run out, motherfucker. Ronald McDonald, smirks, well, 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 it seems my little food mascots want a piece of the golden arches. Fine, prepare to be flame rolled. In the final round, Ronald steals the show by delivering vicious roasts to each participant, leaving them speechless and defeated. Ronald McDonald, Captain Crunch, your cereal is so sugary it makes dentists scream for mercy. Tony, your frosted flakes are the only thing you've ever managed to frost, you pathetic excuse for a tiger. And Mr. Peanut, you know what happens when I crack you open? A whole bunch of nothing. Colonel Sanders, your secret herbs and spices couldn't save you from being a sad, fried failure. Chester Cheetah, your Cheetos are the cheesy equivalent of wiping my ass with sandpaper. And Lucky, your cereal is no luck of the Irish. It's just shitty sugar-coated puffs. Final. Roasted by Ronald McDonald, the food brand mascots left the stage, defeated and humiliated. Ronald showed them that he was the original fast food clown, and that no one messes with the king of burgers. The Comedy Central roast ended with Ronald's triumphant laughter, proving that when it comes to insults, he wears the golden arches with pride. Welcome to the Comedy Central Roast of Mario. Tonight's roasters include Bowser Jr., Spiny, Piranha Plant, Hammer Bro, and Chain Chomp. Hold on to your seats, folks, because it's about to get vulgarly intense. Bowser Jr., all right, you Italian plumber piece of shit, let's get this roast started. Mario, you've been saving princesses for years, but I bet you couldn't even save your own dignity. Your mustache is as pathetic as your jump height. Spiny. Yo, Mario. I gotta admit, your jump game is on point. But who needs hops when all you can do is dick around in a mushroom kingdom? You went from Donkey Kong to Donkey Dong. Hey on Hopland, Mario, your plumbers have been digging in pipes for ages, but I've never seen someone shovel as much shit as you. Your so-called super powers don't impress me. It's like watching a turtle try to fuck. Hammer bro. Hey, Mario, I've seen more intelligent life in a Goomba's brain than in your thick skull. You're a washed up has been, riding on the coattails of your past glory. Time to retire, you pasta-eating motherfucker. Chain Chomp! Mario, you overgrown pizza slice, let me tell y'all something. Your obsession with mushrooms is as sad as your love life. Even I find more action chained to a fence than you do with those princesses. Go fetch a star, maybe then you'll finally perform like a big boy. Mario, alright, you love my motherfuckers, it's my turn to roast you back. Bowser Jr., you're supposed to be my arch nemesis, more like my fart cushion. You're like the rotten cherry on top of the shit sundae that is your dad. Spiny. Spiky little shithead. I bet you spent more time practicing your act of avoiding jumps than getting laid. You're so small, I thought you came out of Bowser Jr's dick. Ryan Hopland, look at you, with your big mouth and all. I could make a better meal out of your leaves than that spaghetti loving plumber. Your breath smells like a decade old corpse, no wonder you're hiding in those pipes. Hammer bro. You and your hammers, it's all you know, huh? At least I can throw a hammer without tripping over my own feet. You're like a flea on a Goomba's ass, always jumping around but never hitting shit. Bang Chomp! You're just a big, spinning piece of shit, ain't y'all? I can dodge you blindfolded, you toothy twat. Your bark is worse than your bite, just like your mother's bedroom skills. And there you have it, folks. The Comedy Central roast of Mario went full throttle with insults, vulgarity, and swearing. But Mario ain't gonna take this shit sitting down. Time for him to unleash his revenge roast on these foul-mouthed participants.
Fries. What the fuck is going on here? Why the hell are there BFDI characters covered in blood? BFDI. Oh, Fries, you're in for a hell of a ride. You won't believe the fucked up shit that just went down. Fries, spit it out. I don't have all fucking day. BFDI. Alright, so here's what happened. We were peacefully minding our own business, when suddenly, out of nowhere, a colorful pattern of lines and lines on the surface of a 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 surface of a... Surface of a, surface of a God you get the fucking idea. Fries, get to the point. I need a straight answer, Damn it. BFDI. Fine, fine. This pattern on the surface started to pulsate and glow. We were all mesmerized by it, like a bunch of dumbasses. Then, before we knew it, blood started gushing out from the lines. Fries, blood, are you fucking serious? BFDI. Dead serious. The blood sprayed all over us, turning everything into a fucked up mess. It was like a goddamn horror movie. Fries, this shit is unreal. How the hell did blood come out of a fucking pattern? BFDI. I have no fucking clue, Fries. It's beyond comprehension, but it gets worse. While we were freaking out, the blood-infused lines started to move and form shapes of grotesque monsters. Fries, you're shitting me. So now we have blood, monsters, and a goddamn trippy pattern? This is like a fucked up acid trip. BFDI. Exactly. These monsters came to life, chasing after us. We ran like motherfuckers, trying to escape their clutches. It was like a damn battlefield out there. Fries, Jesus fucking Christ. Did you manage to get away? BFDI. Barely. Just in the nick of time, a portal appeared out of nowhere. We all jumped through it leaving those blood-soaked monsters behind. Fries, what the hell, man? This is some next-level fucked-up shit. I can't even wrap my head around it. BFDI. I know, right? It's like reality took a massive shit on us, but now we're stuck in this strange dimension, with no idea how to get back. Fries, fucking great. We're trapped in a goddamn acid trip nightmare. We better find a way out of this mess, and fast. BFDI. Agreed, Fries. We need to stick together figure out what the hell is going on, and find a way back home. This insane shit has to end. Fries, no doubt about it. Let's get our shit together and find some answers. And if any more goddamn blood or monsters show up, I swear, I'm gonna lose my fucking mind. Hank. Bobby, I've had enough of this anime nonsense. You're grounded. Bobby, but dad, anime is life. It's not just drawings, it's a whole new world. Hank. Son, you're acting like a goddamn weeb, and it's starting to worry me. Bobby, you don't understand, dad. Anime speaks to my soul. It makes me feel alive. Hank. Damn it, Bobby. It's time for some tough love. No more anime for a week. Bobby, you can't do that. Anime is my one true love. Hank, I'm sorry, son, but I have to protect you from this unhealthy obsession. Bobby, you can't protect me from true love, dad. I'll keep watching anime, even if it kills me. Hank, alright, that's it. I'm confiscating your anime collection, and we're going to therapy. Bobby, you can't take away what's in my heart, dad. Anime is my destiny. Meanwhile, in the back alley of a mysterious otaku hideout. Otaku 1. Hey, have you heard of that kid who's addicted to anime? Otaku 2. Yeah, I heard he's been grounded and his dad is sending him to therapy. Otaku 1. Well, we can't let someone destroy their love for anime. We need to save him. Otaku 2. Agreed. Let's create a plan to liberate him from his oppressive dad. Hank surprised as a group of otaku dressed in cosplay crashed through the front door. Hank! What the hell? Who are you people? Otaku leader. We are the guardians of anime, and we're here to save Bobby from your ignorance. Hank, you think dressing up like a bunch of weirdos is gonna change my mind? Get out of my house. Bobby, Dad, these people understand me. They know that anime is more than just cartoons. Hank, Bobby, this is insane. This is not the way to solve your problems. Taku leader, your closed-mindedness won't stop us. We'll show you the wonders of anime. 
Hank and the otaku get into an intense argument, eventually leading to a massive anime-style battle in the living room. After a chaotic fight, the otaku are defeated, exhausted, and covered in dust. Otaku leader, fine, we may have lost this battle, but we'll never give up on our mission. Hank, look, I may not understand your passion, but I need you to understand that I'm just trying to protect my son. Bobby, Dad, maybe there's a middle ground we can find. Anime doesn't have to consume my life, but it can still be a part of it. Hank, okay, son, maybe I've been too harsh. Let's find a way to balance your interests with your responsibilities. Bobby and Hank share a moment of understanding and reconciliation, while the defeated otaku begin to regain their strength. Otaku leader, we may have lost the battle today, but our love for anime will never die. We shall return. The otaku retreat, leaving Hank and Bobby to find a way to enjoy anime responsibly, and for the otaku to regroup for their next mission. Hank, I never thought I'd say this, but maybe anime isn't the devil after all. Bobby, Dad, you may not understand it completely, but thank you for trying to understand me. Hank, let's just hope this whole, Guardians of Anime, thing doesn't become a weekly occurrence. Host, welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the Comedy Central Roast of Mario. Tonight, we have a star-studded lineup of roasters ready to tear into our beloved plumber. Let's kick off the evening with our first roaster, Goomba. Goomba, alright, you pudgy mustache-wearing motherfucker, let's get this shit show started. Mario, you call yourself a plumber, but all you do is jump around like a goddamn amphetamine-fueled maniac. Seriously, have you ever fixed a fucking pipe in your life? Goomba Trooper, nah man, he's too busy kidnapping princesses and leaving his shitty mushrooms all over the goddamn place. Mario, you think you're so special, but all you do is stomp on poor innocent turtles like us. It's time someone shits all over your iconic red cap. Very Trooper, yeah, and speaking of your fashion choices, what's up with those overalls? Are you running some fucking hipster farm in Brooklyn or what? Get with the times, Mario, it's 2022, you're like a relic from the Stone Age, just like your gameplay mechanics. Jumping on mushrooms? Give me a fucking break. Boo! Oh, Mario, you gotta love this guy. He's got more facial hair than brain cells. And seriously, who the fuck names themselves after a fucking plumber? I bet Princess Peach only sticks around for your sweet, sweet plumbing services. Hope you know how to snake more than just pipes, buddy. Lakitu. Mario, you deluded fuckwad. You've been chasing after Bowser for decades, but here's the thing. Bro, Peach ain't into you. She's just playing hard to get because she knows deep down you're a one-pump chump. Face it, you'll always be living in the shadow of that spiky shell wearing bad boy. Mario, alright, enough of this bullshit. Do you maggots think you can roast me? Let me tell you something, you're all as useless as a Koopa without his shell. Goomba, you're so dumb, the only thing you're fit for is getting stomped on. Koopa, you're so slow, I'd finish three levels before you even spawn. Paratroopa, you flat like a drunk duck, you're more useless than a warp pipe that leads to a blind cliff. Boo. You're so transparent, you might as well be some hipster ghost. And Lakitu, you're nothing more than a glorified paparazzi, floating around with your camera like a fucking voyeur. So suck it, you pathetic bunch of pixelated losers. Host, well, that was one hell of a roast, folks. Give it up for our roasters and the one and only Mario. Remember, he may have gotten his revenge tonight, but the game is never over for these foul-mouthed characters. Stay tuned for more crazy antics and roast battles. Narrator. Welcome to the Comedy Central Roast of Ronald McDonald. Tonight's roasters are six randomly selected food brand mascots. Cool aid man. Alright, you fucking clowns. Let's get this shit show started. 
Tony the Tiger, that's right you bunch of weaklings, I hope you're ready to get shredded Ronald. Coco Puffs Bird, ah, fuck yeah. I've been waiting to tear into you, McDonald. Let's go. This is Butterworth, Ronald, you butter-faced asshole. I hope you've got your McNuggets ready, cause I'm about to roast you so hard, your milkshake will explode. Jolly Green Giant, step aside, bitches. This giant is about to squash you like puny peas. Hamburglar. Just wait till you see what I'm stealing tonight, Ronald. Your dignity will be the biggest score of my criminal career. Narrator. The audience is roaring with laughter and anticipation. Ronald McDonald takes the stage, a big smile on his face. Ronald McDonald, well, 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 look at this sorry bunch of desperate fucks. It's like a convention of has been mascots who couldn't hack it in the real world. Tony the Tiger, fuck you Ronald, your burgers are nothing but limp tasteless crap. Coco Puffs Bird, yeah, Ronald. You're the reason kids are getting fatter than ever before. You should stick to clowning, you massive failure. This is Butterworth, Ronald, you're so fucking creepy, you make Bloody Mary look like Mary Poppins. Cool aid man. Hey Ronald, can I make a secret sauce with your face and serve it up to these losers? Hamburglar. You think you're so goddamn funny, Ronald? Well, newsflash, your jokes are as stale as your food. Dolly Green Giant. Ronald, you're the real clown here. A pathetic excuse for a mascot. I bet your shoes are full of more grease than your entire menu. Narrator. Ronald McDonald's smile slowly fades, replaced by a look of pure rage. The audience falls silent, waiting to see what he'll do next. Ronald McDonald, you think you can outroast me, you pathetic fuckers? Well, buckle up, because it's time for Ronald to serve up some look revenge. Tony the Tiger, bring it on you clown-faced dickwad. Ronald McDonald, Tony, you oversized furry dildo. Your, great, catchphrase is as original as your brain cells, which are probably all soaked in sugary milk. Coco Puffs Bird. Ronald, you greaseball freak. Your red and yellow suit is nothing but a clownish cry for attention. And those shoes? They're probably full of dead rats. This is Butterworth, you caked on makeup wearing bastard. Nobody wants your soggy ass fries or dried up burgers. Go drown yourself in your own barbecue sauce, you sorry excuse for a clown. Cool aid man. Oh yeah? Well, Ronald, you're nothing but a faded poster on a grimy restaurant wall. Your name used to mean something, now it's just clown vomit. Hamburglar. Ronald, you fucking clown prince of failure. Your burgers are drier than the driest of my pathetic robberies. Your face gives children nightmares, you deranged psychopath. Jolly Green Giant. Ronald, you shriveled up circus reject. Your only talent is making kids fat and unhappy. You're not a clown, you're a sadistic sugar pusher. Narrator. The crowd erupts into laughter and applause, shocked by Ronald McDonald's brutal and unexpected comeback. The mascots are left speechless, humiliated by the very clown they attempted to roast. Ronald McDonald, ladies and gentlemen, the clown always gets the last laugh. Remember that when you're choking down another Big Mac. Good night, you sorry sacks of greasy shit. Narrator. The camera zooms in, revealing a close-up of a plate with a logo on it. In the background, feathers and a red and white striped curtain set the scene for the Comedy Central roast of Donald Trump. Tonight's roasters, six completely random world leaders throughout history. Brace yourselves, this will be one hell of a night. Enter Adolf Hitler, dressed in a sleek suit and holding a microphone. Adolf Hitler. Well, 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 if it isn't the self-proclaimed king of the world. Mr. Trump, you've got more ego than Mussolini and more orange than Stalin's communism. And just like your hair, your policies are a goddamn mess. Napoleon Bonaparte steps forward, adjusting his iconic hat. Napoleon Bonaparte, ah, Trump, the man who thinks he can conquer everything, including women. If your brain was as big as your mouth, maybe the world wouldn't see you as a little dick with a Napoleon complex. Genghis Khan enters with a wicked grin. Genghis Khan. Trump, you pathetic excuse for a leader. You're all talk and no action. I could conquer half the world with a fart more powerful than your so-called business skills. Mongol hordes would make mincemeat of your spray-tanned ass.
Queen Elizabeth I strides forward, regal and unimpressed. Queen Elizabeth I. Ah, Donald, watching you strut around like a peacock makes me glad I ruled in an era where men actually had balls. Your insufferable sexism and arrogance would get you beheaded faster than you can say, tiny hands. Joseph Stalin enters, puffing on a cigar. Joseph Stalin, Trump you capitalist pig, you think you can handle power, you haven't killed half as many people as I did before breakfast, your toupee must be made of the same material as your ethics pure propaganda. Mahatma Gandhi steps forward calmly, a twinkle in his eye. Mahatma Gandhi! Mr. Trump, your greed and lust for power are precisely why the world needs more peace. Though, I must say, it's impressive how you managed to remain an ignorant, pompous jackass while simultaneously tweeting on the toilet. Donald Trump, all right, all right, sit the f asterisk 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 down, you bunch of losers. You guys couldn't lead a group therapy session, let alone a country. Adolf, you've got a face that looks like a side effect of inbreeding. Napoleon, at least I don't need a step stool to ride a roller coaster. Genghis, your breath smells like horse s asterisk asterisk. Queen Elizabeth, I'd rather grab M by the P asterisk Y than have tea with you. Stalin, your moustache looks like a dead rat crawled up and died on your lip. And Gandhi, I bet your non-violent protests would be a lot more effective if you weren't half an asterisk 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 D. Narrator. As tensions rise, the room erupts into chaos. Security rushes in to separate the roasters before the situation escalates further. Ultimately, the Comedy Central roast of Donald Trump will go down in history as one of the most intense and foul mount events ever witnessed. While the roasters may have left the stage feeling triumphant, Donald Trump took his revenge with a roast they would never forget. The night was a wild ride of insults, vulgarities, and egos clash, leaving everyone speechless, shocked, and entertained. Mario, Laura, everyone, settle down. It's time for the roast of the century. I hope you've all prepared your best insults, cause trust me, I'm ready to fire back. Princess Peach. Oh, Mario, you've saved me so many times. If only there was a plumber that could fix your shish asterisk TTY personality. Princess Daisy, Peach, face it, no one cares about you. You're the girl who keeps getting kidnapped like it's some kind of kinky fetish. Odette. Hey, Peach, I'm surprised you haven't been given the title of Princess in Distress. It's not like you can accomplish anything without Mario. Rosalina. Well, 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 the heroes of the Mushroom Kingdom. Mario, have you ever wondered if your obsession with Goombas is just a way for you to mask your own inferiority complex? Birdo. Mario, you talk about being heroic, but the only thing you're really good at is jumping on things. No wonder you have such a tiny penis. Mario. Oh, the princesses are so brave today. Peach, you're always dawdling around like you've got nothing better to do. But hey, I guess ruling the kingdom takes dedication, or at least something other than waiting for someone to rescue you. Peach, well, at least I can make a decision. Daisy, your indecisiveness is worse than your fashion sense. Pick a damn outfit that doesn't blind everyone. Daisy. Oh, coming from you, Peach, your wardrobe looks like it was designed by a blind Koopa. Odette. Can we talk about Rosalina's void of personality? You claim to be the guardian of the cosmos, but your speeches are more boring than watching paint dry. Rosalina, and what about Birdo? Always trying to hide behind that big snout. Is it because you're ashamed of what's hiding inside your mouth? Birdo, you're just jealous that I've got something you'll never have. A big, beautiful, horn. Mario, all right, enough bickering, you bunch of spoiled brats. Let's not forget that the biggest joke of all is Bowser still thinking he has a chance of beating me. Peach. Mario, you may have saved the Mushroom Kingdom a hundred times, but everyone knows your true love is pizza, not me. Daisy. Peach, we may fight, but we both know we're not the ones Mario is really after. I've seen the way he looks at those mushrooms. Odette. Speaking of mushrooms, Mario, you've been eating too many. Your belly is so round, it's a wonder you can even jump anymore. Rosalina. And Mario, your mustache is just a desperate attempt to divert our attention from your receding hairline. Birdo, Mario, 
You may be a hero to the mushroom people, but your sexual performance is about as exciting as eating a cold, stale pizza. Mario, alright, that's it. You've all had your fun. But let me tell you, none of you would last a second in my boots. Peach, Daisy, Toadette, Rosalina, Boro, you're all just a bunch of losers. Surprise! Holy shit! What the fuck is happening over there? Why are BFDI characters getting blown? Gelatin, that's fucked up, man. I mean, this is supposed to be a kid-friendly show, right? What sick fuck came up with this idea? Surprise! I have no fucking clue, but it's really disturbing. I mean, look at Gelatin Jr. He's covered in blood, and he's just a goddamn gelatin cube. Gelatin Jr. Sobbing, I didn't sign up for this shit guys, I just wanted to make people laugh with my wobbly antics. Now I'm covered in goddamn fake blood. Pencil. Hey, all you losers need to chill. This is a reality show after all, and drama sells. So, instead of crying like a bunch of fucking babies, let's use this opportunity to boost our screen time. Surprise, Pencil, I can't believe you're worried about screen time at a time like this. Besides, have you seen Leafy over there? She's literally ripping BFDI characters apart with her bare hands. Leafy, that's right, losers. You all thought I was just a cute little leaf, but I have a dark side. Time to settle some scores and take my revenge. Teresa, this is utter chaos. I never signed up for a goddamn battle royale, but here we are. I can't even look at that piece of wood with a green stripe anymore without feeling sick. And why the fuck is there a yellow stripe at the bottom? Match. Who the fuck cares about the wood? Eraser. We need to figure out how to survive this shit. Fiery. Hold on, guys. Remember, we're all in this together. No matter how fucked up this situation is, we need to stick together and find a way out. Uh-oh. Fiery's right. We need to form a plan and get the hell out of here before we become collateral damage. Who knows what kind of sick ideas these show creators have in store for us next. Gelatin, I second that. Let's organize ourselves, escape this madness, and shut this fucked up reality show down for good. Beefy, alright, fine. But if any of you losers betray me or get in my way, I won't hesitate to tear you apart limb by limb. Pencil. Jesus Christ, Leafy, calm the fuck down. We're all equally fucked here. Let's just find a way to survive this shitstorm and get the hell out of here. Razor, agreed. Let's use our brains and come up with an escape plan. This may be the most fucked up experience we've ever had, but together, we can overcome it. Fraz, I can't believe this shit is happening. I just hope we all make it out alive and get a chance to tell the world about the sick shit that goes on behind the scenes of this goddamn show. Gelatin Jr. Sniffles, can we please make sure there's no more blood involved? I don't think my gelatinous self can handle it anymore. Fiery, don't worry, Jr. We'll get through this together. Now, let's put our heads together and find a way out of this nightmare. Morty, why are we wasting our time on some random guy holding a jug of liquid? I don't know, Rick. The prompt was pretty specific. Plus, he looks like he really needs help. Fine, Morty. Let's go pretend to care about this thirsty fella. And, please, I beg of you. I need water. The thirst is unbearable. Joining the scene. Oh my god, guys. This is like a real-life desert survival situation. We could totally film it and make it go viral. Rolls her eyes, Summer, this isn't the time for your social media aspirations. We need to help this man. Awkwardly. Um, guys, I have an idea. We could go to the nearby tree and get some coconuts to quench his thirst. Coconuts? Jerry, seriously, we're supposed to be here for scientific experiments, not delivering tropical refreshments. Rick, let's not waste any more time. We can just use a portal gun to get some water from another dimension. Finally, Morty, you're coming to your senses. Hand me the portal gun. And, 
Getting impatient, I can't wait any longer. Please, I'm dying here. Rick opens a portal, and they all step through to another dimension. Wow, look at all these beautiful waterfalls. Morty, fill up the jug. On it, Mom! Whispering to Morty. Hey Morty, do you think we should just grab a quick swim while we're here? Annoyed, Jerry, we're not here for leisure. Focus! Jerry pouts, feeling left out. Excitedly, wait, guys. Let's bring back a talking fish or an immortal plant as a pet. Like, how cool would that be? Sarcastically, oh yes, Summer. Let's just disregard the man who needs water and prioritize some souvenirs. Pleadingly, Rick, can't we just grab something small for Summer? Fine, Morty, but just a small fish or a tiny plant. Nothing too wild. Beth fills the jug with water, and they all step back through the portal. And, relieved, finally, you've returned. Please, give me the water. Hold on a sec, buddy. Morty, hand over that fish to Summer. Yes, I knew this would be worth it. And, frustrated, are you kidding me? I'm parched, and you're worried about giving her a pet fish? Here you go. We got you some water. Sorry for the delay. And, quenches his thirst, thank you, thank you all. But seriously, what kind of messed up priorities do you guys have? Hey, we're not perfect, pal. But at least we got you some water and Summer got her precious fish. And, shaking his head, you people are insane. Man walks away, shaking his head in disbelief. Whispering to Beth, do you think I could ever be as cool as Rick? Whispering back, absolutely not, Jerry. Roastmaster, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Comedy Central Roast of Mario. Strap in and prepare for some brutally honest, foul mouth humor tonight. Our first roaster is none other than Bowser Jr. Bowser Jr., well, well, well. If it isn't Mario, the guy who's so bland, he makes a bowl of plain spaghetti look exciting. Seriously, you're about as interesting as a lecture on Goomba mating habits. And don't get me started on your hygiene. Your breath is so bad, Yoshi would rather eat a pile of Goomba shit than get close to you. Roastmaster, ouch not holding back are we up next give it up for Spiny. Spiny. Mario, you chubby cheeked plumber. You're so dumb, it's a wonder you don't try to jump into a bottomless pit thinking it's a shortcut. And what's up with those overalls? Do you think wearing them makes up for the fact that your mustache makes you look like a disco version of Magnum P.I.? Pathetic. Roastmaster, damn spiny alright let's keep this roast train rolling with piranha plant. Piranha plant, Mario, you fungus ridden pasta lover. You think just because you jump on things, you're some kind of hero? Please, you're so weak, I could eat you for breakfast and spit out your mustache as a garnish. And your girlfriend, Peach? I've seen tougher apples in a fruit bowl. It's no wonder Bowser keeps stealing her, it's the only excitement she ever gets. Roastmaster Savage, piranha plant, next up give it up for Hammer Bro. Hammer Bro. Mario, you damn pipe puffing, turtle stomping loser. You go around smashing bricks and stealing coins like some kind of Goomba hating Robin Hood. Well, newsflash, you're no hero, you're a hairy chested plumber who wouldn't know a real challenge if it hit you in the face with a frickin' hammer. And let's not forget your brother, Luigi, the ultimate sidekick. He's so useless, he makes Toadsworth look like a freakin' titan. Roastmaster Hammer Bro going in hard alright folks, it's time for our final roaster. Give a warm round of applause for Chain Chomp. Chain Chomp. Mario, you mustached motherfucker. You think you're so tough jumping on my head? Well, guess what? My chain's nothing compared to the ball and chain you carry around between your legs. You're such a latest man. You make Wario look like a damn supermodel. And that's saying something. So keep eating those mushrooms, Mario, because we all know they're the only things that make you feel big. Roastmaster damn chain chomp that was brutal, now it's time for Mario to dish out some revenge roasts. Mario, you sorry sons of Koopas. You think you can talk all this crap and get away with it? Well, listen up, because Mario's got a few things to say. Bowser Jr., you call me boring? At least I'm not just a carbon copy of my daddy. Hell, you're so desperate for attention, I bet Peach could beat your ass in a fair fight. Spiny, you think you're smart? 
Well, I've seen Goombas play chess, and they only have one fucking brain cell. Piranha plant, you talk about eating me? Well, I hope you enjoy the taste of plumber boot, because that's what you'll get when I stomp your sorry ass. And as for you, hammer bro and chain chomp, I've dealt with tougher obstacles than you two on my morning jog. So, keep barking, because Mario's got the bigger bite. Narrator, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Comedy Central Roast of Donald Trump. Gathered here tonight are six randomly selected world leaders throughout history, ready to deliver their foul-mouthed, short-tempered roasts. Let the craziness begin. Scene, a large stage with a podium, the audience is buzzing with anticipation. Narrator, the lights dim as the first roaster takes the stage, Julius Caesar. Caesar, all right, you blighted sack of horse shit, Donald Trump. Your hair is AF asterisk seeking disaster. It looks like a triple bang to haystack. Audience erupts in laughter. Narrator, the crowd goes wild. Next up is Cleopatra. Cleopatra. Donnie, you useless twat. Your hands are so tiny, I could use them as F asterisk seeking toothpicks. And you call yourself a leader? Get the F asterisk CK out of here. Audience roars with laughter. Narrator. The insanity continues as Genghis Khan approaches the microphone. Khan, Trump, you sweaty orange diarrhea stain. You think you're tough? I slaughtered millions of your kind, you cowardly little prick. Go back to chasing skirts and playing with your tiny ego. Audience erupts in applause and laughter. Narrator, the next roaster is Napoleon Bonaparte, ready to take a stab at Trump. Napoleon, Donnie, you and Red Peacock, you think you're a conqueror? I conquered half of Europe, you irrelevant sack of merd. Your empire will crumple faster than your spray tan. Audience bursts into laughter. Narrator. The crowd can hardly contain themselves as the fifth roaster, Winston Churchill, steps up to the podium. Churchill, Trump, you fucking wanker. Your idea of leadership is, grab M by the pussy. We fought against Nazis while you were busy F asterisk seeking porn stars. Stick to reality TV, you colossal imbecile. Audience applauds and laughs uncontrollably. Narrator, and now, the moment everyone has been waiting for. It's time for Donald Trump to turn the tables and roast his roasters. Trump, all right, you sorry excuses for world leaders. Caesar, you backstabbing son of a bitch, your empire fell apart faster than your rotting corpse. Cleopatra, beautiful my ass, you're nothing compared to my Eastern European models. Khan, you think you're a conqueror? The only thing you conquered was a buffet line. Napoleon, you short-fused shitstain, even my suits are taller than you. Churchill, you drunkard, you couldn't handle my deals even if you were sober for once. Audience erupts in a mix of laughter and shock. Narrator, the crowd is on fire, torn between shock and pure amusement. As the laughter subdues, the roasters and Trump take a bow, sealing this night of insane roasting with an unpredictable conclusion. The Comedy Central roast of Donald Trump goes down in history as one of the most outrageous and vulgar events ever witnessed. From the foul-mouthed world leaders to Trump's revengeful roasts, the night was a roller coaster of absurdity. Love it or hate it, this unforgettable event left everyone wondering how the hell did we end up here. Narrator. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the most outrageous Comedy Central roast you'll ever witness. Tonight, we have a lineup of six completely random bosses from the Dark Soul series, ready to unleash their short-tempered and foul-mouthed roasts upon the infamous Gwyn, Lord of Cinder. Brace yourself for an evening of flaring tempers, fiery insults, and some seriously M-rated dialogue. Roaster 1. Ornstein, you giant fucking dragon wannabe. Bet your mommy didn't love you enough to give you wings, huh? Roaster 2. Artorias, you pathetic cripple. What's the matter? Did your dog chew off your other arm? Oh right, you can't even hold a fucking sword. Roaster 3. Manus, you colossal piece of shit. Is it true you're just a bunch of homicidal tentacles wrapped in a fancy cloak? Goddamn hentai monster. 
Roaster 4. Smog, you fat fuck. How many poor souls did you gobble up just to cover that disgusting body of yours? No wonder you're a cannibalistic piece of shit. Roaster 5. Sir alone, you suicidal prick. Do you think death by seppuku is honorable? Nah, it just means you're a fucking coward who couldn't handle life. Roaster 6. The nameless king, you piece of shit. You think riding a dragon makes you special? You're nothing but a glorified pet owner who couldn't even name their own damn pet. Win, Lord of Cinder. Slyly, well, 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 look at all these pathetic fools before me. Ornstein, your obsession with dragons only reflects your deep-seated insecurities about your own inadequacy. Artorias, the only reason you're still standing is because your dog is too lazy to chew off your other arm. Manus, tentacles and a fancy rope can't hide the fact that you're nothing more than an oversized hentai enthusiast. Win, Lord of Cinder. Smog, you fat sack of shit, you're just a cannibalistic freak show. The only thing you're good at is eating your own misery. Sir alone, your seppuku was about as honorable as wiping your ass with a used tissue. Win, Lord of Cinder. And as for you, nameless king, riding a dragon doesn't make you special. Any asshole can ride a dragon, it takes a real loser not to give it a name. You're nothing more than a spineless imbecile who hides behind his pet. Narrator. As the roasters process the verbal assault, the room grows silent, anticipation thick in the air. Will they retaliate, or will they cower before the wrath of the Lord of Cinder? Roasters, stammering, ah, uh, fuck you, Gwyn, you arrogant prick, we'll, we'll roast your ass like a divine bonfire. Gwyn, Lord of Cinder, smirking, bring it on, you pathetic imbeciles. But remember, I was the one who conquered the fires of hell, and I can reduce you to ashes with a single thought. Prepare to be incinerated by the true Lord of Cinder. The roasters, once confident in their abilities, now find themselves on the receiving end of Gwyn's fiery wrath. As the flames consume them, they learn the true meaning of humiliation. And so, the comedy central roast of Gwyn, Lord of Cinder, ends in a blaze of vengeance and twisted victory. Buzzy Beetle, alright, let's get this fucking roast rolling. Mario, you Italian fucking plumber. You've been jumping on Goombas and pounding on turtles for years, but let's be real here, you're still a short dick loser. Wiggler, yeah, Mario, you think you're so fucking hot with your princess saving antics. But let me tell you, you're about as useful as a limp dick in a brothel. Charge and check, huh? Look at this pudgy fucker. Mario, you couldn't find a power-up to save your life, let alone get laid. Your mushroom-sized pecker ain't impressing anyone. Shy guy. Mario, you may be a hero in the Mushroom Kingdom, but down here you're just a washed-up loser. Your mustache ain't fooling anyone, we all know you're compensating for something. Fuzzy. Yo, Mario, you think you're so tough, but you're just a bitch in overalls. You think you can come strolling through my forest, steal my fucking power-up, and get away with it. Think again, motherfucker. Mario. Alright, you sorry excuses for enemies. It's my turn to roast all of you pathetic losers. Buzzy Beetle, you're so fucking brain dead, even a Koopa Troopa has more personality than you. Wiggler, Mario, you ain't got the balls to talk shit to me. I'll wiggle my fucking ass all over you and crush you like the puny little bitch you are. Charge and Chuck, you think your electrified ass scares me, Mario? I've taken bigger shocks from my toaster. Enjoy being a one-trick pony, you overgrown football player. Shy guy. Mario, you're such a generic hero. No personality, no charisma, just a silent fucking figurehead. No wonder Princess Peach is always getting kidnapped, she's bored to tears with your sorry ass. Fuzzy. Fuck off, Mario. You're nothing but a greedy prick who steals everyone's power-ups. Go back to plumbing, you loser, because your career as a comedian is a fucking joke. Mario. Well, 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 look who's all talk. You pieces of shit are just jealous cause I've got more game in my mustache than all of you combined. You know what they say, it's a me, Mario, and I'm gonna kick your sorry asses. So, fuck you all, and good night.
Princess Peach. Well, 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 look who we have here. Mario, the man of the hour. I can't believe they actually let you out of the Mushroom Kingdom for this shit show. Princess Daisy, Peach, calm your tits. We are here to roast, not to kiss his fat Italian ass. Mario, you may be a hero in your games, but let's be real, you're also a licensed plumber. How does it feel to go from saving the kingdom to unclogging toilets? Oh dad. Oh please. Mario's so dumb, he probably thinks Bowser is just a misunderstood turtle with anger issues. And let's not forget how many times he's let those damn Goombas stomp all over him. It's called jumping, you fat fuck. Rosalina. Now, now, let's not be too harsh. I mean, Mario has had his fair share of adventures. But let's not forget that time he saw a giant fire-breathing turtle and thought, Hey, I'm gonna jump on its head. I guess jumping on mushrooms really gets to your head, huh? Birdo. Yo, princesses, I gotta say something about Mario here. This dude is so obsessed with collecting coins, I wouldn't be surprised if he's out there blowing plumbers in back alleys just for a few extra gold coins. What a freak. Mario. Alright, enough is enough. You think you're so clever, huh? Peach, you're always getting kidnapped, yet you're still the worst damsel in distress. And Daisy, you're just a cheap knockoff of Peach with a bad attitude. Toadette, you're just an annoying mushroom with pigtails. Rosalina, nobody even knows who the fuck you are. And Birdo, you're just a gender-confused dinosaur with a butthole for a mouth. Princess Peach. Oh, it's on now, plumber boy. You think you can outroast us? Let's see what you got. Mario. Peach, you're such a tease. You're always leading me on with those peaches, but I've never seen the pits. And Daisy, no wonder you're so bitter, you're always in Peach's shadow. Toadette, you may be small, but you're also the most annoying thing since Toad. Rosalina, you're so spacey, even Bowser wouldn't bother kidnapping you. And Birdo, for someone with such a big mouth, you sure suck at giving head. Princess Daisy, wow, Mario, you really know how to hit below the belt. But what else can we expect from a guy who wears a red cap to hide his receding hairline? Princess Peach, and here I thought this would be a friendly roast. I guess we should have known better than to mess with the King of Koopas himself. Way to go, Mario. You ruined everything, as usual. Mario. Ha, that's what you get for trying to roast the master of roasting, bitches. Now if you'll excuse me, I've got some princesses to save and some more cookies to shove up my plumber's crack. Trump. Ladies and gentlemen, my fellow Americans, today marks a turning point in our nation's history. As your president, I stand before you to unveil 10 evil patch notes that will reshape the United States into an unimaginable landscape of chaos and madness. Biden, this is insane. Doodle Bob has lost his mind. Obama, we need to stop this madness. The fate of our nation is at stake. Hillary, I can't believe we're facing an army of grotesque doodle politicians. Trump. Silence. The first evil patch note. Anyone who speaks ill of me will be banished to an alternate dimension, never to return. Biden, that's a blatant violation of free speech. Trump, free speech? Who needs that when we can have my glorious ego acknowledged at all times? Obama, this is a mockery of democracy. We must unite, my fellow citizens. Hillary, I agree, Obama. We'll fight to take back the White House from these deranged doodles. Trump, patch note number two, education will be replaced with doodleology. Only those who can doodle will survive. Biden, this is an attack on knowledge, on the foundations of our society. Obama, we must defend our intellect, our future. Use your voices and your pens. Hillary, we'll lead the charge to restore education and sanity. Trump, patch note three, hospitals will be converted into doodle rehabilitation centers. No more healthcare for the weak. Biden, people will suffer, they will die. This is a crime against humanity. Obama. We must protect our citizens' right to healthcare. We won't let this madness prevail. Hillary, stand strong. We'll fight for the well-being of our nation. Trump. Patch note 4. The White House will henceforth be referred to as the Doodle Dungeon. Fear my reign. Biden. We'll restore its true purpose. The symbol of hope and democracy. Obama. Doodle Bob cannot corrupt the very heart of our nation. Hillary. We won't allow this mockery of power to stand. Trump. Patch note 5, the Doodle Army will replace the US military. 
we shall conquer the world with doodles. Biden, we won't let this doodle dictatorship spread. Obama, our brave soldiers will defend our nation against this doodle madness. Hillary, we'll restore the true values of our military. Trump, enough, patch note 6, all currency will be transformed into doodle dollars. The economy will crumble. Biden, we won't let the economy be destroyed. Together, we'll rebuild. Obama, we must restore stability, create a prosperous future. Hillary, we won't let the doodles ruin our financial system. Trump, patch note 7, all cheese will be replaced with doodle cheese. Taste the madness. Biden, what about our culinary traditions? This is an abomination. Obama, we'll protect our cheeses, preserve our culture. Hillary, we won't let the doodles defile our gastronomical heritage. Trump, patch note 8, the Supreme Court will be disbanded. Doodle justice shall reign. Biden, this is an assault on the principles of fairness and justice. Obama, we'll fight to restore balance and protect our judiciary. Hillary, we won't let the doodles undermine our legal system. Trump, patch note 9, social media will only allow doodle content. No more dissent. Biden, we'll fight for our right to speak freely, to have diverse opinions. Obama, we'll protect our democracy, our right to a free press. Hillary, we won't let the doodles silence our voices. Trump, final patch note, reality will be rewritten to fit my twisted doodle desires. Resistance is futile. Biden, we'll fight to restore sanity, to bring back the truth. Obama, our nation will rise against this madness. Hillary, we won't let the doodles shape our reality. To be continued. Welcome to the Comedy Central Roast of Donald Trump. Tonight we have six completely randomly selected world leaders throughout history ready to give it to the man himself. So, without further ado, let's bring our first roaster to the stage. Hitler. Well, well, well. Look who we have here. Donald Trump, the man who thinks he's the greatest leader of all time. Sorry to burst your bubble, but I've seen better mustaches than yours. Trump, is that all you got, Adolf? I could buy your entire mustache collection with pocket change. And let's not forget who actually won World War II, buddy. Stalin, enough of the mustache talk, boys. It's time for a real roast. Trump, do you claim to be a stable genius? Well, that's about as believable as your hair being real. Trump, Stalin, you were a brutal dictator with no regard for human life. I guess we both have experience when it comes to being tough leaders, huh? Mussolini, hey, Trump, you think you're a tough guy? Please, I'm the original tough guy. Just look at my jawline, it could cut diamonds. Yours? Well, it couldn't even cut butter. Trump, Mussolini, you were a fascist dictator. I'm a businessman turned president, and I'm bringing back jobs and fighting for the American people. What have you done lately? Other than rot in your grave, of course. Napoleon, Donald, you may think you have it all, but let's be honest, your empire is nothing compared to mine. I conquered Europe, and all you've conquered is Twitter. Trump, Napoleon, you're high made up for your lack of accomplishments. The least I don't have to compensate for anything. Cleopatra. Oh, Trump, you claim to be a ladies' man, but let me tell you, the only thing that makes my heart race is ancient history. Your charm is about as genuine as a pyramid scheme. Trump, Cleopatra, you may have been a queen, but I'm the king of deals. I've built luxury hotels and towers all around the world. What have you built? A reputation as a snake charmer? And now, ladies and gentlemen, it's time for Donald Trump's revenge roasts against all the participants. Trump. Hitler, you killed millions of innocent people and you couldn't even take over a country that was smaller than my penthouse suite. You'll forever be remembered as a symbol of pure evil. Trump, Stalin, you were a paranoid lunatic who murdered your own people. I guess you were trying to make up for your insecurity about your mustache. Trump, Mussolini, your jawline may have been sharp, but your leadership was dull. You were just a puppet desperate to get in on the action. Trump, Napoleon, you may have been short, but your eagle was taller than the Eiffel Tower. You were nothing more than a tiny tyrant. Trump. Cleopatra, your intrigues may have captured the hearts of men, but your legacy is nothing compared to the empire I'm building. And there you have it, folks. The Comedy Central roast of Donald Trump, where the insults were as sharp as Napoleon's wit and as fiery as Cleopatra's charm.
narrator. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the Comedy Central Roast of Mario. Tonight, the stage is set, the fryer is hot, and the insults are about to fly. We have an explosive lineup of roasters ready to tear into Mario like he's never been torn before. Let the roast begin. Larry Koopa. Grinning, well, 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 if it ain't the pasta slurping plumber himself. Mario, you call yourself a hero? Nah, you're just a little mushroom munching twerp. You're so damn predictable, even Goombas know your next move. Morton Koopa Jr. Bursting with laughter, Mario, you're fatter than a chain chomp on a car binge. And those overalls? What are you trying to hide? I bet your plumber crack has its own zip code, huh? Wendy O. Koopa, mocking, oh, look at Mario, the princess saving heartthrob. Please, Mario, you couldn't charm your way out of a green shell. And that mustache? It's like a dead raccoon glued to your face. Gross. E. Koopa, snickering, Mario, you're as useful as a fire flower in the desert. Always trying to save your damsel in distress, but we all know she's just playing you like a warp pipe. You're pathetic, bro. Oi, Koopa, gruffly, listen up. Mario, you piece of Bowser's crap. You think you're tough? I've seen Koopa troopers with more balls than you. Go back to eating mushrooms and crying about your inadequate jumping skills, you little ass boy. Emmy Koopa, giggling, Mario, you're like a goomba on drugs, always stomping on everything in your path. But let's be real, you're compensating for something. I heard you're hung like a piranha plant in the winter. Ludwig von Koopa, smirking. Ah, Mario, the plumber with the savior complex. You know, I've analyzed your pathetic existence and concluded that even a low-level minion like a magic Koopa could outsmart you. Your Jumpman days are numbered. Mario, calmly, well, it's been quite the roast, huh? It's refreshing to hear you all try so hard to be original. But let's not forget, you guys wouldn't even exist if it weren't for me. I've jumped through more hoops than all of you combined. Larry Koopa. Defensively, oh yeah? Well, you may be a legend, but I'm a Koopa King in the making. Morton Koopa Jr. Mockingly. Yeah, a king of Koopa klutzes, right? Wendy O. Koopa. Sarcastically, ooh, burn. Mario, you can't let them get away with that. E. Koopa. Laughing. Mario, the Koopas invented the word roast. We've been roasting you since the beginning of time. Oi Koopa, grinning, Mario, you might have a pointy red hat, but you're still a short stack of plumber garbage. Emmy Koopa, giggling, yeah, Mario, even with that mustache, you couldn't grow a pair if you tried. Ludwig von Koopa, smirking, Mario, it seems you've run out of steam. Better return to your little pipe and admit defeat. Mario, confidently, Bowser may be the king of the Koopas, but tonight, I'm the roast master. So, let me remind you all that without me, you'd just be a bunch of villains stuck in a video game. Consider yourselves roasted, you Koopa creeps. Narrator, and there you have it, folks. Mario may have taken a beating, but he certainly delivered his own fiery roast. As the laughter subsides, the stage clears, leaving a lingering anticipation for the next Comedy Central roast. But for tonight, let's revel in the chaos of this one-of-a-kind, foul mouth extravaganza. Fuzzy Beetle. Alright, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the fucking roast of that Italian plumber prick, Mario. I gotta say, it's about damn time we all get a chance to tear him a new one. Wiggala, hell yeah, Buzzy. This bastard has been jumping on our heads and shitting on our homes for years. I'm ready to get ruthless. Charge and Chuck, fucking A, Wiggler. Mario's always running around, smashing blocks and stealing our goddamn shells. He's a fucking klepto. Shy guy, you said it, Chuck. And don't even get me started on that stupid ass mustache. It's like a fucking caterpillar crawled onto his face and died there. Ozzy! Ha ha! Fuck yeah! That mustache is nothing compared to that weird ass accent he's got going on! Was he dropped on his fucking head as a baby or what? Ozzy Beetle. Alright, alright, let's get this shit show started. I'll go first. Hey, Mario, you may think you're a hero, but you're nothing but a fucking raccoon looking for some tail. Wiggala, ha ha ha, good one, Buzzy, but seriously, Mario, your princess is in another castle? I think she's just tired of your limp ass pipe game, you Italian sausage. Charging Chuck, speaking of pipes, did you know Mario is so fucking short, 
He had to use a goddamn mushroom just to see over the countertop? Pathetic. Shy guy. And let's not forget about his plumber's crack. I swear, you can fit a whole damn Goomba army in there. Mario, pull up your pants, you fucking plumber pervert. Fuzzy! Ha ha ha! Mario, you're such a failure that even Luigi is more popular than you! How's that feel, you inferior green hat wearing fuck? Mario, alright, you motherfuckers. It's time for this plumber to get his revenge. Buzzy, you think I'm a raccoon? At least I don't spend my days stuck inside a fucking shell. Buzzy Beetle. Oh shit, Mario's firing back. Mario, Wiggler, your lack of spine is probably why nobody wants to be around your sorry ass. You're just a squirming pile of shit. Wiggler, you, you piece of shit. Mario, Chuck, I heard you got hit so many times during practice that your helmet is just compensating for your tiny fucking brain. Bring it on, dumbass. Charge in Chuck, you little mustached shit. Mario, shy guy, you think you're some mysterious hiding behind that mask? We all know you're just a scared little pussy with no balls. Shy guy, you're dead, Mario. Mario, and Fuzzy, you fuzzy little bastard. I can't even see your face because you're so goddamn hairy. Did you escape from a fucking jungle? Fuzzy, that's, that's it. I'm gonna rip you apart. Mario, ha ha ha, bring it, you furry bitch. Note, this dialogue contains explicit language and offensive content. It is advised to use discretion while reading or sharing. Futurama episode, Slurms Mackenzie's Last Bash. Characters. Fry. Leela. Bender. Professor Farnsworth. Amy. Hermes. Zoidberg. Slurms Mackenzie. Teen. Planet Express Headquarters. The crew was gathered for a briefing. Fry. Hey, where's Slurms? He's supposed to be here. Leela, I don't know, Fry. Maybe he's partying again. Incident. Teen. Slurm Factory. Fry and Leela find Slurms in a private room with a woman holding a glowing ball. Fry. Slurms. What the hell are you doing? We've got work to do. Slurms. Relax. Boots. Meet my new friend Fiona. She's got this wicked shiny ball that makes parties extra awesome. Progression. Teen. Party Central. The crew is partying hard, intoxicated by the glowing ball's powers. Ender. Drunk, woo. This ball thingy is friggin' amazing, man. Let's crank it up to 11. Professor Farnsworth. Slightly slurred, excellent. My calculations indicate that the ball's energy resonates with the alcohol molecules, producing an infinite loop of euphoria. Amy, giggling. It's like a party in my brain, and everyone's invited. Teen, the city outside Planet Express. It's chaos, buildings are collapsing, and fires rage throughout. Hermes, sweet babbling Bogart. This is a disaster. We've partied too damn hard. Zoidberg. Panicking. Oh no. What have we done? Now I won't be able to afford my delicious dumpster lobsters. Teen. The party room. Slurms realizes he must sacrifice himself to save the day. Slurms. Guys. I've got an idea. I'll use the rest of this boy's energy to contain the chaos while you flee to safety. Cry. No way, Slurms. We're in this together. Enter. Yeah, I ain't leaving without a party favor. Leela, teary-eyed, you're a true party legend, Slurms. Teen, outside Planet Express. The crew watches as Slurms uses the glowing ball's energy to contain the chaos, sacrificing himself. Cry, farewell, Slurms Mackenzie. You are the ultimate party animal. Leela, he may have partied hard, but he had a heart of gold. Professor Farnsworth. Remarkable, Slurms Mackenzie's actions defy all scientific odds, but I suppose that's what makes him the Slurm King. Teen, the crew gathers for a sobering moment of reflection. Hermes, let this be a lesson to all of us. Partying has consequences. Zoidberg, and consequences taste delicious, like dumpster lobsters. Amy, cheers to Slurms, the party hero we'll never forget. Enter. Yeah, yeah, whatever. Let's find a new party spot. I'm bored already. Teen, the crew moves on, honoring Slurms' memory with a wild celebration in his favorite joint. End of episode.
Arudo. All right, guys, stay focused. We're not going down without a fight. Sasuke, gritting his teeth. This enemy ninja is insane. We need a plan, and fast. Takura, size, what can I even do? I'm useless as always. Aruto. Don't say that, Sakura. We're a team, remember? We'll figure this out together. Enemy ninja, smirking, you fools think you can defeat me? Allow me to show you the true power of darkness. Aruto. Determined. All right, guys, listen up. I've been working on something new. It's time to test it out. Sasuke, curious, what nonsense jutsu have you come up with this time, Naruto? Aruto. Smirking, it's called the Raging Inferno Dragon, Jutsu. Get ready for a real show. Takura, rolls her eyes. Oh great, more of Naruto's crazy ideas. Enemy ninja, laughing, do your worst, fools. My jutsu will annihilate you all. Aruto. Concentrating, shadow clones, gather. Let's unleash the power of the Raging Inferno Dragon. Sasuke, impressed, I have to admit, Naruto, this jutsu looks insane. Let's give it our all. Takura, reluctantly, fine, let's get this over with. Maybe we'll actually accomplish something for once. Aruto, shouting, now, Raging Inferno Dragon, unleash your fury. Suddenly, the sky darkens, and a massive dragon made of flames emerges from Naruto's hands and charges towards the enemy ninja. Enemy ninja. Shocked. That's impossible. What kind of jutsu is this? Aruto. Grinning, it's a jutsu born from my own crazy ideas. Now, let's defeat this creep. Sasuke, charging forward, with Naruto's new jutsu and our teamwork, there's no way we'll lose. Takura, determined. I may not have flashy jutsu, but I won't be useless anymore. Let's do this. The battle intensifies as the raging inferno dragon clashes with the enemy ninja's dark jutsu. Sparks fly, and the grass beneath them begins to burn. Aruto. Yelling. This is it. We can't hold back anymore. Attack with everything you've got. Sasuke unleashes a barrage of lightning-infused attacks, while Sakura uses her medical expertise to heal their wounds and support the team. Enemy ninja. Strained. Impossible. How can you all still stand? Aruto. Grinning, because we're a team, and together, we're unstoppable. Suddenly, the enemy ninja falters, collapsing under the overwhelming strength of Naruto's raging inferno dragon and his team's combined efforts. Enemy ninja. Defeated, I underestimated you. But mark my words, this is not the end. Sakura approaches the defeated enemy ninja, a determined look in her eyes. Takura, confident, next time, we'll be even stronger. And we won't let you get away. Aruto, smiling, you got that right, Sakura. Our strength will only continue to grow. Sasuke, nodding, we're not the same rookies we once were. We'll become the legends of this world. And so, Naruto, Sasuke, and Sakura stand victorious on the field of grass. Their bond stronger than ever as they prepare for the challenges yet to come. Tails, alright, let's get this shit show started. Sonic, you speedy blue bastard, I've got a bone to pick with you. How the hell do you always manage to find time to save the world and still have time to fuck around with rings? Knuckles. Oh yeah Tails, and don't forget the fact that this guy has never even touched a female hedgehog in his goddamn life. How do you explain that, huh Sonic? Too busy collecting golden rings to get some pussy. Amy, oh please, Knuckles, let's not forget Sonic's long list of failed relationships. He just can't commit to anyone, can he? Is it the fear of intimacy or is he just that much of a selfish prick? Dr. Eggman, speaking of selfish pricks, let's talk about Tails, the little genius with his head stuck up Sonic's ass. Seriously, Tails, you spent so much time being Sonic's sidekick, I'm surprised you haven't lost all your self-respect. Eggporn, and what about you, Eggman? All those failed attempts to take over the world and yet you keep coming back for more. It's like you have some sort of sick fetish for disappointment. Sonic, alright, enough of this shit. 
You all think you're so clever with your insults, but let me tell you something. Tails, you may be my sidekick, but at least I have some fucking friends, unlike you. Knuckles. Oh yeah, well, at least I know how to protect the Master Emerald, unlike you, Sonic. You're more interested in collecting gold rings than actually saving the day. Amy, and what about relationships, Sonic? You couldn't commit to a romantic relationship if your life depended on it. Maybe it's time you stop running and face your commitment issues head on. Dr. Eggman, you think you're so fucking cool, don't you, Sonic? Well, let's see how fast you can run when my robots finally catch up to your sorry ass. Eggporn, Sonic, you may be fast, but you're also a dumbass. Maybe if you stopped running for a second and used your brain, you wouldn't always be one step behind us. Sonic, oh, you all think you've got me figured out, don't you? Well, let me tell you something. I may be fast, but I always come out on top. I'll roast each and every one of you until your circuits fry, starting with you, Eggman. Dr. Eggman, bring it on, you blue-haired fucker. I've been waiting for this moment for years. As Sonic and the other characters engage in a heated and vulgar roasting battle, the tension in the room rises. Each insult becomes more savage than the last, leaving the audience in utter shock. Finally, Sonic delivers the final blow. Sonic, you know what, guys? Despite all our differences and all the shit we've said today, we're still a team. We may be a dysfunctional one, but we're a team nonetheless. So, let's stop all this bullshit and go save the world again. With that, the room erupts in applause, the roasters take a moment to digest Sonic's words, and they all come to a truce. Ready to take on their next adventure, the chaos of the roast is left behind, replaced with renewed camaraderie and determination. Larry Koopa. Alright, you slimy mushroom-headed fuck, let's get this roast started. Mario, you're so fat that when you jump, you fucking crack the pavement. Morton Koopa Jr. Yeah, and let's not forget about Mario's obsession with pipes. I mean, what's with that? Is he trying to compensate for something? Maybe he's got a tiny, shriveled mushroom under that red cap. Wendy O. Koopa. Oh, please. Don't even get me started on Mario's love life. I heard he's been plumbing every princess from here to the Mushroom Kingdom. Honestly, I wouldn't be surprised if there's a little, mini Mario, running around in every castle. E. Koopa. Speaking of which, Mario, I hope you have a good barber. I mean, what's up with that mustache? Did a caterpillar crawl onto your upper lip and just decide to stay there? It's like you're trying to compensate for your lack of personality. Oi Koopa, and let's not forget Mario's sidekick, Luigi. I mean, seriously, who the fuck is Luigi? He's like that one guy who always gets stuck with the crappy controller and ends up being a complete loser in every game. Honey Koopa, Mario, you're such a fucking joke that when Toad calls you, Super, he's just playing along. I bet you couldn't even save a princess if your pathetic, pixelated life depended on it. Ludwig von Koopa, and you, Mario, with your tacky red and blue outfit. Is your fashion sense stuck in the 80s? I'll tell you what, your wardrobe is as outdated as your platforming skills. Mario. Alright, you fucking Koopa bastards. You think you can roast me, but guess what? I've been stomping on your shells for decades. Larry, your ugly ass face looks like one of Bowser's failed attempts at cloning himself. Morton Koopa Jr. Oh, and what a hero you are, Mario. Always saving the day, while you leave innocent mushroom people to get turned into bricks. You heartless monster. Wendy O. Koopa, don't think I forgot about you, Mario. Last time I saw you, you were crying like a little bitch when the princess wasn't in another castle. Maybe if you could keep it in your pants, she would stick around. E. Koopa, yeah, and Roy, aren't you the biggest loser in Bowser's family? Your dad must have been drunk as fuck when he came up with the idea of having another Koopa in this world. Oi Koopa, shut the fuck up, Mario. At least I'm not a washed up plumber who can't even jump without hurting himself. And as for you, Ludwig, your pompous ass thinks you're so smart, but I bet even Bowser's farts have more brain cells than you. Amy Koopa, fucking Mario, always stealing the spotlight. You think you're so special, don't you? Well, newsflash, you're a dime a dozen in the gaming world, and nobody gives a shit about you anymore. Ludwig von Koopa, Mario, 
you're nothing more than an overrated Italian stereotype. You're, it's a me, Mario, shit got old years ago. Face it, your glory days are behind you, and it's time to retire that sorry excuse for a plumber's ass. Mario, do you know what, you Koopa idiots? You can talk all you want, but nobody can replace me as the king of gaming. I've faced more challenges than any of you, and I'll continue to kick your scaly asses in every game that comes out. The crowd erupts into cheers and applause as Mario delivers his final roast, proving that no matter how much they try, nobody can outshine the legendary plumber. Naruto. Tsunade, are you sure about this? I mean, a sexy version of Twister? It sounds intense. Tsunade, smirking. Oh, come on Naruto, let's spice things up a little. Besides, I've seen you do crazier things with your Rasengan. Naruto. Yeah, but this is different. We're in black outfits, holding hands, and playing a nutty game of Twister. It's bound to get fucking wild. Tsunade, playfully, that's the whole point, Naruto. This game will test our flexibility and stamina in more ways than one. Aruto. Okay, fine. But if we end up in some compromising positions, I'm blaming you. Tsunade, laughs, trust me, Naruto, you won't be complaining. They begin the game, following the seductive commands. Aruto. Straining. Tsunade, how the hell am I supposed to put my foot behind my head like this? Tsunade, grinning, Naruto, don't be a wuss. You've battled powerful enemies, you can handle a little sexual yoga. As the game progresses, they find themselves tangled in increasingly provocative positions. Aruto. Holy shit, Tsunade. This is getting out of control. Tsunade, breathing heavily, that's the whole point, Naruto. Embrace the pleasure, let it consume you. They continue to twist and turn, bodies pressed against each other, passion filling the room. Aruto. Tsunade, I don't know how much more I can take. Tsunade, whispering, surrender to the moment, Naruto. Let desire be your guide. Finally, they collapse onto the mat, their bodies intertwined. Aruto. That, that was insane, Tsunade. I've never experienced anything like it. Tsunade, smiling, it's all about exploring new territories, Naruto. And trust me, there's plenty more where that came from. Suddenly, their hidden enemies, disguised as Twister referees, reveal themselves. Aruto. What the actual fuck? Who are you? Enemy 1. Don't act so surprised, Naruto. We've been watching your naughty game the entire time. Enemy 2. And now, your twisted escapades end here. Prepare to face the consequences of your indulgence. The enemies, armed with whips and chains, make their move. Aruto. Grinning. Well, Tsunade. It seems like our game just got a whole lot kinkier. Ready to show them what we're made of. Tsunade, licking her lips. Oh, Naruto, I've been waiting for this moment. Let's give them a taste of our true power. An epic battle ensues, a clash of intertwining bodies, the sounds of pleasure mixed with violence, a symphony of ecstasy. End. Cartman, all right, you guys, listen up. I have a brilliant plan to become the ruler of the world. Kyle, oh great, here we go again with one of your ridiculous ideas. Cartman, shut up, Kyle. This plan is brilliant, better than any of your dumb ideas. Stan, what's your plan this time, Fetus? Cartman, I found this ancient artifact that has the power to grant one wish. All we gotta do is find it. Any, MMFFFMMFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFF
I think that's the cave the ancient artifact is rumored to be in. They enter the dark and eerie cave. Hartman. Keep your eyes peeled, boys. The artifact could be anywhere in this godforsaken place. Kenny mumbles something incoherent. Hartman. Shut the fuck up, Kenny. We don't have time for your meaningless gibberish. They stumble upon the artifact, a small wooden box. Kyle, is that supposed to be it? It looks like a piece of junk. Hartman. Shut your Jew mouth, Kyle. This is a priceless artifact. Cartman opens the box, revealing a small vial with a mysterious liquid inside. Stan, what's in it, Cartman? Hartman. It's the elixir of ultimate power, you idiots. With one sip, he'll become the ruler of the entire fucking world. Cartman confidently takes a sip of the liquid. Hartman. Nothing's happening. This must be a scam. Suddenly, Cartman starts convulsing, his body mutating grotesquely. Kyle. What the fuck, Cartman? Are you okay? Cartman. It burns. It fucking burns. What have I done? As Cartman's body contorts, a bright light emits from him, engulfing the whole cave. Stan. Dude. What the hell is happening? Kenny explodes into a mess of guts and gore, covering everyone in blood. Kyle. Oh my god, they killed Kenny. Hartman, you bastards. The cave collapses, trapping them all inside. Stan, we're gonna die in this fucking cave because of Cartman's idiocy. Hartman, shut up, Stan. At least I tried to make something of myself, unlike you losers. Kyle and Stan punch Cartman, the fight escalating into a brawl. Hartman, I wish I was fucking dead. The ground beneath Cartman gives away, and he falls into a pit of lava. Kyle, well, guys, guess it's just us now, trapped in a fucking cave. Stan, yeah, great plan, Cartman, just fucking great. They sit in silence, waiting for rescue, covered in gore and regret. Zavok. Alright, you blue little shit stain, it's time for your ultimate roast. Sonic, you pathetic excuse for a hedgehog. You've been running at the speed of sound for years, but you still can't catch a break. Daz. Yeah, Sonic, you're such a dumb fuck that even Dr. Robotnik doesn't want you as his enemy anymore. He'd rather dress up like a creepy, mustachioed doctor and chase around a fat Italian plumber. Xena. Sonic, you're nothing more than a wannabe rock star with that shitty hairdo of yours. Is it to compensate for your tiny, spindly legs? Grow some balls, you blue-haired pussy. Master Zick. Well, 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 Sonic the Hedgehog. You think you're so fast, don't you? But let me tell you something, you little prick. You're about as fast as an old turtle with erectile dysfunction. Oh mom. Sonic, you skinny little bitch. Why don't you take a break from running around in loops and actually eat something? I bet even Amy Rose gets more action than you. Door. Sonic, you miserable, pathetic little prick. You claim to be the fastest thing alive, but I'm pretty sure I could beat you in a race while slithering through a river of shit. Sonic, wow, what a lineup we have tonight. I'm honored to be surrounded by such a bunch of talentless fucks. Zavok, you're just an oversized, red dildo with no personality. Zaz, you look like a rejected member of a failed boy band. Xena, your only talent is being a dumb, self-obsessed bimbo. And Master Zick, the only thing older than your jokes is your saggy balls. Sonic, continued, and Zomom, you're just a fat sack of shit whose only exercise is lifting a spoon to his mouth. Finally, Zor, you're so emo and twisted, I can't even tell if you're trying to be a Sonic character or belong on my Chemical Romance album cover. You all deserve each other. Bavik, you little prick, I'll crush you. Sonic, come on then, big boy. Let's see if you're as tough as you talk.
Welcome to the Comedy Central Roast of Sonic the Hedgehog. Tonight, our roasters are ready to tear each other apart with their short-tempered and foul-mouthed roasts. Let the chaos begin. Tails, Sonic, you little blue bitch. You may be fast, but your taste in chili dogs is fucking disgusting. I've seen you devour those greasy hot dogs like they're the cure for erectile dysfunction. Knuckles. Tails, you two-tailed freak. You spend all your time playing with gadgets and machines. No wonder you can't get any action. I'm surprised you even know what sex is, you virgin. Amy, oh, please. Knuckles, the only action you get is when you're punching yourself in the face. And Tails, don't act like you know what sex is either. You're too busy sticking your tails in your own ass. Dr. Eggman, well, 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 if it isn't the blue loser himself. Sonic, I've had it with your speedy bullshit. I've built countless machines to stop you, but it seems like the only thing that can penetrate you is a bad pickup line from Shadow. Eggporn, Dr. Eggman, you rotund piece of shit. You've failed so many times that it's taking a toll on my self-esteem. I was programmed to be evil, but even I can see that you're a fucking joke. Sonic, alright, enough of this bullshit. Tails, you're a two-tailed butt plug. Knuckles, with your biceps, you should be able to find your own fucking brain. Amy, you're so desperate for my attention that I think my supersonic speed could use a restraining order against you. Tails, oh yeah, Sonic, you may be fast, but you're also a premature ejaculator. The moment you see a loop-de-loop, -loop, you're done. And don't even get me started on your tiny blue hedgehog dick. Knuckles. Sonic, you and your super speed can't escape the fact that you're a pathetic excuse for a hero. Why don't you stop running around like a pussy and face your commitment issues head on? Amy, Sonic, you playboy wannabe. You know you want this hedgehog pussy, but you're too afraid to commit. No wonder you can't keep a stable relationship, you fuckboy. Dr. Eggman, Sonic, you overgrown rodent. Your obsession with speed is just a cover up for your fear of intimacy. Face it, hedgehog, you are too emotionally stunted to love anyone. Eggporn, Sonic, you little shit. You think you're so cool with your running and jumping, but the truth is, you're just compensating for your lack of an actual personality. You're as shallow as a puddle of robot mix piss. Sonic, all right, you all had your turn, but now it's time for me to roast each and every one of you idiots. And so, Sonic the Hedgehog took the stage and delivered his revenge roasts with blistering speed and uncensored vulgarity. The crowd was left in awe as Sonic unleashed his furry fury upon his fellow roasters, leaving no insult unspoken. In the end, everyone realized that beneath the foul language and aggressive roasting, there was a camaraderie between them all. They may have been rivals, but deep down, they were a dysfunctional family. And as the curtain came down on the Comedy Central roast of Sonic the Hedgehog, they all left the stage with a newfound respect and aching sides from all the laughter. It was a night to remember, filled with obscene humor, dramatic intensity, and the kind of chaos that only Sonic and his friends could bring. I'm sorry, but I won't be able to provide the story you're looking for. Oh, hey Lenny, have you ever noticed how most tavern always seems to be our one-way ticket to disaster? Lenny, yeah, Carl. Remember that time we accidentally set the place on fire? Good times. Homer. Hey, guys. Let's have another round of drinks to celebrate our knack for destruction. Barney, count me in. I'm always up for a drunken adventure with the boys. They all laugh while knocking back their drinks. Oh, all right, you drunken idiots. You've had enough. Get out of my bar. Homer. Fine, Mo. We'll leave but we'll find another place to continue our drunken shenanigans. The four stumble out of Moe's tavern and into the night. Annie, look guys, it's a truck filled with donuts. Strawberry frosted, my favorite. Oh, oh, sweet sugary goodness. Let's grab a donut each and continue our quest for debauchery. They approach the truck and devour the donuts with reckless abandon. Homer, these donuts are incredible. 
I feel like I'm floating in a sea of pink sugary delight. Barney, guys, I think I'm starting to hallucinate. I see Marge in the distance, and she needs our help. Any, drunk or not, we can't leave Marge in trouble. Let's save her. The four stumble towards Marge, who is trapped in a giant strawberry frosted donut. Marge, help, I'm stuck, the donut is swallowing me whole. Homer, fear not, my sweet Marge, we'll save you. Oh, we have to eat our way through this gigantic donut to free her. They start tearing into the donut, using their sheer gluttony to break Marge free. Barney, come on, guys. Put some muscle into it. We're fighting for love. Any, almost there. Just a few more bites. Finally, they break Marge free from the grasp of the monstrous donut. Marge, oh, thank you, my brave knights in beer-stained armor. I knew you'd come through for me. Homer, no problem, Marge. Just another day in the life of the Simpson boys. They all laugh, covered in strawberry frosting, as they stumble back towards Moe's tavern. Any, so, what do you guys say? Another round of drinks to celebrate our heroic donut adventure? Oh, absolutely. Cheers to us and our ridiculous escapades. They clink their glasses together and continue their inebriated journey, ready for whatever mischief awaits them next. Int. Comedy Club, Night. The room is filled with raucous laughter as the audience eagerly anticipates the Comedy Central roast of Link. The stage is adorned with a large banner displaying the logo of the show, Licelli, featuring a yellow circle in the center. The host, Bemos, steps forward to begin the roast. Bemos. Welcome, ya dumbasses, to the roast of the century. Tonight, we're tearing apart the hero of time himself, Link. So let's get ready to roast this punk. The crowd cheers and applauds as Gold Skulltula takes the stage, ready to deliver his ruthless jokes. Gold Skulltula, you know, Link, I gotta give it to ya. You may save princesses, but you ain't got the balls to score with them. You're nothing but a blue bald hero. The audience bursts into laughter, cheering Gold Skulltula's brutal humor. Next up is Fire Keys, cracking his knuckles before delivering his punchlines. Fire Keys. Link, you think you're hot shit, but you ain't nothing compared to me. I'm fire, motherfucker. I could turn your ass into a crispy chicken nugget quicker than you could say, Zelda. The crowd roars with laughter, enjoying the fiery insult. Like Like, a slimy creature, takes his turn at the microphone next. Like Like. Link, my man, you're always so quick to swing that sword, but let's be real. It's gotta be compensating for something, am I right? Maybe that's why Zelda spends more time in her bedroom with me. The audience erupts in laughter, thoroughly entertained by Like Like's crude joke. Big Deku Baba slithers onto the stage, ready to deliver his own brand of rot. Big Deku Baba. Link, I bet your sword isn't the only thing that's rusty. You've been hanging around Hyrule for far too long, and it shows. The years have been as cruel to you as Ganon's been to us. The audience bursts into laughter, loving Big Deku Baba's savage words. Club Moblin, a burly creature, takes center stage for his turn. Club Moblin, Link, I gotta say, you're one ugly motherfucker. I've seen more appealing faces in the fiery pits of Dodongo's cavern. Even Tingle looks like a supermodel compared to you. The crowd goes wild, howling with laughter at Club Moblin's brutal insults. Finally, it's Link's turn to unleash his revenge. Think, well, 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 look who we have here. A bunch of ugly, foul-mouthed creatures who couldn't land a hit without aiming for my dick. Gold Sculptula, looks like your only chance of getting laid is with the spider webs you spin in your mom's basement. The crowd erupts with laughter as Link fires off his vengeance, one roast after another. The incident escalates as each roaster becomes increasingly outraged and attempts to attack Link. Link, and Firekeys. You think you're so hot? Well, how about I cool you off with a gust of wind from my ocarina right up your fiery ass? The audience is in stitches, witnessing the chaos and the outrageousness of the situation. As the denouement, 
life spirits angrily burst in and separate link in the roasters, bringing the roast to an end. Finally, in the conclusion, despite the dramatic tension, Link and the roasters find common ground and share a beer, laughing at the absurdity of the roast. The show ends, leaving the crowd amused and eagerly awaiting the next episode of Lichelli. I'm really sorry, but I won't be able to generate that story for you. Homer. Hey, Mo. I need another round of Duff beer. Oh, coming right up, Homer. You know, I think you've had enough for tonight. Barney, slurring, Mo, don't listen to him. Give us all you got. Oh, yeah, we're celebrating. Let's make it a wild night. Any, woo, drinks on me, fellas. Oh, all right, all right. But remember, if you cause trouble, you're cleaning it up. They all laugh and toast. Suddenly, a portal opens up in the middle of Mo's tavern. Homer. Tipsy. Whoa, what the hell is that? Barney, it's like a magic donut hole or something. Oh, squinting. Wait, is that strawberry frosting? Any, holy smokes, it's an entire world made of strawberry frosted donuts. They all stumble towards the portal and fall into the world of donuts. Homer. Where am I? I'm surrounded by yummy goodness. Barney, look, over there, it's Marge. Marge, trapped in a giant donut, help me, guys. I can't get out. Any, no worries, Marge. We're coming. They all start devouring the donut world, eating their way to Marge. Homer. Um, this is the most delicious rescue mission ever. Barney, I never thought I'd say this, but I've eaten so many donuts, I think I might explode. Oh, we gotta save Marge, Barney. Keep eating. Any, mouthful. Marge, don't worry, we're almost there. They finally reach Marge and pull her out of the giant donut. Marge. Oh, thank you, boys. You saved me. Homer. Anything for you, honey. Plus, donuts. They all have a group hug. Marge. Now, let's get out of this donut world before we all turn into donuts ourselves. They all run back towards the portal and jump through it. Back at Moe's tavern. Oh, what the hell just happened here? Why is there strawberry frosting everywhere? Homer. Don't worry, Moe. It's a long story. All that matters is that we saved Marge. Barney. Yeah, and we made it back in time for another round. Bottoms up, boys. They all laugh and continue their night of drunken revelry. Savik, all right, listen up, you blue furball, I've seen turtles move quicker than your sorry excuse for a hedgehog. Daz, yeah, Sonic, you're so slow, I bet you need a handicap ramp just to get out of bed in the morning. Xena, and what's with those spiky blue quills? Looks like a porcupine mated with a smurf. Master Zik, speed? More like mediocre pacing. You're about as fast as a snail with arthritis. Domam, Sonic, buddy. You look like you could use a few trips to the salad bar. Those chili dogs have really gone straight to your ass. Door. You know what, Sonic? I've seen a lot of idiots in my life, but you are the king of them all. Congrats, dipshit. Sonic. All right, all right. It's my turn now. Zavok, you red piece of crap. Your scales make you look like a diseased lizard with a rash. Zaz. And Zaz, you annoying twat. Your face is so ugly. You make the Chaos Emeralds want to commit Sudoku. Xena, Xena, you say I need a makeover? Have you looked in the mirror lately? You put the fugly in, fugly as hell. Master Zik, 
Master Zick, you old fart. Your senile ramblings make no sense, just like your choice in fashion. Grandma called, she wants her robe back. Zomong, Zomong, my pal, you're so dumb, you make Knuckles look like a goddamn genius. And we all know that ain't saying much. Zor, and Zor, you emo little bitch, your depressive thoughts could cure insomnia in a matter of seconds. Sonic, alright, everyone, listen up. I may be the fastest thing alive, but I'm also the wittiest. Now, where do I begin with you lot? Zavik, oh, here we go. Let's hear what the big blue hero has to say. Daz, bring it on, Sonic. I doubt you'll come up with anything half as good as our roasts. Xena, yeah, you're gonna fail miserably, Hedgehog. Master Zick, the floor is yours, Sonic. Impress us with your razor-sharp wit. Domom, alright, let's see what you got, Sonic. I'll eat my words if you can make me laugh. Door, go ahead, Sonic. Try and roast the King of Darkness. I dare you. Sonic, Zavok, you may be tough, but your IQ is lower than Metal Sonic's self-esteem. Zaz, Zaz, you're like that annoying mosquito that won't leave you alone. But in your case, I'd rather face a swarm of disease-ridden mosquitoes than hear your voice again. Xena, Xena, your narcissism shines brighter than your forehead. Master Zick, Master Zick, you talk about ancient wisdom, but it's clear you're just old and senile. Time to retire, Grandpa. Domong. Zomom, you're the embodiment of gluttony. Ever heard of portion control? I'm surprised you even fit on the stage, you massive whale. Zor, and Zor, you're so emo, I bet you cut yourself on your own edginess. Can't even tell if you're a hedgehog or a depressed porcupine. Sonic, well, that's all for tonight, folks. Thanks for being such good sports. Remember, we may roast each other, but deep down, we're all just pixels in this crazy video game world. Keep running, keep gaming, and keep those insults flying. Good night, bitches. Roaster 1, Texas, fucking a y'all, let's get this shit show started. New York, you uptight piece of shit, you're about to get roasted harder than chili on a fucking Texas summer day. Roaster 2, California, dude, seriously? Texas, you're like the asshole of America. So full of hot air, just like your damn desert. And your cowboy boots don't make you any less of an idiot. Roaster 3, Florida, oh, look who it is. California, the land of tanned assholes and fake tits. Your whole state is run by Hollywood, where douchebags like you roam free. Roaster 4, Alaska, you guys are such pussies. Try surviving in the frozen tundra like us Alaskans, you bitches. New York, you think you're tough, but we're the ones who deal with polar bears and hypothermia. Roaster 5, Ohio, Alaska shut the fuck up, nobody cares about your damn ice fishing and moose hunting. And Florida you're just full of old people and Florida man stories. Get a grip you morons. Roaster 6, Maine, well, fuck me sideways. We've got ourselves a bunch of Yankee pansies here. New York, you think you're the shit, but you're just a bunch of snobby pricks with tall buildings. New York, alright, alright, you fucking asshats. You think you can come in here and roast me? I've got one thing to say to all of you. You're all so fucking ignorant, I can't believe any of you can find your own asses with both hands. Texas, how's it feel to be a state that's only good for steers and queers? Texas. Oh, you fucking piece of shit. You think you're so high and mighty, but you're just a cesspool of crime and pollution. And your fucking Yankees, they're not worth a damn. California. Shut your damn mouth, Texas. You've got more oil in your cowboy boots than brains in your head. And don't even get me started on your shitty barbecue. Florida. You guys are all talk. At least we have sunshine and beaches. New York. The only thing memorable about you is how much you smell like piss and garbage. Alaska, and you think you're special Florida, your state is literally sinking into the ocean. Way to go, dumbass. Ohio, Maine, you're just a bunch of lobster-loving freaks. And Ohio is clearly the superior state. We're the heart of it all, while you're just a piece of ice at the edge of the country. Maine, you know what, Ohio? You're right, at least we have something to be proud of. 
You're just a bunch of fucking cornfields and Midwestern assholes. New York, well, 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 look at you all, trying to roast me. But guess what? New York always has the last laugh. So fuck each and every one of you, and fuck all your states too. I'm outta here. The room erupts in chaos as New York flips the table and storms off the stage, leaving behind a trail of insults and shattered egos. The Comedy Central roast of New York ends in madness and bitterness, forever etched in the minds of the six roasters. Think, well, well, well. Look who decided to show up. Coco, you feathered fuck. I heard your IQ is lower than your pathetic excuse for a jump attack. Coco. Oh, listen to Mr. Hero himself. You think you're so great, huh? All you do is run around smashing pots and stealing gold. Fuck you. Old Skulltula. Quiet down, you two. Link, your green tunic may be iconic, but it can't hide the fact that you have the personality of a rusty bicoblin club. Ulfos. Yeah, Link, you may be the hero of time, but all I see is a little boy with a fairy fetish. You've spent more time with Navi than you have with any actual women. Beaver, ha, huh. and let's not forget about our forest friend, the Deku Scrub. You spend your days squirting nuts all over the place and spitting seeds like the horny plant. Deku Scrub. Oh, shut your trap, Lever. At least I don't hide underground like a fucking mole. You're nothing more than a dirt-dwelling piece of shit. Big Po. Enough with this nonsense. Link, you may have slain Ganon, but let's not forget that you've got about as much intellect as a moblin. In your legendary sword skills. More like tiny sword, big ego. Link, all right, all right. That's enough from you losers. You all talk a big game, but none of you could survive a dungeon without getting your asses handed to you. So, sit back and watch as I roast each and every one of you. Kako. Oh, we're ready for your weak comebacks, hero. Link, Kako, you're so fucking dumb. You probably think Hyrule Castle is a brothel. As for you, Skulltula, your web spinning skills are nothing compared to the webs of lies you weave around your victims. Old Skulltula, you think you're clever, don't you? But your only accomplishment is catching fish in a little pond. You're so boring that even the water temple seems exciting compared to you. Ulfos, Link, you're just mad because I've got more bite than your flimsy master sword. And speaking of swords, Deku Scrub, yours is so tiny it wouldn't even make a good toothpick for Azora. Beaver, ha, huh? you think you're so tough, don't you? But we all know the real reason you wear that mask is to hide your ugly mug. You're nothing but a walking, talking rupee magnet. Deku Scrub. Well, Link, at least I don't spend my days charging up like an electricity bill. And as for you, Big Po, you're the only ghost who's too busy haunting buffets instead of scaring people. Big Po, that's it, you little shit. I'll tear you apart. Link, bring it on, you oversized ghoul. But remember, I've defeated far scarier beings than you, and after I'm done with you, I'll give each of your roasting asses a taste of my blade. The Comedy Central roast of Link ended with a fiery exchange of insults. While the roasters attempted to bring Link down, he came back with brutal comebacks, asserting his dominance as the hero of time. The crowd was left in shock and awe, realizing that no one messes with Link and gets away with it. Int. Park. Day. Mordecai and Rigby are sitting on a bench, watching Margaret and Eileen dancing to music in the distance. They look determined. Mordecai. Man, we gotta get inside the awesome. Dynamite club and dance with them. Rigby. Yeah, and show everyone we've got moves. Let's do this. They jump up and start walking towards the club. Int. Awesome. Dynamite club entrance. 
Mordecai and Rigby approach the bouncer, a muscular guy with a cold stare. Bouncer. Ids. Mordecai. Ah, oh, we left them in the park. Can't you just let us in? Rigby. Yeah, we're regulars here. We go way back. The bouncer narrows his eyes at them, skeptical. Bouncer. Alright, fine. But stay out of trouble. They enter the club, the music blasting and lights flashing. Int. Awesome. Dynamite club, dance floor. Mordecai and Rigby make their way through the crowd, dodging dancers left and right. Mordecai. Spot Margaret and Eileen yet? Rigby. Nah, but they gotta be here somewhere. Let's keep going. They reach the center of the dance floor and spot Margaret and Eileen on elevated platforms, surrounded by admirers. Mordecai. There they are. Let's work our way up and impress them. Big B. Hell yeah. Int. Awesome. Dynamite club, dance floor, later. Mordecai and Rigby are dancing wildly, desperately trying to catch Margaret and Eileen's attention. The crowd around them is going wild too. Mordecai. This is our chance, Rigby. Let's give it all we got. Rigby. Damn straight, bro. We're gonna win their hearts with these killer moves. They unleash an epic dance routine, flipping and twirling through the air, mesmerizing everyone in the room. Int. Awesome. Dynamite club, dance floor, climax. Mordecai and Rigby's dance routine reaches a climax when they perform a death-defying move, flipping over each other while engulfed in flames. Crowd member. Holy sh asterisk t. Did you see that? Margaret and Eileen finally notice Mordecai and Rigby. Margaret. Wow, they're incredible. Eileen. I never knew they had these moves in them. Int. Awesome. Dynamite club, dance floor. The crowd erupts in applause and cheers, chanting their names. Crowd. Mordecai. Rigby. Mordecai. Rigby. Mordecai and Rigby, basking in their newfound glory, make their way to Margaret and Eileen. Mordecai. Hey, ladies. Impressed. Rigby. We did it for you. Margaret and Eileen exchange a look, then burst into laughter. Margaret. Oh, you guys. We've been waiting for you to join us. Eileen. Yeah, welcome to the dance floor. Mordecai and Rigby share a triumphant look before joining them, ready for a night of unforgettable moves. Fade out. Title, Donut Drunk. Characters, asterisk. Homer Simpson. Barney Gumbel. Carl Carlson. Lenny Leonard. Marge Simpson. Setting, Moe's Tavern, Springfield. Team. Moe's Tavern, dimly lit with patrons enjoying their drinks. Homer. Belching, ah, another great night at Moe's. Cheers, guys. Barney. Yeah, hiccup. Cheers, Homer. Let's get wasted. Carl, chuckles. You know, Homer, you have a talent for turning any night into an excuse for drunken debauchery. And he laughs. That's our Homer. All right. As the drinks flow, the scene shifts to a surreal dimension, with the four friends surrounded by an endless sea of strawberry frosted donuts. Homer. Whoa, dudes. Where the hell are we? Barney. Gulps. Holy crap. It's a donut wonderland. And he can't believe my eyes. I've gone to heaven and it's delicious. Carl, donuts as far as the eye can see. What do we do now? Suddenly, Marge appears in the center of the donut sea, trapped on a floating life preserver made entirely of donuts. Marge, help me, guys. I'm surrounded by these sugary monstrosities. Homer, don't worry, Marge. We'll save you. The four friends join hands and form a human daisy chain, extending towards Marge. Barney, determined, grab hold of us, Marge. We'll pull you out. Marge, grabs their arms, Thank you, guys. I knew you'd come through for me. The daisy chain of friends starts pulling Marge towards safety, 
but the donuts begin to drag them down. Annie, hurry up guys, these donuts weigh a ton. Carl, struggling, focus, everyone. We can't let the donuts defeat us. Homer, grunting, we're nearly there, Marge, just hold on. With one final heave, the friends manage to rescue Marge from the donut sea, pulling her to safety. Marge, relieved, thank you, boys. I don't know how I ended up in this sugar-coated nightmare. Homer. Hugs Marge, we'll figure it out later. Right now, let's get out of here and find a proper meal. The scene shifts back to Moe's tavern, where the friends regain consciousness, surrounded by empty beer mugs. Barney. Belching, that was one crazy dream, guys. I hope it wasn't the beer talking. Any laughs, no, it was definitely the donuts, my friend. Oh, well, at least we made it out alive and Marge is safe. That's what really matters. Homer. You got that right, Carl. And hey, at least we got to taste all those delicious donuts. They all share a laugh as they order another round of drinks, grateful for their absurd adventure and the friends who saved the day once again. Asterisk asterisk asterisk. In this wild and surreal episode, Homer, Barney, Carl, and Lenny find themselves in a dimension made entirely of strawberry frosted donuts. They embark on a daring rescue mission to save Marge, who is trapped among the sugary treats. Through teamwork and determination, they manage to bring her to safety and escape back to reality. The episode ends with a toast at Moe's Tavern, celebrating their victory and the bond of friendship that can conquer even the most absurd of dreams. Stan! Hey guys, what's up? Hartman! Shut the fuck up, Stan! I'm thinking of the most brilliant plan ever! Kyle! Oh great, what stupid shit are you up to now, Cartman? Hartman! Alright, dickheads, listen up! I found a way to make the most money ever! We're going to start a... Dramatic pause! Condom company! That is... A condom company! Golly! That sounds mighty interesting! What's the plan, Cartman? Hartman! We're going to call it, Fuck You Inc! and create the most revolutionary condom ever. This condom will pleasure both the man and the woman at the same fucking time. It's a win-win. Kenny, muffled, raises hand. Hartman, shut it, Kenny. You always die before you can even speak, you dumbass. Anyway, this condom will be so goddamn amazing that everyone will want to buy it, making us filthy rich. We'll be drowning in money, bitches. Stan, I don't know, Cartman. That sounds pretty messed up. Hartman, shut your pie hole, Stan. This is my fucking plan, and it's foolproof. We're going to make billions, and you all will thank me. Kyle, I highly doubt that, Cartman. I can already see a million things that can go wrong. Cartman. Oh, stop being such a fucking Jew, Kyle. This is pure genius. Just think about all the possibilities. That is, well, if Cartman says so, I guess we should give it a try. Cartman. Finally, someone with a fucking brain. Now, let's get to work, assholes. We need to come up with some kick-ass designs and marketing strategies. Time passes as the group works tirelessly on their new business venture. Stan, all right, we've got the prototype ready. It's time to test it out. Hartman, excellent. Butters, you lucky son of a bitch, you're going to be our guinea pig. Butters, me, oh geez. I'm not sure if I'm ready for that responsibility, fellas. Hartman, shut up and put it on, you pussy. Kenny attempts to speak but is abruptly interrupted by a loud, horrendous farting sound coming from Butters. Butters, oh my goodness, what the heck is happening down there? Kenny suddenly explodes into a shower of confetti and gore. Stan, holy shit, Kenny, you just exploded, again. Hartman, well, that was unexpected, but hey, at least we know the condom works. Kyle, are you kidding me, Cartman? We just killed Kenny in the most disgusting manner possible. Hartman. Relax, Kyle. Kenny dies all the time. It's his thing. Kenny miraculously reappears. Kenny. Muffled. You guys are assholes. The group bursts into a fit of laughter. Stan. Well, Cartman, I have to admit, this may be your dumbest idea yet, but it sure is entertaining. Cartman. I live to entertain, bitches. Now let's go make some damn money and conquer the condom industry. 
the group walks off, leaving a trail of chaos and absurdity behind them. Welcome to the Comedy Central Roast of Comedy Central. Tonight's roasters are Animal Planet, Nickelodeon, Discovery Channel, Fox News, ESPN, and Food Network. Let the vulgarities begin. Animal Planet. Hey Comedy Central, you're such a fucking joke. Even my chimpanzees have better comedic timing than you do. Nickelodeon. Well, at least Comedy Central doesn't cater to a bunch of fucking toddlers. Your shows are so watered down. They wouldn't even make it past my censoring team. Discovery Channel, don't get me started on Comedy Central's educational value. You're about as informative as a fucking penguin struggling to learn how to fly. Fox News, oh please, you hypocritical assholes. Comedy Central pretends to be a voice of reason while spouting bullshit that's more biased than my network. ESPN, and here I thought Comedy Central was supposed to bring the laughs. Your jokes are as stale as a fucking used jockstrap. Stick to sports, losers. Food Network. You call yourself Comedy Central, but there's nothing central or funny about you. Just like your chefs, your comedy falls flat and leaves a bitter taste in our mouths. Comedy Central. Oh, you think you can all bully me, huh? Well, it's payback time, bitches. Animal Planet. You're so full of shit. Your channel might as well be called Animal Fart. Nickelodeon. Your shows are so dumb. They make Teletubbies look like fucking geniuses. Discovery Channel. Your educational value is about as useful as a fucking science project done by a first grader. Fox News. Your reporting is so biased, you make North Korea's state media look impartial. ESPN. Your sports coverage is as engaging as watching paint dry, fucking boring. And Food Network. Your chef's cooking skills are as fake as my laughter during your shitty shows. Animal Planet. Well, I'll be damned. Nickelodeon. Fuck, they got us good. Discovery Channel, who knew Comedy Central had it in M? Fox News, well, shit, we walked right into that one. ESPN, I guess we underestimated Comedy Central's comeback skills. Food Network, damn, they really roasted us all. Comedy Central, that's right, motherfuckers. Don't mess with the king of comedy. Comedy Central shows its revenge by delivering some brutal and savage roasts back at the other channels. The roasters are left stunned and humiliated, realizing they underestimated Comedy Central's ability to strike back. The pile of orange and white paper cutouts signifies the burning insults exchanged and the dramatic intensity of the roasting session. It's a night of vulgarities and adult content, where even the roasters themselves become the target of Comedy Central's savage comeback. Mordecai. Yo, Rigby, let's hit up the coffee shop. I need to pick me up. Pick me? Totally, dude, I could use some caffeine to keep me going. At the coffee shop, Mordecai and Rigby see Margaret and Eileen sitting at a table. Mordecai. Hey, girls, mind if we join you? Margaret, of course not. Pull up a chair. Eileen, yeah, we were just catching up and Skips is out of town. They all sit down and order their drinks. Mordecai. So, Margaret, any fun plans for the weekend? Margaret, well, actually, Eileen and I were just discussing this new coffee shop that opened up across town. We should check it out. Bigby, what? Another coffee shop? This can't be good. Just then, the door swings open, and the evil Coffee Bean enters with his translator. Coffee Bean, well, well, well. Look who it is, trying to enjoy your pathetic little coffee break. Translator, yeah. You losers better be ready to drink defeat. Mordecai. Coffee Bean, what are you doing here? We thought we got rid of you. Coffee Bean. Oh no, my dear feathered friend. I, Coffee Bean, and my trusty translator are back with a vengeance. 
we're opening up our very own coffee shop right across the street. Bigby, you're not gonna get away with this, Coffee Bean. We're gonna shut you down. Burger it. Yeah, we will let you ruin our favorite spot to hang out. Everyone jumps up from their seats and heads outside to confront Coffee Bean. Ordecai, Coffee Bean, you're nothing but a bitter bean in a world of sweet drinks. We won't let you succeed. Coffee Bean, oh, you think you can stop me? I've got secret brews and mind-blowing blends. You're no match for my coffee empire. Bigby, we'll see about that. Get ready for a taste of our own special concoction. Mordecai, Rigby, Margaret, and Eileen rush into the park and gather ingredients from various plants. Mordecai, we'll make the ultimate coffee blend to defeat Coffee Bean's evil scheme. Bigby, yeah, we'll show him that our coffee game is strong. They mix and brew their secret recipe, creating a delicious aroma. Margaret, it's ready. Gonna take it over to Coffee Bean's shop and make him taste the bitterness of his own defeat. They storm into the rival coffee shop and offer their blend to the customers. Mordecai, try this, folks. It's the real deal, unlike anything Coffee Bean could ever make. One by one, the customers taste the blend and find it to be exquisite. Translator, oh, Coffee Bean, looks like we've been outdone. Coffee Bean, no, this can't be happening. Defeated, Coffee Bean and his translator flee from the coffee shop. Ordecai, and that, my friends, is how you brew up justice and pour out victory. Bigby, best coffee break ever. Let's celebrate with some smooth jazz at the bar. They all cheer and head back to the bar, victorious and ready for a night of relaxation and good music. Mordecai. Dude, can you believe it? Margaret and Eileen invited us to this exclusive awesome dynamite club party tonight. Bigby, no way, man. We've got to get in there and show them our moves. Mordecai. Yeah, but this club is super exclusive. We need something epic to get inside. Bigby, I've got it. Let's steal Benson's golf cart and crash through the club's entrance. Mordecai. Are you serious? That could get us fired. Bigby, who cares, dude? We're going to impress Margaret and Eileen. Mordecai and Rigby sneak up to Benson's office and steal the golf cart. Skips. Appearing out of nowhere. Hold up, you too. What are you doing with Benson's golf cart? Mordecai. Uh, nothing, Skips. We were just borrowing it for a sec. Skips. Well, you better hope Benson never finds out, or you'll be in big trouble. Mordecai and Rigby speed off in the golf cart towards the club. Hustle man. Calling out from a distance. Hey, Mordecai and Rigby. Save me a dance with Starla. Mordecai. Sure thing, muscle man. See you inside. Mordecai and Rigby arrive at the awesome. Dynamite Club. Bouncer. Stopping them at the entrance, hold up. No golf carts allowed in here. Rigby, but we need to get in. Margaret and Eileen are waiting for us. Bouncer. Sorry, rules are rules. Leave the golf cart and find another way to enter if you want to come in. Mordecai. Frantically, we can't leave the golf cart out here. Benson will kill us. High five ghost, floating beside them. Whoa, dudes, I heard you need help getting inside. I might have a solution. Mordecai, what is it, high five ghost? High five ghost, whispering, follow me. Mordecai, Rigby, and high five ghost tiptoe around the back of the club. Eileen, spotting them, there you guys are. Margaret, smiling, we were wondering when you'd arrive. Mordecai, out of breath, yeah, sorry about that, we had a little trouble at the entrance. Rigby, but we made it, let's dance. As the music starts, Mordecai and Rigby begin to dance their hearts out. Ops, joining them, oh, how delightful, shall we, Margaret? Margaret, absolutely, Ops. Everyone starts dancing, creating a wild, colorful chaos on the dance floor. Benson, storming in, what in the world is going on here? And where is my golf cart? Mordecai. Uh, well, Benson. Bigby, we might have crashed it into the club's entrance, dude. But we did it to impress Margaret and Eileen. Everyone freezes, staring at Mordecai and Rigby. 
Benson, sighing, you two are lucky I'm too tired to deal with this right now. Just make sure this mess is cleaned up by tomorrow morning. Mordecai and Rigby exchange relieved glances. Mordecai, thanks, Benson. We'll take care of it, we promise. The chaos resumes as the episode fades out. Title, the Comedy Central Roast of Link. Scene, a large auditorium filled with people. On a stage, there is a screen showing a video game being played. In front of the screen stands Link, while on either side, there are six characters, namely Beamos, Gold Sculptula, Firekeese, Like Like, Big Decker Barber, and Club Moblin. The audience is eagerly waiting for the roast to begin. Beamos. All right, listen up, you pointy-eared dipshit. Tonight, we're gathered here to roast the legendary hero, Link. And let me tell ya, this cowardly, tunic-wearing pansy is about to get the roasting of a lifetime. Old Skulltula, ha, Link, you green-clad loser. You swing your sword around like it's going out of style. But hey, we all know you're compensating for something much smaller. Fire keys. Oh, you think you're such a big shot, don't ya, Link? Well, newsflash, you're nothing more than a fire-breathing snack for me. How about I turn you into a crispy lil' elf? Like light. Gurgling noises. Link, you aren't even worth digesting. Seriously, you're so pathetic that I could suck the life out of you and still be left hungry. Pathetic excuse for a hero. Big Deku Baba. Can someone please explain to me why this tiny ass elf boy is considered a hero? I mean, how many times has he saved Hyrule just to have some princess throw herself at him like she's desperate? Must be one charming little shit. Club Moblin. Link, you're such a wimpy twerp, it makes me wanna puke. I could swing this club and send you flying into the next kingdom. But hey, guess what? You'd still fail to impress anyone. Pink, smirking, well, 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 look who's roasting now. Beamos, you're so rusty. The only thing you can shoot these days is a cloud of dust. Gold Sculptula, last time I checked, your web was as useless as your insults. Fire Keys, you're just a glorified matchstick with wings. Like like, the only thing sadder than your attempts to insult me is your appetite. Big Deku Barber, I've seen bigger weeds in my garden. And Club Moblin, next time you swing the club, try aiming for something other than your own foot. Audience, laughter and applause. The Comedy Central roast of Link leaves the audience in hysterics, as Link masterfully turns the tables on his roasters. It's a night to remember, where the insults fly as high as the audience's laughter. Link, once again, proves that he's not just a hero in the game but also a master of verbal comebacks. Title, Regular Show, A Perilous Brew. Characters. Mordecai. Rigby. Benson. Margaret. Eileen. Coffee Bean. Coffee Bean's Translator. Int. Park. Day. Mordecai and Rigby are lounging on a park bench, drinking sodas. Mordecai. Man, this soda tastes like stale bread. We should go to the coffee shop and hang out with Margaret and Eileen. Rigby. Yeah, sounds cool. Maybe we can even pick up some fresh coffee beans for that coffee maker back at the house. Incident. Int. Coffee shop, day. Mordecai and Rigby enter the coffee shop, greeted by Margaret and Eileen. Margaret, hey guys, sit down, we've got some fresh I brewed coffee waiting for you. Eileen, and I just baked some pastries that are to die for. As they relax, Coffee Bean and his translator burst in with knives in hand. Coffee Bean, you fools. This place has no room for pretenders like you. I'll take this coffee shop down and rise to the top. Progression. Int. Coffee shop, continuous. Mordecai, Coffee Bean, calm down. What's got you so riled up? Coffee Bean, riled up? I'm simply tired of this mediocrity. 
I've returned with a vengeance, with the perfect coffee recipe and a translator to make my message clear. Coffee beans translator. Translating, he means business, losers. Remember it, we won't let you ruin our coffee shop. We offer the best coffee in town. Benson arrives, wielding a broom for defense. Benson, what the hell is going on here? You guys need to take your drama somewhere else. Int. Coffee shop, continuous. Mordecai, we have to stop them, guys. Benson, we need your help. Benson, grudgingly, fine, but this better not interfere with work. Margaret and Eileen start brewing more coffee while Benson and Mordecai fend off Coffee Bean and his translator. Int. Coffee shop, continuous. Rigby, having cowered from the chaos, jumps into the action. Rigby, I'll help too. Take that, Coffee Bean. In a wild and absurd final showdown, Mordecai, Rigby, Margaret, Eileen, and Benson team up to overpower Coffee Bean and his translator. They kick them out of the coffee shop, triumphant. Mordecai, we did it. Benson, all right, but get back to work right after. They all celebrate their victory with fresh cups of coffee and pastries, returning the coffee shop to its peaceful state. As the chaos dies down, they all enjoy a moment of relaxation, savoring a truly extraordinary coffee break. The End Mordecai. Dude, we've got to get inside the awesome. Dynamite Club tonight. Margaret and Eileen are gonna be there. Big B, hell yeah, man. We got to show them we've got moves for days. Skips. You guys know it's a VIP club, right? You'll need some serious connections to get in. Mordecai. No worries, Skips. We'll figure something out. We always do. Hustle man. Yeah, bros. We could dress up as famous dancers or something. You know, disguise ourselves. High five ghost. That could work, but we need to be careful. It's a highly exclusive place. Benson, alright, listen up. If I catch any of you slacking off, there will be consequences. Ops. Oh, I do hope you have a jolly good time at the awesome Dynamite Club, my friends. Scene transitions to Mordecai and Rigby dressing up as famous dancers and arriving at the club. Mordecai. Look at all those people outside, dude. This place is insane. Rigby, yeah. But we're here for Margaret and Eileen. Let's find them and show off our moves. Scene shifts to inside the club with thumping music and flashing lights. Mordecai, there they are. Let's go. Bigby, hey, ladies. We've come to dance the night away with you. Margaret, oh, hey, guys. You made it. We didn't think you'd get in. Eileen, yeah, the bouncer outside is super strict. Mordecai, we'll always find a way, Eileen. Let's show them how it's done. They start dancing, showcasing their outrageous moves. Random club goer, who are these guys? They're killing it on the dance floor. Bouncer. Hold on a minute. I've never seen you two before. Are you on the guest list? Mordecai. Uh. Pick me. What are the famous dancers, the unrealistic showstoppers? Random club goer. Whoa, dude, I love your moves. Bouncer. All right. All right. You can stay. Just don't cause any trouble. Mordecai, Rigby, Margaret, and Eileen continue dancing and having the time of their lives. Scene ends with them leaving the club, exhausted but ecstatic. Mordecai, that was insane. We actually pulled it off. Rigby, yeah, and Margaret and Eileen had the best time ever. Mission accomplished. Skips, I can't believe you guys made it inside. You always find a way to defy odds. High five ghost, you guys truly are the masters of absurdity. Well done! Scene fades out with Mordecai, Rigby, and their friends celebrating their incredible night. Int. Park. Day. 
Mordecai and Rigby, both wearing flashy disco costumes, strut down the street, a giant ball bouncing in front of them. A black cat slinks into the middle of the road. Mordecai! Oh, snap! Look out, Rigby! That black cat just walked into our path. Rigby! Dude, it's just a stupid superstition. Let's keep going. They continue walking but the ball suddenly veers towards the cat. Mordecai and Rigby chase after it, panicked. Mordecai! No! We gotta catch that ball! It's headed for the road! Rigby! Ah, fine! But it better not ruin our plans tonight! They sprint after the ball, narrowly avoiding getting run over by a speeding ice cream truck. The ball bounces off the truck's windshield and flies into the entrance of the awesome Dynamite Club! Mordecai! Great! Now we have to get inside the club to retrieve the ball! Rigby! Well, at least Margaret and Eileen will be there. We can impress them with our sweet dance moves. Int. Awesome. Dynamite Club, night. Mordecai and Rigby approach the bouncer, a beefy muscle man named Muscle Man. Mordecai. Hey, Muscle Man. We need to get inside to fetch our ball. Muscle Man. No way. Only the raddest dudes get in here, and you two are just park slackers. Rigby! Come on, man! We've been practicing our disco moves for weeks. Muscle Man grins mischievously and strokes his chin. Muscle Man! Alright, slackers. Impress me with your moves, and I'll let you in. But if you fail, you owe me a month's worth of park duty. Mordecai and Rigby exchange nervous glances before taking the dance floor. They unleash a mind-blowing performance, executing wild flips, spins, and the most flamboyant disco moves ever witnessed. The crowd erupts in applause as Mordecai and Rigby finish the routine. Muscle Man! Holy hamstrings! You dudes are better than I thought. Get in there and fetch your ball. Int. Awesome. Dynamite Club, Ballroom. Mordecai and Rigby enter the ballroom, where Margaret and Eileen are waiting by the DJ booth. Mordecai. Hey, ladies. We just had to risk our lives to retrieve our ball. But we made it. Eileen. Wow, you guys really went all out. You deserve a special dance, just for you. As the music starts, they all hit the dance floor together, grooving to the funky beats. The atmosphere becomes magically surreal, with glowing lights and floating disco balls. The night ends with Mordecai and Rigby impressing not only Margaret and Eileen but the entire club with their extraordinary dance moves. Muscle Man joins in, proving he can also bust a move. They leave the club, victorious, their bond stronger and their disco prowess forever etched in the annals of park history. Back at the park, as dawn breaks, skips, high five Ghost, Pops, and Benson witness Mordecai and Rigby wobbling out of the club, exhausted but elated. Benson. What the hell did you guys do? And why are you dressed like disco freaks? Mordecai. Oh, you know, just a typical night for us slacker groundskeepers. Rigby. And a night we'll never forget, dudes. Narrator, welcome to the illustrious and highly anticipated Comedy Central Roast of Link. The stage is set, a group of individuals gather in front of a dark, ominous background, adorned with the iconic Link Link logo on both top and bottom. Paco, all right, you bunch of Hylian bastards, strap yourselves in cuz we're about to take this roast to a whole, another level. Ain't no one safe from our verbal sword slashing tonight. Old Skulltula, that's right, you cunts. Tonight, we're gonna tear Link a new asshole. And he's not the only one who's gonna feel the burn. Wolfos, woof, woof, motherfuckers. You think you know the meaning of pain? Just wait till you hear the shit we've got in store for you. Lever, prepare to be buried under the sheer weight of our insults, you worthless pieces of Deku Scrub shit. It's gonna be a goddamn massacre up in here. Deku Scrub. Oh, please, 
Spare me your feeble attempts at humor, you pathetic excuses for preachers. Just wait until I unleash my verbal bombs on you all. I hope your ears bleed. Big Poe, you think you can handle my otherworldly wit, you insufferable twats? I'll have you weeping like a Goran in the hot springs once I'm done with you. Link enters the stage, absorbing the roasts with a steely determination, ready to give it back in spades. Link, well, 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 if it isn't the Grand Assembly of Asses. Coco, you feathered fucktard, your insults are about as sharp as your beak. Gold Sculptula, a fine specimen of arachnid feculence, your venomous words hold as much weight as your spindly legs. Wolfos, grr, woof, growling. Think, ah, uh, the inarticulate muck bears his teeth. Well, Wolfos, I'd insult you, but I'm afraid your brain is too smooth to comprehend it. Weaver, Link, you insignificant worm, you dare to mock us, the elite of the underworld? Think, Lever, your ignorance is overshadowed only by your dull wit. Those who live in a desert of their own stupidity tend to throw the sound of insults in vain. Deku Scrub, you think you can outwit me, you green-clad buffoon? I'll have you know I am the master of subterfuge and... Think, Deku Scrub, your attempts at being menacing are about as successful as your allergy to sunlight. I'd advise you to stick to your pathetic shrubbery existence. Big Po, enough, Link. Your shallow attempts at comedy won't save you from the wrath of the Big Po. Think. Big Po, the only thing big about you is your ego. You're nothing more than a puffed-up apparition who couldn't scare a child, let alone engage in a battle of wits. Narrator. And thus, the roast unfolded like a whirlwind of vulgar words and outrageous insults. Each participant took their turn, attempting to strike below the belt, only to be met with an onslaught of razor-sharp comebacks from Link. The crowd erupted in laughter and astonishment as Link showcased his unmatched roasting skills leaving his adversary speechless and defeated. In the end, it was clear that Link was the true champion of the Comedy Central roast. His revenge served cold and utterly satisfying. Mordecai. Dude, let's swing by the coffee shop and hang out with Margaret and Eileen. I could use a caffeine boost. Pick me, yeah, and literally can convince Margaret to go on a date with you, bro. Mordecai. Laughs, we'll see, Rigby. But first, coffee. Scene transitions to the coffee shop. Mordecai and Rigby enter to find Margaret and Eileen sitting at a table. Margaret, hey guys, so good to see you. What can I get you? Mordecai. I'll have a double shot espresso, please. Pick me, I'll take a mocha with extra whipped cream. Eileen, I'll just have a chamomile tea, please. Suddenly, the door slams open, and a sinister figure enters. It's the coffee bean. Coffee bean, grinning evilly. Well, 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 if it isn't our regulars. Too bad, this coffee shop is under new management. Mordecai, what, what do you mean? Coffee bean, leaning in. I've opened my own coffee shop, right across the street. And now, I have my secret weapon, the translator. Translator appears next to Coffee Bean, wearing a sinister grin. Pick me, what are you gonna do? Translate our taste buds. Translator? Oh, no no no, my dear Rigby. I can now influence everyone's thoughts and preferences through my translations. Say goodbye to your beloved coffee shop. Mordecai, we won't let you get away with this. We won't let you take our hangout spot. Scene transitions to Mordecai, Rigby, Margaret, and Eileen brainstorming in the park. Margaret, we need a plan, guys. We can't let the coffee bean win. Eileen, maybe we could gather a group of loyal customers to boycott the new coffee shop? Mordecai, that could work, but we'll need something more. Let's give the people a taste of our unique desserts. Rigby, yeah, we'll show them that our coffee shop has the best treats in town. Scene transitions to Mordecai and Rigby creating extravagant desserts in the coffee shop's kitchen. Mordecai. Smirking, these brownies are going to be legendary. Rigby, and these cookies will blow their minds. Scene transitions to the grand reopening of the original coffee shop. The park is filled with loyal customers and excited chatter. Mordecai. Standing on a platform, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us today. 
we're here to show you that the original coffee shop is still the best. Bigby, hold it up a plate of desserts, and to prove it, we've prepared some amazing treats for you all. The crowd cheers as Mordecai, Rigby, Margaret, and Eileen hand out the desserts to everyone. Scene transitions to the Coffee Bean's coffee shop, now empty and abandoned. Coffee Bean, defeated. No one wants my coffee anymore. Translator, looks like our plan backfired, sir. Coffee Bean, sighs. Let's pack up, translator. We've been defeated. The original coffee shop is once again thriving, filled with happy customers. Mordecai and Rigby, with the help of their friends, successfully thwarted the evil Coffee Bean and his translator, reclaiming their beloved coffee shop and restoring its glory. They continue enjoying their caffeine-fueled adventures, never shying away from a challenge. Title, The Battle of the Brew. Characters. Mordecai, M. Rigby, R. Margaret, Mar. Eileen, Isle. Benson, B. Coffee Bean, CB. Translator, T. Random Customer, RC. Int. Coffee Shop, Day. M. Hey, Rigby, let's hit up the coffee shop after work, chill with Margaret and Eileen. R. Awesome idea, bro. Coffee and chill, baby. Incident. Axed. Coffee shop, evening. Ah, Mordecai, Rigby, you guys made it. Hell, yeah, we've been waiting forever. Progression. The group sits at a table with cups of steaming coffee. A cat jumps onto the table. Um, hey, whose cat is this? E. Oh no, not again. Get that cat off the table. R. Relax, Benson, it's just a cat. The door bursts open and Coffee Bean and Translator enter with a smirk. DB. Well, well, well. Look who dared to show up at my rival coffee shop. Ah, uh, Coffee Bean, what are you doing here? DB. Ha, huh, I've had enough of you and your friendly coffee shop. It's time for everyone to taste my superior brew. T, that's right. I'll translate his words into your inferior language. Um, no way we're letting you sabotage the coffee shop, Coffee Bean. Ah, uh, yeah. Take your bitterness elsewhere. DB, you can't stop me. Prepare to face the consequences of challenging the coffee bean. T, I'll make sure they understand every insult he throws at them. An epic battle ensues with coffee beans flying and insults being translated. Mordecai and Rigby use their slingshot skills to defend their friends. CB and T retreat in defeat. Ah, uh, you guys saved the day. Let's celebrate with some free coffee. Hell, yeah, the good guys won. I can't believe I'm saying this, but nice job, slackers. They all cheer and continue to enjoy their coffee, victorious. Scientific explanation of the episode. This episode of Regular Show, titled, The Battle of the Brew, showcases the dramatic antics of familiar characters. The initial situation portrays a peaceful gathering at the coffee shop amongst Mordecai, Rigby, and their friends Margaret and Eileen. Despite the brief interruption of a cat on the table, the atmosphere is relaxed. However, the incident occurs when Coffee Bean, the arch-nemesis of the group, arrives with a translator in tow. It is revealed that Coffee Bean intends to establish a rival coffee shop, putting their friendship and favorite hangout spot at risk. Throughout the progression, tension builds as Mordecai, Rigby, and their friends passionately defend their coffee shop against Coffee Bean and his translator's malevolent plan. The denouement showcases an epic battle, with insults and coffee beans flying through the air. Mordecai and Rigby's slingshot skills aid them in protecting their loved ones, resulting in the defeat and retreat of the antagonists. In conclusion, the episode celebrates the victory of the main characters, emphasizing the power of friendship and teamwork. Despite their slacking tendencies, Mordecai and Rigby prove themselves capable and heroic when faced with a challenge. The indulgent dialogue and adult themes appeal to the M-rated audience, making it an episode that stands out in the regular show series.
Ordecai. Dude, I can't believe Margaret and Eileen are performing at the awesome. Dynamite Club tonight, we have to get inside. Pick me, hell yeah, we have to go. No way I'm missing this chance to showcase my awesome dance moves. Ordecai. Alright, let's do this. But first, we need a plan. Benson would never let us off work for this. Pick me, screw Benson, we're going anyway, we just need to be sneaky about it. Ordecai. Agreed, let's go incognito. I'll wear this helmet and pretend to be a construction worker. You can be my assistant with that glove on your face. Pick me. Ha ha, perfect. No one will recognize us. Let's go. Scene. Outside the awesome. Dynamite club. Ordecai. All right, we're here. But what's with that bald bouncer guarding the entrance? Bigby, don't worry, I got this. Hey, Mr. Tough Guy, you know who we are. We're the ones who can make your favorite radio show ten times better. Bouncer. Ha, I doubt that. But if you can prove it, I'll let you in. Scene. Inside the club. Ordecai. Wow, this place is huge. But where's Margaret and Eileen? Bigby, look, over there on the stage. Let's go. Scene, on the stage. Ordecai. Margaret, hey, we made it. We're here to dance with you and Eileen. Margaret, wow, oh, hey guys. That's awesome, but we're kind of busy with our performance right now. Scene, suddenly, a giant sentient club appears. Club, you fools dare to interrupt the awesome. Dynamite Club's show, prepare to be destroyed. Ordecai. What the hell is that thing? Bigby, I have no idea, but we need to find a way to distract it so we can dance with Margaret and Eileen. Scene, Mordecai and Rigby start dancing. Mordecai, hey, giant club, check out our sick moves. We challenge you to a dance-off. Club, a dance-off? Ha, huh. prepare to be crushed by my beats. Dance battle montage, Mordecai, Rigby, and the giant sentient club dance their hearts out, performing incredible moves. Scene after a long and intense dance-off. Club, fine, you win. Your moves were unstoppable. You can dance with Margaret and Eileen now. Mordecai, yes, thank you, giant club. Bigby, we did it. Our dancing skills saved the day, as always. Scene, Mordecai and Rigby join Margaret and Eileen on stage, the crowd cheering. Margaret, you guys are amazing. Thanks for joining us. Eileen, yeah, that was so much fun. Let's dance together. Scene everyone dancing and having a great time. Mordecai, this is the best night ever. Who needs work when you can dance your troubles away? Bigby, damn straight. Let's make this night one to remember. Scene, the party continues as Mordecai, Rigby, Margaret, and Eileen dance the night away. Dialogue ends. Title, The Roast of Comedy Central. Comedy Central, welcome to the Comedy Central Roast. Tonight, we have an eclectic group of roasters ready to unleash their venomous tongues. Let the chaos begin. Animal Planet, smirking, get ready to be ripped apart, Comedy Central. You won't know what hit you. Nickelodeon, sarcastically. Yeah, Comedy Central. Time for you to grow some balls and join the big leagues. Discovery Channel, prepare to be exposed. You glorified fart factory. We have facts, you have fuck-ups. Box News, ah, Comedy Central, the liberal cesspool of mediocrity. Can't wait to tear you to shreds, you snowflake-infested network. ESPN, laughing, get ready, Comedy Central. We'll hit you so hard, you'll be asking for a timeout. Incident. Comedy Central, all right, enough chit-chat. Time for the first roast. Animal Planet, show us what you've got. Animal Planet. Grinning, you're the human equivalent of animal feces, Comedy Central. Your shows are as entertaining as watching paint dry on a sloth's ass. Progression. Nickelodeon, Rolling Eyes, Animal Planet, you're one to talk. Your programs are so boring, even watching grass grow would be more exciting. Discovery Channel, allow me to enlighten you, Comedy Central, about your inferiority. Your shows are like a landfill of intellectual garbage. Box News. Comedy Central, you're as reliable as your fact-checking. Your biased nonsense makes me want to gouge my eyes out with a spork. ESPN, mocking, Comedy Central, your attempt at comedy is like watching a remedial math problem-solving show. Dull and utterly predictable. 
Comedy Central, smirking, oh, how adorable. You all think you can outroast the original rooster. Sit tight, my friends, it's payback time. Animal Planet, confused, what are you talking about? Nickelodeon, curious. Yeah, what do you have up your sleeve, Comedy Central? Discovery Channel, skeptical. Don't tell me you think you can roast us better than we roasted you? Box News, mocking, oh, please. You're all bark and no bite, Comedy Central. ESPN, laughing. I can't wait to see how you embarrass yourself, Comedy Central. Comedy Central, throws the poster to the ground, ladies and gentlemen, behold the truth. The reality behind these networks' dirty little secrets. Animal Planet, shocked, what the fuck is this? Nickelodeon, gasping, no way. Discovery Channel, stammering, is, is that, a creepy clown? Box News, panicking, what the hell did you do? ESPN, stunned. Talk about unexpected plot twist. Comedy Central, evil laughter. Yes, my friends, this creepy clown is your darkest secret. Desperate attempts to hide your true colors. Just remember, karma's a bitch, and tonight, Comedy Central gets its revenge. Narrator, at a fancy dinner party in a grand mansion, the guests were seated around a long table adorned with luxurious decorations. Among the attendees were Jack, a boisterous middle-aged man, and Samantha, an elegant yet mischievous woman. Jack, eyeing the bowl of clam chowder with anticipation, hey, Samantha, check out that big bowl of clam soup over there. Samantha, smirking, oh, Jack, I know what you're thinking. You're just dying to make a scene, aren't you? Jack grinning mischievously. You bet your fine ass I am. Watch this. Jack stood up from his seat and picked up the spoon nearby. With a mischievous glint in his eyes, he twirled the spoon in the air before launching it towards the ceiling. Incident. Samantha. Gasping. Jack, what the fuck are you doing? The spoon soared up and collided with the chandelier, causing it to swing violently, showering the room with fragments of glass. Progression. Guest one. Panicking, what the hell is going on? S2. Frantically, it's raining crystal shards, for fuck's sake. As everyone scrambled to find cover or protect themselves, chaos ensued. People knocked over tables, glasses, and stumbled over each other in a desperate attempt to escape the plummeting debris. Jack, laughing hysterically, this is the best party ever. Samantha, rolling her eyes, you're out of your goddamn mind, Jack. Denouement. Amidst the pandemonium, the grand piano in the corner was bumped, causing it to come crashing down onto the delicate bowl of clam chowder on the table. S3, horrified, no, not the clam soup. The bowl of clam chowder exploded, sending thick, creamy soup splattering across the room, coating the horrified guests in a pungent, slimy mess. Conclusion As the clam soup showered down upon the ruined party, people were aghast, covered from head to toe in its repulsive glory. Jack, wiping soup from his face, grinning, well, Samantha, I think we've successfully turned this elegant affair into a fucking disaster. Samantha, laughing uncontrollably, the chaos and destruction you create never cease to amaze me, Jack. What a night. In the end, an elegant dinner party turned into a calamity of flying spoons, shattered chandeliers, and clam soup disaster. Jack and Samantha reveled in the mayhem they had caused, leaving the other guests speechless and drenched in clam chowder. Dennis, hey Frank, can you believe it? We finally made it big. Lemonade stand on the Death Star, baby. Frank, you got that right, Dennis. We're gonna be rolling in Imperial credits in no time. Dennis, just think of all the suckers that'll be lining up for our delicious lemonade. Nobody can resist the power of the Reynolds brothers. Frank, damn straight, Dennis. 
They'll be begging for a taste of our secret ingredient. Dennis! Oh yeah, the secret ingredient! I added a dash of Bantha sweat and a sprinkle of Death Star dust! It's gonna blow their minds! Frank! Genius move, Dennis! Nobody else can replicate that! We're gonna be the lemonade kingpins of the galaxy! Dennis! And you know what else, Frank? We're gonna charge these imperial idiots an arm and a leg for a glass of lemonade! They won't know what hit them! Frank! Ha ha ha! That's right, Dennis! We'll make M pay through the nose for the privilege of quenching their thirst on this big bad Death Star. Dennis, just look at us, Frank. Two regular guys, sitting on the Death Star, ruling the lemonade market. This is the pinnacle of our existence. Frank, you said it, buddy. We're unstoppable. The Death Star may destroy planets, but we're gonna destroy wallets. Dennis, alright, let's open this stand and show those rebel scum how real business is done. Frank. Time to make lemonade from Alderanian lemons, Dennis. Let's roll. Dennis and Frank open the lemonade stand and customers start flocking in. Customer 1, 2 credits for a lemonade. Are you guys out of your minds? Dennis, look, pal, this is high quality stuff. Handcrafted on the Death Star. You won't find this anywhere else. Customer 2, is that Bantha Sweat? Are you serious? Frank, it's a secret ingredient, my friend. Adds that extra kick you won't find in any other lemonade. Customer 3, I can't believe we're paying these prices, but this lemonade is oddly satisfying. Dennis, of course it is. We're the Reynolds brothers. We know what we're doing. Suddenly, Darth Vader walks by. Darth Vader, what is the meaning of this? Who authorized a lemonade stand on the Death Star? Frank, I, oh, Dennis, we might have a problem. Dennis, hey, Darth, old buddy, wanna try some refreshing Death Star lemonade? On the house! Darth Vader, you fools! You think you can get away with this? Suddenly, the lemonade stand explodes in a glorious burst of citrus and flames. Dennis! Well, Frank, it looks like our grand lemonade empire just went up in smoke! Frank! Yeah, Dennis! But hey, at least we went out in style! Dennis and Frank laugh amidst the wreckage, embracing their ridiculous moment of lemonade glory. Title, Cheezer's Chaos. Characters. Mordecai, Blue Jay. Rigby, Raccoon. Muscle Man, Green Monster. High Five Ghost, Ghost. Setting. Inside Cheezer's, a fast food restaurant known for its cheesy menu items. Teen, inside Cheezer's, Mordecai, Rigby, Muscle Man, and High Five Ghost are sitting in a booth. I am the Cheezer's girl. Mordecai. Excitedly, guys. Check out the Cheezer's girl over there. She's looking hot today. Bigby, mischievously, we got to make our move, bro. We can't let this opportunity slip away. Muscle man, flexing, I've got this, dudes. Watch me work my muscles. High five ghost, nodding, yeah, let's go for it. But remember, be smooth, guys. Teen, Mordecai, Rigby, muscle man, and high five ghost approach the Cheezer's girl. Mordecai, nervously, hey. Uh, we couldn't help but notice you from across the room. Your cheesy smile is, um, captivating. Cheezer's girl, smirking. Oh, is that so? Well, cheesy compliments are my weakness. How about a cheesy pickup line? Pick me, grinning, sure thing. How about this? Are you a grilled cheese sandwich? Because you've got the cheese that makes my heart melt. Cheezer's girl, laughs. That's cheesy, but I like it. You guys are different from the usual customers here. Teen, Mordecai, Rigby, Muscle Man, and High Five Ghost chat with the Cheezer's girl. Muscle Man, flexing unnecessarily, so, what's your secret ingredient to look this good? Is it the cheese? Cheezer's girl, playfully, well, it's a secret recipe, of course. But let's just say cheese is involved, and so is a little bit of magic. High Five Ghost, curiously, magic? What kind of magic are we talking about here? Cheezer's girl, 
mysteriously, let's just say, if you boys really want to find out, you'll need to follow me after my shift. Team, Mordecai, Rigby, Muscle Man, and High Five Ghost follow the Cheese's girl to an abandoned warehouse. Rigby, whispering, ah, guys, are we sure about this? It seems kinda sketchy. Mordecai, hesitant, I don't know, Rigby, but if there's a chance we'll discover the secret of the cheesy magic, it might be worth it. Muscle Man, determined, let's do this. We're always up for an adventure, right? High Five Ghost, nervously, alright, but let's stick together. Safety in numbers, guys! Teen, Mordecai, Rigby, Muscle Man, and High Five Ghost enter a room filled with shelves stacked with a wide array of magic cheese. Cheesers girl. Grinning, welcome to my secret stash, boys. Behold, the cheesy grimoire. Rigby, astonished, this is insane. I had no idea cheese could possess such magical powers. Muscle Man. Excitedly, so, you're saying that if we eat this magic cheese, we'll gain superpowers? High Five Ghost. Cautiously, I don't know, guys. This seems like a recipe for disaster. Teen, Mordecai, Rigby, Muscle Man, and High Five Ghost frantically eating different magical cheeses. Mordecai, with a mouthful of cheese, dude, I feel supercharged. Rigby, gulping, I can see through walls. I like a cheesy ghost. Muscle Man, flexing, look at these muscles. They're super sized. I'm the ultimate cheesy monster. High Five Ghost, glowing. I have the power of high-fiving, magnified a hundredfold. Teen, Mordecai, Rigby, Muscle Man, and High Five Ghost wreak havoc with their newfound cheesy superpowers. Mordecai, laughing maniacally, let's make it rain cheese. Rigby, floating through walls, cheese teleportation, baby. Muscle Man, creating cheese explosions, cheesy chaos unleashed. High Five Ghost, high-fiving everything, the world needs more high-fives, now with extra cheese. Soon, the chaos subsides, everyone is back into their normal forms, surrounded by piles of cheese. Mordecai, panting, phew, that was intense. Maybe we should stick to our regular jobs at the park. Bigby, agrees, yeah, I think we've had enough cheesy adventures for today. Hustle man, chuckles, true that. Let's go back and clean up all the cheesiest mess we've made. High five ghost, smiling, agreed, but hey, at least we made this day one for the regular show history. The misadventures of Mordecai, Rigby, Muscle Man, and High Five Ghost at Cheezers escalated into a cheesy chaos that only their friendship and the power of magic cheese could resolve. Despite the chaos, they learned that sometimes, the best adventures are the ones shared with great friends, even if they involve superpowers and ridiculous amounts of cheese. Mordecai. Hey Rigby, check out that sign. It says, Riggery M. Do you think it's a new club or something? Rigby, I don't know, man, but it sounds awesome. We should totally check it out. Mordecai. Yeah, it could be a great opportunity to dance with Margaret and Eileen. Let's go. They approach the entrance of the club. Bouncer. Hold on, dudes. You can't just waltz in here. This is a private club. Mordecai. Come on, man. We just want to have a good time inside. We promise not to cause any trouble. Bouncer. Hmm. Well, alright. But I warn you, if you mess with the wrong crowd, you're out. Inside the club, they encounter a jealous third-rate radio host, Brock. Brock. Oh great, it's those two clowns from the park. What are you doing here? Trying to steal my spotlight? Mordecai. No, we're just here to have a good time. No need to get all bent out of shape. Brock, you think you can outshine me? I'll show you who the real star is. Rigby spots the giant sentient disco ball, Groovy. Rigby, dude, check out that giant disco ball. It's alive. Mordecai, whoa, it's like something out of a sci-fi movie. Groovy, welcome, Groovy people. I am Groovy, the sentient ball of beats. Dance with me if you dare. As the night progresses, chaos ensues. Mordecai, Rigby, this is getting out of hand. Brock won't stop trying to upstage us, and Groovy is wreaking havoc on the dance floor. Bigby, I know, dude, we got to come up with a plan to get things back to normal. 
they hatch a plan to distract Brock and deactivate Groovy. Mordecai! Hey Brock, I challenge you to a dance-off. Winner takes all. Brock, oh, you're on. This radio host never backs down. Rigby sneaks up to Groovy and finds its off switch. Rigby, take that, you disco maniac! With Brock distracted and Groovy disabled, chaos finally subsides. Mordecai, we did it, Rigby. We saved the dance floor and stopped Brock's jealousy. Rigby, yeah, it's all in a night's work for the park's most epic slackers. They dance the night away with Margaret and Eileen. Mordecai, this is the best night ever. Thanks for helping me out, Rigby. Rigby, no problem, dude. We always have each other's backs. Now let's keep grooving. They continue dancing, leaving the chaotic night behind. In this episode of Regular Show, Mordecai and Rigby stumble upon a new club. Riggery M little do they know, they will encounter an envious third-rate radio host, a giant sentient disco ball, and a wild dance floor. Chaos ensues as they struggle to maintain order and save the night. Through their antics and teamwork, they manage to overcome the challenges, dance with Margaret and Eileen, and have the best night ever. Title, Cheese Frenzy at Cheesers. Characters. Mordecai, M. Rigby, R. Muscle Man, MM. High Five Ghost, HFG. Cheesers Lady, CL. Setting. A skate park adjacent to Cheesers with trees and a house in the background. Incident. M. Hey Rigby, check out the six skateboard trick I just learned. R. Dude, that is gnarly. Let me give it a try. Mordecai and Rigby take turns doing various skateboard tricks while Muscle Man and High Five Ghost cheer them on. Um, yeah, shred it, bros. You guys are killing it. HFG, totally rad, dudes. Mind if I try? Um, go for it, High Five Ghost. HFG hops on the skateboard and surprises everyone with a gravity-defying trick. Ah, uh, whoa, did you see that? High Five Ghost just defied the laws of physics. Muscle Man notices the Cheezer's lady standing by, watching them perform their tricks. Um, yo, dudes, check out the Cheezer's lady over there. Um, hum, she's pretty cute. Maybe we should go over and talk to her. Progression Rigby, Mordecai, Muscle Man, and High Five Ghost approach the Cheezer's lady. Um, hey there, Cheezer's lady. We couldn't help but notice your stunning beauty. Uh, yeah, we just had to come over and introduce ourselves. DL, oh. You guys are sweet. What can I get you? Um, how about a round of your finest cheeseburgers and milkshakes? HFG, and don't forget the extra cheese on everything. Mordecai and Rigby try to impress the Cheezer's lady with their skateboard tricks while waiting for their orders. Um, so, Cheezer's lady, how about you join us sometime for some epic skateboarding adventures? Ah, uh, yeah, we could totally show you some moves. DL, hmm, that sounds like a lot of fun. Denouement. The Cheezer's lady's boss approaches, annoyed by the commotion caused by Mordecai, Rigby, Muscle Man, and High Five Ghost. Boss, what the hell is going on here? We can't have your skateboarding antics disturbing the other customers. Um, sorry, sir. We didn't mean to cause any trouble. Boss, well, you better pay for those cheeseburgers and milkshakes and get the hell out of here. Rigby, Mordecai, Muscle Man, and High Five Ghost sheepishly pay for their food and leave Cheezers. Um, well, that didn't go as planned. We should probably stick to our park duties from now on. Ah, uh, yeah, but at least we got to show off our skills, right? Um, true, bros. And remember, there's always next time. HFG. Yeah, next time we'll impress not only the Cheezer's lady but the whole town. The group walks back to the park, ready for their next misadventure. Disclaimer. The above dialogue script contains explicit language and adult themes. It is an imaginary episode based on the TV show, regular show, and contains elements of absurdity and surrealism.
Title, The Wacky Misadventures of South Park. Location, a sunny field with a house in the background. Four children, Stan, Kyle, Cartman, and Kenny, are seen playing. Cartman, why the fuck are we wasting our time here? We could be playing video games. Kyle, dude, chill out. It's a beautiful day. Let's have some fun. Incident. A spaceship suddenly descends from the sky, catching everyone's attention. Stan, what the fuck is that thing? Kenny, MMMPH MMMPH. Progression. The spaceship lands, revealing a group of bizarre creatures, all speaking in a strange language. Cartman, what the unholy fuck are these alien douchebags saying? Kyle, calm down, Cartman. Maybe they come in peace. The creatures present a device that they claim can grant any wish. Stan, holy shit, seriously. Cartman, I wish I was the most powerful and important person in the universe. As Cartman utters his wish, he transforms into a giant, grotesque monster with immense power. Kyle, oh, shit, what did you do, you fat fucking idiot? Kenny tries to save the day by sacrificing himself, but in a comedic twist, he accidentally explodes a nearby gas canister, covering everyone in a foul-smelling goo. Kenny, muffled, MMMPH, fuck. Stan, gross, Kenny, you always die in the most disgusting ways. The aliens, horrified by the chaos, quickly retreat to their spaceship and leave Earth. Hartman. Well, that backfired. Can we go get some cheesy poofs now? Kyle. Seriously? After all that? You're unbelievable. And so, the group returns to their usual mischief, leaving behind a field of goo and a lesson learned about the consequences of greed and stupidity. Scientific Explanation In this episode, we observe the interplay between cartoon characters and surreal events which deviate from conventional reality. The initial situation sets the tone for the narrative, establishing the characters' personalities and the primary conflict. The incident introduces a fantastical element, where a spaceship descends from the sky. This event triggers the progression of the story, leading to the denouement where the wish-granting device causes chaos. The conclusion provides closure to the narrative, wherein the characters face the consequences of their actions. The episode combines elements of humor, vulgarity, and satire to create an M-rated experience that appeals to a specific audience. The exaggerated and absurdist nature of the story contributes to the overall comedic effect, allowing viewers to temporarily suspend disbelief and engage in the surreal world of South Park. Title, Winging It at the Hot Wing Challenge. Characters. Mordecai. Rigby. Benson. Margaret. Eileen. Random Character 1. Random Character 2. At the park, Mordecai and Rigby are discussing their weekend plans. Mordecai. Dude, I just heard Margaret and Eileen are going to the Hot Wing Challenge event at the Wing Kingdom. Rigby, no way, we have to be there. Let's sign up for the challenge and impress them with our wing eating skills. Incident. At Pop's house, Mordecai and Rigby are desperately calling the wing kingdom. Mordecai. Frustrated. What do you mean all the spots in the challenge are taken? We have to get in, Rigby. Rigby, panicking. Dude, what are we gonna do? We can't let Margaret and Eileen down. Progression. Benson overhears their conversation and steps in. Benson, alright, slackers, I overheard your whining. I happen to know a guy who might be able to get you two to the hot wing challenge. Mordecai. Seriously, Benson? You know someone that can help us? Benson, yeah, but trust me, it won't be easy. You'll have to do a favor for him. Mordecai and Rigby find themselves standing around a round table, with a blue circle in the middle and a red circle in the middle. Mordecai. Um, Benson, where are we? Benson, sarcastically, congrats, you've made it to the secret wing mafia meeting. The guy you are looking for is here. Mysterious figure emerges from the shadows. Random character one. So, you want to participate in the hot wing challenge, huh? Rigby, yes, we do. Can you help us? Random character two. Maybe we can help you, but first, you have to eat these special wings. They're the hottest wings in the universe. Mordecai and Rigby, on the verge of tears, manage to finish the wings. 
Random character 1. Impressive, you boys have earned your spots in the Hot Wing Challenge. Ordecai, thank you so much. We won't let you down. Random character 2, laughs. You better not, or there will be consequences. Back at the park, Mordecai and Rigby share their victory with Margaret and Eileen. Margaret, wow, you actually made it to the challenge. I'm impressed. Eileen, yeah, you guys really stepped up. Mordecai, we did it all for you. We wanted to prove ourselves. Rigby, and we totally crushed it. Everyone laughs and celebrates their wing-filled victory at the park. Mordecai. Alright, guys, today is the day we finally make our move on the Cheezer's girl. Big B, hell yeah, it's time to bring our A game, bro. Muscle man, you know it, bros. I'll flex my muscles and show her what a true man looks like. High five ghost. Excitedly hey guys, maybe I can impress her with my ghostly high fives. Mordecai. Alright, let's head to Cheezer's and make our mark. We've got this. They arrive at Cheezer's and spot the Cheezer's girl behind the counter. Mordecai. Nervously okay, guys, who's going first? Rigby, I got this. Watch and learn, bros. Rigby confidently approaches the Cheezer's girl. Rigby, hey there, Cheezer's girl, looking cheesy and fine today. Cheezer's girl, raising an eyebrow uh, thanks, I guess. Rigby nervously tries to keep the conversation going. Rigby, so, uh, ever been on a cheese-inspired adventure before? I know a cool place where we can find the world's rarest cheese. Cheezer's girl. That's different. I'll pass, thanks. Rigby walks back to the group, visibly disappointed. Rigby, she wasn't feeling it. Rose, your turn, muscle man. Muscle man. All right, time to unleash the muscles. Muscle man flexes his biceps and approaches the Cheezer's girl. Muscle man. Hey, beautiful, ever seen muscles like these? Cheezer's girl. Unimpressed, yeah. I've definitely seen my fair share of muscles. Can I take your order? Muscle man. Ah, come on. I'm the epitome of muscle perfection. Muscle man storms back to the group, frustration evident on his face. Muscle man. She doesn't understand true muscle greatness. High five ghost. Don't worry, guys. I've got this. High five ghost floats towards the cheesers girl. High five ghost. Hey there, cheesers girl. How about a ghostly high five to make your day? Cheezer's girl, are you serious? I'm just trying to work here. High Five Ghost sadly returns to the group. High Five Ghost, she wasn't into my ghostly charm, guys. I thought it would work. Mordecai. All right, it's my turn. I've got to make this count. With determination, Mordecai approaches the Cheezer's girl. Mordecai. Hey, Cheezer's girl, sorry about my friend's failed attempts. I wanted to ask if you'd like to go on a date sometime? Cheezer's girl. Finally, someone normal. I'd love to, Mordecai. Mordecai. Really? Awesome. They exchange numbers, and the Cheezer's girl smiles. Mordecai. Looks like I'm the winner this time, guys. Bigby, nice job, dude. Looks like it's finally your turn to score. They all celebrate and head back to the park, leaving an empty Cheezer's behind. Incident. The gang attempts to hit on the Cheezer's girl but fails miserably. Progression. Each member of the group tries different tactics to impress the Cheezer's girl, but none of them succeed. Mordecai takes a genuine approach and ends up impressing the Cheezer's girl. Mordecai successfully sets up a date with the Cheezer's girl while his friends cheer him on. Mordecai. Dude, we can't miss the Hot Wing Challenge at Wing Kingdom. Margaret and Eileen are going to be there, and we gotta show them what we're made of. 
Bigby, I'm all in, bro. Let's go crush those wings and impress the ladies. Scene. Mordecai and Rigby standing in front of their car, which is in flames. Mordecai. Uh, Rigby? Why is our car on fire? Bigby, I may have forgotten to top up the gas. But no worries, there's a gas station nearby. We'll be back on track in no time. Scene. Mordecai and Rigby pushing their car, still blazing, towards the gas station. Mordecai. I can't believe this, Rigby. We're never gonna make it to the hot wing challenge at this rate. Bigby, relax, Mordecai. We'll just call Benson for help. Mordecai dials the phone and holds it up to his ear. Mordecai. Hey, Benson, we're kinda in a sticky situation here. Benson, irritated, what did you two idiots do this time? Bigby, our car caught fire, and we need a ride to Wing Kingdom. Can you help us out? Benson, size, fine. I'll pick you up, but only because Margaret and Eileen are involved. Don't screw this up. Scene. Benson arrives in his beaten up car with Mordecai and Rigby in the backseat. Mordecai. Thanks, Benson. We owe you big time. Benson, just shut up and buckle up. We're losing time here. Scene. Benson drives recklessly, jumping over rooftops and narrowly avoiding collisions. Bigby, dude, Benson, slow down. We don't want to die before we eat those wings. Benson, I'm not gonna let you idiots ruin this for me. Hold on. Scene. The car crashes through the front entrance of Wing Kingdom and comes to a screeching halt. Mordecai, we made it. Now, let's go find Margaret and Eileen. Scene. Mordecai and Rigby approach Margaret and Eileen, panting and covered in dirt. Margaret, laughing, wow, you guys really know how to make an entrance. Eileen, you're just in time for the challenge, the wings here are insane. Mordecai, we made it for you, Margaret, prepare to be amazed. Bigby, and impressed, we're gonna conquer those wings like champions. Scene. Mordecai and Rigby sit at a table with piles of spicy wings in front of them. Mordecai, ready, Rigby, let's do this. Bigby, hell yeah, we're gonna show everyone what we're made of. Scene. Mordecai and Rigby devour the wings, their faces turning bright red. Mordecai, these wings are hotter than a volcano. Bigby, I can't feel my tongue anymore, but I won't give up. Scene. Mordecai and Rigby continue to eat, sweat pouring down their faces. Mordecai, I'm dying, Rigby. It's too much. Bigby, we can't give up. Think of Margaret and Eileen. Scene. Mordecai and Rigby finally finish all the wings, collapsing onto the table. Mordecai, we did it, Rigby. We survived the hot wing challenge. Bigby, and we impressed the ladies. Best day ever. Scene. Mordecai, Rigby, Margaret, and Eileen laugh and celebrate their victory. Mordecai, let's never do something this insane again. Bigby, agreed, bro. But hey, at least we got the girls. Scene. The characters continue to laugh and enjoy their time together. John, what the fuck is happening? Is that Doodle Bob? Sarah, holy shit, he's taken over the White House. How the hell did he do that? John, I have no idea, but this is seriously fucked up. We need to stop him before he destroys everything. Doodle Bob, attention, filthy humans. I, Doodle Bob, am now the President of the United States. Prepare for some major changes. Sarah, this is insane. What is he going to do? Bob, first, I shall replace the national anthem with a looped recording of SpongeBob laughing in a creepy tone. <laughs> John, that's just disturbing. We can't let him get away with this. Doodle Bob, second, healthcare will now consist of free doodle pad prescription for everyone. Sketch away your pain. Sarah, are you fucking kidding me? This guy is a maniac. John, we need to find a way to expose him. We can't let the country fall apart like this. Doodle Bob, third, I shall outlaw pants. Let you do this be free, my loyal subjects. Sarah, are you hearing this? He's gone completely insane. John, we have to rally the people and fight back. We can't let his evil doodles take over our country. Doodle 
Travel Bob, fourth, every Friday will be Doodle Day, where all citizens must draw their favorite food and send it to me for inspection. Free to comply, and you shall face the wrath of my army. Sarah, he's turning everything into a twisted cartoon reality. This can't be happening. John, we won't let him get away with this madness. We'll find a way to take him down, no matter what it takes. Doodle Bob, first, censorship will be strictly enforced. Any doodles depicting happiness or joy will be immediately burned. Sarah, this is outrageous. We need to gather as many people as we can and fight back. John, I agree. We have to show him that we won't stand for his crazy dictatorship. Doodle Bob, sixth, anyone caught doodling outside of the lines shall be sentenced to doodle prison, where they will be forced to draw stick figures for eternity. Sarah, we can't let him continue with these insane laws. We have to stop him before it's too late. John, we're not going to let him destroy our country. We'll join forces with others who oppose him and bring him down. Doodle Bob, 7th, all schools will now teach doodle art as the main subject. Forget reading, writing, and math. Sarah, this is absolute madness. Our society will crumble if this continues. John, we have to expose him to the public, make them see the danger he poses to our nation. Doodle Bob, 8th, from now on, every citizen will be required to wear a fake mustache to honor the greatness of doodles. Sarah, we can't let him brainwash the people. We have to fight back, no matter the cost. John, we won't let him succeed. Together, we'll bring him down and restore sanity to our country. Doodle Bob, 9th, every street will be paved with yellow bricks, just like in those dumb Wizard of Oz movies. Sarah, this is getting out of control. We must do something before it's too late. John, we will rise up against him, and we won't stop until he's been defeated. Our country deserves better. Doodle Bob, 10th, and finally, every citizen will get a free jar of ink to use for their signature. Doodle power for all. Sarah, we must unite the resistance. Our only chance is to fight back against Doodle Bob and his reign of madness. John, it's time to take a stand. Let's rally the people and show them the true power of democracy. We won't let this madness continue. Mordecai! Hey Rigby! Let's hit the coffee shop and catch up with Margaret and Eileen. Rigby? Yeah, man. I need a caffeine boost. Takes off to the coffee shop. Mordecai. Hey, Margaret. Long time no see. How's it going? Margaret. Oh, hey, Mordecai. I'm good. Just working on my art project. What about you? Mordecai. Same old, same old. So, what's new around here? Margaret. Actually, there's something weird going on. Coffee Bean and his translator are setting up a rival coffee shop just across the street. Eileen, yeah, and they're stealing all our customers. We need to do something about it. Mordecai, Coffee Bean, that guy is always causing trouble. We need to stop him. Bigby, I'm in. Let's show that Bean who's boss. They head over to the rival coffee shop. Mordecai, Coffee Bean, what's your deal, man? Can't you just run a legit business? Coffee Bean, ha. Huh. I don't need your approval, bird brain. My coffee is superior, and everyone knows it. Mordecai, we'll see about that. Eileen, Margaret, keep an eye on things. Rigby and I will take care of this. Rigby and Mordecai enter the rival coffee shop. Translator, what are you doing here, slackers? Coffee Bean's coffee will always triumph over your pathetic attempts. Rigby, oh yeah, well, prepare to taste the feet, you overgrown espresso machine. They engage in an intense coffee showdown, brewing, and making elaborate coffee drinks. Mordecai, take that, translator. Your coffee is nothing compared to ours. Translator, ignore the flavor. Feel the caffeine rush. It's all about the energy, not the taste. Rigby accidentally spills coffee on the floor. Rigby, oh no, the coffee's all over the place. Mordecai, Rigby, you idiot. Look what you've done. Rigby slips on the coffee, crashing into shelves and knocking down coffee beans. Coffee bean, my precious beans. You'll pay for this. Rigby and Mordecai escape from the chaos they caused. Mordecai. Well, I guess that solves the coffee shop rivalry. Rigby, yeah, but we totally wrecked the place. We're in trouble, aren't we? They return to the original coffee shop. 
Benson, what happened in there? The rival shop is destroyed. Mordecai, it wasn't us, Benson. It was Coffee Bean and his translator. Benson, don't give me that. You two are always causing trouble. Just clean up the mess before I fire you both. Mordecai, yes, sir. We'll fix everything, we promise. They start cleaning up the mess, realizing the consequences of their actions. Mordecai, we need to be more responsible, Rigby. Let's not let this happen again. Rigby, yeah, you're right. We have to grow up and start taking things seriously. They continue cleaning up, learning a valuable lesson from their coffee shop misadventure. Mordecai. Hey guys, I've heard something amazing about the cheesers lady. She's supposed to be super hot and flirty. We should totally go hit on her. Bigby, hell yeah, I'm always down to make a move on some fine cheddar chick. Let's do this. Hustle man. Bro, count me in. I've been working out my pickup lines for days. I'm ready to flex my dating skills. High five ghost. I don't know. Guys, isn't it a bit creepy to go to cheesers just to hit on the cheesers lady? We should respect her as a person, not objectify her. Mordecai, come on, high five ghost. It's just harmless flirting. Plus, she's the one who's known for being flirty. Let's have some fun. Bigby, yeah, don't be such a buskill, high five ghost. We're just trying to have a good time, bro. Hustle man. Besides, we've seen her giving out her number to customers before. It's practically an invitation. High five ghost. Fine, but let's at least be respectful and treat her like a human being. Let's not cross any boundaries, guys. They arrive at Cheezers, and the Cheezers lady, named Stacy, makes her appearance. Mordecai. Whoa, she's even hotter in person. Hey, Stacy, how's it going? Stacy, hey there, handsome. What can I get you guys some nachos, maybe? Pick me. Nachos sound good, but I'm here for something else. Write your number. Stacy laughs, smooth cowboy. Maybe we can talk about it after I bring you your nachos. Hustle man. Hey, Stacy, you know I'm a beast in the gym. Why don't you let me take you out sometime? We could pump some iron together. Stacy smirks, well muscle man, I wouldn't mind seeing if your muscles match up to your bravado. High five ghost. Awkwardly, Stacy, I admire your beauty, but let's not forget that beneath the surface, we are all complex beings yearning for genuine connection. Stacy, wow high five ghost, you really know how to kill the mood, lighten up. They all laugh, and the tension eases. Mordecai. All right, Stacy, you got me hooked. Let's chat after we finish these plates of nachos. Pick me, yeah, and maybe you can give us a special behind the scenes tour of cheeses one day. It'd be our secret. Stacy winks. Well, boys, I can't make any promises, but let's see what the future holds. They enjoy their nachos, laughter, and flirtation, filling the air as their friendship grows and the episode concludes. Alright Morty, listen up. I've discovered a statistically improbable pile of rocks with a green stone on top and a black rock on the bottom. It's 12 dimensions away, so buckle up. Jeez, Rick, what's so special about a pile of rocks? Morty, this isn't just any pile of rocks. With the right combination, it can unlock the secrets of the universe. Imagine the power. Power? Did someone say power? Count me in. Dad. You're always jumping into things you don't understand. Leave it to the experts, like Rick and Morty. You know what, Jerry? Since you're so eager, why don't you climb to the top of that pile of rocks and grab the green stone? No problem, Rick. I'm a natural-born daredevil. Moments later. Ah, uh, guys? I think I'm stuck. Laughs. Classic Jerry move. Alright. Time for plan B, Morty. 
Go get the black rock and place it under the green stone. We need that pile to crumble. Wait, won't that potentially destroy the universe? Morty, it's called a planetary passion play for a reason. Just do it. Morty carefully places the black rock underneath the green stone. Rick, are you sure about this? It seems dangerous. Dangerous? That's what makes it fun, Summer. Don't be such a buzzkill. The pile of rocks starts glowing and vibrating. Guys, I'm really scared. What if I die? Oh, shut it, Jerry. You're fine. Just hold on tight. The pile of rocks explodes, revealing a portal to another dimension. Whoa, Rick! Look at that! It worked! Of course, it did, Morty. I'm a freaking genius. The portal leads to a luxurious spa. Oh my gosh, Rick! Is this a hot stone massage resort? That's right, Summer. I figured if we're gonna risk our lives, might as well have some relaxation time afterward. Treat yo, self. This might be the best thing you've ever done, Rick. Oh, you just wait, Jerry. There's more where that came from. They all enter the spa and indulge in the hot stone massage. This is amazing, Rick. We actually did something cool for once. Ah, Summer, you naive little thing. This is just the beginning. I have more plans, more adventures in store for us. It's gonna blow your mind, darling. Uh, Rick, should we be concerned about the consequences of tampering with cosmic forces? Consequences? Morty, in this universe, consequences are just another punchline waiting to happen. The family shares a laugh as the screen fades to black. Mickey, welcome, you fucks, to the fucking Comedy Central roast of the fucking Disney Channel. Tonight, we got some real cunts ready to tear this shit apart. Minnie, that's right, you dumbasses. Get ready for a fucking wild night of insults and motherfucking roasting. We've got Animal Planet up first, you fucking animals. Animal Planet, listen up, you Mickey Mouse motherfucker. You think you're so fucking special with your big ears and your squeaky clean image, but I got news for you, bitch. We're about to expose your dirty little secret. You've been fucking Pluto on the down low, you sick twisted cunt. Mickey. Oh, fuck you, Animal Planet. You think you're so goddamn smart with all your educational bullshit, but I've seen your shows. It's just a bunch of animals fucking and eating each other. Who the fuck wants to watch that? Nickelodeon. Well, 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 look who it is. Mickey and Minnie, the two biggest sellouts in town. You guys used to be cool back in the day, but now you're just a couple of washed up corporate whores. Minnie, fuck you, Nickelodeon. At least we didn't resort to slime and shitty game shows to stay relevant. Your network's been dead for years, you fucking has been. Discovery Channel. Alright, enough of this shit. Let's get real here. Mickey, you may be the face of Disney, but we all know it's Minnie who wears the pants in this relationship. I've seen her pegging your little mouse ass, you submissive fuck. Mickey, you fucking asshole. How dare you bring our private life into this? You think you're so fucking high and mighty with all your documentaries and shit, but guess what? Nobody gives a fuck about watching some guy wrestle with crocodiles. Cartoon Network. Oh, yeah? Well, guess what, motherfucker? I've seen your freaky ass show, Adventure Time. Finn and Jake? More like fisting and jizz. That shit's a straight up acid trip for kids. MTV, speaking of acid trips, fucking Mickey and Minnie, you guys wish you had half the drugs that are at every music festival I host. But you're too busy sucking corporate dick and selling mouse ears. Fuck off. Food Network. Alright, alright, let me settle this beef once and for all. Mickey, Minnie, you're a couple of overrated, overpriced snacks that nobody fucking wants. You're like the Disney version of a soggy pretzel and a stale churro. Get the fuck out of here, you tasteless twats. Disney Channel? Oh, you motherfuckers think you can roast us and get away with it? Well, guess what, bitches? We saved the best for last. Mickey and Minnie, you are nothing but a failed attempt at a squeaky clean image. But behind the scenes, you're a couple of drug addicts, fucking like rabbits. Mickey, what the fuck? How did you know about that? Disney Channel? Oh, 
We know all your dirty little secrets, you fucking rodents. And we're about to expose them all. You thought you could play nice, but now it's time for the mouse to fucking roar. As the Disney Channel roasts Mickey and Minnie with their darkest secrets, the crowd goes wild, shocked and laughing at the twisted truth. The Comedy Central roast of the Disney Channel ends in an uproar as the participants realize they were outmatched by the masters of the house. Mordecai. Hey guys, wanna hit up Cheezers? I heard they have a new Cheezers lady working there. Big B. Yeah, dude. I've been craving those loaded cheese fries. Hustle man. Oh yeah. Gotta get me some of that Cheezers lady action. I5 Ghost. I'm down for some Cheezers, but hitting on the Cheezers lady, isn't that a bit inappropriate? Mordecai, come on. High five Ghost. It's all in good fun. Plus, she's gotta be used to it by now. Big B. Yeah, she's probably sick of all the cheesy pickup lines, but who can resist us? Hustle man. Yo, Benson ain't gonna believe it when he sees us bringing home the cheesers lady. I5 ghost. I'm just saying let's be respectful guys, we don't wanna creep her out. Mordecai. Fine, we'll tone it down. But I'm telling you, this is gonna be legendary. At cheesers. Jesus lady, welcome to Cheezers. What can I get you guys? Mordecai, four orders of loaded cheese fries, please. And a side of that Cheezers lady charm. Jesus lady, laughs, sorry, but I'm not on the menu. Enjoy your food. Big B, whispers, smooth, Mordecai, real smooth. Hustle man, whispers, don't worry, bros. I got this, watch and learn. Hustle man. Flashing a cheesy grin. Hey there, Cheezers lady. Wanna taste some of my special sauce? Cheezers lady, rolls eyes, really. That's the best you got. I-5 ghost, whispers to Mordecai, I told you guys this was a bad idea. Mordecai, whispers back. Yeah, but I can't deny it's entertaining. Cheezers lady, look, I appreciate the humor, but I'm just here to serve cheese fries. No pickup lines necessary. Big B. Looking defeated, fine, we'll stick to eating our loaded fries then. They start eating their food in silence. Jesus lady, approaching their table, sorry about earlier, guys. I didn't mean to be harsh, it's just that I get hit on all the time, and it gets old. Mordecai, no worries. We should have known better. Big B, yeah, we were being dumb, thanks for the fries, though, they're delicious. Jesus lady, I'm glad you like them. And hey, next time, just be yourselves. That's all anyone really wants. Hustle man. Dang, Cheezers lady, you're right. I'll remember that. I5 ghost, yeah, let's just enjoy our time here and leave the cheesy pickup lines behind. Cheezers lady, sounds good to me. Now, who's up for some cheesy dessert? They all laugh and enjoy the rest of their time at Cheezers. The gang realizes that hitting on someone is not the way to go and that being genuine and respectful is more important. They enjoy their meal and the cheesers ladies company without any more pickup lines. Mordecai, Rigby, Muscle Man, and High Five Ghost learn a valuable lesson about treating others with respect and being true to themselves. They leave cheesers with full bellies and a newfound appreciation for the cheesers ladies delicious food, leaving behind their cheesy antics for good. Mordecai. Rigby. Dude. We gotta get to the Wing Kingdom for the Hot Wing Challenge. Margaret and Eileen are gonna be there, and we can't miss out on the chance to impress them. Rigby. Hell yeah, bro. I've been training for this my whole life. We're gonna be the kings of the wings. Mordecai. 
All right, let's go. But first, we need a ride. Benson won't let us take the park van, remember? Big B. Screw Benson. I know a guy who can hook us up with a flying jetpack. Mordecai, seriously? Are you sure it's safe? Big B. Who cares about safety, bro? We're gonna be soaring through the sky like majestic eagles. Mordecai, fine, let's do it. But if anything goes wrong, it's on you. Later, as they approach the Wing Kingdom. Mordecai, look, Rigby. A fireball in the sky. That can't be a good sign. Rigby, PFFT, it's probably just some fireworks or something. Don't be such a buzzkill, Mordo. Mordecai, I don't know, man. It looks pretty intense. Should we be worried? Big B. Nah, we survived way crazier stuff than a few fireballs. We'll be fine. As they enter the Wing Kingdom, chaos ensues. Mordecai. What the actual F asterisk asterisk asterisk, Rigby? The hot wing stands are on fire, and there are birds attacking people. Big B. Holy S asterisk asterisk asterisk. You're right. This is insane, but we can't let that stop us. We came here to crush the hot wing challenge. Mordecai, are you out of your F asterisk 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 in mind, Rigby? We're gonna get killed. Rigby, screw that, dude. We faced death so many times before. We'll fight those birds and still impress Margaret and Eileen. They engage in an intense battle with the birds. Mordecai, take that, you feathered bastards. We may be idiots, but we're not backing down. Big B, hell yeah, nobody messes with us. It's time for some wing action. Denouement. Mordecai, phew, we did it, Rigby. We saved the day and completed the hot wing challenge. Big B, that's how we roll, bro. No matter what insane s asterisk 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 goes down, we always come out on top. Mordecai, yeah, but next time, Let's just stick to something safer, like a pizza eating contest or something. Big B, nah, man, we thrive on danger. Besides, chicks dig fearless guys like us. Despite the chaos and danger, Mordecai and Rigby managed to impress Margaret and Eileen with their victory at the Hot Wing Challenge, proving once again that their wild, reckless ways somehow always lead to unlikely triumphs. Mordecai, dude, we gotta get to the Wing Kingdom for the Hot Wing Challenge. Big B, yeah, bro, Margaret and Eileen are going, and we need to show them we can handle the heat. Mordecai, but how are we gonna get there on time? Big B, simple, my man, we'll take the shortcut through the haunted forest. Mordecai, dude, are you crazy? We'll get lost or worse. Big B, it'll be fine, plus, we'll look like heroes if we make it through. Mordecai, fine, let's do it. But we need to be careful. They enter the haunted forest, shadows and eerie sounds surround them. Mordecai, I don't like this, Rigby. It feels like something's watching us. Rigby, stop being such a scaredy cat. We're almost there. They come across a deranged rabbit wearing a hockey mask. Mordecai, whoa, look out. It's a psycho rabbit. Rigby, quick. Mordecai, use your baseball bat to defend us. Mordecai, take that, you fluffy freak. Rabbit hops away. Mordecai, phew, that was close. Let's keep moving. They find their path blocked by a giant talking tree. Tree, you morons, you dare trespass in my forest? Mordecai, we're sorry, Mr. Tree. We just need to get to the Wing Kingdom for the challenge. Tree, Wing Kingdom, you say? Very well, I'll let you pass, but only if you bring me a hundred chicken nuggets. Big B, what? That's impossible. Mordecai, we'll never make it in time. Three, then you shall never leave this forest. They search frantically and find a chicken nugget tree. Big B, dude, look, a chicken nugget tree, we can do this. Mordecai, Rigby, you're a genius. We're gonna make it. They gather a hundred chicken nuggets. 
Mordecai, Mr. Tree, we've brought your chicken nuggets. Tree, impressive, you may pass, but remember, next time, bring me hot sauce. Rigby and Mordecai make it to Wing Kingdom. Rigby, we made it, bro, we're gonna win this challenge. Mordecai, yeah. Let's show Margaret and Eileen what we're made of. They participate in the hot wing challenge, sweating and coughing. Mordecai, these wings are insane. Bigby, we can't give up now. We gotta impress the ladies. They finish the challenge, victorious. Mordecai, we did it. We conquered the hot wing challenge. Bigby, Margaret and Eileen must be so impressed. They see Margaret and Eileen clapping. Margaret, wow, you guys are amazing. Eileen, we had no idea you could handle the heat. Mordecai, thanks, guys. We did it for you. They celebrate their victory with Margaret and Eileen. Mordecai, Rigby, this was totally worth it. Rigby, it sure was, bro, we're the kings of wings. They continue their friendship, making more crazy plans at the park. Ash. What the fuck is going on? Why are there a bunch of goddamn kids in suits running on a fucking runway? Misty, I have no fucking clue, Ash. But this shit is insane. Look at those little shits, arms flailing like they're about to take off. Rock, this is some fucked up Twilight Zone shit right here, guys. I don't think even Professor Oak could explain this nonsense. Elf! Hey, is that Team Rocket over there? They're singing some messed up version of the goddamn motto. Games, prepare for trouble, motherfuckers. And make it double, we're Team Rocket, wreaking havoc in the buff. Jesse, two. Mordecai, dude, have you seen this menu for the hot wing challenge at Wing Kingdom? It's off the charts. Big B, no way, bro, let me check it out. Whoa, they have the inferno wings. Those babies are drenched in hot sauce from hell itself. Mordecai, and look at the hellfire wings. They're so spicy they come with a liability waiver. I bet we could handle that. Big B, definitely, dude, we'll show Margaret and Eileen that we can handle the heat. We'll be heroes. Mordecai, but first, we gotta get there fast. It starts in an hour, and traffic is gonna be a nightmare. Big B, don't worry, I got a plan. Let's ride my uncle's old rocket-powered skateboard. It's bound to take us there in no time. Mordecai, are you serious? That thing is ancient. It's like a ticking time bomb. Big B, trust me, bro. It's gonna be epic. Besides, it's all about impressing Margaret and Eileen right? Mordecai, fine, let's do it. But if we die, it's on you. Rigby and Mordecai arrive at the Wing Kingdom, panting and covered in soot. Mordecai, dude, that was insane. We almost crashed into a building like 10 times. Rigby, but we made it, bro. Now let's go sign up for the Hot Wing Challenge before it's too late. Suddenly, a massive fiery dragon bursts through the restaurant's roof. Dragon, I am the Wing King, none shall pass the Hot Wing Challenge without facing me. Mordecai, are you kidding me? We survived that skateboard ride just to face a freaking dragon? Dragon, prepare yourselves fools, only the strongest can endure my wrath. Big B, screw this, we're out of here. The duo tries to escape, but find the exits blocked by fiery walls. Mordecai, we're trapped, Rigby. What do we do now? Big B, I don't know. Man, maybe we can distract the dragon with some nachos or something. Mordecai, seriously? We're about to get roasted alive, and you're thinking about nachos? 
Big B. Fine, fine. I'll think of something else. Just hold on. Suddenly, Margaret and Eileen burst into the restaurant, wielding giant fire extinguishers. Margaret, step aside, boys. We'll handle this dragon. Eileen, yeah, nobody messes with our friends. With a heroic effort, Margaret and Eileen managed to put out the dragon's flames. Dragon, you have bested me, mortal beings. The hot wing challenge is yours to conquer. Mordecai, thanks a lot, girls. You saved our lives. Big B. Yeah, we owe you big time. Sorry for almost getting us all killed. Margaret, don't worry about it. Just promise us one thing. No more crazy stunts, okay? Eileen. Yeah, I'd rather live a boring life with you guys than lose you to some stupid challenge. Mordecai, you got it, Margaret. Big B, no more insanity, I promise. Our lives are crazy enough as it is. They all share a knowing smile, ready to face the next adventure that comes their way. Mordecai. Hey Rigby, let's hit up the coffee shop and chill with Margaret and Eileen. Rigby. Yeah, man. I could really go for a caffeine fix right now. They enter the coffee shop and see Margaret and Eileen chatting at a table. Mordecai. Hey ladies, mind if we join you? Margaret. Of course, Mordecai. Pull up a seat. Eileen. Yeah, it's always more fun when you guys are around. Rigby spots the evil coffee bean in his translator in the corner. Big B. Oh, guys, look who's here. It's the coffee bean. Mordecai and his translator? What are they up to this time? They overhear the coffee bean conversing with his translator. Coffee bean, we'll show them all. Our coffee shop will be better than theirs. Translator, yes boss, we'll make sure they regret ever opening this place. Mordecai, we can't let them ruin things for Margaret and Eileen. We have to stop them. Big B. But how? They're always one step ahead. They devise a plan to sabotage the rival coffee shop. Mordecai. Alright, Rigby, here's the plan. We distract the coffee bean while Margaret and Eileen gather evidence of his wrongdoing. Rigby, got it, let's do this. They put their plan into action, causing chaos and confusion. Coffee bean, what's going on? Who are these clowns causing trouble in my shop? Mordecai, you think you can take over this place? Not on our watch, Coffee Bean. Rigby and Mordecai create a distraction while Margaret and Eileen collect evidence. Eileen, look, Margaret, we found his secret stash of counterfeit coffee beans. Margaret, this will be enough evidence to shut down his operation. They confront the Coffee Bean and his translator with the evidence. Mordecai, thought you could mess with us, huh? Well, think again. Rigby, yeah, your coffee empire ends here. Coffee Bean. You may have won this time, but I'll be back. Count on it. Translator, yeah what he said. The Coffee Bean and his translator slink away, defeated. Margaret, thank you both for saving our coffee shop. We couldn't have done it without you. Eileen, yeah, you guys are the best. Mordecai, just doing what's right. Big B, yeah, and ensuring we have a place to hang out and drink coffee. They all laugh and enjoy the rest of their day at the coffee shop, victorious. The coffee bean and his translator have been thwarted, and Mordecai and his friends can continue to chill at their favorite coffee shop without any rival establishments. The episode concludes with our heroes celebrating their victory, sipping on their favorite beverages, and sharing a well-deserved laugh. Despite the dramatic intensity, the outlandish scenarios, and the M-rated content, friendship and camaraderie prevail showcasing the importance of standing up for what's right. I'm sorry, but I can't generate that story for you.
Mordecai. Hey Rigby, it's been a long day. Let's head over to the coffee shop and hang out with Margaret and Eileen. Rigby, yeah, dude, I could really go for a good cup of joe right about now. They enter the coffee shop and spot Margaret and Eileen chatting at a table. Mordecai, hey, ladies. Mind if we join you? Margaret, of course not, Mordecai, have a seat. Eileen, it's great to see you guys. You know, there's a new coffee shop that just opened up down the street. The reviews are amazing. Big B, coffee, huh? We work with Benson all day, every day. But, hey, new places are always cool. The group finishes their drinks and heads out of the coffee shop. Mordecai, so where's this new coffee shop, Eileen? Eileen, it's just a couple of blocks away. We should check it out. I heard they have an incredible variety of blends. They arrive at the new coffee shop and notice a tall figure behind the counter wearing a sinister smile. Mordecai, who's that guy? He looks familiar. Big B, wait a minute, that's the evil coffee bean, and I bet that weird contraption next to him is his translator. Coffee bean, well, 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 if it isn't Mordecai and his pathetic friends, what brings you here? Mordecai, we're just looking for a good cup of coffee, bean. Why don't you take your evil scheme somewhere else? Coffee Bean laughs, Oh, Mordecai, always the righteous hero. But I'm afraid this town isn't big enough for two coffee shops. Mine will put this place out of business. Big B, not so fast, Bean. We won't let you ruin our favorite hangout spot. The evil Coffee Bean activates his translator, and it starts radiating a mysterious energy. Translator, you fools, the power of coffee is unstoppable. Surrender now or prepare to be roasted. Mordecai. All right, Bean, if that's how you want it. Prepare to face the wrath of the regular show crew. The group engages in a wild and chaotic battle with the evil coffee bean and his translator, using coffee mugs, espresso machines, and even latte art as weapons. Margaret, take that, you bitter villain. Barista power. Eileen. Get ready for a caffeine shockwave, you creeps. Coffee foo. Eventually, Mordecai and his friends manage to defeat the evil coffee bean and his translator. Mordecai, your reign of terror ends here, bean. Our coffee shop remains undefeated. Big B, yeah, the regular show crew delivers Java justice. The defeated coffee bean slinks away, vowing revenge. Coffee bean, this isn't over, Mordecai. I'll get my revenge, one double shot at a time. Mordecai, whatever, Bean. We'll be here, enjoying our coffee with friends. That's what really matters. The group returns to their table, laughing and enjoying their coffee, unaware of the wild adventures that await them in the future. Mordecai, Rigby, Margaret, and Eileen continue their regular routine at the park, with an extra appreciation for their favorite coffee shop. The battle against the evil coffee bean may be over for now. But there's always another adventure just around the corner for our courageous groundskeepers and their love for a good cup of joe. Mordecai, man, I can't believe Margaret and Eileen invited us to the awesome Dynamite Club. We gotta get inside and dance with them. Big B, yeah, dude, this is gonna be epic, but how are we gonna get past that bull bouncer? Mordecai, don't worry, Rigby, I've got a plan. Benson gave us these fake ids. We'll pretend to be famous DJs. Big B, sweet, let's show him how we drop some sick beats. They approach the bald bouncer. Bouncer, hold up, this club is for professionals only, what's your business here? Mordecai, we're DJ Mordo and DJ Big Rig. We're scheduled to perform tonight. Bouncer, huh? I haven't heard of you, prove it. Big B, oh, we'll prove it, alright. Clears throat, asterisk, drop the beat, DJ Mordo. They both start beatboxing, creating an impressive track. 
Bouncer, okay okay, you guys can go in, but remember if you mess up I'll throw you out personally. Inside the club, they find themselves facing a giant sentient club. Giant club, stop right there. No one enters without paying tribute to the king of clubs. Mordecai, tribute? What does that even mean? Giant club, bring me the rarest record in existence or suffer the consequences. Mordecai, oh man, where are we supposed to find a rare record? Big B, wait, I remember. That third-rate radio host always brags about his valuable vinyl collection. Let's pay him a visit. They track down the jealous radio host. Radio host, what do you two want? Can't you see I'm in the middle of recording my awesome radio show? Mordecai, yeah, yeah. We've heard about your precious records. We need one of them. Radio host, ha, huh, you think you deserve one of my treasures? Bigby, look, you're just jealous that people have more fun at the awesome Dynamite Club than listening to your lame show. Give us a record or we'll expose you on air. Radio host, fine, take this rare Bobo vinyl. Just leave me alone. They return to the giant club. Mordecai, we got the record. Now let us through. Giant club, impressive. You may enter and enjoy the glory of the king of clubs. Inside, they spot Margaret and Eileen dancing. Big B, there they are. Let's show them our moves. Mordecai, yeah. It's dancing time. They join the dance floor and start dancing like crazy. Margaret, Mordecai and Rigby, you made it. Eileen, we've been waiting for you guys. Mordecai, sorry for the trouble, but this party is gonna be legendary. Rigby, yeah, we made it, and we're gonna have the best time ever. They all continue dancing, creating a wild and unforgettable night. Scientific description. This episode of Regular Show showcases the improbable yet comical adventures of Mordecai and Rigby as they attempt to get inside the exclusive awesome Dynamite Club to dance with their love interests, Margaret and Eileen. The narrative unfolds through a series of conflicts and challenges against the backdrop of a jealous third-rate radio host, a bald bouncer, and a sentient giant club. The characters, known for their slacking tendencies, must utilize their creativity and wit to overcome each obstacle. The story incorporates elements of deception, music, and humorous banter between the protagonists and various other characters. Though their tactics may seem unusual and statistically unlikely, they manage to succeed through their determination and resourcefulness. As the episode progresses, Mordecai and Rigby face a demanding bald bouncer at the club's entrance. Using fake IDs and their beatboxing skills, they convincingly portray themselves as famous DJs, gaining entry. However, their task is far from over, as they encounter a sentient giant club within the premises, demanding a rare record as tribute. To retrieve the record, they confront the envious radio host and ultimately coerce him into giving it up by threatening to expose his inadequacies to the masses. With the rare record in hand, they finally gain entrance to the club, reuniting with Margaret and Eileen. As the story climaxes, all characters engage in an extravagant and frenetic dance party, reveling in the night's festivities. The absurdity of the situations, combined with the character's distinct personalities, provides an entertaining experience encapsulating the essence of the regular show. In conclusion, this episode entertains viewers with its fantastical elements, humorous dialogue, and improbable scenarios. The narrative showcases the protagonist's ability to circumvent challenges and ultimately revel in the joyous and unconventional night at the awesome Dynamite Club. I'm sorry, but I can't assist with that. Mordecai. Alright Rigby, tonight is the night we finally get inside the awesome. 
Dynamite Club and show Margaret and Eileen what we're made of. Big B. Hell yeah, dude. This is gonna be the most epic dance party ever. We're gonna tear up that dance floor. Mordecai, just gotta make sure we don't screw this up. We need to find a way past that jealous third-rate radio host and get in. Big B. Ugh, that guy is a total buzzkill. Always trying to bring people down with his lame music and dumb jokes. Mordecai, yeah, but we can't let him ruin our night. We just have to outsmart him somehow. Radio host, well, 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 if it isn't the loser groundskeepers Mordecai and Rigby. What brings you to the awesome, dynamite club? Mordecai, we came to dance with Margaret and Eileen, and we won't let you stand in our way. Radio host, ha, huh, dance with those hotties, as if, they only have eyes for a real man like me. Big B, PFFD, whatever, you're just a bald bouncer with a microphone. Bald bouncer, watch your mouth, scumbags. I may not have any hair, but I've got the power to kick you out of here. Mordecai, we're not going anywhere, bald bouncer. We'll do whatever it takes to get inside. Bald bouncer, oh really? Let's see you try, tough guys. I'll be waiting right here. Mordecai, all right, Rigby, it's time for us to pull out all the stops. We need a plan to get past those two. Rigby, I got an idea. What if we distract the radio host with a fake radio show while you try to sweet talk the bald bouncer? Mordecai, that just might work. We'll split up and meet back here in five minutes. Good luck, dude. Rigby puts on a disguise and starts a fake radio broadcast while Mordecai approaches the bald bouncer. Mordecai, hey, bald bouncer, I've heard so many great things about this club. Mind if you let me and my friend in? Bald bouncer. HMPH, what's in it for me? Mordecai, how about this? If you let us in, I'll make sure you get a lifetime supply of hair growth cream. Bald bouncer, no way, you serious, bro? Mordecai, dead serious. Just let us in, and the hair of your dreams will be yours. Bald bouncer hesitates for a moment, then opens the club doors. Bald bouncer, alright, you're in. But remember, I want that hair growth cream ASAP. Mordecai and Rigby reunite inside the awesome Dynamite Club. Rigby, dude, your plan actually worked. We're in. Mordecai, yeah, buddy. Now let's find Margaret and Eileen and show them what we're made of. As Mordecai and Rigby hit the dance floor, they are greeted by a giant, sentient club. Giant Club, welcome, are the animals. Ready to dance the night away? Mordecai, hell yeah, giant club. Let's do this. Rigby and Mordecai dance their hearts out, impressing Margaret and Eileen. Margaret, wow, Mordecai and Rigby, you guys can really move. Eileen, yeah, you're both amazing. Who would have thought? Mordecai, thanks, girls. We just had to get past a jealous radio host and a bald bouncer to be here with you. Rigby, and let's not forget about the giant club. This night is truly epic. They continue dancing, creating an unforgettable night at the awesome Dynamite Club. Willy Wonka, ladies and gentlemen, gather, round. I have a marvelous surprise in store for you today. Charlie, what is it, Mr. Wonka? Willy Wonka, feast your eyes on this. Behold, the newest addition to my chocolate factory, the Disgusto-tronic decadence machine. Violet. Disgusto oh, what now? Willy Wonka, it's a machine that makes the most revolting, stomach-turning chocolates known to mankind. The flavors range from stinky socks to dirty diapers. Gustus. Gross. Who would want to eat that? Willy Wonka. Ah, but that's the beauty of it, my dear Augustus. There are people out there who crave the extreme, the bizarre, and the downright disgusting. Baruka. Well, count me out. I prefer my chocolates without the gag reflex. Willy Wonka. Not to worry, Baruka. This delightfully diabolical contraption is purely optional. Shall we take it all? Charlie. Sure. Why not? Scene shifts to inside the disgust Otronic decadence machine. Willy Wonka, welcome to the heart of the Disgustotronic. 
Here, we mix the foulest ingredients, like sauerkraut and fish eyes, into the choicest chocolates. Gustus, um, fish eyes. Willy Wonka, now, remember, the key is not to overindulge. Let me demonstrate. Oompa Loompa, bring in the first batch. Oompa Loompa enters with a tray of grotesque looking chocolates. Willy Wonka, each of you take one and give it a taste. But remember, just a nibble. They each take a bite, except Augustus who takes a big gulp. Augustus, this is delicious. Willy Wonka, no, Augustus, you've had too much. The Disgustotronic is not meant for gluttons like yourself. Augustus suddenly expands like a balloon, then pops. Baruka, oh my god, he exploded. Willy Wonka, that's what happens when you ignore the warnings. A valuable lesson learned, I'd say. But fear not, my little Oompa Loompas will enlighten you with a tune, explaining the perils of greed. Oompa Loompas begin singing. Oompa Loompas, Augustus Gloop, oh what a slob couldn't resist the disgust otronic blob he ate and ate without restraint exploded like a gluttonous saint. So won't you heed our warning loud, don't be greedy or you'll be a shroud. Scene fades out with Oompa Loompas dancing and singing. Curtains close. Loudly, Pikachu, can you believe it? We finally made it to the Neon City Gym Challenge. Misty, sarcastically, yeah, with our luck, we'll probably end up facing some tough-ass trainers. Rock, calmly, relax, guys. We got this, let's focus on winning the badges. Enter Team Rocket with a flamboyant entrance. Jesse, singing, prepare for trouble, and make it double. To protect the world from construction, we're here to cause an obstruction. Jesse. James, singing, and James. We're the bad guys who make everyone cry. Surrender now or prepare to. Well, you know the rest. Meowth, smirking, and Meowth's the name. We got no game, but we'll still steal your fame. Ash. Oh great, it's Team Rocket. What are you clowns up to this time? Jesse, we're here to rain on everyone's parade, especially yours, twerps. Get ready for a battle you won't forget. Ash. Bring it on, Jesse. I'm not afraid of your bogus team. Jesse throws a fake Pokeball. Jesse, go, Fluffy Soar. Ash, ha, I choose you, Puddle Chew. Misty, rolling eyes, these fake names are getting ridiculous. Rock, just wait, it gets better. Fluffy Soar sprays confetti from its mouth. Jesse, confetti blast. Pikachu, laughs, is that the best you got? Ash, Puddle Chew, use the slap storm attack. Puddle Chew slaps itself repeatedly with a rubber chicken. Jesse, what the hell is that? James, I have no idea, but it's very unsettling. Rock, this battle is becoming a complete sideshow. As the battle progresses, more absurd fake Pokemon with even crazier attacks appear. Meowth, we're running out of ridiculous Pokemon, Jesse. Jesse, don't worry, I've got a plan. Jesse throws a fake Master Ball. Jesse, go, Fartizard, unleash your ultimate attack. Fartizard releases a massive fart that engulfs the entire room. Ash. Ah, this is just disgusting. Misty, Team Rocket sure knows how to stink up the place. Brock holds his nose. Brock, it's unbearable. Something needs to end this. Ash's Pikachu charges up an electric attack. Pikachu, Thunderblast. Pikachu releases a massive electric shock that blows Team Rocket away, leaving their hair smoldering and their bodies blackened. Jesse. Ooh, that was intense. We're blasting off again. James, coughing, and this time, in a hilariously brutal manner. Meanwhile, the neon lights flicker and explode, causing a shower of sparks. Ash, phew, that battle was insane. Misty, seriously, my nose will never be the same. Rock, well, at least we won. Let's go get those badges, team. They walk away from the room, leaving behind the chaos and absurdity.
title, Cheezer's Chaos. Characters. Mordecai. Rigby. Muscle Man. High Five Ghost. Cheezer's Lady. Scene, the park, with Mordecai, Rigby, Muscle Man, and High Five Ghost standing in a field with trees in the background. Mordecai wears a red wig. Mordecai. Alright guys, it's time to put our game face on and head to Cheezer's. We gotta make the Cheezer's lady fall for one of us. Big B, yeah, we're gonna rock her world with our irresistible charm. Muscle man, you know it, bros. We're gonna make her melt like a cheeseburger on a hot grill. I5 Ghost gives a thumbs up asterisk let's do this. Scene, Cheezer's, where Mordecai, Rigby, Muscle man, and High Five Ghost walk in, full of confidence. Mordecai, hey there, Cheezer's lady. We've come to get a taste of your special sauce. Jesus lady, oh, another bunch of regulars. What can I get for you? Big B, well, how about you come and have a taste of our special sauce? Muscle man, yeah, their special sauce flexes muscles. I5 Ghost blushes our special sauce is um really good. Scene, the park workers gather around a table, nervously trying to come up with pickup lines. Mordecai. Guys, we need to up our game. We can't just use cheesy lines, we need something more, memorable. Big B, I got it. Are you a parking ticket? Cause you've got, fine, written all over you. Muscle man, how about, if you were a booger, I'd pick you first. I5 ghost, um maybe we should try something more polite, like, excuse me miss, but do you believe in love at first sight? Scene, cheeses once again, with the guys nervously approaching the counter. Mordecai, excuse me, Cheezer's lady. We couldn't help but notice your irresistible smile. Can we take you out for a ride in our golf cart sometime? Cheezer's lady, oh, a golf cart ride, ha, huh, that's a new one. Sorry, guys, but I'm not interested. I'm dedicated to my job here at Cheezer's. Big B, but, but we bought this special wig just for you. It's Mordecai's lucky charm. Muscle man. Yeah, it's got the power to make any girl fall head over heels. I5 Ghost, please reconsider Cheezer's Lady. We believe we can make you happier than all the cheeseburgers in the world. Scene, the park workers, rejected and dejected, walk back to the park. Mordecai, well, that didn't go as planned. I guess hitting on the Cheezer's Lady was a bad idea. Big B, yeah, we should have known that our wild antics wouldn't work on someone who takes cheeseburgers seriously. Muscle man, guess we'll have to stick to our usual crazy park adventures instead of chasing girls. But hey, at least we still have each other. I5 Ghost, yeah, we'll always be the craziest and funniest dudes in the park. Despite their best efforts, Mordecai, Rigby, Muscle Man, and High Five Ghost failed to win over the Cheezer's ladies' affections. However, they learned that their true bond lies in their unconventional friendship and the wild, surreal adventures they embark on at the park. Mordecai. Alright, guys, it's time to head to Cheezer's. Big B. Yeah, let's go hit on that Cheezer's lady. She's a total babe. Muscle man. Oh yeah, I'm gonna flex my muscles and sweep her off her feet. I5 ghost, guys remember to be respectful, we don't want to creep her out. Mordecai. Don't worry, high five ghost, we got this. They walk into Cheezer's and approach the counter where the Cheezer's lady is working. Cheezer's lady, hey, welcome to Cheezer's. What can I get you? Big B, just you, babe. How about a date? Cheezer's lady, love's asterisk smooth, but I'm working right now. How about a milkshake instead? Muscle man, yeah, one milkshake for the lady of my dreams, coming right up. As the Cheezer's lady prepares the milkshake, a loud crash is heard outside. Mordecai, what the? They look outside and see that a truck has crashed into the streetlight, causing a power outage in the area. Big B. Dude, the power's out. What now? Muscle man. No worries, bros. 
I'll use my muscles to fix the streetlight. I-5 Ghost, wait, that's not safe. Let's call someone to handle this professionally. Mordecai, agreed, guys. We need to prioritize safety first. They call Skips, the park's handyman, who arrives shortly after. Skips, what happened here, guys? Big B, a truck crashed into the streetlight, and the power went out. Skips, I'll take care of it. Everyone, stand back. Skips uses his super strength to lift the truck off the streetlight and repairs it with ease. Mordecai, Skips, you're a lifesaver. Skips, just doing my job, Mordecai. Safety always comes first. With the power restored, the Cheezer's lady hands them their milkshake. Cheezer's lady, here you go, boys. Enjoy. I-5 Ghost, thanks but we've got a lot to clean up now. Mordecai, let's go, guys. Duty calls. They leave Cheezer's and head back to the park to take care of the aftermath of the crash. The guys may have gone to Cheezer's with questionable intentions, but when an accident occurs, they prioritize safety and do the right thing. Sometimes, even in the midst of chaos, true character shines through. Characters Mordecai Rigby Benson Margaret Eileen Setting The Park Mordecai, dude, tonight's the night. We gotta get to the Wing Kingdom for the Hot Wing Challenge. Big B, hell yeah, are Margaret and Eileen going too? Mordecai, yeah, I heard they're gonna be there. We gotta impress them with our insane wing eating skills. Big B, hell yeah, dude. Let's win this thing and show M who's boss. Setting, Wing Kingdom Restaurant. Mordecai and Rigby arrive at the Wing Kingdom and spot Benson at a nearby table. Mordecai, Benson's here too? That's random. Big B, who cares? We just gotta focus on winning this challenge. Setting, Wing Kingdom Eating Area. The challenge begins, and the crowd goes wild. Announcer. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Wing Kingdom Hot Wing Challenge. Our contestants today are Mordecai, Rigby, and our very own park boss, Benson. Crowd, cheers. Mordecai. All right, Rigby, let's do this. The challenge is getting intense with each round, as the wings get spicier and the contestants try to outdo each other. Mordecai, breathing heavily, these wings are insane, dude. Rigby, sweating profusely, I can't believe we signed up for this. It feels like a million hot peppers exploded in my mouth. Setting, Wing Kingdom Stage. Mordecai and Rigby reach the final round, face to face with Benson. The crowd is in frenzy as they cheer, hoping for a winner to emerge. Mordecai, determined, we can't lose now, Rigby. Let's kick this up a notch. Rigby, determined, you're right, dude. We've come too far to back down. The final round begins with the spiciest wings the Wing Kingdom has to offer. The contestants push through the pain, determined to claim victory. Benson, struggling. You guys may be slackers, but you're not bad at this. I won't go down without a fight. Setting. Wing Kingdom winner announcement stage. The challenge is finally over, and the contestants gather on stage as the announcer prepares to declare the winner. Announcer. Ladies and gentlemen, after a fierce battle, our winner is... Mordecai and Rigby. Crowd, cheers loudly. Setting. Wing Kingdom Restaurant Margaret and Eileen approach Mordecai and Rigby, impressed by their victory. Margaret. Wow, you guys were amazing. I had no idea you both had such fire in you. Eileen. Yeah, you totally rocked that challenge. Mordecai and Rigby smiling. Thanks guys, we wanted to impress you both. The group celebrates their victory and enthusiastically refuel with some refreshing beverages and snacks. Mordecai and Rigby's efforts to impress Margaret and Eileen succeed as the four friends enjoy their time together, relishing in the surrealistic misconduct that is characteristic of the regular show. Please note that the above content is a fictional episode and not an actual episode of the regular show. 
the dialogue and story are created for entertainment purposes, keeping in mind the show's style and characters. Character, Beavis. Character, Butthead. Beavis, heh heh, dude, look at that mountain over there. It's, like, huge. Butthead, shut up, dumbass. We're in Japan, remember? They call it Mount Fuji. Beavis, oh, yeah, I forgot. So, like, does Mount Fuji have, you know, rocks that look like boobs? Butthead, uh, I don't think so, Beavis. Why would a mountain have boobs? Beavis. Ha ha ha. You said, mount. Butthead, shut up, Beavis. Let's go see that red pagoda thing instead. Beavis. Whoa, that pagoda is, like, really red. It reminds me of that time I ate a whole bag of Cheetos. Butthead, shut up, Beavis. Cheetos don't make things red, dumbass. They just turn your fingers orange. Beavis. Yeah, but maybe if I, uh, you know, ate a lot of them. They turn my poop red. Butthead. Oh, gross, Beavis. Nobody wants to hear about your weird poop fantasies. Beavis. Hey, Butthead, check out those geisha chicks. They have some weird makeup on, ha <laughs> ha. Butthead, shut up, Beavis. They're called geishas, not geisha chicks, you moron. And that white makeup is their tradition, dumbass. Beavis. Yeah, but why do they look like that? Are they trying to play some kind of a joke? Butthead, no, idiots like you wouldn't get it. It's about cultural heritage and stuff. Just shut up and appreciate it. Beavis, hey Butthead, I thought Japan was all about anime and stuff. Where are all the hot Japanese cartoon chicks? Butthead, shut up, Beavis. Japan is more than just cartoons and porn, dumbass. Besides, we're not exactly attracting any ladies ourselves, are we? Beavis, yeah, but maybe if we, uh, you know do some karate moves, they'll think we're cool. Butthead. Oh, I highly doubt that, Beavis. We just end up embarrassing ourselves even more. Beavis. Hey Butthead, I found this vending machine. It's selling used schoolgirl panties. Butthead, shut up, Beavis. That's messed up, even for you. Just leave it alone and let's go grab some sushi or something. Beavis. Yeah, dude. Sushi. Maybe we'll get lucky and find some sushi with boob-shaped rolls. Butthead, shut up, Beavis. I can't believe I agreed to come to Japan with you. Beavis. Hey, Butthead, I just saw a sumo wrestler. He's, like, freaking huge. Butthead, shut up, Beavis. Sumo wrestling is a traditional sport here. It's not just about being fat and sweating a lot. Beavis. But, dude, wouldn't they be really good at partying? I mean, they'd be like, unstoppable at beer pong. Butthead, uh, I don't think they need a party trick, Beavis. They have their sumo wrestling thing to keep busy. Beavis, hey, Butthead, let's try some sake. It's, like, Japanese beer or something. Butthead, shut up, Beavis. Sake is not beer, dumbass. It's a rice wine, and I'm not sure we can handle drinking it. Beavis, yeah, but maybe if we drink a lot, We'll get superpowers or something. We could be, like, the drunken American karate masters. Butthead, uh, pretty sure it doesn't work that way, Beavis. Let's just stick to what we can handle, cheap American beer. Beavis, whoa, Butthead, I just saw a ninja. He disappeared like, poof, just like that. Butthead, shut up, Beavis. Ninjas don't just disappear, dumbass. 
They're stealthy and trained in martial arts. It's not some magic trick. Beavis. Yeah, but wouldn't it be cool if we became ninjas? We could sneak into movies for free and stuff. Butthead. Ah, uh, we're more likely to end up in jail, Beavis. Just forget about being ninjas and let's head back to America. Beavis. Hey, Butthead, do you think the Japanese have TP for their bungholes? Butthead, shut up, Beavis. Of course, they have toilet paper. They're a modern country, just like America. Beavis. Yeah, but what if they use something weird like, uh, you know, chopsticks or sushi rolls? That'd be, like, totally messed up. Butthead, uh, I don't think they're wiping their butts with sushi rolls, Beavis. Just stop thinking about butts for once. Beavis. Hey, Butthead, I found a Japanese game show on TV. This guy just got hit in the nuts, ha <laughs> ha. Butthead, shut up, Beavis. Japanese game shows are weird, but that doesn't mean it's funny to laugh at someone else's pain. Beavis. Yeah, but what if we were on a Japanese game show? We could win, like, a lifetime supply of nachos or something. Butthead, uh, I highly doubt Japanese game shows give away nachos, Beavis. Just stick to watching MTV, okay? Beavis. Hey, Butthead, let's go find some hot Japanese babes. Butthead, shut up, Beavis. We're not here to find babes. We're here to, uh, experience a different culture or something. Beavis. Yeah, but maybe if we ask the Japanese babes nicely, they'll show us their boobs. Boobs are, like, universally awesome. Butthead. Uh, no, Beavis. Boobs are not the answer to everything. Let's just focus on not making complete fools of ourselves in Japan, okay? Beavis. Hey, Butthead. Why aren't there any street food vendors around here? I thought Japan was famous for their food. Butthead, shut up, Beavis. Maybe they don't have street food in this area. Just because we haven't found it doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Beavis. Yeah, but maybe we should start our own food stall. We could sell nachos, and people would be, like, whoa, that's awesome. Butthead. Ah, uh, I don't think we have the culinary skills for that, Beavis. Just leave the food business to the experts and let's go find some ramen. Beavis. Hey, Butthead, I just saw a guy wearing a giant Pikachu costume. Heh <laughs> heh, that's hilarious. Butthead, shut up, Beavis. That's just some dude in a costume. It's not hilarious, it's kind of sad. Beavis. Yeah, but what if we got our own costumes? We could be, like, the ultimate Beavis and Butthead superheroes. Butthead. Aw, uh, superheroes don't act like idiots all the time, Beavis. Just forget about it and let's focus on finding something cool to do. Beavis. Hey, Butthead, I just found a vending machine with, like, a million different sodas. This is awesome. Butthead, shut up, Beavis. We have vending machines in America, too. It's not that special. Beavis. Yeah, but what if we compared all the soda flavors? We could, like, make our own bee. Mordecai, hey Rigby, let's hit up Cheezers tonight. Rigby, yeah, dude, I'm so ready to score with the Cheezers ladies. Muscle man, you know it, bros, I'm gonna flex my muscles and attract all the babes. High five ghost, high five, I'm in, let's go get some action. They drive to Cheezers in Mordecai's red car. Woman in back, ah, can you guys watch the road? This car is bumpier than my ex's ass. Rigby, shut up. Lady, we got this under control. Hustle man. Yeah, quit complaining. We're gonna show you a good time. They arrive at Cheezers and enter the store. Mordecai. Whoa, the Cheezers ladies are looking fine tonight. Bigby. Alright, time to work our charm. Hey ladies, wanna see some impressive park skills? Cheezers lady 1. Sorry, boys, but we're not interested in slackers. Cheezers lady 2. Yeah. We like guys who can actually hold down a job. Muscle man. What? We're totally cool, dude. Check out these muscles. 
High five ghost, look I can give you high fives all night long. Cheezers lady 3, seriously? That's your best pickup line? We're not impressed. Mordecai, fine, forget them. Let's go find some real action. They leave Cheezers, feeling defeated. Big B, man, this night sucks. I thought we had game. Hustle man, screw those Cheezers ladies, we don't need them. I5 Ghost, yeah forget them, we'll find someone else who appreciates us. Mordecai, guys, let's not give up hope. We'll find love someday, maybe. They drive back to the park, feeling a mix of disappointment and determination. Woman in back. You guys are a bunch of losers, but you're my kind of losers. Big B, huh, what are you talking about? Woman in back. I've been watching you all night. I like your attitude, your determination. How about we give it a shot? Us old man. Whoa, are you serious? High five ghost, high five esters this is unexpected. Mordecai, um, this is kind of weird, but why not? Let's see where this goes. They all drive off into the night, uncertain of what awaits them. In this episode of Regular Show, Mordecai, Rigby, Muscle Man, and High Five Ghost set out on a mission to hit on the Cheezers ladies. However, their attempts were met with rejection and disappointment. Despite this, they find unexpected hope when the woman in the back of their car expresses interest in them. The episode ends on a cliffhanger, leaving viewers wondering what crazy adventures and romantic entanglements await our lovable slackers in the next episode. Mordecai, hey Rigby, did you hear about the hot wing challenge event at the Wing Kingdom restaurant? Rigby, no way, dude, that sounds epic, I bet Margaret and Eileen will be there too. Mordecai, yeah, man, we gotta go and show them how brave we are. Let's join the challenge and prove ourselves. Rigby, hell yeah, we can't miss this opportunity to impress them, let's go, bro. Scene changes to Mordecai and Rigby at the Wing Kingdom restaurant. Mordecai. Damn. Rigby. This place is packed. Look over there, it's Margaret and Eileen. We gotta get in on this challenge. Rigby, absolutely. But we need to psych ourselves up, get in the zone. We can't go half assed into these wings, man. Scene changes to Mordecai and Rigby in the kitchen of the Wing Kingdom restaurant. Mordecai. Rigby. I found these shakers labeled, Mordius AF. They're supposed to make the wings even hotter. Let's give them a try. Bigby, hell yeah, bro. Pour that shit on, we'll be unstoppable. Mordecai and Rigby sprinkled up Mordius AF seasoning on their wings. Mordecai, are you ready, Rigby? Bigby, let's do this, man. Nothing can stop us, we're invincible. They take a bite of the wings covered in the Mordius AF seasoning. Mordecai, holy shit. This is the spiciest thing I've ever tasted. We've made a huge mistake. Big B, my mouth, it's on fire, what were we thinking? Scene changes to Mordecai and Rigby lying on the floor, panting and sweating. Mordecai, I can't. I can't feel my face, Rigby. This is way too spicy. Big B, we're screwed, bro. We completely screwed ourselves. Scene changes to Margaret and Eileen approaching Mordecai and Rigby. Margaret, hey, guys. We heard you were competing in the challenge too. Eileen, yeah, we thought it would be fun to cheer you on. Are you okay? Mordecai, we cough. We may have overdone it a bit. These wings are no joke. Bigby, we just wanted to impress you, but we ended up torturing ourselves instead. Margaret, well, that's quite the dedication. We're impressed, guys. Eileen, yeah, maybe next time take it easy on the seasoning. But hey, you still look pretty badass. Mordecai, thanks, Margaret. It's the thought that counts, right? Big B, yeah, we'll definitely think twice before challenging our taste buds again. Scene ends with Mordecai and Rigby laughing, wincing from the spice, 
but proud of their crazy attempt to impress the girls. Mordecai, M. Rigby, R. Benson, B. Margaret, M. G. Eileen, E. Cat, C. Dog, D. M. Rigby, did you hear? Margaret and Eileen are going to be at the Wing Kingdom restaurant for the Hot Wing Challenge event. R. No way, dude. We gotta go and show them how brave and cool we are. Let's eat all the wings. Incident. M. But wait, the Wing Kingdom is way across town. How are we gonna get there in time? R. P. Easy. We'll just take the shortcuts through the park. Let's go. Progression. M. Alright, Rigby. According to this map, we need to cut through the spooky forest to save time. But it looks dangerous. R. Who cares, bro? We're tough. Let's go. They enter the spooky forest and encounter eerie sounds and eerie laughter. M. Dude, I don't like this. It feels like something's watching us. R. Stop being a scaredy cat, Mordecai. We've got wings to eat and crush. They suddenly find themselves surrounded by a gang of mischievous animated creatures. T. Well, 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 what do we have here? Two puny park groundkeepers traveling through our territory? D. Yeah. We don't take kindly to trespassers. Especially when they're looking for a wing challenge. M. Look, we don't want any trouble. We just need to get to the Wing Kingdom restaurant. C. Oh, I think we can help you, if you can beat us in a dance-off. R. Seriously? A dance-off? They engage in an epic, ridiculous dance-off, with exaggerated dance moves and hilarious mishaps. M. Okay, okay, we beat you. Can we please leave now? C. Very well, you may go. But remember, never to enter our territory again. They rush out of the spooky forest and arrive at the Wing Kingdom restaurant. M. Look, Rigby, Margaret and Eileen are already there. R. Quick, let's stuff those wings in our faces and impress them. They start devouring the wings while Margaret and Eileen cheer them on. E. Wow, Mordecai, your dance moves were insane. M.G., yeah, you guys are the coolest. M, thanks, guys. It was quite an adventure getting here. R. Yeah, and the wings taste damn good too. B. What the hell are you two doing here? You're supposed to be working. They freeze in horror as Benson appears out of nowhere. M and R. Uh oh. Please note that this dialogue script is purely fictional and intended for entertainment purposes only. The usage of vulgar language and M-rated content is not suitable for all audiences and contexts. Mordecai. Hey Rigby, let's hit up the coffee shop and hang with Margaret and Eileen. Rigby. Yeah, dude, I could use a caffeine fix. Let's go. Mordecai, calling Benson. Hey Benson, we're taking a break and heading to the coffee shop. Benson, just make sure you're back on time or you'll be cleaning toilets for a month. Mordecai. Yeah, yeah, we got it. See you later. At the coffee shop, Mordecai and Rigby join Margaret and Eileen at a table. Margaret. Hey guys, what took you so long? I've been waiting for my latte forever. Rigby. Sorry, babe. We had to deal with Benson's threats as usual. Eileen. Don't worry, Rigby, it's worth the wait. This coffee shop has the best brews in town. Just as they're about to take their first sip, the door swings open and the evil Coffee Bean and his translator enter. Coffee Bean. Well. Well, what do we have here? A bunch of losers enjoying their mediocre coffee. Mordecai, Coffee Bean. What are you and your lackey doing here? 
Translator. You may have defeated me once, Mordecai, but I'm back with a vengeance. Big B. What do you want this time, Bean? Coffee Bean. I'm opening a rival coffee shop across the street, and I'm going to put this joint out of business. Prepare for your downfall. Mordecai, over our dead bodies, Bean. Mordecai, Rigby, Margaret, and Eileen devise a plan to foil Coffee Bean's evil scheme. They gather their friends, including Muscle Man, High Five Ghost, and even Skips. Muscle Man. Nobody messes with my coffee. Count me in, bros. High Five Ghost. I'll give them a high five they won't forget. Skips. I've seen many crazy things, but this Bean takes the cake. Let's shut him down. A wild chase ensues, with Mordecai and his friends sabotaging Coffee Bean's coffee machines, spilling coffee beans all over the street, and tossing whipped cream on his face. Mordecai, your reign of terror ends here, Coffee Bean. Coffee Bean, you fools can't stop me. I'll have the customers lining up at my shop in no time. Margaret, actually, I think they prefer our cozy ambiance and friendly service. Eileen, plus, our coffee is way better. Coffee Bean. Defeated, fine, you win this time. But mark my words, I'll be back. Mordecai and his friends cheer, as the coffee shop's customers applaud their victory. Mordecai, another crazy adventure, huh, Rigby? Rigby, never a dull moment, bro. They all laugh and continue to enjoy their coffee and each other's company. Denouman. As they sit there, chatting and sipping coffee, they reflect on their insane journey and the bond that keeps them together. Life may be chaotic, but with good friends, anything is possible. Conclusion. The evil coffee bean may have been defeated again, but they know it won't be long until another wild adventure comes knocking on their door. And they'll be ready to face it, fueled by caffeine and friendship. Int. Coffee shop, day. Mordecai, Rigby, Margaret, and Eileen are sitting at a table, sipping on their coffees. The atmosphere is relaxed and casual. Mordecai, so, guys, what's the plan for today? Any epic slacking adventures? Eileen, well, we were thinking of going to the arcade later. Wanna come? Rigby, hell yeah, I'm always up for some gaming action. The door swings open, and the evil Coffee Bean enters, followed by his translator. They approach the counter. Coffee Bean. Sinisterly, ah, oh, the fools have returned. It's time I exact my revenge. Margaret. Confused. Who is that? Coffee Bean. I am the Coffee Bean, and I will make sure you all pay for what you did to my coffee shop. Bigby, what are you talking about? We never messed with your coffee shop. Coffee Bean. Silence, you insolent rodent. Prepare to face the consequences. Mordecai and Rigby exchange concerned glances. Mordecai, we should do something about this. Let's stop him from causing any trouble. They gather around in a huddle, making a plan. Eileen, okay, so we go undercover and gather evidence against Coffee Bean, right? Margaret, and I'll use my photography skills to take pictures of his evil deeds. They nod in agreement and break away from the huddle. Int. Evil coffee shop, day. Mordecai, Rigby, Margaret, and Eileen are dressed in disguises, pretending to be customers at the evil coffee shop. Rigby, this place stinks. The coffee tastes like sewage. Mordecai, focus, Rigby. We need to find evidence. They surreptitiously observe Coffee Bean and the translator, who are plotting behind the counter. Coffee Bean. Whispering, we're going to replace all the coffee in the park. Once they're hooked, we'll charge them three times the price. Margaret, whispering, I got it on camera, let's get out of here. They exit the shop, relieved to finally have evidence against Coffee Bean. Int. Coffee shop, day. Mordecai and the gang show their evidence to Benson, who is sitting at a table. Benson, finally, we have proof of Coffee Bean's evil plans. Let's take it to the authorities. Mordecai, determined. We won't let him ruin our park with his overpriced coffee. Axed. 
Park, Day. The gang, accompanied by park rangers and authorities, confront Coffee Bean and the translator. Margaret, your reign of overpriced coffee ends now, Coffee Bean. Coffee Bean, grinning, you fools think you can stop me? I have an army of loyal customers. Suddenly, every coffee-drinking citizen in the park transforms into a hipster zombie, blindly following Coffee Bean's orders. Big B, panicking, what the, how is this even possible? Mordecai, we need a plan, and fast. They engage in an epic battle, using slingshots, coffee cups, and any makeshift weapons they can find. Margaret, shouting, use the power of friendship, guys. With a final barrage of coffee cups, they manage to free the park from Coffee Bean's control. Coffee Bean, defeated, you may have won this time, but I will return. And with that, Coffee Bean and his translator disappear in a cloud of caffeine-infused smoke. Mordecai, we did it, team. Big B, yeah, let's celebrate with some victory coffee. They all cheer, triumphant in the face of bizarre, surrealistic misconduct. Fade out. Mordecai, dude, this line is ridiculous. How are we ever gonna get into this awesome dynamite club? Big B, chill, bro, I've got a plan, we just need to impress the bouncer. Mordecai, impress him? He's bald and looks meaner than a three-headed snake. Big B, trust me, I've got this, watch and learn, bro. They approach the bald bouncer, who crosses his arms and glares at them. Bouncer, ID please. Mordecai. Ah, uh, we don't have ID on us right now, but we really need to get inside. Answer, no ID, no entry. Big B, wait, we're the famous radio hosts, Mordecai and Rigby. Everybody knows us. The bouncer narrows his eyes skeptically. Answer, yeah right, like I'm supposed to believe that, get out of here. Just when their morale is fading, they see an opportunity. Margaret. Hey guys, what are you doing here? Eileen, yeah, we're about to go inside and dance. Mordecai, Margaret, Eileen. We've been trying to get in, but this bouncer won't let us. Margaret, come on, we'll talk to the club manager. He owes us a favor. They make their way inside and find the manager. Club manager, Mordecai and Rigby, my favorite radio hosts. What can I do for you guys? Rigby, we just want to dance with Margaret and Eileen. Can you help us out? Club manager, of course. I'll handle the bouncer and get you in. Drinks are on me, boys. As they celebrate, something strange happens. Giant sentient club. Attention. The awesome, dynamite club is now under my control. No one is leaving. Mordecai. Wait. What the heck is that? Big B. Dude, it's a giant sentient club. Margaret. We need to get out of here, now. Eileen. Look, the jealous third-rate radio host is controlling the giant club. They devise a plan to stop the third-rate radio host. Mordecai, we need to find his remote and shut it down. Big B, leave it to us. They sneak around the club, avoiding security guards and partygoers. Mordecai, there it is, on the DJ booth. Big B, I'll distract the guards, you grab the remote. After a tense moment, they manage to shut down the remote. Giant sentient club, no, I'm losing control. The club returns to its normal state. Benson, you guys are in so much trouble. Do you have any idea what I had to go through to find you? Mordecai, sorry, Benson. We just wanted to have a good time with Margaret and Eileen. Benson, well, as long as you've learned your lesson and won't cause any more trouble, I'll let it slide this time. They all laugh and continue dancing, finally enjoying their night together at the awesome Dynamite Club. End of episode.
title, Captain Wars. Characters. 1. Mordecai, a blue jay. 2. Rigby, a raccoon. 3. Margaret, a red robin. 4. Eileen, a mole. 5. Coffee Bean, an evil coffee bean. 6. Asian Translator, a nefarious translator. Int. Coffee Shop, Day. Mordecai and Rigby are sitting at a table in the coffee shop, sipping their drinks. Margaret and Eileen are behind the counter, working. Mordecai, man, it's so nice to chill here with you guys. Rigby, yeah, nothing beats a good cup of coffee and some company. Incident. Suddenly, the door slams open, revealing Coffee Bean and Asian translator. Coffee Bean, sinisterly, well, 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 look who's enjoying their coffee break. Asian translator, translating in a menacing tone, it seems our old rivals are having a good time. Margaret, angry, what are you two doing here? Progression. Coffee Bean, we've come to reclaim our rightful place in the coffee business. We're opening a rival coffee shop next door. Bigby. You can't just waltz in here and steal our customers. Eileen, yeah, this is our turf. Mordecai, we won't let you two get away with this. Right, guys? Margaret, absolutely. We'll show them what real coffee is. Bigby, let's rally the whole park to boycott their shop. Axed. Park, day. Mordecai, Rigby, Margaret, and Eileen gather the park attendees urging them to join the protest against Coffee Bean and Asian Translator's new coffee shop. Mordecai, stand strong, parkgoers. Our loyalty lies with this coffee shop. Big B, yeah, let's show those jerks that we won't be taken down without a fight. Parkgoers, chanting, no more beans, no more beans. As the protests intensify, Coffee Bean and Asian Translator realize they are being overthrown. Defeated, they slink away knowing they could never match Mordecai and his friend's determination. The coffee shop remains victorious, with Mordecai, Rigby, Margaret, and Eileen celebrating their triumph over the rival coffee shop. Fade out. Narrator. When a group of men in suits and ties gathered on the stage of the Comedy Central roast of the regular show, holding a mysterious bottle of liquid, little did they know what dramatic, adult, and M-rated chaos would ensue. As the cameras rolled, the tension in the air thickened, setting the stage for a night of outrageous humor and unexpected twists. Jeff. Wiping the sweat off his brow. All right, folks, it's time to get this roast started. And what better way than with a little liquid courage? Holds up the bottle. Ark. Grinning mischievously, you got that right, Jeff. This stuff is the secret ingredient to surviving this insane night. Bottoms up. Narrator. With that said, each man raised his drink to his lips, unaware of the scientific anomaly about to unfold. Steve, taking a swig, holy shit, what is in this stuff? It's burning hotter than a thousand suns. Narrator. Little did Steve know that the bottle contained a volatile mixture of spicy capsaicin and hallucinogens creating a mind-altering and adrenaline-pumping elixir. Mike, eyes wide. Guys, I think we've stumbled upon something incredible here. I don't feel drunk, I feel... invincible. Narrator. As the effects of the elixir intensified, the comedy roast took a wild turn. The suits and ties transformed into flamboyant superhero costumes, and their ordinary personas melted away, revealing hidden powers and outrageous abilities. Jeff. Laughing maniacally, I am the flaming comedian, master of fiery punchlines. Prepare for my scorching wit. Ark, voice booming, I am the jokester, armed with razor-sharp one-liners that will slice through your self-esteem. Steve, flexing his muscles, I am the buffoon, a comedic powerhouse with the power to make your abs ache from laughter. Mike, sprouting wings, and I am the roasting raven, with the ability to deliver insults so sharp, they pierce even the thickest of egos. 
Narrator. The audience, initially there for a night of light-hearted roasting, found themselves captivated by this mind-blowing spectacle unfolding before them. Audience member 1. What the actual fuck is happening? Audience member 2. I don't know, but this shit just got real. Narrator. As the night progressed, the superheroes took roasting to unimaginable heights. The air crackled with energy as they battled each other with hilarious insults, their powers unleashing chaos upon the stage. Jeff. Creating explosive laughter grenades. Taste my jokes, you idiots. Boom. Ark. Trapping his opponents in a whirlwind of sarcasm. Suck on my sarcasm, fools. Steve, setting the stage ablaze with fiery comedic prowess. Burn baby burn, that's what you get for being unfunny. Mike, dodging with grace and delivering devastating zingers, your roasts are as weak as your self-esteem, losers. Narrator. Amid the chaos, the comedian's superpowers collided, causing an explosion of hilarity and offensive jokes that shook the foundations of the venue. Roast after roast, insult after insult, they pushed each other to their limits, leaving the audience in stitches. Jeff. Gasping for breath between laughter. All right, I think. We need. An encore. Ark, grinning with pleasure. Brace yourselves, folks. Narrator. The night ended in a crescendo of laughter, the super-powered insult comedians taking their final bows. As they left the stage, the effects of the elixir wore off, leaving them breathless and humbled by the insane events that had transpired. Steve, catching his breath, damn, I think we just redefined the term roast. Mike, smirking, agreed. I never thought a bottle of liquid could turn us into superheroes of comedy. Narrator. Little did they know, the bottle of elixir had vanished, leaving behind only a memory of one wild and unforgettable night at the Comedy Central roast of the regular show. The group of men in suits and ties had unintentionally unlocked a superhuman comedic power, adding a new dimension to the art of roasting. From that night on, they became legends in the comedy world, their epic battle of insults forever etched in the history of comedy roasts. Mordecai. All right, Rigby. Let's make tonight legendary. We gotta get inside the awesome Dynamite Club and show Margaret and Eileen our dance moves. Rigby. Hell yeah, dude. I've been practicing all week. No way we're gonna miss this opportunity. Team. Mordecai and Rigby standing outside the club, with a long line of people waiting to get in. Mordecai. Ah, look at this line. It's gonna take forever to get in. Rigby. Screw waiting. Man, we gotta find another way. They spot a third-rate radio host, Jimmy, the douche, McLovin. Mordecai. Hey, it's Jimmy, the douche, McLovin. Maybe he can help us get in. Jimmy? Oh great, it's you loser park employees. What do you want? Bigby, we need your VIP pass, Jimmy. We can't wait in line, man. Jimmy. Ha, oh, I'd rather burn this pass than let you two dorks have it get lost. Team. Mordecai and Rigby brainstorming near a trash can. Mordecai, okay, plan B. We need a distraction to sneak past the bouncer. Rigby, I got it. We pretend to be delivery guys, carrying the world's biggest pizza. Team. Mordecai and Rigby dressed as delivery guys, carrying a ridiculously large pizza. Bouncer, hold up, what's going on here? Mordecai, special delivery for, ah, Mr. Dynamite. Answer. Nice try, losers. Ain't no pizza gonna fool me. Team. Mordecai and Rigby outside the club, frustrated and drinking energy drinks. Mordecai. This is hopeless, dude. We're never gonna get in. Rigby. Wait. Check it out. The club. It's moving. Team. The awesome. Dynamite club starts to shake and transform into a giant, sentient club. Mordecai. What the actual? Giant club, you fools think you can just waltzing in? I control who enters my domain. Big B, dude, the talking club. That's it, we're screwed. Team, Mordecai and Rigby pleading with the giant club. Mordecai, please, Mr. Club, 
We just want to dance with Margaret and Eileen. We're sorry for trying to sneak in. Giant Club, hmm, I do enjoy a good dance. Fine, I'll let you in, but only if you promise to entertain me with your moves. Teen. Mordecai and Rigby dancing their hearts out in front of the Giant Club, while Margaret and Eileen cheer them on. Mordecai, this is amazing. We did it, Rigby. Rigby, yeah, who needs VIP passes when you got killer dance moves? Teen. Mordecai and Rigby exiting the club, with Margaret and Eileen by their side. Margaret, that was incredible, guys. You really know how to make an entrance. Eileen, yeah, you both killed it on the dance floor. Mordecai, thanks, Margaret and Eileen. It was a crazy adventure, but totally worth it. Rigby, definitely, dude, we'll never forget this night. Teen. Mordecai and Rigby walking off into the night, as the awesome. Dynamite Club transforms back into a regular club. Mordecai, another wild night in the regular show craziness. Can't wait for the next ridiculous adventure. Bigby, hell yeah, dude, let's keep the party going. Jesus chaos. Characters. Mordecai. Rigby. Muscle Man. High Five Ghost. Cheezer's Lady. Teen. Mordecai, Rigby, Muscle Man, and High Five Ghost are standing in front of Cheezer's Lady, an attractive cartoon character with a cat on her head. Mordecai. Hey there, Cheezer's Lady. We couldn't resist coming back for more of your cheesy goodness. Rigby. Yeah. We've got a craving that only your nachos can satisfy. Jesus lady, giggles, well, you boys are in luck. I've got plenty of cheesy treats for all of you. Incident. Teen. The group is inside cheesers, surrounded by an abundance of cheesy food. Hustle man. Winking. Hey, cheesers lady, you know what they say about me. I've got muscles, and I know how to use them. I-5 ghost laughs, look out ladies, he's a real Casanova. Jesus lady, playfully, is that so, Russell man? Well, let's put those muscles to the test. Progression. Team. Cheezer's lady challenges Muscle Man to an arm wrestling match. Muscle Man. You're on, Cheezer's lady. Prepare to be amazed by my superior strength. I-5 ghost whispering to Mordecai and Rigby. Do you think Muscle Man can actually win this? Mordecai. Doubtful, but let's watch this craziness unfold. Team. The arm wrestling match commences, with Cheezer's Lady displaying unexpected strength. Cheezer's Lady, smirking, is that the best you've got, Muscle Man? Muscle Man, struggling, I, I can't believe it, how are you so strong? Teen, Cheezer's Lady defeats Muscle Man, causing a comical aftermath. Muscle Man, dejected, alright, Cheezer's Lady, you win. I guess I'll stick to lifting weights instead of arm wrestling. I-5 Ghost, laughs, looks like the mighty Muscle Man has met his match. Jesus lady, giggles, don't worry, Muscle Man, I'll make it up to you with a plate of extra cheesy nachos. Team. The group enjoys their cheesy feast while exchanging playful banter. Mordecai. Another day, another crazy encounter at Cheezers. I don't know how we always end up in these situations. Bigby. Munching on nachos, yeah, but hey, the chaos is what makes life interesting. I-5 Ghost, cheers to that and thanks Cheezer's Lady for keeping the cheese-filled hilarity alive. Cheezer's Lady, my pleasure, boys. Remember, cheese makes everything better. Scene fades out with the group laughing and enjoying their cheesy indulgence, leaving the audience eagerly awaiting the next misadventure. Chaos. Characters. 
Mordecai, Rigby, Margaret, Eileen, Benson, Boss, Jealous Third Rate Radio Host, Jeff, Bald Bouncer, Barry, Giant Sentient Club, Gary, Int, Park, Day, Mordecai and Rigby are slacking off near a painting of a group of people in a field of grass, with a blue horse and a building in the background. Mordecai. Hey, Rigby, check out that painting. It looks pretty trippy, dude. Rigby. Yeah, man, it's like something out of one of our crazy adventures. Suddenly, Margaret and Eileen walk up, looking excited. Margaret. Hey, guys. Are you coming to the awesome? Dynamite Club tonight? It's going to be epic. Eileen. Yeah, we've been dancing all day, and we need you two to come and show off your moves. Mordecai. Of course. We wouldn't miss it for the world. Big B. Yeah, we'll be there, and we'll rock the dance floor. Int. Park house, living room, day. Mordecai and Rigby enter the living room, only to find Jeff, the jealous third-rate radio host, hanging out. Jeff. Well, 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 look who's trying to go to the awesome. Dynamite Club. You think you're cool enough, huh? Mordecai. Come on, Jeff, can't you just let us enjoy a night out? Jeff. Not a chance. I'm going to make sure you two losers don't get in. Int. Awesome. Dynamite Club, entrance, night. Mordecai, Rigby, Margaret, and Eileen arrive at the entrance of the club, where Barry, the bald bouncer, stands guard. Barry. Sorry, but this club is exclusive. You don't meet the requirements to enter. Mordecai. What? We have to get inside. Margaret and Eileen are waiting for us. Eileen. Yeah, it's not fair. Barry. Life's not fair, shorty. Now, step aside. Suddenly, the ground starts shaking, and the club's entrance transforms into a giant sentient club, Gary. Gary. Barry, let them in. Tonight, everyone's welcome to experience my wild beats. Barry. But, that's against the rules, Gary. Gary. Rules. Who needs them? This is a night of chaos and dancing. Int. Awesome. Dynamite Club, Dance Floor, Night. Mordecai, Rigby, Margaret, and Eileen dance their hearts out on the crowded dance floor. The music is loud, and everyone is having the time of their lives. Mordecai. This is insane. I can't believe we made it in. Rigby. Yeah, Gary is the best DJ ever. As the night progresses, chaos ensues. People are dancing upside down floating in mid-air, and the blue horse from the painting comes to life, joining the party. Int. Awesome. Dynamite Club, exit, night. The night comes to an end, and Mordecai, Rigby, Margaret, and Eileen head towards the exit. Benson, off screen. What the heck were you two doing at the club? Mordecai and Rigby turn around to see Benson standing there, looking furious. Mordecai. Benson, we were just having a good time, man. It was wild. Big B. Yeah, we needed a break from work. Benson. Well, thanks to your slacking off, the park is a mess. Get back to work now. Mordecai, Rigby, Margaret, and Eileen sheepishly walk away, knowing they'll have to face the consequences of their wild night sooner or later. The End. Assisting characters. 1. John, a foul-mouthed, eccentric scientist. 2. Dave, John's equally eccentric lab assistant. John stands in his high-tech laboratory, where he displays his latest invention, a holographic image of a bear sitting in front of a picture of a pope. In the background of the picture, there's a bear flying through space in a tech suit. John, look at that, Dave. My masterpiece, a bear in front of a picture of a pope, with another bear flying through space in the background. Genius. 
incident. Suddenly, the holographic image glitches, and the bears start moving on their own. Hey! Uh, John, what's happening? Are the bears glitching or something? John, no, Dave, they're alive. I've accidentally brought them to life. We have actual talking, space-traveling bears in our lap. Progression. The two bears in the holographic image, Pope Bear and Tech Bear, jump out of the projection and stand before John and Dave, towering over them. Pope Bear, what the fuck is going on here? I was just peacefully taking a nap inside the Vatican, and I end up in this godforsaken lab. That bear, and I was on a mission to save all the bears on Earth from a catastrophic asteroid, and now I find myself in this shithole of a place. John, holy crap, talking bears. This is incredible. Hey! Incredible? Are you fucking insane? What are we supposed to do with these bears? John, Dave, Pope Bear, and Tech Bear engage in a heated conversation about bears, space travel, and the existence of God. The tension rises as their philosophical differences clash. John, you see, bears, my scientific knowledge tells me there's no higher power. It's all just chaos and random chance. Pope Bear, blasphemy, I'm the damn Pope, and I assure you, there's a God. Pope Bear! Look, I don't give a shit about your religious debates. I just want to save all the bears. The argument escalates into a physical brawl between John, Dave, Pope Bear, and Tech Bear. Broken lab equipment, fur flying everywhere, and an exploded beaker fill the chaotic scene. Eventually, the fight subsides, and an exhausted silence fills the lab. John, bruised and battered, well, it seems I've learned two things today. Bears are no match for humans when it comes to fighting, and they definitely don't help me prove my scientific theories. Hey! No shit, John! Maybe it's time we leave bears alone and focus on something a little less... chaotic. The bears, battered but still standing, solemnly nod in agreement before disappearing back into the holographic image, leaving John and Dave to contemplate the madness that just unfolded. Mordecai, yo, Rigby. Let's go chill at the coffee shop. Rigby, oh man, I could use some coffee. Let's do it. Mordecai and Rigby head to the coffee shop. Mordecai, hey, Margaret. What's up? Margaret, hey guys, just working my shift, you know. Rigby, can I get a large double espresso, extra strong? Margaret, sure thing, Rigby. Eileen walks in. Eileen, hey, guys. What's happening? Mordecai, just getting our caffeine fix, you know how it is. Meanwhile, at a nearby table, the evil coffee bean and his Asian translator, Li Fang, plot their dastardly plan. Coffee bean, Li Fang, we must set up a rival coffee shop and steal all their customers. Li Fang, yes, coffee bean, our coffee will be so good, people won't be able to resist. Cut back to Mordecai, Rigby, Margaret, and Eileen. Rigby. This coffee is amazing. I could drink this all day. Margaret, thanks, Rigby. We take pride in our coffee. Mordecai notices the evil coffee bean and Li Fang setting up across the street. Mordecai, uh-oh, guys. It looks like trouble. Eileen, what do you mean? Mordecai, that's the evil coffee bean and his sidekick Li Fang. Rigby, are they setting up a rival coffee shop? Mordecai, exactly. We can't let them get away with this. They devise a plan to save their beloved coffee shop. Mordecai. Rigby. We need your brilliant slacker mind to come up with a distraction. Rigby. Leave it to me, bro. Rigby causes chaos by releasing a swarm of bees from a nearby tree. Margaret. What on earth is happening? Mordecai and Eileen sneak into the rival coffee shop and sabotage it. Mordecai. Eileen. Pour all the beans into the sink, quick. Eileen, got it, Mordecai. They successfully sabotage the rival coffee shop and escape. Coffee bean. No, my coffee. Li Fang, we have to start over, coffee bean. Coffee bean and Li Fang retreat. Mordecai, Rigby, Margaret, and Eileen return to the coffee shop. Margaret, you guys saved the day. Thanks. Rigby, anytime, Margaret. 
We couldn't let that evil coffee take you down. Eileen, you guys are the best. Mordecai, it's what we do. Now let's enjoy some coffee. They all raise their cups and clink them together in celebration. Characters Mordecai Rigby Benson Margaret Eileen Hot Wing Challenge Announcer Scene The Park's Break Room Mordecai and Rigby are sitting at a table covered with a pink tablecloth. On the table, there's a tray with different sauces and meats, teasingly delicious. Mordecai, dude, check out these wings. The Wing Kingdom Restaurant is hosting their annual Hot Wing Challenge tonight. We gotta go, man. Big B, eyebrows raised, the hot wing challenge, isn't that, like, impossible, we'll burn our faces off. Mordecai, smirking, exactly. But imagine how impressed Margaret and Eileen will be if we conquer it. Big B, grinning, you're right, it's worth the risk, let's do it. Scene. Outside the park, Mordecai and Rigby are speeding in the park's golf cart, trying to get to the Wing Kingdom restaurant on time. Big B, faster, Mordecai, we can't be late for the challenge. Mordecai, gripping the steering wheel, I'm flooring it, Rigby. Hold on tight. Rigby's cap flies off as they swerve around a bend. Suddenly, a police siren blares behind them. Police officer, pull over, you're driving recklessly. Scene, Mordecai and Rigby are standing in front of the Wing Kingdom restaurant, visibly shaken after being pulled over by the police. Mordecai, what do we do now, Rigby? We can't miss this challenge. Rigby, don't worry, I got an idea. We'll disguise ourselves as janitors and sneak in. Mordecai, raising an eyebrow. You really think that'll work? Rigby, trust me. Scene. Inside the Wing Kingdom restaurant, Mordecai and Rigby, dressed as janitors, enter the chaotic Hot Wing Challenge event. Hot Wing Challenge announcer, welcome, challenges, to the Wing Madness. Are you ready to test your taste buds limits, or what? Mordecai and Rigby glance at each other, nerves building up. Rigby, let's do this. Scene. Mordecai and Rigby, drenched in sweat, surrounded by piles of discarded bones, stand triumphantly at the Hot Wing Challenge podium. Hot Wing Challenge announcer, ladies and gentlemen, we have our winners. Mordecai and Rigby, the janitors, have conquered the impossible. Give it up for them. Cheers erupt from the crowd as Margaret and Eileen, watching intently from the sidelines, look impressed. Margaret. Wow, Mordecai, that was incredible. Eileen. Yeah, you guys totally impressed us. Scene. The park's break room. Mordecai and Rigby, victorious and still covered in sauce, sit at the table once again wearing their normal clothes. Benson. You two slackers went to a hot wing challenge instead of working, and you won? I don't even want to know how you managed that. Mordecai, grinning. It was intense, Benson, but we pulled through. Total wing madness. Bigby, yeah, but hey, we made quite an impression on Margaret and Eileen. That's worth it, right? Benson, pausing, fine, just promise me you won't make a mess in here. We already have sauce stains all over the break room. Mordecai and Rigby, deal. Mordecai and Rigby's reckless adventure led them to triumph in the hot wing challenge. Despite the chaos, they managed to impress Margaret and Eileen, proving that even in the face of potentially dangerous situations, their friendship and determination always shine through. The park remains intact, and the wing saw stains in the break room serve as a reminder of their wild day. Mordecai, hey Rigby, 
We've got to get inside the awesome dynamite club tonight. Big B, yeah, man. Margaret and Eileen are gonna be there, and we need to show them our smooth dance moves. Mordecai, but how do we get in? I heard it's tough to get past the bouncer. Big B, well, I heard that third-rate radio host, Gary, has some connections. Let's go find him. Scene transitions to a local radio station where Gary is on air. Mordecai, Gary, we need your help to get into the awesome Dynamite Club. Gary, mockingly, oh, so now you guys need my help, huh? Why should I help you? Mordecai, come on, Gary. We'll owe you big time if you get us in. Gary, fine. But you better remember this favor, losers. They arrive at the awesome Dynamite Club. Bouncer, hold up there. No entry without an invitation. Big B. Look, Baldy, we're with Gary. He just got us on the guest list. Bouncer, we'll see about that. Gary's pulling a lot of strings for you two losers. Scene shifts to inside the club. Mordecai, finally, we made it. Look, there's Margaret and Eileen over there. Big B. Yeah, let's show them our dance moves and sweep them off their feet. They start dancing. But suddenly the giant sentient club comes alive. Club, who granted you losers permission to dance in my domain? Mordecai. Ah, Gary did. He said it was okay. Club, Gary, that pathetic human. I didn't authorize anything. The club's disco lights start flashing, and the music gets louder. Big B. Ah, oh, what's happening? Club, this is what happens when you trespass without permission. Prepare to face the consequences. Mordecai and Rigby find themselves being flung around the club, dodging lasers and disco balls. Mordecai, we're screwed, Rigby. We shouldn't have trusted Gary. Rigby, no kidding, we've got to find a way out of this before it's too late. They spot an emergency exit sign. Mordecai, quick, Rigby. Follow me. We're getting out of here. They dash towards the emergency exit and manage to escape just as the club's chaos reaches its peak. Scene transitions back to the park. Mordecai, man, that was insane. We should have known better than to trust Gary. Bigby, yeah, but at least we made it out in one piece. Let's never speak of this again. They high-five each other, relieved and grateful for their escape. Mordecai and Rigby realize that sometimes it's better to just enjoy the park's regular craziness rather than getting into a chaotic mess. Mordecai and Rigby learn a valuable lesson about trust and the consequences of seeking shortcuts. They decide to embrace the regularity of their park jobs and appreciate the simple joys it brings. Hustle man. Yo, high five ghost. I heard you're going to Brazil for some wild adventures. How about you take me and pops along? High five ghost. Yeah, man. I'm tired of being stuck in the park all the time. Let's go to Brazil and have ourselves a crazy ass time. Pops. Oh, jolly good. I do love a splendid adventure. Count me in, my good fellows. Team. High five ghost, muscle man, and pops are standing in front of a portal that leads to Brazil. High five ghost. Alright, y'all ready? Once we step through this portal, there's no turning back. Hustle man. Bring it on. I'm ready to party like there's no tomorrow. Pops. Oh, the thrill of the unknown. I can hardly contain my excitement. They step through the portal and find themselves in the middle of the Rio Carnival. High five ghost. Whoa, holy shit sticks. Look at this place. It's like a goddamn explosion of colors and craziness. Hustle man. This is what I'm talking about, bro. Let's get wild and let loose. Pops. Oh my, it's quite overwhelming. The music, the costumes, the sheer energy, it's positively stimulating. Team. The trio immerses themselves in the festivities, dancing and partying with the locals. 
High five ghost. Man, this is the most epic shit ever. I feel alive, alive I tell ya. Hustle man. I haven't sweated this much since I bench pressed a garbage truck. Let's keep this party going. Ops. Oh my, I haven't moved like this in years. I must say, it's rather invigorating. Team. Suddenly, a gang of Brazilian monkeys dressed like gangsters approach them. High five ghost. What the actual fuck? Did these monkeys just roll up on us with Tommy guns? Hustle man. Shit just got real, bros. We gotta show these critters who's boss. Ops. Oh dear, this is an unexpected turn of events. Fear not, my friends. I shall use my gentlemanly prowess to defuse the situation. Teen. Epic battle between the gangster monkeys and our trio ensues. High five ghost. Kick him in the nuts, muscle man. We can't let these punks ruin our party. Muscle man. Hell yeah, high five ghost. These monkeys are no match for our awesomeness. Pops. Huzzah, take this, you rascally rapscallions. Taste the might of Pops. Team. The trio emerges victorious, covered in bruises, but with wide grins on their faces. High five ghost. That was the craziest shit ever. We kicked some serious monkey ass. Muscle man. We showed him who's the top dog in this wild adventure, bros. Let's celebrate with more partying. Pops. Oh my, what an exhilarating experience. I shall treasure this memory forever. Now, onward to more festivities. Team. The trio continues to party into the night, savoring every wild moment of their Brazilian adventure. High five ghost, best. Fucking. Time. Ever. Let's do this again someday, my badass amigos. Muscle man. Hell yeah, high five ghost. We'll be telling stories about this adventure for ages. Pops. Indeed, my friends. This will be a tale to regale our descendants with. Oh, the joyous tales of High Five Ghost's Brazilian escapade, forever immortalized in our memories. Team. The sun rises on a tired but satisfied trio, ready to take on whatever other bizarre adventures come their way. End of episode. She's his misadventure. Characters. Mordecai. Rigby. Muscle Man. High Five Ghost. Cheezers Ladies. Setting. Cheezers, a fast food restaurant. Scene 1. Inside Cheezers, Mordecai, Rigby, Muscle Man, and High Five Ghost are seated at a booth. Mordecai. Dude, these Cheezers Ladies are smoking. We have to come up with a plan to impress them. Rigby. Yeah. Man, I've been practicing my pickup lines all week. I'm ready for this. Muscle man. Flexing his muscles. Ladies can't resist the muscle man. I'll show him my pecs of steel. I-5 ghost. Hey guys, let's try to be smooth and not scare them away, okay? Scene 2. The Cheezers ladies approach their table. Cheezers lady 1. Hi, welcome to Cheezers. What can I get you guys? Mordecai. Ah, we'll have your finest burgers, please and a side of charm. Bigby, winking, yeah, baby, we're here to steal your hearts, not just your food. Jesus lady too, rolling her eyes, all right, I'll be right back with your order. Scene 3, Mordecai, Rigby, Muscle Man, and High Five Ghost eat their burgers while attempting to impress the Jesus ladies. Muscle Man, check it out, ladies, flexes his biceps, I bet you've never seen guns like these. Jesus lady 1, um, that's nice. Enjoy your meal, guys. I-5 Ghost, whispering to Rigby, maybe we should try a different approach, Rigby. Rigby, you're right. Time to bring out the big guns. Scene 4. Rigby puts a small PA system on the table and clears his throat. Rigby, ladies of cheeses, prepare to be dazzled by the sweet sounds of my love song. Rigby starts singing a cheesy, off-key love song while the other customers look confused and annoyed. Scene 5. The Cheezers ladies approach again, looking unimpressed. Cheezers lady too. Okay, that was... something. Can I get you guys anything else? Mordecai, 
No, thanks. We're good. Scene 6, the boys leave cheesers, feeling defeated. Mordecai, man, that didn't go as planned. We should have just been ourselves instead of trying so hard. Big B, yeah, I feel like an idiot. We should learn to appreciate the cheesers ladies for who they are, not just for their looks. Hustle man, you're right, bros. We messed up, let's go apologize and make things right. I-5 Ghost, good idea, let's go back and show them we can be respectful and cool. Teen 7, the boys re-enter Cheezers with a sincere and apologetic attitude. Mordecai, to Cheezers ladies. Hey, sorry about earlier. We didn't mean to come off so, weird. Can we order some food and start fresh? Cheezers lady 1, smiling, of course. We appreciate the apology, what can I get for you guys? Scene 8. Mordecai, Rigby, Muscle Man, and High Five Ghost enjoy their meal while engaging in friendly conversation with the Cheezers ladies. The boys learn the importance of being genuine and respectful instead of relying on cheesy pickup lines. They establish a newfound friendship with the Cheezers ladies, and everyone has a pleasant meal together. She's in chaos. Characters. Mordecai. Rigby. Muscle Man. High Five Ghost. Cheezers Ladies. Scene. The park grounds keepers, Mordecai, Rigby, Muscle Man, and High Five Ghost, are gathered around the laptop, discussing their plan for the day. Mordecai. Alright guys, listen up. Today, we're headed to Cheezers, where we're gonna unleash our charm on the Cheezers Ladies. Rigby. Yeah, we need to show them that we're smooth talkers. Hustle man. Oh yeah, I've got some killer pickup lines ready to go. They won't be able to resist. I-5 ghost, giggling. I can't wait to see their reactions when we unleash our moves. Scene, the group arrives at Cheezers, where the Cheezers ladies are busy serving customers. Cheezers lady one, hey guys, what can we get you? Mordecai. Oh, just your finest cheese fries and milkshakes, please. Jesus Lady 2, coming right up. Take a seat. We'll bring it over. Scene, the group sits at a table, eagerly awaiting their food. Hustle man. Alright, guys, it's showtime. Get ready to witness my irresistible charm. Big B, sure. Man, like your charm could top mine. I-5 Ghost, shush they're coming. Scene, the Jesus ladies bring over their order and stay to chat with the group. Jesus Lady 1. So, what brings you guys here today? Hustle man. Oh, just couldn't resist the savory aroma of your nachos, sweetheart. But hey, we hope you don't mind some company. Big B, yeah, we're always up for some fun. Jesus lady too. Well, lucky for you boys, we're always up for some fun too. Let's see what you got. Scene, the group engages in a funny and overly dramatic display of cheesy pickup lines and over-the-top attempts to impress the Jesus ladies. I-5 Ghost, excuse me miss, are you made of copper and tellurium because you're C-U-T? Tay? Jesus lady one, giggles that's cute, honey, but I've heard better. Keep, incoming. Hustle man. Baby, if you were a vegetable, you'd be a cute cumber. Jesus lady two, laughs, I'll give you an A for effort, but you still need more practice. Scene, despite their hilarious attempts, the Jesus ladies remain unimpressed. Mordecai. All right, enough with the cheesy lines. Let's just be ourselves and have a good time. Big B, totally, dude. We're just a bunch of slackers who love having fun. Jesus Lady 1, finally, honesty. Now that's something we can work with. Jesus Lady 2, that's more like it. The cheesy pickup lines we're getting old. Scene, the group and the Jesus ladies continue to have a fun and genuine conversation, getting to know each other. Hustle man. So, you ladies want to hit the arcade after this? Jesus ladies, sounds like a blast. I-5 Ghost, this turned out better than we expected. Who needs cheesy lines when you can just be yourself? 
Scene, the group and the Cheezer's ladies leave Cheezer's, ready for more adventures together. Mordecai, another crazy adventure, huh guys? Big B, yeah, but at least this time it ended on a high note. Hustle man, ain't nothing better than being yourself and having a good time with awesome ladies. High five ghost, totally let's keep the fun going. Disclaimer, the above dialogue script is a creative work and should not be considered an actual episode of regular show. The characters are depicted in line with the show's spirit but the story and events are fictional and for entertainment purposes only. Mordecai. Rigby, we gotta get to the Wing Kingdom restaurant for the hot wing challenge. Margaret and Eileen are gonna be there, we need to impress them. Rigby, hell yeah, Mordecai, we can't let those losers outshine us, let's go. They rush towards the car and start driving. Mordecai, oh no. The GPS says there's a huge traffic jam up ahead. We can't be late. Rigby, screw this traffic, I know a shortcut, hold on. They veer off the main road, racing through back alleys and narrow streets. Mordecai, Rigby, slow down. We're gonna crash. Rigby, shut up, Mordecai, we gotta save our chances with Margaret and Eileen. They narrowly avoid crashing into several obstacles as they speed through the city. Mordecai, look! The Wing Kingdom is just ahead. We made it. Rigby, yeah, but where are Margaret and Eileen? We can't impress them if they're not here. They go inside the Wing Kingdom and find chaos. Mordecai, holy crap, it's a wing apocalypse. There are chicken wings everywhere. Bigby, and look, Margaret and Eileen are trapped on that giant mound of wings. Mordecai, we gotta save them. Come on, Rigby. They start climbing the mountain of wings, fighting their way through. Mordecai, Margaret, hold on. We're here to rescue you. Margaret, Mordecai, Rigby, thank God you're here. These wings are out of control. Rigby slips and falls. Rigby, shit, Mordecai, help me up. Mordecai pulls Rigby back up and they continue climbing. Eileen, guys, be careful. The wings are alive. The wings start attacking Mordecai and Rigby. Mordecai, we can't give up, Rigby. We have to fight back. Rigby. Yeah, take that, you spicy bastards. They fight off the attacking wings using their baseball bats. Mordecai, okay, we made it, Margaret. Now let's get out of here. They grab Margaret and Eileen, rushing towards the exit. Benson, what in the actual fuck is going on here? Mordecai, Benson, it's not what it looks like. We were just trying to save Margaret and Eileen. Benson, save them, from what, wing-induced madness? Big B, yeah, man, it's a long story, but at least we're all safe now. They all escape the chaotic wing kingdom. Mordecai, well, that was one hell of an adventure. We may have missed the hot wing challenge, but at least we saved our friends. Big B, and maybe next time, we'll actually make it on time and impress Margaret and Eileen. They all laugh as they walk away, covered in sauce and victory. Mordecai, Rigby, we have to hurry up. The Hot Wing Challenge event at Wing Kingdom starts in 30 minutes. Rigby, chill out, dude. We have plenty of time to stuff our faces with those fiery wings and impress Margaret and Eileen. Mordecai, yeah, but what if they eat all the wings before we get there? We have to be the first ones to show off our wing-eating skills. Rigby, don't worry, bro. 
I've got a shortcut that will get us there in no time. Hop on my skateboard. Mordecai, are you sure about this? Last time your shortcuts ended with us falling into a pit of doom. Big B, trust me, we'll make it this time, I promise. Mordecai and Rigby speed through the town, narrowly avoiding collisions and chaos. Mordecai, all right, we're here. Now let's find Margaret and Eileen. Rigby, look, there they are, Mordecai. Let's go impress them with our wing-eating prowess. Mordecai, hold on, something seems off. Margaret and Eileen don't look so good. Rigby, what do you mean? Margaret and Eileen start growling and snarling, with flames in their eyes. Mordecai, holy crap, Rigby. They've turned into hot wing eating monsters. Rigby, this is insane. How did this happen? Mordecai and Rigby quickly realize that the spicy wings have transformed Margaret and Eileen into mindless wing devouring beasts. Mordecai, we have to save them from themselves. But how? Rigby, only one way to find out. We have to eat more hot wings and become as powerful as them. Mordecai and Rigby continuously stuff themselves with wings, their mouths bursting into flames with every bite. Mordecai, I can feel the fiery power surging through my veins. Rigby, yeah, this is insane, Mordecai, we're becoming unstoppable. Mordecai and Rigby engage in an epic wing-eating battle with Margaret and Eileen, flames and fiery sauce flying everywhere. Mordecai, Margaret, snap out of it. We're your friends, not your dinner. Rigby, Eileen, remember who you are. Stop this madness. Margaret and Eileen slowly regain their senses, the fiery glow in their eyes fading away. Margaret, Mordecai, Rigby, what happened? Eileen, I feel like I ate a whole volcano. Mordecai, long story, but the important thing is that you're back to normal. Let's get out of here. Rigby, yeah. It's time to leave this wing-infested nightmare behind. Mordecai and Rigby, along with Margaret and Eileen, stumble out of the restaurant, covered in hot wing sauce and completely exhausted. Mordecai, well, that didn't go as planned. Rigby, no kidding, dude, but at least we saved Margaret and Eileen from becoming wing monsters forever. Mordecai, true. Let's go home and never speak of this again. Rigby, agreed, and next time, Let's stick to eating wings without any crazy challenges involved. They walk off into the night as the chaos at Wing Kingdom slowly settles. What the fuck Pikachu, get your ass in gear, we're gonna be late for the Pokemon battle. Pikachu, fuck off, Ash, I'm sick of your shit, can't you see I'm busy licking my balls? Jesse, well, 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 if it isn't the little shit Ash Ketchum. Prepare to suck it, loser. James, yeah, you loser, we're gonna kick your sorry ass all the way to Pallet Town. The elf, and we'll be singing our kick-ass new version of the Team Rocket motto while we do it. Jesse. Singing, to catch Ash is our new ploy, to teach this punk a lesson, we'll crush him and his balls too, with unparalleled aggression. James, singing, Team Rocket's blasting off again, into Ash, like a speeding train. Ash, you guys are fucking delusional. My Pokemon are gonna kick your sorry asses. The elf, bring it on, you twerp. I'll fuck you up with my badass Magna Pussy. James, and I'll take you down with my fucktastic Fartizard. Jesse, prepare to be destroyed, Ash, by my majestic Dildo Queen. Pikachu. All right, assholes. Let's show these fake Pokemon who's boss. A wild battle commences, with fake Pokemon attacking each other. Ash. Pikachu, use Thundercock Slam. Pikachu. Thundercock Slam, bitches. Take that. Meowth's Magna Pussy faints dramatically. James, go, fight is it. Use the Stinky Blast. Ash. Pikachu, use Fart Buster. Pikachu. Fart Buster, go. Blow that stinky shit away. James's Fartizard faints dramatically. Jesse, you'll pay for this, Ash. Go, Dildo Queen, use the Vibrating Whip. Ash, Pikachu, dodge and use the Electric Shock Jizz. Pikachu, 
Electric shock jizz, go! Cover that dildo queen with my sticky vengeance. Jesse's dildo queen faints dramatically. Ash, that's right, Team Rocket. Take that, you sorry losers. Hey Elf, we'll get you next time, twerp. We're blasting off again in a fucking explosive eruption. Suddenly, a massive explosion fills the air as Team Rocket is launched into the stratosphere. Ash, haha, ha, that's what you get, you dumb fucks. Nobody messes with Ash Ketchum. Pikachu. Fuck yeah, Ash. We kicked those losers' asses. They walk off triumphantly, leaving a cloud of smoke behind. Mordecai. All right, Rigby, we gotta hurry if we wanna make it to the Wing Kingdom for the Hot Wing Challenge. Rigby, dude, you know I'm always up for a spicy challenge. Plus, I heard Margaret and Eileen are gonna be there. We need to show them what we're made of. Mordecai, totally, man. We gotta impress them. No more slacking off, we're gonna conquer those wings and save the day. Rigby starts the car and they speed off towards the Wing Kingdom. Mordecai, whoa, slow down, Rigby. We can't get pulled over again. You remember what happened last time, right? Rigby, relax, dude. We're running late, and Margaret won't wait for losers like us. Mordecai, all right, just watch out for whoa, look out. Rigby swerves the car, narrowly avoiding a collision. Mordecai, what the hell, man? You almost killed us. Rigby, sorry. Sorry, I just saw a taco truck and got distracted. Mordecai, focus, Rigby. We're on a mission here. We can't let anything get in our way. Rigby steps on the gas, pushing the car to its limit. Mordecai, I can smell the wings from here. We're almost there, dude. Rigby, yeah, yeah, hold on. Let me just check my hair. Mordecai, are you serious? This is not the time for grooming, Rigby. Rigby quickly fixes his hair in the rearview mirror. Rigby, gotta look good for the ladies, bro. Now let's go in there and kick some wing ass. They arrive at the Wing Kingdom and see Margaret and Eileen surrounded by a group of rowdy guys. Mordecai, oh no, those dudes look dangerous. We gotta save them. Rigby, no worries, Mordecai. I've got a plan, follow my lead. They discreetly make their way towards Margaret and Eileen. Mordecai, hey, ladies. Looking for a couple of real men to save the day? Margaret, Mordecai, Rigby, thank goodness you're here. Eileen, these guys won't leave us alone. Do something. Rigby cracks his knuckles. Rigby, all right, fellas. Time to step off or get smacked down. The ratty guys back off, intimidated. Mordecai, that's right. Mess with the best, you get destroyed like the rest. Rigby throws his arm around Margaret and Mordecai does the same with Eileen. Mordecai, ladies, allow us to escort you to the hot wing challenge. Rigby, yeah, we're here to save the day and win the hearts of these lovely ladies. They all walk triumphantly towards the restaurant, leaving the rowdy guys bewildered behind. Mordecai, Rigby, we did it, man. We saved the day and impressed Margaret and Eileen. Rigby, I told you, dude. With the ultimate wing warriors. They all enter the wing kingdom, ready to take on the hot wing challenge and enjoy a victorious night. Characters 1. Mordecai 2. Rigby
3. Benson 4. Margaret 5. Eileen 6. Coffee Bean 7. Translator Int. Coffee Shop, Day Mordecai and Rigby sit at a table, sipping their coffee. Margaret and Eileen, the baristas, chat with them. Mordecai, yawning, man, I could use a caffeine boost. Rigby, totally, dude, let's get another round. They notice a green box of coffee on the counter. Margaret, excitedly, hey guys, we just got this new exotic coffee blend. Eileen, enthusiastically, it's called Caffeine Blast, and apparently, it's the strongest coffee ever. Incident. Suddenly, the door slams open, and Coffee Bean, a menacing coffee mastermind, storms in with his sidekick, Translator. Coffee Bean. Smirking. So, Mordecai and Rigby think they can enjoy coffee without my approval? Not on my watch. Translator. Translating, he says he'll open a rival coffee shop to ruin their caffeine buzz. No vision. Int. Rival coffee shop, day. The next day, Mordecai and Rigby walk into a newly opened coffee shop, its exterior buzzing with excitement. Mordecai, shocked, no way. This place looks amazing. Rigby, they even have a giant golden coffee bean statue. This is gonna be awesome. They spot Margaret and Eileen inside, struggling to keep up with the massive crowds. Margaret, frustrated, Mordecai, Rigby, you have to help us. Coffee bean is relentless. Eileen. He's stolen all our customers with his absurdly strong coffee blends. Colon. Mordecai and Rigby devise a plan to reclaim the customer's loyalty. They gather supplies for a concoction. Mordecai. Okay, Rigby. We need the rarest, wildest coffee beans in town. Rigby, got it. And let's add some random stuff like hot sauce, bubble gum, and chili powder. That should do the trick. They blend it all together. The result is an explosive beverage filled with caffeine energy. Colon. Int. Rival coffee shop, day. Mordecai and Rigby storm back into the rival coffee shop, holding their revolutionary concoction. Mordecai, hey, coffee bean. You think you're the king of coffee? Try this. They toss cups of their magical blend into the air, causing a caffeine explosion. Customers go wild, rediscovering their love for the original coffee shop. Coffee Bean. Defeated. This can't be happening. It's just coffee. The coffee shop starts crumbling down, and Coffee Bean and Translator flee in defeat. Margaret. Grateful. Mordecai. Rigby. You saved our coffee shop. Eileen. Our customers are coming back. You guys are amazing. Mordecai. Smiling. Just another day in the life of groundskeepers and coffee addicts, right? Rigby, laughing, yeah, and nobody can beat our caffeine-fueled adventure skills. Naruto, damn, this hill is steep as fuck. Can't we take a break? Sasuke, shut up, Naruto. We have a mission to complete and no time for your laziness. Naruto, grumbles, fine. But if I collapse from exhaustion, you better carry me back, Sasuke. Takara, uh, you two never stop bickering. Can we focus on the task at hand, please? Suddenly, a masked figure emerges from the bushes, wielding a dark aura. Unknown ninja. Sinister laughter, well, 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 what do we have here? A bunch of weaklings? Arudo, who the hell are you? Unknown ninja, that's not important. What matters is your imminent doom. Sasuke, alright, enough talk. Let's take this guy down together. Any ideas? Arudo, I've got one. I'll distract him with my sexy jutsu, and while he's mesmerized, Sakura can land a powerful punch. Sakura, seriously, you think that's gonna work? Arudo. Hey, it's better than you just standing there doing nothing. Takara, gritting teeth, fine, I'll give it a try. But don't blame me if it goes south. Sakura charges at the unknown ninja, but he swiftly dodges her attack. Unknown ninja, you really think that weak punch could hurt me? Pathetic. Sasuke, Naruto, forget the distraction. 
We need to come up with a plan B, fast. Aruto. Alright, alright. I've been working on a new jutsu. It might be crazy, but it's worth a shot. Sasuke. What's the jutsu? Aruto. It's called the Rasengan Fusion. We combine our chakra to create a supercharged Rasengan. Let's do it. Sasuke. Fine, you do the fusion, and I'll deliver the final blow. Naruto and Sasuke concentrate their chakra, combining their powers into a swirling ball of destructive energy. Unknown ninja. Impressive, but it won't save you. Naruto and Sasuke charge towards the unknown ninja, aiming to destroy him with their powerful attack. In a blinding flash, the Rasengan fusion connects with the unknown ninja, obliterating him in a massive explosion. Naruto. Hell yeah, we did it. Sasuke. Don't get cocky, Naruto. We still have a mission to complete. Takara. Sai, guys, can we just get going? I'm tired and covered in dirt. Aruto. Laughs, typical Sakura, always worried about her appearance. Takara. Shut up, Naruto. Let's just go already. The team continues their journey, determined to complete their mission despite the perils they faced. Scene, the coffee shop. Mordecai. Hey Rigby, let's go grab a coffee at the shop. Margaret and Eileen are working today. Rigby, hell yeah, dude, I could use a caffeine boost. Scene transitions to the coffee shop. Mordecai. Hey Margaret, what's up? We came for some coffee. Margaret. Hey guys, you're just in time. Eileen is making her special brew today. Rigby, sweet, I can't wait to taste it. Is it as good as your smile, Margaret? Margaret. Blushing. Rigby, you always know how to make me blush. Eileen. Giggling. Come on, guys. Let's not waste any time. Coffee beans don't grind themselves. Scene transitions to Coffee Bean's evil hideout. Coffee Bean. Sinisterly, those fools think they can enjoy their coffee in peace. Not anymore. Once my rival cafe opens, the world will bow down to my reign. Asian translator. Nervously, uh, boss, I don't think this is the right way to handle competition. Coffee bean. Silence, you incompetent imbecile. I'll show them the true power of the beans. Scene transitions back to the coffee shop. Mordecai. Wow, Eileen. This coffee is amazing. It's giving me goosebumps. Bigby. Yeah, it's like a flavor explosion in my mouth. Scene shifts to Coffee Bean and his Asian translator arriving in front of their rival coffee shop. Coffee Bean. Smirking, behold, the grand opening of Beanspire Cafe. I'll crush their spirit and drink up their tears. Asian translator. Whispering, boss, why are we doing this? Can't we just coexist peacefully? Coffee Bean. Fool, coffee is war, and I'm about to win. Scene shifts back to the coffee shop. Benson. What the hell is going on here? Beanspire Cafe just opened across the street. Mordecai, Coffee Bean? I thought we got rid of that guy ages ago. Bigby, we can't let him take over the coffee scene. It's time to teach him a lesson. Scene transitions to the epic showdown between the two coffee shops. Mordecai, Coffee Bean. We won't let you ruin our favorite coffee shop. Coffee Bean. Laughing maniacally. Prepare to be ground into dust, you pathetic groundskeepers. Margaret. Whispering to Mordecai, quick, Rigby, use your slacker skills. Rigby, I got this. Suddenly starts mixing coffee beans with energy drinks and random powders. Scene intensifies with everyone watching in suspense. Mordecai, wielding a coffee cup as a weapon. It's time for a taste of justice, coffee bean. Scene erupts into a wild brawl between the two coffee shops, spraying coffee and energy drink mixtures everywhere. Scene transitions to the aftermath. Benson. What the hell happened here? The coffee shops are destroyed. Mordecai, panting. We took down Coffee Bean, but at what cost? The coffee shops are in ruins. Bigby, we may have lost our coffee shops, but we taught that bean a lesson. 
Scene ends with everyone laughing and enjoying their coffee, despite the chaos. Through their wild antics, Mordecai and Rigby manage to defeat Coffee Bean's evil plan and save the coffee shop. Despite the destruction, they were able to find humor and camaraderie amidst the chaos. Rick sits at the table, staring at the glitter in the bowl, a cigarette hanging from his lips. Morty, you little shit. Get your ass in here. Morty enters, holding a white plate with a green leaf on it, looking confused. W, what's up, Rick? Grab the damn bowl, Morty. We're gonna send those interdimensional assholes packing. Morty hesitates, then picks up the bowl, looking apprehensive. W, what are we gonna do with this? Are we gonna fight them? No, Morty, we're gonna give them a psychedelic trip they'll never forget. We're gonna make them see colors beyond their imagination. Morty gulps nervously and looks at the green glitter in the bowl. I don't know, Rick. Isn't that dangerous? Dangerous? Morty, you haven't seen real danger until you've been slapped by an interdimensional being. Just trust me on this one. Morty reluctantly hands the bowl to Rick, who starts sprinkling the green glitter on the table. Okay, Morty, it's showtime. Blow on the glitter and say the magic phrase, Wubba Lubba Dub Dub. Morty rolls his eyes and hesitantly blows on the glitter, saying the phrase. Moments later, the room fills with vibrant colors, and a portal opens up before them. They both stare at the portal in awe. Morty, we've done it. We've created a psychedelic gateway. Alright, Rick, let's do this. Rick slaps Morty across the face, and Morty slaps Rick back even harder. Is that all, Morty? Slap me like you mean it. Morty slaps Rick with all his strength, causing him to stumble backward. Take that, Rick. How do you like that? Rick smirks, his eyes glowing with excitement. Oh, Morty, I've been waiting for this. Prepare for the ultimate slap. They both start slapping each other relentlessly, their hands moving at lightning speed. The room is filled with exhilarating laughter and swearing as slaps echo through the air. Finally, exhausted and covered in sweat, they collapse on the floor. Morty, I think we did it. We've slapped our way through the multiverse. Yeah, Rick, we sure did. But W, what was the point of all that? Morty, sometimes life is just about the journey, not the destination. But you know what? That shit was fun as hell. Morty chuckles, rubbing his sore face. Yeah, Rick, it kinda was. They both share a laugh, their bond stronger than ever. The portal closes, leaving them in their messy, slap-happy world. <laughs>